Hey everybody, it's Shaban, and today's a good day because today you're going to become a better game programmer. A lot of you have been asking for a more advanced tutorial, uh, advanced game programming, uh, code architecture, and some of you have been even asking for 3D, and that's what you're going to get. All right, so this is going to be a bit of a doozy. All right, I'm pumped. I hope you're pumped too. But we're going to be doing this in one sitting. And the reason why we're going to be doing this in one sitting, by we, I mean I, am going to be doing it in one sitting because I'm going to make mistakes and I'm gonna fix those mistakes in front of you. And um, this way I can think out loud about how a game programmer thinks. If I try to do this in a bunch of little segments, then I'm afraid that I'd be too tempted to create like perfect you know, cuts and make sure that I don't make any mistakes or anything like that. I wanna avoid that. Okay, so uh, this is gonna be long. So let's go ahead and open up our Godot editor. Go ahead and create a new, uh, game project we're going to be doing 3d but you can be doing 2d because the project we are going to be doing and i'm going to be talking about it as we import the files drum roll please we're going to be making a pool game pool right everybody loves pool pool as in like billiards we're going to be hitting balls and stuff like that i'm going to start importing um, and then talking about this all right this the assets that um, you can find here and probably in the description below um, is this dot blend file Okay, so pause now and download Blender if you don't already have Blender installed because you're going to need Blender in order to be able to um, import these assets. I'm going to click and drag billiardtable.blend into my file systems uh, panel here inside my uh, new project. And so I'm going to use this opportunity to talk about pool and why we're doing pool. Pool because these assets are everywhere, right? So if these assets become unavailable, you can continue to do this tutorial by using other assets and just kind of keep following along. It would be totally fine. Also, you can do it in 2D if you want. Um, it's a simple enough game that you can do 2D. In fact, I invite you to do 2D if you prefer 2D. Go ahead and grab 2D assets. I'll probably have a link for 2D assets below as well. But there's other reasons why um, I'm doing pool because it's a famous game. Uh, many people already know the rules of pool like nobody actually knows the rules of pool right everybody has a different idea of like what is the rules of pool but the point is you can look this stuff up i don't have to talk too much about it um also it's a pretty small game it doesn't focus too much on the assets i don't want to talk about set decoration and like the world building and all that kind of stuff and story i'm not trying to do that i'm trying to focus mostly on code so it should be hopefully faster for us to set this up um it's also a great little example um that gets right into these big questions about like what type of systems are we creating which systems should talk with which systems which objects should be parts of which systems and talk within which systems and that's a really important thing for talking about code architecture all right very cool uh and you know what because why not it's pool who doesn't like pool some shoot some pool all right very cool um let's start with i'm gonna click cre create a new 3d scene if you're doing 2d do 2d i'm not going to talk more about 2d just letting you know obviously I'm like 3d scene i'm going to change the node to main I, I told you that you know probably in the thumbnail that this is fully explained um well when i say fully explained i don't mean like i'm fully explaining all the 3d stuff i'm not fully explaining all of the basic godot stuff in the basic programming stuff because uh this is an advanced tutorial so go ahead and take my beginner's godot tutorial or some other beginner godot tutorial to learn a little bit more about the interface and basic godot stuff and if you also, it's going to assume you have some basic knowledge of programming, some basic idea of variables, control structures, if statements, loops, and that kind of stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and hit save, and I'm going to save this as a main.tscn file. All right, that's the convention for our, uh, basically our entry point to our project is called main.tscn. Very cool. Um, for us to be able to do anything, let's we have to see something on the screen. So we're going to be using this billiard table.blend file. This is the authoring file for blender now blender is a free and open source software so perfect for you know godot i should have mentioned that before and you hopefully you didn't close out of the video and i'm like go download another software and you think it costs money or something like that anyway so billiard table dot blend um you can't really open this directly inside of godot because godot is not blender but godot does have the ability to access like the runtime of blender if it's installed so that it can uh, import the graphics directly into godot and what's really cool about this is that it's called round trip editing if you modify the blender file um, inside of blender and save it then it should hopefully update automatically within godot as well so if i click and drag billiard table at blend directly into the scene you might be like what the heck that's an authoring file directly in the scene and actually yeah see it's, you're able to do it but this is highly limited and we're going to 
probably not go this way. But the point is that you'll notice that it says billiard table and there's this little scene icon that's similar to the scene icon you would see if this were a Godot scene. So you might think, is this a Godot scene? No, there's no TSCN file for this billiard table anywhere to be found. If I click on the little clapboard icon to open this in the editor, it's actually going to tell me like, you know what, this is not a Godot scene. You want to try to open it anyway. You can say, sure, but here's the thing. Like it opens, it doesn't say that it's like not saved. It says that it's saved because it's actually opening the blend file. And I just told you like, wait, you can't do that. Well, you can't. What you're seeing here is basically all of these different, the structure of the Blender file, the components within the Blender file, these little meshes. When I say mesh, I'm talking about basically the collection of vertices and such um, with the you know material, the kind of the color, the texture applied to those things. They're, they're non-interactive elements of the game, right? They're just the appearance of 3D. Very cool. But notice how we're not actually able to do anything here. If I like hide some of these balls, like the 9, 8, and 14, that's kind of an interesting uh, order. All right. And if I try to, you know, hit save control S, it's going to like pretend like it's saving it, but you can notice this little conspicuous little asterisk icon appears. It says basically it's not going to actually save anything. In fact, if I go to the main scene, you'll see that those balls are still visible, even though they appear to be invisible. They appear to be invisible inside of the billiard table, like little dot blend file. So I'm not actually able to do anything with this. I'm going to close this little blend file out because this is not very helpful. It's Okay, it's going to mock me with this, like, do you want to save changes to a thing you can't save? Uh, okay, like save and close just to see if it... Okay, I was, I was afraid I was going to, like, crash, you know. It didn't even close it, right? Because it's not able to save and close it. That's kind of like a bug. That's okay. Just do, don't save. Say, I recognize it can't be saved. Silly. All right, so what I actually want to do is I want this to be in the Godot scene format so I can make some changes to it. So the billiard table is still here. I'm going to click on this little clapboard icon again, but this time I'm going to choose new inherited instead of open anyway. So basically I want to do new inherited. It's basically going to take the blend scene and it's going to load it in as the main scene of this new unsaved Godot scene. Since it's a Godot scene, we can make changes to it. So I'm going to save this. I'm going to call it billiardtable.tscn. I'm going to go with the default and click save. Very cool. Now we have that billiard table at TSCN file in the file system. And if I hide like the nine and eight ball and hit save and I come back to the main scene, you'll notice, wait, where are those balls? They're, they're still there. Well, don't panic. Remember, this billiard table is what we got when we dragged the blend file directly inside of the scene. So this is not actually an instance of the billiard table.tscn file that we had just created. So I'm actually going to Right click on this little billiard table and hit delete, delete nodes, click OK. And I'm going to drag in the billiard table.tscn file. And very cool, we should see now, hopefully, that those two balls are missing. So in fact, it is allowing us to make some basic changes um, that are Godot specific. Now, we can't actually do much more. If I wanted to rename this file to like, you know, something else, I can't really do anything. If I want to do rename, it's not really letting me do anything. If I want to delete it, it's going to say, you can't delete the scene that it inherits from because what it's doing is it's still working within that blend file directly. See, it says this is the, the blend file that's just being wrapped by the billiard.tscn file. And so we can't actually do anything. But if we want to actually change how this is imported, which is actually kind of what we do want to do, we actually have to change the import uh, settings of the blend file directly. Or you can go into bl uh, Blender. If you go into Blender, you can you know, do whatever the heck you want with the graphics. Um, so billiard table dot blend. I want to change this up so that uh, we don't have cue sticks just like floating around on the table. Now, of course, we can hide them. But ultimately, what I actually want to do is I want to save this out as more than just a blend file. Because right now, these meshes, I can't do anything with them. I want to be able to move the balls around, right? I want to be able to shoot the balls with the cue sticks or whatever they're called, the cues. The should have probably looked that up before this tutorial. Anyways, um, so that's what I want to do. And I can do that by double clicking on the billiard table that blend file. When I double click on it, it's going to open up this kind of like import editing thing, which is kind of cool, right? Here it is. I'm going to resize it. It might take a few minutes or something, depending on the speed of your computer. <clears throat> and now that I'm over here in this, you know, little import settings, I can specify what gets imported and how, which is kind of cool. So here's here's the stuff that I'm currently importing. Um, what I want to do is I want to say, I don't want all these balls. I don't need all these balls. I only need one of them because I'm going to use one ball mesh. And again, the mesh is just the graphic for the ball. 
um, I'm just going to have the one ball mesh and I'll just create however many instances of that ball as I need and apply a different texture to the ball depending on the type of ball it is. I can do that by with, it doesn't matter with the ball because they all are effectively the same mesh, right? So I'm going to select the white ball. See, notice how this red thing is a mesh instance. This is effectively a node that you can actually, uh, you know, work with inside of Doe, this mesh instance. But the mesh itself is what is being created directly within Blender. <clears throat> Very cool. And so with this mesh selected, I'm going to click on this little enabled for the save the file so that I can save this out as a separate file than the blend file. And then where I want to save it, I'm going to click on this little folder icon. And already I can tell, like, I don't really like this. I want to be able to save it into a separate folder than just right there in the root. But we'll fix that in a second. I'm going to call it ball. And it's either going to save it as an RES file or a TRES file. It doesn't really matter which one because it's just a mesh we can't change anyways. So it doesn't have to be this like editable TRES or whatever. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and click save. I'm just going to go with whatever Godot wants to save it as and then click save. <clears throat> and notice how it actually doesn't appear yet in the file system, right? It's because it's not going to do anything until I click re-import. So for the Q stick, um, I also want to save the Q stick out because I also want to be able to move this independently. This isn't just a graphic that sits static in the scene. I want it to be able to be moved so that we can have the, sh the appearance of shooting the ball. So I'm under save to file and click enabled and I'm going to call this, I don't know, Q, Q stick, I guess. I don't know. You probably know more about pool than I do. I'm just going to call it whatever. You can call it whatever you want. I'm going to click save. And now cool. I basically am saving these meshes out separately so that I can um, inside of my file system, I can move, put them in their own separate interactive kind of scenes. Um, now there are a lot of balls. Um, so I'm not going to do this for each of these, but notice how if you select any of these mesh instances, you can say skip import, which is to say it's not going to import this as a mesh instance node inside of the dough. It's just going to skip it entirely. I'll just do it for a Q-Stick 2, just so you can see that how it works. If I click skip import on, you can do it for all the rest of the balls if you want. Um, just not the one that you're going to be importing <laughs> that you're saving, because if you say skip import, it's probably not even going to save it. All right, go ahead and click... Uh, so skip import on queues too. I'm going to click re-import. Um, it's going to attempt to re-import that blend file like it had done when we first dragged in the .blend file. Um, and hopefully, if all goes well, what we should see here is that this queue stick 2 doesn't actually import whatsoever. And we should see these res files. Okay, very cool. So we have ball.res, we have queue stick.res. This other queue stick is totally absent. Um, very, very cool. Now, I don't actually need to see any of these um, inside of the, uh, it's on top of my table because we're going to bring them in as basically separate um, scenes later on. So I'm actually going to hide all of these balls. In fact, you can select multiple balls by clicking and then holding shift and clicking everything that you want to hide so that it basically makes it all invisible. Cool. So we have basically an empty clear table. If I come back to the main scene, you'll see that cool. It's an empty clear table and it you look carefully, it looks like where the heck is this table? Like if you look at this little like green and blue and red lines, where they intersect is the center of the world. And the center of the world is kind of some arbitrary place that it was when you just kind of clicked and dragged in this file. So I come into the billiard table scene. It's also actually kind of in some weird arbitrary place. I'm not sure why. It almost seems like the person who made this file decided on that kind of origin point for the table. It's kind of weird. Um, or maybe they didn't. Maybe just how Godot imported it, with Blender, the blend file. What I want to do is I want to center everything because that's just going to make it easier for me to make reference points um, so that it's right there in the center of the table. So if I click on billiard table fabric, hold shift and click billiard table plastic grids or whatever. And if I go to the transform settings in the inspector and click on this little like zero out button for the position, I like it. It's right there in the center. Um, now, don't be overzealous. Don't do that for the scale yet, because we don't know if the scale actually is a problem. It's possible that the author of this file actually chose this import scale um, in order for it to match up with like a standard size pool table. Uh, we can kind of verify that later. So I'm going to kind of leave it as is. I come back to the main scene. Now it looks like it's in a different arbitrary position. That's OK, because this is just effectively an instance of that TSCN file. I want to zero it out to match the uh, default position 000 that we had just uh, saved inside of the billiard table.tscn file by clicking on this little reset position. So now the, the 
um, instance is at the default 000 that we had saved it inside of billiard table.tscn file. So within main, very cool, I can um, save this out. I'm trying to go relatively quickly because I want to kind of get to the code. That's what I want to fully explain, so to speak. So um, actually, before we keep moving, I want to fix our file system right now. It's just everything being dumped in the, uh, the root of the resources folder. And you know what? If it's like a game jam game or something like that, then you know, power to you. I'm not going to shame you for just dumping all your junk inside of the um, root directory of your resources folder. But um, I think this fold, this game is probably going to be big enough that it warrants let's like organize our scenes and stuff a little bit better, organize our file system a little bit better. So I'm going to do this by creating a separate folder for my assets, a separate folder for my scenes, a separate folder for my scripts, and so on. Now you might be like, I've heard that it's better to just create like a separate folder for like your player, a separate folder for each enemy and stuff. Well, yeah, if your player has like a whole bunch of different like scripts and stuff in it, and you know, it's big enough that you want, that is a very good idea. But like, there's no one size fits all. Like this, for this kind of size of project, I think that is perfectly fine to just create a different folder for each type of asset. In fact, I think that's going to be easier for me to like locate the stuff that I'm working with. I'm going to right click on the RES folder and I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to call it assets. I'm going to create, I'm going to right click the folder, the RES folder again, I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to call it scenes. Okay, so I have an assets and scenes folder. So I'm going to select the textures uh, folder. I'm going to hold control or maybe command on Mac. But on the Windows, I'm going to hit control. I'm going to click on the ball.res file, click the billiard table at blend file, click the qstick.res file, and I'm going to click on this, I guess this icon.svg that we're not using. And I'm going to click and drag it into the assets folder. <clears throat> now, uh, the icon.svg, you might be like, shouldn't we just delete the icon.svg file? This is the Godot icon, folks. Okay, come on. Where's your allegiance? Also, it's bad luck. If you delete the default icon, then it's, you know, who knows what could happen. <laughs> Hopefully none of you are superstitious are like, really? Is it bad luck? Maybe. Anyways, um, <laughs> I'm going to move this billiard, ta uh, billiard table.tscn file and the main.tscn file inside of the scenes folder, but first save it. Save, save. You are reducing your likelihood of crazy stuff happening because if you, do billiard, if you don't save it and you drag them into a new folder, the, the editor is going to be like, wait, hold on, where's that file? And it's like going to be confused. Okay. Reduce your likelihood of things getting bad by clicking and dragging them into the scenes folder. If you're like, I accidentally didn't save it. Uh, well, see, I guess good luck. You know, see if it works. Restart Godot if like things seem weird or corrupt. If it's still bad, well, I guess you might have to restart some of the stuff. It's kind of risky to rearrange your file system like while you're working. Okay, in fact, it probably would have been safer to just first close Godot and then rearrange your files. But actually, maybe not, because they import files. All right, well, anyways, it's better to just be right the first time with your file system. Let's run the scene so that we can actually have, you know, some niceness about what we've been doing so far, like a payoff, some small payoff. Go to the... Why, okay, billiard table is select. Do, okay, we're going to open up main.tscn. <laughs> it apparently closed main.tscn when we dragged it into a new folder. Um, and I'm going to run from main.tscn. And you might be like, does that matter? Well, not really, but it matters the first time because what's going to happen is going to be like, oh, you've never defined a main scene. Do you want to select this one? Well, if you're in the billiard table.tscn file, then no. <laughs> so make sure that you're in the main scene and select the main.tscn file as your initial point. Click select current and it's going to open it up and you're going to be like, I thought I was trying to have a little validation for the work I've done so far. Instead, I get a gray screen. Um, Yeah, because this isn't a 2D game. This is a 3D game and a 3D game, in order to be able to see these like mesh assets in the world that you've created, you need what's called a camera. OK, so we're going to create a camera. So for main scene, I'm going to create a new node as a child of main. We're gonna call it camera, and we're gonna just go with the default camera 3D. <clears throat> and you'll notice something um, pretty interesting here. First of all, I forgot to tell you like how to kind of navigate. If you hold right click on your uh, mouse and then WASD, it's how you can kind of fly around. If while holding right click, you scroll up and down, it'll change the speed at which you're able to fly. And you can see the little icon of this little running person to say like how many units per second this character is flying, I guess. I don't know. All right, but we also see this blue arrow, red arrow, and green arrow, okay? So each of these represents an axis within 3D space, and the arrow allows you to translate the position of the object in 3D space. The blue arrow represents the Z axis, 
and the po and the direction the arrow is pointing is the positive direction of each uh, respective axis. So blue pointing this way is positive. So this way is blue positive. The green axis is the uh, y axis. The red axis is the red axis. This follows the convention of OpenGL. That's the Godot authors decided on that. Unity and Unreal each do a different set of like which ones. Z and which one's X and Y. We're not talking about those engines. But you'll notice that um, the camera, if you look at it, it's facing the direction of Z negative. And that's by, uh, that's intentional. Um, OpenGL, the positive, uh, sorry, the forward vector is the negative Z direction. Okay, we'll talk more about that later. All right, so what I want to do is I want this camera to be like looking at the table. So I'm not going to do anything with the red axis because I want the x-axis because I want this to be directly in the center of the table. So I'm actually going to kind of move it back a little bit. I'm going to move the camera up with the y-axis. And then I'm going to use this little rotating orbit thing to rotate around the x-axis. That's what the red orbit line looks like, the arc. It allows you to rotate around the x-axis. Okay, very cool. It's very different than like the whole, you know, one rotation axis in 2D. Click and I'm going to kind of have it point down towards the the uh, table and if you're like well how is it actually looking like what does it look like like what how do i know how it's supposed to be well you can hit play or you can just click on this little preview icon see the little preview icon here click preview and this is what i'm actually looking at it's like okay well that's not quite the whole table so instead of like adjusting and then clicking preview every like couple seconds what i'm going to do actually is i'm going to click on the little view um, menu in the toolbar and click two viewports so that in one of the viewports, I'll click on this bottom one and click the little preview checkbox so that in the view, in the bottom little editing viewport thing, I can see the little yellow rectangle, which is the actual what the camera is going to see in the uh, game, the, the game's viewport. And I'm going to click and drag. Uh, is this selected, folks? OK, there we go. And I'm going to kind of like resize this so that the entire billiard table is within the view of the um, viewport and i'm gonna whoops you diddle i'm gonna rotate it so it's looking a little bit more down we can kind of push it up a bit okay i'm gonna move it forward a little bit maybe look a little bit further down i want to be able to see the whole table i think that's that's pretty good maybe move it down a little bit so we can kind of see a little bit more you might want like a little bit more negative space around the edges or something like that but i want you on your screen to be able to see as much as possible that of what I'm doing. I'm going to actually make it look even further down. OK, I really like this. Okay, that's pretty good. I'm going to hit Save. I'm going to go back to one viewport mode. I'm going to hit Run so that I can see what it's supposed to look like and should look all awesome, except, oh my gosh, what's this like spooky, dark table junk? Like This didn't look anything like what it looked like inside of the like editing window. It's I feel like this is some kind of like fraud. It's like false advertising. This is what it was supposed to look like. I even hit preview. What? It's because the what we see inside of the editor is kind of like this like dolled up scene that allows us to see more easily like what we're dealing with. We're not actually seeing it as we would run the game because we need lighting. Okay. But sometimes you want to be able to work in a scene that is like dark, but like, you know what I mean? Sometimes you're making a dark game and like you still want to be able to edit what you're working with very easily. And so it's kind of just, you know, by default, this kind of brightness that you see inside of the editing window. Um, if you want it to not look dark inside of your game, you're going to need a light. So with the main scene selected, I'm going to click on this little add new node. I'm going to type a light and you can see there's a number of different options. There's a spotlight. There's omnidirectional light. Well, the one I want is the directional light 3D. This represents basically like sunlight. Okay, and it's like, what? Everything became dark. It became dark because, like, see the front of the table's bright. It's just facing perfectly from, you know, Z. I need this to kind of point down a little bit. See, if I point down, you can see that, oh, cool. I'm able to see, like, I maybe even make it kind of like this. That's kind of cool. Very neat. And if I hit play, you'll see, ta-da, our table has light. This might be good enough for you. I'm going to go slightly further than this. Um, because there's no shadows, like there's shading, there's light and shading, but there's no shadows. Okay, I can show you what I mean. If I come to the assets and I drag ball.res 
inside of my scene. Here's my ball mesh. Notice how it's separate from the billiard table, which is awesome. If I kind of try to drag it above the table, you'll look carefully and you don't see any actual shadow because the, the light's not casting a shadow. So if I click Directional Light 3D and under the shadow drawer of the Directional Light 3D settings of the inspector, it's currently unchecked. If I click Enabled, you'll see, well, it still doesn't appear like there's a shadow for the ball and you might be like, what gives? And I'd be totally supportive of your what gives question because what the heck? Um, but if you look at the pocket carefully as you click shadow, you can see that there actually is in fact a shadow. The problem is that this, so the surface of the table is is casting a shadow, but the ball is so small. It's only like a couple inches or you know a few centimeters in diameter. So by default, meshes of that size just they are not going to cast a very nice shadow because like it would be ridiculously like imagine all of the shadows that'd be cast by all the like tiny little objects everywhere. It'll be like shat fingers are casting shadows on themselves, which is maybe fine, but that's generally not what we want. We could either make everything really big, which is probably not a good idea. We want to keep things as close to that like reference size of an actual table as possible. Instead, you can change inside of the directional light settings under uh, re-enable shadow. Under bias, it basically chooses like, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm cautioning to like spend too much time explaining 3D stuff. Let's just say that make it smaller and then it's like a little bit more zealous about allowing shadows that are on small objects. If I drag this over to the left, you can see like, holy moly, it's casting shadows to the point where like the edge of the table casts shadows, which is fine. But now it seems like even the surface is casting, shadow, casting shadows on itself, which is a bit much. So it's kind of hard to drag precisely here. So I'm just going to like type it manually 0.05. That's good enough for me. The ball clearly casts a shadow and the surface looks mostly fine. This looks kind of bad. You can change the normal bias to kind of like smooth it out a little bit too. You mess with that. I'm not messing with that. All right, I'm going to hit save. And here's the other thing. It's like suddenly there's just way too much junk on the screen. It's like there's this orange box. There's this like giant white arrow thing. The thing about the directional light, it doesn't matter where the directional light is because all that matters is the direction of the light. It's basically casting infinite rays of light from infinite far away. So I'm going to move it far the heck away and out of my sight. Get out of town. I don't want to look at you. Whew. Get out of here. But no, look, it's still the same. So if I hit play, you can see there's the ball. It's casting a shadow. We still have the light. Okay, very good. Let's keep going. Um, if you haven't cleared the table already, go ahead and clear the table. I'm going to keep this little ball mesh out here for now because I'm about to like do something with it. But inside of your billiard table uh, TSCN file, go ahead and like hide all the stuff that's on the table because we don't need it anymore. Right now, all we need is a table and a ball, right? Because we want the ball to be able to fall. Right now, if you remember, I hit play, the ball doesn't fall. The ball doesn't fall because I can't think of a rhyme. That's not the reason why, but anyways, yeah, the ball doesn't fall. For it to fall, we'll see that it's just a mesh. It's just an appearance of something. It's like a sprite. It's like a 3D sprite almost that represents a collection of vertices. And then also it has a material applied over it so that we can have some kind of appearance <laughs> over those like wire mesh of what the mesh is. If we want it to fall, it has to be inside of the physics engine. In order for it to be the physics engine, it has to be a body. Okay, so um, physics engines act on bodies. So with the main node selected, I'm going to create a new body and there's a number of different bodies there's even a vehicle body what is this going to be like freaking what's that game called with the soccer soccer cars <laughs> i feel like such a dumb dumb that i can't remember <laughs> it'll come back to me the soccer car game uh yeah we're just driving around on the pool table with our soccer cars like some of you are like oh my gosh skip this game engine shaban does can't think of rocket league oh rocket league that's the game, um, like right off the top is that. All right, we're not doing that. We're going to do with this rigid body 3D because look, it's a pool ball, right? Because <laughs> we're making pool and it's a, like a swimming pool ball. No, it's because that's just the most simple type of body and that's what we want. Whenever it's like some kind of just physics game, it doesn't have to be a sphere. It can be any kind of thing that just like bounces around. That's going to be a rigid body. Click create. Uh, now we've got a ball mesh in this rigid body. Well, the met, the ball body is what's going to move around in space, and we want the mesh to follow it. So I'm going to click and drag the ball to the rigid body so that it's childed, we'll call it, 
to the rigid body so that when the rigid body moves, the ball moves as well. But I want to be clear that this ball is not the ball. The ball, this is just the mesh of the ball. So I'll just call it ball mesh using Pascal case by convention. And I'll change rigid body 3D to be ball because the rigid body is going to represent the root of this ball because we want everything to do with the ball to follow this body. So it's going to be the root. And speaking of root, I want this to be its own scene, right? In fact, let's just first make sure that it can actually fall. If I click and drag and up and I play, you'll see it falls. Hooray, it falls through the table. Well, first let's finish out the ball. So I'm going to make this its own scene by right clicking on the root of what is going to be this, the ball scene, which is this rigid body. And I'm going to choose, uh, not make scene root, do not do that. Save branch as scene. And I'm going to call it ball.tscn, but I'm going to put it inside of the scenes folder I had created. So ball.tscn in the scenes folder, click save. And I'm going to go inside of the ball scene itself by clicking on the little clapboard or double clicking ball.tscn inside of the file system. And you'll notice right away that this ball mesh is just floating around here floating out here away from the origin point of the uh, ball scene. I want to fix that by selecting the ball mesh. And I want it to be lined up perfectly with the center of that ball rigid body. So I'm going to go to transform. I'm going to click this little reset to 000 button. And now it's actually the ball scene is away from the center because inside of the main scene, I had like moved it to see if I was able to like have it fall. So I had already offset from the 000, the ball scene, when I had saved it uh, as scene. So I want the rigid body also to be at the 000 point. It's, it's really best that your scenes um, emit, like emerge basically from that 000 center point. It would work, frankly, because the ball's going to have to move anyways. But uh, it's, it's going to be a lot cleaner to just do it this way. All right. Uh, very cool. Um, with the ball select, we have our ball mesh. I'm going to come back to the main scene and look, here's my ball. It's an instance of the ball scene. I can kind of click and drag and hit play, and you'll see that it falls through the floor. Okay, so we've got a couple of problems. And one of the problems, uh, Godot is yelling at me about this little yellow icon. And again, watch a beginner tutorial if you want to learn more about kind of what collision shapes are. But the rigid body doesn't have a shape. It has no means of being able to detect collision because it doesn't have a shape that allows it to detect collisions. This could be a cube, it could be a sphere. It doesn't read in the data of the mesh to be able to figure that out. With the ball selected, I'm going to click on this little create new uh, child, and I'm going to create a new uh, shape. So I'm going to type in shape. I'm going to do collision shape 3D. It's like collision shape 2D, but the 3D version. And then under the shape where it says empty, I'm going to choose a uh, sphere shape because believe it or not, balls are spheres. This is also an English class. <laughs> This is what a sphere is. This doesn't look like a sphere. This looks like kind of a cool child toy, but this is not a mesh. It's not like has a whole bunch of triangles and faces and stuff like that. This is the most basic concept of a sphere. It's basically a three-dimensional object that has, it's just like three circles is basically how we can represent a sphere when we were talking about three axes. That's okay. I'm going to click and drag this in. And I want to be very, very, very clear with you. Do not change the scale because the scale is the node 3D's settings, not the shape's settings. If I click on sphere shape, you'll see that I'm changing the radius. This is what the physics engine reads. It reads the radius of the sphere shape. It doesn't care about the node 3D's transform. You are going to create problems. Don't mess with it. Keep scale one, one, one on your node 3D transform when you're working. I'm going to click and drag the red icon in, the little red handle, control handle to reduce the radius. And you'll notice that there's this little M that appears. That M tells you, hopefully, that Godot's physics engine works in meters. And usually, physics engines work in meters. And so um, when I click and drag this in, this is talking about the radius of the ball in meters, which will give us a good sense of what the size of the ball is in space. So if I click and drag this little icon in, go all the way until it goes into the ball, and then back up slightly so it's just as big as the ball needs to be. This is like 0 0.026, 0 0.026 meters or 0 0.027. Okay, well, so that means that it's about 0 0.05 meters in diameter. That's about five centimeters in diameter, actually a little bit over five centimeters in diameter and a pool ball by convention, I think, by like standards actually, is supposed to be like two and a quarter inches, I think. And so two and a quarter inches is like a little bit over five 
centimeters. So this actually appears to be approximately to scale, maybe a little bit small, but it's good enough. Okay, I, I like that. If it wasn't, then I would probably recommend going into the import settings of the blend file or whatever, you know, it doesn't have to be the blend file. It could also be like a, uh, a GLTF file like that's been exported and you can change the import settings there and you can change the scale for uh, everything that you're importing so that it does match the correct um, size. It'll just make things a little bit easier if it, if it matches the size of what pool is supposed to be. <clears throat> All right, very cool. I'm going to save that, come back to the main scene. We have our ball. It now has a collision shape if you look very carefully at it. See? <laughs> it's kind of hard to see it. It's there. All right. And if I save and run, it still falls through the table. What the heck? What the heck, ball? Why are you falling through a table? It's a dumb thing to do, isn't it? Isn't it a dumb thing to do? Can't you tell that there is a table? No, it can't tell there's a table because the physics world doesn't care about tables. It doesn't care about meshes. It doesn't care about colors. It doesn't know anything. It's in its own little physics world doing physics, gravity and physics integration stuff. And there's only one body in that world, so it just falls. So we need another body for it to fall on top of, and the surface of this table doesn't have a body. So what we need to do is add a surface to the table, and we can do that inside of the main scene if we wanted to, but then it's just going to be floating outside of the table. I think that it makes more sense that that body or the surface of the table is inside of the billiard table because that makes sense for where the you know scene composition. It's the surface of the table. It should be in the billiard table. A TSEN file. Now, I'm going to do something that I don't recommend you following me to do. I just want to, to let you know that some of you may already know that you can have Godot automatically create this collision shape for a body um, based on the mesh data. Be very careful with that. In many games, that's totally fine. But I'm going to show you that don't follow me, but like I'm going to show you that if I actually double click on the billiard table.blend file, it's going to be like, hold on be careful alert and it's not even really showing me like what the alert says like that's kind of weird i don't actually want to do anything with this blend file i'm just showing you how you can have um godot it's godot it's not blender godot is creating i think it's Godot that's doing it yeah it's godot that's doing it because it would do it for like a gltf file and obj file too and all that kind of stuff um but inside of godot we're able to um, select what we want. So this is the billiard table fabric. This is for for what we want um, Godot to create a collision shape. <clears throat> Again, don't do this. Just because I'm doing it on the screen doesn't mean you should do it. Hopefully you know enough English to know I'm saying don't do what I'm doing. <laughs> All right. I just want to show you how you can do it. So what I can do is with the mesh instance thing selected, the red node, which will ultimately become the object, with inside of Godot. Uh, if I click uh, physics under on, now automatically it's applying the default settings of like guessing the collision shape, which is for it to be a static body, which is what we want because we don't want this body to fall. We don't want it to have forces integrated onto the body directly. Um, but under shape type, it's using basically what algorithm to use to create a collision shape from this mesh data. And by default, it's decompose convex, which is a pretty good default because convex shapes are much more performant than concave shapes. And you'll see that it's basically, it has to create multiple convex shapes because otherwise, like how is it gonna be able to create those pockets? But the problem is you'll notice that these pockets are like kind of weird and they probably will create problems with the a ball apparently falling in the hole. You know, also, if you look carefully, that shape is at, like it's overlapping the stick, which means that it's actually over the surface of the table. This is not what we want. We can't really do anything in here. We want to be able to have more control over the uh, settings of this. But if you actually just quickly, if you click Try Mesh, this is the most advanced and most true to mesh version of a collision shape that you can create. And if you're creating a relatively simple game on on like a uh, platform like maybe PC or like Xbox or something that that can probably has fast enough processing power to handle collisions of like high precision, then you know that's probably fine and it's quick and easy and you can always 
delete it later if you don't like it. Look how perfect it is. Like, oh my gosh, it's like creating a collision shape that's like perfect to the pocket. Now you might be tempted to do this because it's fast and it might create the most like authentic like ball falling experience, but usually it doesn't have to be this perfect and it's not actually perfect because the problem with this is even the surface of the table has all these triangles, which is really not what we want. If it's a physics based game, even if it's not a physics based game, even if it's just a game where you run around, the surface that you run around on should not be like a whole bunch of triangles. All right. You're, you're just asking for problems in the physics engine. The ball that's rolling is probably going to like, even though it's supposed to be flat, it's probably going to catch like little edges of these triangles and it's going to bounce. Weird edge cases are going to happen where it's just going to like get stuck somewhere. It's going to roll and then just kind of like fall into some weird cavity. It's going to be doing silly stuff. So you want this to be as actually perfectly simple as it can be. So I'm going to click close. I don't want to click reimport. I want to click close. I want to create the static mesh myself. A uh, static mesh, the static body collision shape myself. So with billiard table selected inside of the billiard table.tscn file, I'm going to create a new node and I'm going to make it a static body 3D node. I'm going to rename it to, I don't know, surface or something like that or surface body. I don't care what you want to call it. Surface body. That sounds kind of morbid. We've been talking about like bad luck and SVG files and spooky lighting and now surface bodies and we're talking about swimming pools. Guys, this is getting scary. All right, very cool. Let's with surface. I'm going to create a new collision shape. Ta-da! Collision shape 3D, and I don't want it to be a sphere. I want it to be a box. I'm going to choose box shape 3D from the selection, and that's that's not what I want my shape to look like. But again, do not use scale handles. Don't do it. That's changing the node 3D's scale. Use the little like circle things. So if I click and drag so that this shape is as thin as possible. In fact, I can have the box shape selected. Click on the box shape so you can see um, how small it's making it. The Y is now 0 0.001 meters, which you might be like, isn't that too thin? And the answer to that question is maybe. <clears throat> but how this physics engine works is that it won't fall through or go through the static body unless the collision shape uh of the rigid body entirely goes through the object so you might be like well shouldn't it be like really fat then well as soon as it goes entirely through the surface of the static body's collision shape and it's within the collision shape that's already bad news that it's already going to do totally you know silly things probably just going to fall right through and keep falling so um it being 0.001 actually doesn't really make it um or shouldn't let's find out I want to now change. I want to now resize the uh, Z and X, um, you know, signs of the box shape. But it's kind of hard to tell from this visual mode. So under perspective, I'm going to click this little perspective view and choose top view. This allows us to basically go into this three, uh, this basically 2D mode, this orthogonal, which means that there's no perspective at all. If there's an object that's like a mile or a kilometer beneath this table you would see it just as well as you would see it if it was like one meter below the table okay which is really cool and all you have to do to move around and pan around the screen is hold right click and drag just like in the 2d view all right i'm going to kind of zoom in real close and what i want to do is i'm going to change the x scale um, and the z scale use the little control handles such that the corner of this surface collision shape just touches kind of the edge of the pocket. This is good enough for me. And you might be like, what? Art, isn't this creating like a problem? Like it's not going all the way to the edge of the wall. If we were to go all the way to the edge of the wall, then we'd go actually into the pocket, which is even worse. In fact, it doesn't matter that it's going almost to the edge of the wall because um, the ball is big enough that it's going to hit the wall before it like actually touches the edge of the wall. If this were an actual billiard table that was like, I don't know, you spent like a million dollars on this billiard table and it like the surface is like suspended like over and like you can actually see under the table, like it would work exactly the same. It's never going to actually hit this edge because it's going to hit the, the wall first. So this is actually perfectly fine. I'm going to save it. Now, if you want, you can make more uh, static. No, no, keep one static body. Just add more shapes. You can add more box shapes to like, you know, finish out kind of this like edge of this pocket. 
knock yourself out. Not literally. That's an expression that we use to say, uh, it's kind of a dumb expression. Let's not use it anymore. Anyways, try your best. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm going to just keep it just like this. And I'm going to go back to the main scene. And I'm going to put the ball like directly above the table, just like right here. And I'm going to hit save and I'm going to hit run. And ta -da, it's on the table. Now, at this point, you might be like, Shaban, it went through the table. What the heck? See, if I put it like really high above the table and I hit play, it worked for me. The reason that I'm saying this is because like, I don't know. It depends on your computer. Okay. But if I like put it all the way the heck up here and I hit play, it goes through the table. And that's because like the physics step is such that once it's going fast enough, when I say physics step, I'm basically talking about like the frames of the physics engine, like the frames per second. The physics steps become so separated at that speed that it actually falls through the table. So that's actually not good at all. Um, we'll probably fix that later once we get to dealing with the walls of the table. I can fix it now. But basically, you need to increase the number of steps that are happening so that it doesn't. If you just make the like table like fatter or something like that, it's not going to fix it. Like I said, it's going to go straight through the surface of the table. So you're probably going to have to increase the number of physics steps that happen uh, um, per frame uh, and also just per second. Hit play. Hopefully, it just sits right there on the table. Beautiful. All right. I love it. I'm loving it. That was not, I, that's not like a trademark thing. It has nothing to do with that. All right. Um, very good. Assigning ball tag. Okay. Yeah. What do we want to do? I want to um, make it so that the ball looks like different balls. Like I'm going to have more than one ball, right? Like if I duplicate this and like, okay, now I have two cue balls. Well, that's not what I want. I want one of them to be the cue ball and I want one of them to be the other ball. <laughs> The eight ball, I don't know. <laughs> this ball, this game of pool doesn't only has the eight ball. Um, no, well, I want to be able to assign a different texture to the balls, right? So I'm actually going to undo that. We're going to have one, one ball for now. I'm going to come to the ball scene, and we're going to learn how do you apply a texture to a ball. Um, well, well, notice how we have the rigid ball. We don't apply it there. We don't apply it to the collision shape. We apply it to the ball mesh. Well, this is the ball mesh instance. This is the node that allows you to be able to translate this mesh in 3D space. But if you want to actually change the mesh information, you're going to have to change the actual, uh, you're going to have to apply what we call a material to the mesh itself. So if I click on the little mesh button, then you'll see that these are the mesh settings that it's basically taking directly from Blender. And um, a mesh can actually have a number of different surfaces, right? You'll see that under here it says surface. Right, there's surface zero and there's a, a material applied to it. There could be any number of different surfaces. Like for example, you might have a hero that has like skin that's kind of rough looking and suddenly they have like a cape that's like really shiny and whatever. They might have like eyes that might have a different surface that have a kind of a different looking material. So it's not just the color. It's also kind of how it looks, how light bounces off of it and such. So this ball only has one surface and we need to modify what's called the material in order to be able to uh, make this look different, to change the color. So if I click on the now material, so again, we went into the ball mesh, now we're going to ball material. You can see like, oh, oh wow, look at this. So this is kind of this idea of physically based rendering PBR. I'm not going to be talking about that in much detail, but each of these things kind of describe how the ball is supposed to look. And where do you think you would go in order to change like the texture? Well, obviously you would go to albedo because the word albedo makes you think of texture. Anyways, this is what I'm talking about. This is you just have to kind of learn it. Albedo is basically like the new diffuse map kind of thing. Again, if you don't know 3D, that's all right. Just kind of follow along. Um, currently the texture is empty because we went with cue ball and it's using a color instead of a texture and under the assets folder under the textures folder you can see there's different options I'm going to click and drag I don't know blue one like blue that jpeg <laughs> that's not what it's called but anyways I'll drag it over here into texture and you'll see that a graphic in fact if I hover over this graphic you'll see that this is type comp compressed texture 2D it's basically a texture that's like it's saved as a file so if I click and drag this over to the texture um, property of the albedo property. 
of our material, uh, you'll see, okay, cool, now the ball's got this little two look to it. Now if I come over to the main scene, you'll see that the ball has now got the two look. All right, cool. It's like the solid blue two ball. Okay, awesome. Well, here's the problem, of course, because this ball is blue, and if I make a duplicate, that ball's blue. <laughs> Well, they're both blue. I want them to be different. You know what I mean? I want them to be uh, different kinds of balls. Well, there's a couple of ways we can do this, right? One of the ways you can do it is you can actually right click and choose like, uh, don't actually do this, but if you do editable children, like I guess expand, collapse, branch, it's one of these things. That I think it used to be called editable children, but it's probably expand or collapse branch. That allows you to change the um, different properties of this uh, of the uh, different child nodes of this scene and you might be like why would you ever do that that sounds like a bad plan in fact why would it even let you do that well if you think about it a scene when it's born it has all of the default settings it has these children the children have these properties values set to those children but you can change around the children after it's been born you can do it in the code right you can delete like this or that child it's like imagine like a human being born right so they're born with all their body parts but if like a kid's like i don't want a hand anymore they can cut their hand off and it's fine then that, not every person's hand is gone is that kid you know what i mean so uh, it's kind of why am i going into these morbid examples anyways but yeah you can do that and um that is a good idea for this could be a good idea if like this is ball is like set decoration and you're creating basically a general template for what like a wall can look like or certain things can look like and then from the you know instance of that particular you know set decoration you can change some of the like textures or some of the settings of each of the children um, of that kind of complex set decoration if you really want to um that's fine right um, but that's not really what I want to do. I want to be able to modify this in the code. What I want to do is I want to expose a variable to the up the root nodes, the root node of the scene, so that when I modify that setting, it will the code will automatically apply the new value to it. That's what I want to do. Okay. Now again, when I was talking about the set decoration thing. If you do this in the code, if you expose like a value to the editor, then it will only show up after you hit run. That's why I mean like for a level designer, it makes sense for them to be able to change certain settings of the children directly inside of the scene. Otherwise, it's usually a little bit faster and gives you more options if you change the uh, if you apply the changes in the code. So within the ball scene, uh, I want to be able to um, again expose this texture so that I can apply a different texture um, directly to the ball um, through the code. So to do this, I'm going to create a new script and I'm going to create the new script right there on the ball scene. So I'm going to click on this little, uh, well, actually, before we do that, I want to create a script folder. I'm going to right click on the RES. I'm going to do create new. I'm going to do script. Why did I do that? RES not create new, create new folder. And I'm going to call it script. Okay, now we have an assets folder, a scenes folder, and a scripts folder. I'm going to, um, with the ball selected, I'm going to click on this create new uh, scene, and it's going to be called ball.gd, and it's not, I do not put it in the scenes folder. I'm going to click on this little change folder icon here, and I, I'm going to have to click this little up arrow to go back a directory, choose scripts. I'm going to call it ball.gd. Very good. Click open. Ball.gd will go for the default, like it's going to inherit from rigid body 3D. Everything's good. Click create. It's gonna give me a bunch of junk. I don't like junk, so I, I'm just like, whenever I open a new script, this is probably a little excessive, but I like to just delete everything. I'm like, get out of there, except for this. Like, it's a, it's a, it's a rigid body, so we'll keep that. Um, and we wanna have the properties of rigid body available to us inside of the script. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to what we call expose um, this texture property. You notice how the text, you had that texture property in that like albedo dropdown list. I'm gonna, also create a texture property but it's going to belong to the script and i'm going to allow you to drag a texture to that texture property inside of the inspector so to do this i have to create a variable and i'm going to call it a texture okay 
And uh, you might be like, why am I creating a little underscore? And the, the whole underscore thing, this is the kind of the recommendation under style, like the style guide for Godot, I think generally, where this texture is something that I don't want a different code file to modify. And this is just a convention. You don't need it for it to work. This is just a convention to say, please don't try to modify this property, this variable from another code file. Okay, well, what is the texture? Well, in order for me to export it to the editor, well, I have to use the, and when I say export, this is the annotation you use to expose it to the editor. We use the export keyword, and you'll note our annotation. You'll see like, wait a minute, you can't use export unless you say what type this is so that the inspector knows what the heck you can modify. Is it an integer, you type in a number, or is it like something else that you can drag in from the file system? Well, this is a texture 2D. Now you can do compressed texture 2D because if you remember and you hovered over the asset, it says compressed texture 2D. It actually doesn't make any difference because ultimately it's gonna become a texture 2D to my understanding. All right, so it's gonna be a texture 2D with the ball selected. You can see that and I scroll up to the top that here it is exposed to the editor and I can click and drag on one ball, yellow ball over here and there it is, yellow. If I hit play, guess what? It's still blue. It's blue because just because we have a variable called texture, we could have called it pizza. Like we could have called it pizza, all right? It doesn't make any, it doesn't know what to do with this texture unless you do something with the variable. So what do I want to do? It Let's say on ready. It's like, didn't you delete ready? It's like, yeah, but you know, it's like, I'm like, get out of here. You know, it's somebody, and then they come back later. Like, ah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. You're my friend. Remember ready? We're friends, right? Please accept my apology. All right, so very good. We have a ready function. So this is basically, it'll be called when the object is ready. <laughs> okay, what do we wanna do? We want to apply this texture to the object. So how do we do that? Do we say like self.texture? Well, no, because the self refers to the rigid body. So if we wanna modify the texture, it's gonna to have to uh, apply that to the mesh, right? So um, let's, I'm just actually gonna access this mesh directly. I'm not going to expose it to the editor. I'll do that later for other things. I just want to show you how you can do it. Probably this ball scene is not going to change structure ever, <laughs> or at least anytime soon, because it's such a simple thing. There's a rigid body, there's a collision shape, and there's a mesh. If you have to add like other fancy stuff later, uh, that's all well and good. But you know, um, so I'm going to access it directly by doing ball mesh. You're like, wait, hold on. By doing that, like, isn't that not good practice? I heard from somewhere that like using node references, actually by me in my beginner tutorial, I think, <laughs> this is okay because this system is so coupled. The ball mesh is perfectly coupled to the ball. If you want to just use the little dollar sign and like access the child, this means get child. That's basically what this dollar sign means. That's fine. You can always refactor it later, but this is, you're, you're likely never ever going to see a problem with at least this particular situation. Um, and what we need to do is we need to get the material. So get active material, and remember, it's not, well, it's not asking what surface. Remember, there can be multiple surfaces. Are we going to, the eyeballs of the ball mesh, the cape of the ball mesh? No, just the zero of the ball mesh, which is the whole darn mesh. It's an integer. It's like uh, basically the index of that surface. You have to do it, even if there's only one surface, I'm pretty sure. Um, and what about this material? Unfortunately, I don't know why it needs to do this, but it knows it's a material. Like if I control click on it, it's a material. But here, there are different kinds of materials, as you can see. There's like base material, there's canvas item material, and all this kind of stuff. The type of material that I'm working with is actually, well, in fact, we'll find out. Right? Um, see this material, if I hover over it, it's a standard material 3D. What the heck is standard? I don't even see standard material 3D in here. In fact, it's under base material 3D, which is kind of like this abstract class, I believe, for a standard material 3D or ORM material 3D. Basically, it's not easy to find it, but not all materials have the albedo texture, right? So you would have to save this out as like a separate variable as a standard material 3D if you wanted to actually access that um, like little tool tip that tells me like any more stuff about it. Um, but I know, well, let's actually go back to that material, base material 3D, standard material 3D. Oh, okay, well. There's not a lot of additional stuff. So let's come back to the abstract here. Okay, it has albedo texture. That's exactly what I want. It's of type texture 2D. That sounds 
perfect. So that's what I'm going to be modifying. So I'm going to do albedo underscore texture, and then I'm going to set it to, well, this texture variable. Very good. So um, very good. So I'm going to get the active material. I'm going to set its albedo texture to the texture that I am loading in from the uh, whatever I've dragged into that texture property. And notice how the underscore doesn't actually appear in the name of the property um, that we've created. But if I hover over it, you can see the underscore. That's because Godot recognizes this convention is so common that it just like ignores the underscore. All right, very good. So if I hit play, you'll see that, ta-da, it's blue. I don't like that. I wanted it to be yellow, right? Why didn't it change? Okay. So maybe there's a couple of different things that are going on here. Perhaps let's, whoops, what have I done? What have I done? I moved my dough window away from the center of the darn OBS thing. Why did I do that? All right, um, a couple of things um, that could be uh, wrong with this. Now this is the default texture, okay? Because like if I come over here to main, I look at ball, actually that might be the problem. No. See, it's taking it. Yeah, it has the default texture and it's yellow and hit play and it's blue. So what I'm going to do is from the ball, let's actually go back into the material settings under ball mesh. <clears throat> this is a, uh, okay. So with actually, you know, while I'm here, I'm going to apply a different clear coat to it because even though this isn't really a, material so it's just this is this ball should be shinier we should be waxing our balls guys we got to wax our balls i mean the like the pool balls we got to wax them all right click enabled and look how waxy it is yeah we all like some waxy balls all right i'm gonna click this little like reset texture button to back to like no texture <laughs> now let's, hit play. let's see if it's yellow it's white okay so we've got a problem inside of our thing why is it not working uh that's really a good question i'm not sure why it's not working it should work whenever you are like you think something should work and it's probably something simple you can test it out right you can just say like did this happen like is the ready function even working is everything working as expected it says did this happen very good so it is working should be working at least Mm. folks shaban is dumped this is why i'm told you that we're i'm doing this all in one sitting so that i can like create problems in fact i was surprised that it didn't change it should have changed it even with the, i'm going to go back to blue folks i'm going to put my blue ball back in there because it really it should have overwritten this because this is the active material and that is the albedo texture uh i don't know uh drag red over here inside of the main i'm in the main scene it still looks blue Hit save, hit play. That's blue, right? I'm not losing my mind. What? Is this working for you? <laughs> like in the comments, you're probably going to be like, come on, Siobhan, like, didn't you know that you should do this thing? Uh, yeah, you know, yellow by default, um, but we overwrote that to red here. Is this... Yeah, well, of course, because it said it printed it. This is bizarro land. What? The Jimmy Crimble. Is it not setting the albedo texture after getting the active material? And we're setting the texture. I wrote Ablido, guys. Guys, I wrote Ablido. That's what I did. I wrote Ablido. This is what happens with the world. <laughs> Delete this. Why didn't that like error out? It should have been like, what the heck is an Ablido? Well, actually, I know why. I did that. Now it's red. Oh my gosh, folks. Spelling lesson. Okay. Remember how I said that get, get active material could be anything? <laughs> well, that's part of the problem. It's supposed to be a material. In fact, I'm actually just kind of surprised 
that it didn't crash when it tried to set a property that doesn't even exist. Come on, get out of wet. Maybe Ablito is a thing. It's like inside the engine somewhere, like deep inside the engine, there's an Ablito. Someone look it up for me, please. Um, and they just like forgot that, you know, it's just somewhere in the deep, darkest parts of the engine. <laughs> it just doesn't do anything. All right, it worked. That was fun. Oh, okay, okay. Now that I'm all thrown off, we have our red ball. It's not blue anymore, even though the ball is blue. The ball is blue by default. Notice how, like, if I come to 3DZ, it's blue. But I have effectively overridden it inside of the script upon ready. So let's test it out. So if I actually come over here and I make a duplicate of this ball and I put it over here, they're both blue. But let's make it so that this one is red. And, like, let's make this one uh, yellow. Just, like ketchup and mustard red and yellow now when i hit save and i hit play you can see that they're both yellow is this another ablito problem this is what i'm going to call problems from those ablitos all right um no what's happening here and this is like one of these kind of issues that are kind of hard to find uh but what's happening is that material <clears throat> so if i kind of click under uh let's go back to the ball scene um with the ball mesh selected, this uh, material here isn't itself an object. Okay, inside of the script editor, when I looked at this whole like material thing, this is an object. All right, so because it's an object, um, you can reference this object uh, in different places. That's what's effectively happening here. When I'm using this get active material albedo texture, this albedo texture is this material that belongs to the ball mesh. When I create a new ball scene, it doesn't, in Godot, it doesn't create a new instance of the material that belongs to the mesh. They're sharing resources. They are sharing the same mesh. They're sharing the same material on the mesh. To, to illustrate like th this kind of problem, if I come to the bi billiard table, and don't follow me, if I hold middle click, by the way, and drag, it goes back to perspective mode. But holy moly, put me under the table. Why was I hiding under the table, folks? What is this? Like nuclear fallout? Like that's the only time you should hide under a pool table to save yourself from the nuclear bombs. Anyways, um, so if I were to, so you have this shape. Now, if I duplicated this shape and I kind of put it over here, look what happens when I try to resize one of those shapes. They both change because the collision shapes are sharing the same box shape node okay they're they're sharing not shape node the same box shape object they're just basically two different references to the same shape when we create a new collision shape node the collision shape is different we can have different properties but they're sharing the same box shape object so if i wanted them to be different with the other box shape i would right click on the box shape and i would in the, the box shape where you see it here in the inspector. Now we choose make unique. By doing so, what we've done is a set shape. What we've done is we've created a new instance of box shape. Now when I change it, it doesn't change the original one because it's referring to a totally unique and different box shape. So I'm going to delete this collision shape because I'm done with that. And that's effectively what we need to do with our material, right? See, if you right click on a material, you can do make unique. But that, what's that going to do? It's just going to make this particular material unique, and it's still part of the ball. So, like that may not actually fix the problem. So, what we want to do is we want to do this in the code. And the code doesn't have like a make unique function. There's no like get active material dot make unique. That's not a thing, but it is a thing because in code, as you hopefully know, or maybe you don't, is that you can create a new instance of an object using the new keyword right um if it were like c sharp but you can use the new function if it's Godot, and that's what we're going to do we were going to make a new one uh before we assign the texture so i'm actually going to comment this out <clears throat> for now and i'm going to create a new material i'm going to call it new material so very new very real new material and uh it's going to be a standard material 3d dot new because we know it's going to be standard material we hover over it it says standard material 3d so it's we're going to make a new standard material 3d and um, this new material we're going to apply our albedo texture 
Now we see Alveolar Texture because we know it's a standard material. Okay, very good. And it's going to help me spell it. Gosh. And we're going to set it to texture. So now we have a new material. It's going to have its own texture. I'm going to grab that ball mesh again, but instead of like doing get active material, I'm actually going to set the active material by overriding it. If I type material, you see there's material override. Okay, material override. And we're going to say equals new material because that's the name of this material. Very good. Now, local variables by default do not, by default, by convention, do not have an underscore that precedes the name. Now, if I hit play, you should see hopefully we got ketchup and mustard. Very cool, because each of them, when the code is run, is creating a new material. All right, very good. Let's keep going. All right, so we're actually at a very important um, checkpoint inside of our project, because right now, we, okay, we got a couple of balls. Let's get rid of one of these balls. There's two balls. No, let's keep them. I like them. I like ketchup and mustard for now. Um, this is a really important part in like, we're an hour and 10 minutes, I think, into this tutorial, and we're talking about our first big code architecture decision. Okay, because we want to be able to play this game, right? We want to be able to hit this ball, right? So you're now starting to talk about taking an input. Now you're talking about there being systems where you are um, having the player interact with the world. And that's your first kind of big code architecture decision, which is how does the player interact with the world and how do you structure that in the code? How do you structure that in the node? Node in the code. The Cody Nody. All right. Um, so there's so many ways that we can handle it. There's so many different ways to do it. But here's the problem. Because a big decision like this very quickly like snowballs into like all the rest of our code architecture decisions. It kind of all re revolves around this kind of major big decision up front. Now, not all decisions are big. This one's a pretty big decision. And this one's not a decision we can refactor very quickly if we kind of go one path and start, you know, doing everything around it. So no pressure. No pressure at all. Okay, so like, what's one way we can do it? Well, I guess like we can try to do separation of concerns, this idea that, okay, well, the balls handle themselves and the cue stick should handle itself. And then the controllers of the, the controller of the player is like different. And then the camera for the play is everything handles its own self with its own script. Okay, that's not a very good employment of separation of concerns because it's the system itself that it's, that is its own separate concern. Okay. So what I mean by that is, and a good way to kind of think of this is like, if we have some kind of player or some kind of object, like the ball, right? What are things that are always associated with balls? Well, they always have a mesh, they always have a shape. Why would you separate that out? They're all just part of ball. Like, don't be scared of it. Don't be scared of this little like ball mesh thing because it's those systems, like this mesh should be perfectly coupled to the ball. And you can even kind of like <laughs> flaunt anyone who says otherwise by using a direct reference to the child inside of the parent script, the, the script on the parent node. That's totally fine. And similarly, when you are kind of making these decisions, you can kind of think of it in terms of like, okay, is this component of this system um, always part of this system? And secondly, is this component ever part of a different system? If the answer is yes, it's always part of the system and no, it's never part of a different system, that's a huge green flag. Is that a thing? Is there like a green flag? I guess it depends on what part of the world you are. Like a red flag could be a good thing, right? Well, green flag being a green light, a good light, I guess some parts of the world they use blue lights. Anyways, whatever. It's a good flag that says it's fine. It's probably fine for it to be coupled into that system because it's always there and it's never part of something else. And so similarly, okay, a player, like what does a player always have? Well, the player always like has to deal with the cue ball. The cue ball has nothing to do, like the cue ball is always what the player has to interact with. The player doesn't, is not supposed to, like this is again, the rules of pool. The player should only hit the cue ball, should not hit any other ball. Okay, cool. So maybe the cue ball should just be part of the play system of the game. Uh, the cue stick, you're always going to interact with the ball with a cue, st not always, I guess you kind of pick up the ball and move it around, but the cue stick is always has to do with the player, right? So generally speaking, in this case, it's like, well, maybe the cue stick and the ball should be part of the same system, okay? The same central system that handles all of the playing specific, you know, uh, 
nodes. And that can be all handled through that play system. So that's one way to think of it. Like, let's create a play system that handles all our play-specific nodes. Um, but you might be like, okay, well, what about, should it be like a player node? Should we create a node called player? Because that's like a common thing. We create a node called player. Well, hold on to our horses for one second. Because even though pool is a multiplayer game, it's a turn-based multiplayer game. Only one person is playing at a time, right? So you could share the same cue stick. And you certainly are sharing the same cue ball. You only have one cue ball, right? And you can share the same cue stick. Um, and you share the same camera because it's, it's turn-based, right? So instead of creating like a different player node for each player, there could even be like three players. That doesn't matter. They can just share the same nodes, right? And if you think about it, what are the actual like discernible like relevant differences between players well in the simplest form like the only difference really is that like one of one player is solids and one of them is stripes like whose turn it is like you know what i mean it's just like some very basic kind of values there's not really anything else that's very different about the player and you might be like well later you might have like an avatar for your player maybe you have like custom stick textures or something well that's fine that's very possible that that will end up happening. But even in that type of situation, it's still useful to have a play system that handles the playing behavior of the game, including what happens with the cue stick, what happens with the ball. And you can always remove as a separate system, like a player account, which has like its avatar, which has like, you know, the cue sticks and all the junk that it has associated with that. And that can be a separate system that barely talks with the play system. It doesn't need to communicate very much with the play system, right? Because the play system should only care about how the game, not how the game works, but just how the game interacts uh, with the player. So that's what we're going to do. <clears throat> okay, so um, that's what we're going to, let's go ahead and create this play system. Um, I'm going to select the main node. And I'm going to create a new node 3D. That's the most generic node that can move around inside of your scene. I would choose node, but the play system is going to have like nodes as children that move around. And so they should be able to reference their parent transform and node 3d is the most basic 3d node that has a uh, transform so i'm going to click create i'm going to change its name to play system um, i want the cue ball to be part of the play system so with the first ball selected i'm actually going to drag it into play system and i'm going to change the ball's name to cue ball and uh i suppose i want to remove the texture from it so i'm going to remove the texture from it i'm going to come back to the ball scene I'm going to make the default texture just like empty and actually the default material because it's going to be blue. So with the ball mesh selected under material, I'm going to set, don't clear the whole material. I mean, I guess you could because you're just creating a new material when it's ready. I'm going to zero out the texture. Okay, very good. So that it's kind of this white ball. The white ball is just the default without a texture. I'm going to hit play. Make sure that it doesn't crash. Okay, cool. It's fine because it's trying to apply like null to the texture. I was making sure it like didn't crash when I did that. All right, very good. Now we have two balls. I'm going to, the other ball, I guess I'll assign uh, red or something like that. It can still be ketchup. So when I hit save and I hit play, you can see that there it is, the white ball, the red ball. Now you might be like, wait, hold on. Now that the cue ball is child into the play system. They're now kind of like in different places. There's ball two and cue ball. Like, aren't we going to have problems like mix matched, mix mismatched transforms the answer is it's possible but never move the play system the play system isn't going to move around this is not the player the player is not going to like walk around the table the play system is just going to remain zero 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 and that's going to make it more uh consistent across you know the, the balls so they can all share uh, a transform that is within the same reference so keep play system zero 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 which is main zero 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 and cue ball can still move around freely but by having a child into the play system, we're basically coupling it to the play system so that we can modify anything associated with the cue ball from the play system's script. Okay, so that's very good. Um, very cool. Save it. We're going to start this way. Uh, we are going to want to create a script, but here's the thing. So we aren't able to play yet. So what's the first thing that we're going to do with playing? I think the most fun thing to do would be to like hit the ball, right? So let's go ahead and hit the ball. And um, we have our nodes. We have places that we have cue ball. Um, but like, should where should we put the script? Should the, should the cue ball handle hitting itself? 
and that's a really you know i said in the to the like beginner tutorial that like you know this node is a big kid it can handle itself and generally that's a pretty good idea but you might be like okay well the ball is a big kid it can handle itself it can shoot itself right and that's maybe one way you want to do that but here's the problem with doing it that way by having ball.gd remember this ball.gd script is supposed to be applied to all the balls right you're not supposed to hit any of the other balls right so if there's going to be code inside of the ball.gd that has to do with hitting balls it should only work on the cue ball and so you might be like okay well you just have something in there that says like if it's the cue ball no 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 you're you're <laughs> generally you do not want to work like that <laughs> okay you don't want to have like a script that works for like all characters and then you say like well if it's a player character if it's an npc all like within one script no don't do that that's not a good idea you might be like well i mean we could always extend it we could always say like you know cue ball extends ball and then we can have a cue ball script or something like that or maybe even like a cue ball like nested class or that ugh don't do the ball can only in Godot can only uh, possess one script, and all balls can possess the ball.gd script. Keep ball the ball script as just all balls as possible. It should like the things that are in the script should apply to all the balls. The cue ball. The only thing specific about the cue ball is you play with the cue ball. So anything that has to do with playing with the cue ball should be in the play system. It's okay for the play system to handle. The cue ball. You might be like, well, I thought the ball should handle itself. No, it's okay. The play system can handle the cue ball. That makes things a lot more straightforward and streamlined. It's okay for some things to work outside as long as they're part of the same concrete system. And the cue ball is part of the play system. So with the play system selected, I'm going to click on this little create new script uh, button. And by default, I don't know why, but first of all, it's putting me back in the scenes, which is like, it should just assume I wanted scripts because the last script I made i put it inside of the scripts folder but also why is it doing pascal keys in their own in godot's own style guy they recommend using snake keys for scripts so okay i'm going to click on the little new file folder or choose folder instead of scenes i'm going to go back up go back to scripts instead of play system being pascal case i'm going to do snake case because that's the can that's the recommendation and it's because it makes it more you know, less likely to have problems between different types of operating systems that some care about capitalization and some don't. Let me click open. Play system.gd, it extends node 3D. Very good. Click create. Very cool. Delete everything because, I, <laughs> you know, I don't like to look at it. You know, it's like when you go around the corner, are you somebody who like screams when you're startled? I'm someone who deletes code. Whoa, delete everything. Ah, all right. Um, what do we need to do? Well, we want to be able to shoot the ball. So here's, here's one of these things is like, should I access the ball by doing like this? Um, don't do it. We did that. And that is like, aren't you, well, that's a hypocritical thing to say. Well, we did that for the ball because the ball is a very simple, a very simple, uh, structure of nodes. This play system can like, we're probably going to change our mind a lot. <laughs> There's going to be cue sticks. There's probably going to be like cameras. There's probably going to be other stuff, some fancy stuff. Where are we going to put the cue ball? Who knows? So um, let's actually not be lazy and let's expose uh, a variable to the editor, which allows me to reference the cue ball uh, directly without using that little dollar sign. So I have a reference to a variable rather than like trying to use the dollar sign to basically do get node every single time. So we can do this by doing export just like before. Um, it's going to be a variable, and we're going to call it a uh, cue ball, I guess. And uh, well, we can't say equal. We're gonna we want it to be something you can drag in, and it's a rigid body three D. That's what it is. So now when I do this and I say from the main scene, I can click and drag with the play system selected, and we can see cue ball here. I can click and drag cue ball and we don't have to do this like node path thing anymore which is awesome with godot the newer versions of godot you can kind of click and drag and since it's a rigid body 3d it allows me to drag it on there you'll see that cue ball is now referencing specifically the node called cue ball if we were to put like well do we want to do something with it yet well if i were to just to show you if i were to drag cue ball like into the, like the main scene that's a dumb idea but it's still referencing cue ball 
okay? So if you change the, you know, the hierarchy of your nodes after the fact, it stays, it stays attached, which is really, really cool. Okay, well, what do we want to do? We want to make it so that we shoot the ball. So let's create an action inside of our uh, project settings that has to do with shooting balls. So I'm going to click project, project settings. And under the input map, I'm going to add a new action. I'm going to call it shoot, I guess. Click add. It's going to be like, oh, we have a new uh, built-in action called, uh, not built-in, it's a custom action called shoot. Click a little plus and you can make it like, I guess, click. I'll just click on that. And go, oh, that's what I wanted, left mouse button. For shooting, very good. Click OK. Shooting as left mouse, like that should just be a built-in action. It's like all games have that. Like I bet even Rocket League, you know, has a reason to click in order to shoot. <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't probably doesn't. But anyways, click close. And okay, so we have this new thing um, for our. You know, we have this shoot action. Okay, so when should we do the shoot action? Well, we, any moment of the game. Let's just say, like, let's go into process. Delta, because, you know, whatever. And I'm going to um, ask the question. If input dot press is action just press shoot. Uh, Godot just crashed, everybody. That's what happened on my screen, and it's not editing it out. <laughs> Reopen. Reanimate. 3D pool. Try that again. It's like it was telling me, like, don't put it in process, you dummy. Or something like that. Well, you know, Godot, like, you, you're not the boss of me. I do what I want. I play pool. I play pool because that's what I want to do. You know? Let's try that again. Folks. All right. If input dot is action just pressed. Shoot, I'm going to hit enter. <laughs> this time it didn't die. All right. It's like, shoot, I shot Godot. It's like, Godot. <laughs> it's just killed it. Oh, man. All right, uh, well, what are we going to do <laughs> when we shoot the ball? We're going to assume that this shoot works. So I'm actually just going to go on ahead for the sake of time. We're going to uh, apply some kind of like force to the ball, right? So Q ball, it knows it's a rigid body, so there's like stuff. Look, there's apply central force. What <laughs> Apply central impulse. What the heck is the difference between apply central force and apply central impulse? The answer to that question is actually not as much as you probably think. Um, some of you may have heard that you apply an impulse when you want some like instantaneous momentum because you learn in physics class that it's like instantaneous momentum. And like if you want to like do one big shot, do impulse. If you want to like do some shot over time, do force. And in fact, I, I'm just going to actually control click, look at it. It'll be like applies the directional force without affecting rotation. It's time dependent, meant to be applied every physics update. Apply central impulse, an impulse that's Time independent exclamation point. I mean, is that a little bit hyperbolic? You need exclamation points in your <laughs> documentation. This is like, did I write this documentation? All right, applying an impulse every frame would result in a frame rate dependent force. Like, da, 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 da. you can say whatever you want, but I've actually looked through a number of physics engines before, like in the source code of these physics engines. It's kind of funny what you find in these places. Like, when you look at the difference between an impulse and a force, sometimes it's just this, like, apply central impulse is impulse. It's just force times 100. It's just like apply central force, but they just like do an alias and they just like multiply it by 100. <laughs> Sometimes they it like, uh, they just set the velocity because like ultimately that's what an impulse is doing. It's like adding to the velocity directly, right? So some of them they just add to the velocity, whatever you type. It's like the funniest thing what's happening behind the scenes. So don't, don't expect it to be some kind of like actual, you know, you know, true to life, like physics thing. It's it's probably not. It's probably just some like just add to velocity or something. You could you just add to velocity if you want. Like I don't care. Um, and what are we gonna apply to it? I I'm just gonna like be clear what I'm adding. It, it expects a vector, right? That's what it says. It's like it needs to be a vector because we're working in 3D, folks. Okay, you gotta apply the impulse on the center of the ball, basically the center of mass of the ball, 
in some direction. Like we could apply impulse, but then it would choose like where on the ball am I hitting it? And yeah, sure, we could make a really cool pool game where we like chip the ball and it like spins around and does fancy stuff. Okay, you can add that later, but uh, we're just going to hit the center of the ball every time. So let's call it, uh, I don't know, like impulse vector. Dance around because I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Uh, impulse vector and um, what am I doing? Impulse vector, vector three. If I like just get up and run, it's because I have to go to bathroom. All right, uh, let's do impulse vector. Did that make you uneasy that I even mentioned that? Let's apply impulse vector directly. Now, like I did one here because I'm just gonna apply like one whatever the heck impulse is, like whatever units it's using for the. A impulse like thing thing impulse function behind the scenes just apply one in the x direction okay let's do that you can hit plus or play and then i'm gonna click hey look oh my god what the white hits the ketchup uh, look, uh, get out of here oh fell off the cliff everybody something fun just turn something something dangerous Kids playing and that stuff happens. Got to be careful. Um, so what? Where were we? We okay? So we're able to shoot the ball. It doesn't shoot at all in the right direction though. So uh, that's one of the problems. Um. So what we need to do next is I'm gonna go to the bathroom. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. I'll be right back. All right, I'm back. I probably won't be as <laughs> jumpy. I knew I shouldn't have drank like a mug of tea before I came here. But like my whole family's sick in the house and I've got to ward off the sickness by drinking a bunch of tea. All right. Um, very cool. What were we talking about? Uh, let's see. What, what were we doing? Okay, we've got balls. We can play. We can shoot the balls and they hit each other. Very cool. But here's the problem, right? We can't like aim, right? We can't like turn around and shoot the ball a different way and so we can start working on that but i think what makes what would be kind of more fun and interesting is we have the visualization of aiming the ball which is with a stick right like if you think about it like you got a here's my cue stick right like we want to be able to like look down a cue stick and like the cue stick helps us kind of like aim to see like where like which direction we're hitting the ball um very cool so <clears throat> It's going to get complicated. Okay, so for those of you who have trouble look, like thinking in 3D space, put on your brain food. <laughs> put on your brain. Eat your brain food. Eat your granola. Eat your apples. Get ready, okay? It's going to probably get a little bit confusing, but that's okay. Let's just start it and do some fun stuff. So what we know we're going to need is we're going to need that asset, right, under uh, that we had saved out, that qstick.res file. If I just kind of click and drag that into my scene, there's a couple problems right away let's do something fun so the cue stick right now it should be part of the play system right but should it be a child of the cue ball like see the thing is the stick needs to follow the ball right because like wherever the ball goes our stick is gonna have to go there too because we're gonna have to hit the ball again so you might be like oh yeah the cue stick should be a child of the cue ball that should be no problem well here's the problem so when i shoot it's like wah that was kind of fun like, look at it look at it go wah go 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 all right um hopefully that wasn't too loud in your ears um but the point is that the cue stick as a child of this ball, like, is that is a way that you can lock its position to the ball. But also, that's not how we want to lock the position to the ball, okay? Because like it's also locking, it's it's also getting the transform the the rotation from the ball too. So we want them to be kind of siblings of each other in some way. But before we do that, there's something that I really want you to recognize, and this might not make sense to you automatically. So just kind of follow along as we go through this maybe it'll make more sense as we go notice how uh, the camera when we had created it by default the camera faced in the negative z direction i had mentioned that about opengl before that is not only the convention that is how the game engine works with all of its systems so inside of the script for example you don't follow me just like look at what i'm writing so if i write vector three you can create a new one by just like using these parentheses, but they're built in vector threes, including vector three dot forward. And if I hover over it or click on it, you'll see that vector three forward is zero, zero, negative one. 
See, it's the forward vector that just represents the local direction of forward, okay? So this is like all the way baked into the engine. Don't like try to skirt this, okay? Just like how when you bring in 2D assets, by default, the um, forward direction should be zero degrees so that the rotation degrees of that graphic, so like if it's a missile and you want it to shoot forward, the zero degrees is the direction the missile should be facing. So if you're working with 2D assets, you should request that all of those 2D assets comes in facing zero degrees. Okay. Same thing with meshes. See, um, the person who created this particular file, I'm glad they kind of messed it up so that I can fix it in front of you because these these files might actually not be available by the time that you watch this video and you want to go out there and get your own files. You also might be in a similar situation where the Q stick is not facing negative Z. That's what we want. We want the Q stick to face the built-in forward vector direction. Right now, it doesn't. Okay. In fact, how is the Blender person supposed to know that we were going to be working with Godot, like that where the forward vector is negative Z? It might have been a different edit. Uh, different um, engine. So if you want to go into Blender and fix it there, that's probably the better way to do it. But if you don't know how to deal with 3D application, like 3D digital, digital content creator applications like Blender, um, I'm showing you how you can kind of fix it from inside of the engine. This would apply to other game engines as well. So the Q stick mesh is this thing called Q. Okay, first unparent it from the cue ball. Bring it back to be a sibling of the cue ball by clicking and dragging it to the play system node. Next, I want to be clear that this is the Q-Stick mesh, okay? In order for me to fix it, I can't go into the editor, like the blend file, as far as I know, and change like the orientation of the mesh as it will be imported into this mesh uh, instance 3D node. Like As far as I know, you can't do that. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create like a container for this Q-Stick mesh where I fix the orientation of the mesh inside of that container so that the container is facing the correct direction. And the mesh is all like I'm modifying its uh, transform so that it faces the, the direction necessary for the container to be facing negative Z with the mesh facing negative Z. So let's do that. So with the play system selected, I'm going to create a new node. It's going to be node 3D. This is effectively going to be the container for the Q stick, but this is going to represent the Q stick itself. When I want to make changes to like the Q stick's position, I'm going to be changing this node 3D. So I'm going to drag this Q stick mesh to the node 3D, and I'm going to rename node 3D to Q stick, not Q stick container, because I want to be clear that if I were to go into Blender and re import it, like, you know, fix its orientation inside of Blender and re import it, I'm still going to be calling it Q stick because this is the Q stick. There's nothing else. It's not like some other kind of container. It's this is going to represent our Q stick. Okay, so very cool. Our Q stick is now zero zero zero. Everything is good. So with the Q stick mesh, I'm going to reset it back to zero 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 in this position. Go ahead and do that zero 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 in the position and everything like that. And I'm going to now start modifying um, this Q stick mesh. In fact, I'm going to like hide the camera 3D just so that it's like not like take it. In fact. You can hide other stuff too. I'm gonna like hide the billiard table just so that it's like maybe a little bit easier. Eh, the billiard table actually helps me. So I'm gonna bring this back and I'm going to rotate it so that it faces negative Z, right? That's pretty good. So like, okay, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. That looks about right. But I'm actually gonna drag um, this whole Q stick node. So I'm gonna select its parent Q stick up so that I can be sure that it's like even. So I'm with the acoustic mesh selected. I'm actually going to change from perspective mode to like right view or left view. Okay, I'm going to do right view, doesn't matter. Okay, I can see what I'm doing now. It's very cool. I'm going to actually put it up in the sky so you can have better contrast. And I'm going to again drag around that red axis, the x axis so that okay, that's about I want it to be as perfectly straight as I can make. That's about right for now. It doesn't look that great. <laughs> Again, it would be better to like actually do this in Blender, but you know, we'll go for that for now. I'm gonna um, come back to perspective, and here's the problem. If I look at the top view, you'll see that it's actually not just the you know x-axis that's the problem. It's also like it's tilted around 
the y axis as well. It's like, oh man. So I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to line it up. It's probably even offset a little bit. I'm going to line it up so I rotate around the y axis until this is like in the center of this pocket and it's also in the center of this bottom pocket. Make your screen as big as you need it to be. So I'm going to kind of move it over a little bit. Again, I'm I'm um, changing the transform of the acoustic mesh node. It's not quite right, but I don't want to spend too much time on this. Okay, very good. Not quite good. I'm kind of move it slightly. More like that. Pretty good. Not quite good. It's like Bob Ross going on right now. That's pretty good. It's probably not going to look great. Still not perfect. I kind of messed it up, didn't I? I messed it up, folks. If you know of like a better, you know, if you, for anyone else who's like watching this, like in the future, you want to like, that's pretty good. I, I like that. It didn't take too much time. Like if you have some recommendations, you can post that as a comment if you like on here. All right, very good. So now when I come back over here and it ended up being like negative 86, neg or like 179.2, <laughs> negative 108. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go back to perspective mode by just middle clicking and dragging. Now the Q-stick faces approximately negative Z. And everything else is kind of lined up. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to lock the Q-stick mesh in this orientation. So with Q-stick selected, I'm going to click a little handcuffs as we talked about in the beginner tutorial. It allows you to lock your children to the parent, so the Q stick mesh can no longer be accidentally selected. So whenever I want to like move the Q stick, it's gonna if I click on the Q stick, it's gonna click on this Q stick parent. In fact, I'll even like un you know just so it's very clear. Like we have a cue ball and we have a Q stick. Don't worry that it looks like we have like an additional child node here because this is representing what we want. I'm gonna bring it back to zero zero zero. So see, it's nicely on the table. I like it. Very cool. So. Um, now that the uh, cue stick is, uh, you know, in its right kind of like orientation, we want to be able to look down the cue stick, right? And how do you look down a cue stick? You look down a cue stick with like a camera, right? And so you could try to like bring the other camera into place. I actually kind of like that overhead camera thing because it might be useful later. So I'm actually going to create a new camera. It's going to be part of the play system. And you can have multiple cameras in a scene. All you have to do to change what camera, which camera is the current camera, is with the camera selected, there is a property called current. When you click on it, it basically uncurrents all the other cameras. Very good. And we want to look down this cue stick. And so if I hit play, oh, actually, first I want to make a current camera and click check to that. Here we go. We're looking down. <laughs> like the middle of the table and directly into the stick it's like whoa that's not quite where we want it right we want the cue stick to be maybe a little bit higher from the stick think of about it kind of like as a person right kind of look a little bit down from the stick so now when we hit play you can see like okay now i'm looking down the stick a little bit better that's pretty good so at this point you might be in fact i'm going to change this camera's name to aim cam because it's like the camera that you aim down but here's the thing um and this is kind of like aim down sights if you're trying to make like a you know some other kind of game where you shoot something um so you might be like well the aim camera and the cue stick are all should be connected to each other right you should, you're always looking down the barrel of the chopstick the barrel of the cue stick right right that's how you always want it you want it right there um and so you might think about that in fact you might even think you're so clever as to like make the cue stick as like a child of the aim cam because like the child can move independently of the parent. So if, for example, if I were to make the cue stick the child of the aim cam, then you might be like, cool, now I can move the cue stick like independently of the camera, right? Which is kind of cool. But when you move the camera, it like moves them both. It's like, that's pretty neat. You might think that's a good idea, but it's going to probably not be a great idea. And there's a couple of reasons for this. We'll talk about those in a second. But one of the problems right off the bat is if I were to move the aim camera over here such that we're like actually looking down the barrel of the stick, um, you know, and we hit play and it's like, okay, there we are. Very good. But if we were to 
try to rotate around the ball, what's going to happen? Well, if we rotate the camera, you'll see that it's like rotating around the camera's point. Like that's not how we want to aim a stick. We want to aim around the ball. The ball is where we want the pivot point of our rotation to be. Well, you can't really change the pivot point of the camera, right? Not directly. So now sure you can do offsets and stuff like that. Don't, don't mess with that. It's when you want to offset something, it's better to just create a container, you know, that from which you offset. Okay. So I'm going to click and drag Q-Stick back to be a sibling of the AIM camera, not a child of it. And I'm going to create a node that's going to serve as like the parent for the AIM camera and the Q-Stick so that they can move together. They can move independent. They move together from with that uh, parent node. They can move independently of each other. And also you can choose the pivot point. So I'm going to set the cue balls default position back to zero 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 so that it's right there in the center so we can use it as like a reference point there it is right there in the center i'm going to create a new uh, node 3d for play system um let's do node 3d i'm going to call this one the container that you're going to be using to aim around the ball so i guess like aim container like i don't whatever you want to call it i'm going to make aim cam and q stick the children of aim container and again the reason for this is because look the aim camera is right there at zero, 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 rotation zero, zero, zero. However, the aim camera, you see it? Like it, it's, you know, if I select the aim cam and I do preview, you can see like it's still looking down the barrel of the, the Q stick. But if I, instead of rotating the aim camera, what if I rotated the container? See, the zero, zero, zero is right there in the center of what's going to be the ball. So if I rotate the aim container, look goes around the ball right because it's zero 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 point is right there at the ball so we're basically instead of moving the camera and the stick to the ball's position effectively we're going to move the contain the aim containers position of the ball so that it's zero 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 it's pivot the pivot point that's going to translate to its children is right there at the center of that ball so we're going to rotate the aim container not the aim camera or anything like that so the reason we're doing this is you could like try to do some kind of complex math to be like thinking like how do you how what's the math for like the moon orbiting around the earth or something like that like don't get into that you don't have to get into it's almost always going to be easier unless you need it to have like like floating around in space and use all sorts of other kinds of celestial body math or something like that to just set the containers pivot point to wherever you want to rotate around come on some basic stuff all right <clears throat> so that's what we want to do um let's go ahead and um, you can further, let's, I, let me show you a, a nice trick. So like, is this really aiming down the barrel of the camera or the, the, the cue stick the way that we want it to? I'm gonna move the cue ball up slightly just above the table because that's where it's ultimately gonna be. So move it there. Don't change the aim container, keep it at zero, zero, zero just change the camera and the sticks position but for you to know like where should the camera and the stick position be sometimes it helps to just create like a placeholder thing just as like a reference so with the aim container selected i'm going to create a temporary just like a collision shape that's like the shape of a person okay so with aim container selected i'm going to create a collision shape and uh godot's gonna like give me like a huge error it's like freaking check engine light it's like what are you doing don't make me crash. It's like, all right, well, you'll, you'll be fine. I know you're not the child of a body, but whatever. We're just using it as a reference. What does like a person look like? Well, you can do a sphere and a capsule shape if you want. I'm just going to do a capsule shape. Okay, this is like a person. This is not going to be visible. It's not like we're going to delete it. I'm going to change the size of it. Here you can use the scale because it doesn't really matter. We're just doing this for like an appearance, so, like something that looks like a person. And I'm going to put this like capsule where i think the person should be standing like right there now i'm going to take the aim cam and i'm going to move it up into like the eyes of the person right is the person the person's like i think their head should be closer to the to this cue stick so i'm actually going to set the aim cam like down this a little bit it's kind of like a little short person <laughs> and it, it helps to actually have a person and then make it look like what a cute like a person would look like. Now, it ultimately, it doesn't really matter because we're not going to look at the person. What matters is how it looks down the barrel of the stick. 
And so with the stick selected, actually, I, maybe I need to kind of, well, first of all, what we need to do two viewports. Let's do two viewports and let's set the perspective uh, of one of the viewports to be the, uh, what it's going to look like down the person. First of all, look, we're looking at the side of the table, but notice how like the pockets, like everything looks like really stretched and weird. So I'm going to change the field of view to like, I don't know, like something like 60, kind of like when they, I'm not going to give you examples of video games. All right, but the 60 looks a little better. Maybe we could even do a little bit more zoomed in so we can see what we're doing a little bit more. Um, make your screen as big as you need it to be, right? That doesn't look very right, and that's partially probably because of the rotation that we didn't get perfectly when we did that little aim stick, uh, the Q stick. Okay, cool. I think maybe the Q stick can afford to go up a little bit and kind of rotate it a little bit more like that that's pretty good i guess <laughs> just do what you need to do for it to like look kind of right right and we can always hide this position shape right so that's that's pretty good i don't want to spend too much time on it you can always hit play just so you can look at it that looks that looks pretty good again it's probably the rotation that's not quite right that it doesn't look quite down the center of the ball I might like get frustrated enough that I fix it, but for the sake of time, I'm going to move on. Um, very good. So um, let's make it so that we can actually now rotate that. We can come back to just one viewport. Let's rotate this aim container in the code, right? Right now, it just sits there. And again, we can make the aim container its own script, but the, like the aim container is only part of the play system, right? And it's never going to be part of anything else. And you could put it in the script. And you know what? That's probably fine. But here's the thing. The play system is what is going to govern like how we're playing the game, right? And that's going to involve like aiming and shooting and like sh hitting the ball and all this kind of stuff. And um, I think that it would actually make things a little bit more complicated to try to have the aim container be like the separate thing that all it does is like rotate. Let's just do it inside the play system. If necessary, we can always refactor it, but this is. I think it's just going to be more clean to rotate it in the play system. So inside of the play system script, um, I'm going to make it so that we can access that aim container, export, ver, we'll call it aim container. It's a node through 3D. I'll save it. And with play system selected, I'm going to drag the aim container, not aim cam, into the new variable that I just assigned. And every tick, what I want to do is I want to rotate the aim container, right? But here's the problem. Do we do it in process? Like we could do it in process. Like that's where we did this shoot thing. Now I just want to take an aside right now. You might be like, what the trash, Shaban? Like why? Like I had to go to the bathroom. I was going to probably explain this earlier. But like this looks so trashy. Like why is it inside of process? Why is it inside of physics process? Because it's a physics related thing to shoot a ball. Why isn't it inside of like integrate forces? Why isn't it inside of its own separate function even? Like, what are you doing? Well, here's the thing. Remember how I said like it was a heavy decision to decide to like do this play system thing instead of like having all these separate scripts and stuff? That's a heavy decision. That's a decision that is going to be very difficult to refactor. Putting this little thing inside of your process function, this little if statement, this is a light decision. This is something that you can just throw together. It works and just move it elsewhere at any time. Put it inside of a different function, put it inside of physics process. It doesn't matter. You can fix this problem months down the road, and it's not going to make any difference at all. <laughs> okay, don't worry about that. Okay, just relax. Now, when we're aiming, here's the thing. Um, when we're aiming around, we don't, we don't want to just check, hey, has something clicked? We want something that's a little bit more continuous that has to do with mouse motion because we're trying to check basically how much has the mouse moved. Um, you can do that inside a process, but it's a lot more complicated. And we have a function that's built in that allows us to get this information directly. It's called the input function, the virtual function. It has the event, uh, event parameter that gives us information about the event that has happened. So this is actually like a really kind of useful thing. Inside of here, you can check to see like, you know, uh, not there. Let's print what the input is, just so you can see. If I do print uh, event, and look what happens. See, if I click, you'll see it says input event mouse. 
button and then input about mouse motion. If I hit F on the keyboard, you'll see it says input event key, you know, input event key code G, which is 71, right? So like any kind of input hap like gets uh, sent to this input function, passing in what input it was through the event argument that becomes the event parameter, right? And it only happens whenever there's some kind of input that happens. It doesn't happen every tick, just when there's input. But here's the thing. I'm not interested in like keyboard events. I'm only interested in the event, the mouse motion event, which tells me, okay, that's the current position of the mouse. And the relative property of the mouse motion uh, event is the number of pixels that the mouse has moved since the last tick. That sounds very, very useful. That's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to create, I'm going to do var mouse motion, which I'm going to store as the event, right? But you might be like, wait, some the event could be a keyboard event. Well, that's true. But what we can do is we can say event as mouse motion. And input event mouse motion, actually. Input event mouse motion. Because that's, see, it says input event mouse motion. We're basically saying, I'm going to assume that this event is an input event mouse motion. And you can do that with the as keyword. The as keyword is generally relatively safe because what it's doing is it's going to attempt to convert event to input event mouse motion. If it succeeds, then the event will remain the same, but be explicitly in the code in input event mouse motion. If it fails, as in the event is not, let's just see. Well, I'll show you what it looks like. If it fails, I can bring that prevent prevent that print event back, and I hit play, you'll see that, look, mouse motion's all well and good, but if I hit the key, you'll see it says, uh, it still says input event key. Mods none, physical false. It no, what, did I? Oh, because not event, mouse motion. Gosh darn it, folks. <laughs> okay, uh, the event is still the event. Um, if we're storing the result of attempting to say that the event is an input about mouse motion by using the as keyword. Okay, mouse motion. That's what I meant. If I hit play, you'll see, okay, input event mouse motion still, it still thinks that mouse motion, the variable, is an input about mouse motion. But if I hit the key, you'll see it says null. It says null because what happens with the as keyword is it's going to say like store the result of assuming that event is an input about mouse motion. If, you, if your assumption was correct, then cool. It's your event is going to be an input event mouse motion. And notice how when I do mouse motion now, now that it has correctly assumed that, I can see stuff that associates that has to do with uh, mouse motion, which you're not really seeing anything specific. But one of those things was like uh, position, and one of those things was relative position, and so on. However, otherwise, it's going to say null. So I don't want to right away use this mouse motion uh, variable because remember, if I start doing stuff that's mouse, mouse motion specific, but I have a key, that it was an input key, it's going to crash because it only applies to mouse motion. But if I say if mouse motion, then this is basically, if it's not falsy or like zero or false or null, then this code block will be executed. If mouse motion is null because it failed to make that assumption correctly, then this code block will not be executed. This is effectively like creating a function called func input event mouse motion, right? This is basically what it allows us to do. So that's what we're going to do. If mouse motion, what do we want to do with the mouse motion? We want to do something with the container. We want to change its rotation, right? So let's do, you can do different types of rotation. There's different ways to rotation, but I'm actually going to just modify the rotation degrees directly. Okay. We're doing degrees. I know like, it's like, what about quaternions? What about all this other stuff? That's okay. We can work with uh, Euler um, angles and degrees. We'll maybe talk about that in a little bit. But the point here is that, you know, rotation degrees is this idea of like zero to 180 uh, around a particular axis. In this case, the aim container, what axis are we trying to rotate around? If you need to go to the 3D view to check, to remind yourself, it's like a top, right? The axis that it goes around is going to be the top, the axis that points up, right? You see what I'm saying? So if we want to rotate around the ball, we're going to rotate it like a top around the y-axis. So rotation, <laughs> rotation degrees dot y, but what do we want to do with it? We're going to add to it. We're going to keep adding to it um, by what? We're going to add something related to the mouse motion, but we're going to add 
its relative uh, what? The, the, remember, in 3D space, we have X, Y, and Z. Mouse, there's only two axes. There's X of the mouse, and there's Y of the mouse, right? Well, we want it to rotate around when we move the X as axis of the, the mouse. So we're interested in how many pixels have moved since in the X direction of the mouse um, since the last tick. So we'll do relative.x. Kind of do full screen so you can see what I'm typing better. I'm going to go ahead and hit play. <clears throat> and look, oh my gosh, it works like perfectly. I mean, other than the fact that the darn like Q stick is like not perfectly rotated. Woo! All right, well, it's not quite perfect. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to move the Q stick up a little bit so that it's kind of closer to the center of the ball. <clears throat> so undo this full screen not the aim container aim container needs to stay where it is with the ball i'm going to move the cue stick up actually can kind of like move it forward a bit like whatever you need to do because you can see where's that ball located again we should probably fix that let's move it down a little forward a little that's pretty good maybe even need to move the aim cam forward a little bit now all right now i hit play there, much better. See, we're aiming around this cue ball. Maybe, anyways, that's pretty fine. Now when we click, okay, a couple problems. <laughs> the ball just, you know, it's like we're shooting not the direction of the stick, and the cue stick is not actually following the ball so that it's able to hit the ball again, you know, right next to the ball. So uh, one of the things that I want to do is I want to make it so that the aim container's position remains attached to the ball's position. Now, again, you might be like, let's move the aim container as a child like the cue ball. No, don't do it. Remember, the rotation gets messed up. <laughs> um, it'll be, it'll follow the ball's rotation also. Um, so inside of the process function, I'm going to say aim container's position is always going to be equal to the ball's position. So cue ball uh, dot position. Okay, save it, run it. We we shoot. Now it follows the ball, which is good. But like, we can shoot the ball a lot of times, and it doesn't shoot the direction the cue stick is facing. So we got some work to do. Um, another thing to notice is that like now we've got two different things going on in the process function. There's we're setting the position of the aim container, and we're also shooting the ball. Okay, this is kind of a good opportunity to um, separate this out to like make this its own separate function. So I'm going to create a new <clears throat> function, member function, and I'm going to call it, uh, I don't know, like handle shot input. Now you might be like, why are you putting it down here? Like, Why am I not putting it above two spaces between function definitions? But why is it down here? And well, by convention, by convention, I mean the Godot style guide. They recommend that you put all the virtual functions, the ones that like basically are over, uh, over, uh, overridden from the Node 3D. Node 3D has process and input built in. <clears throat> when you make them, they're automatically being called. Those sh are recommended to be above your custom private functions. Now, again, we still have this underscore here, though, because we're saying that the handle shot input should only be called inside of this playsystem.gd script. That's what uh, this denotes. That is a private method, even though you could hypothetically still call it because there's no access modifiers inside of Godot. It's not going to prevent another script from calling it. This is just saying to other programmers and yourself in the future, don't touch it in it's another script. All right, I'm going to click and drag this, cut, paste, call it here. Handle shot input. Again, this is fine because it's inside of the same script. Click play. Still works. Still can shoot. Very good. Mm. Um, this is uh, another this is also an opportunity um, to fix and it's not really it's, it's kind of like a fix but notice how when I hit play you'll notice that I'm able to like aim around the ball but some of you have become accustomed to like shooting games or first person perspective games where like you don't see your mouse right so you can change that um, on ready and you can put this anywhere in the code but I recommend putting it in the play system because the play system is what handles kind of the play input of the game so in, on ready, what you can do is you can change the mouse mode of input. So input.mouse mode. 
And so input is this uh, like this singleton that's bit built in um, that has a mouse mode property. You might be like, isn't input a, a static class and not a singleton? I don't know. It could be either, really. <laughs> it doesn't really matter, though, because there is only going to be one mouse mode. And if it happens to belong to the static class and you can set it from here, then, you know. Um, yeah. I'm just going to say single thing because whatever. Mouse mode. And uh, what do we want to change the mouse mode to? Um, here are the different mouse modes you can set it to. Captured, confined, confined, hidden, hidden, invisible. You can actually kind of click on it so you can see what it is. If I click mouse mode, you can see these are the different options. By default, it's mouse mode visible. We can, it's like, oh, hidden, that's good. No, all it does is make the mouse visible, but you can still move it outside of the screen. Instead, what you want is this mouse mode captured. It'll be hidden, and the position will be attempt to be locked to the center of the screen. So um, back in play system, we're going to do input, what is it? Um, dot mouse mode uh, cap. Captured. Very good. So when I hit play and I run this, you can see that ta-da! It's like trying to keep the mouse locked into the center of the window. You can see by my like a uh, little blue thing, which is just like my uh, mouse cursor highlighter application. Um, it's trying to stay in the center, um, and it doesn't leave the screen. Now you can do that if you want, but the problem with this is if you hit escape on your keyboard, it doesn't close the window, and you can't click on the little close window thing. So you're gonna have to do like Alt F4 on your keyboard and windows you might risk accidentally pressing it twice and closing godot um you can do alt tab or like windows key or something like that to get out of this and hit all the four or you can like add to like process if input like escape is pressed then do like get tree dot you know exit but i'm just gonna close i'm just gonna comment this out so that you can still see it but i'll do pass so it doesn't get mad at me that this function body is empty and very good we're ready to move on. Are there any questions? Oh gosh, it's pre-recorded. Can't ask. Can't answer. Ask questions in the chat though. In the chat, the uh, comments. All right, I'm gonna come back. And um, what I want to do is I want to make it so that I can shoot the direction. I want to shoot the ball the direction that the the uh, cue stick is facing. Okay, but there's a couple of issues here. Now. Um, one of those issues is that, uh, you know, we could do that right away. It's really up to, uh, like, what do we want to do first? Do we want to make it so that we shoot the direction of the cue stick, or do we want to make it so that the cue stick can kind of like move forward and back? We just did this, like, the cue stick is able to move around. I want the cue stick to be able to look like it's moving forward and back with the mouse. And since we're already on the topic of mouse and like moving, you know, relative X and Y. Let's just finish this up, um, especially since your brain is already tuned to thinking about nodes and stuff. This is like really put on your thinking cap right now because it's about to get really kind of tricky with the nodes here. Are you ready? I'll wait. No, I won't. Hit pause. Eat the granola bar. Whatever it is you want <laughs> to, to do to put your thinking cap on because it's getting kind of fancy. Here's the thing. I want to make it so that the cue stick can move forward and backwards in the code. So how do I do that? Well, I'm going to move its position, right? So if I have the cue stick selected, it's like, okay, what position are we moving forward and back? Right now, its position is like this 0.079, the 0.784. Or we're trying to figure out what is the position that it's like right next to the ball and what is the position that it's like the furthest away from the ball. We want those two positions because we're going to be moving back and forward between those positions. Kind of like in a game like Angry Birds where you like use a uh slingshot and there's like kind of like a minimum shoot and there's like a maximum shoot like you want to kind of have that set up but here's the problem if i move this z like back you'll see that it allows me to move like it's, it changes the z position and not anything else because its parent the aim container is you know aligned with the global x y and z axes remember a child um, transform is with respect to its container. Okay, aim container is perfectly in the center, which is great. That's actually how we want it to be. 
Q stick is offset from that, and it's offset by this amount, 0.07 meters on the Y and 0.8 meters on the Z. But if I move this back, you'll see that like that looks mostly okay, right? If I were to do this like little view two viewports thing, and I were to move this forward and back, see like that doesn't look too bad. So if you really want to just like settle for that, that's mostly fine. But the thing is, it's actually worse than it looks at this point. If that's good enough for you, great. Do what you want. But what if this were slightly more rotated, like this? Right, the cue stick. If I'm moving forward and back, is that how someone shoots a ball? No, it isn't. Right? If we were to go back to this like view to viewports mode and go back to the aim cam preview, you'll see like as I move this forward and back, Oops, not the camera. The cue stick. Like, it, look at that. It's like, that. it looks like it's going up. It's like, what? This looks stupid. And it does look stupid because you're not doing it right. Like, it's not... You're moving the whole stick. <laughs> you just want to move the stick forward and back. Not, like, entirely, like, you know, the whole stick from the center point and keeping its rotation, right? Like... Do I have to rotate it more ridiculously just to really illustrate what I'm talking about? Like, if we move just on the Z, it, like, this is not how people shoot. What people do is if you click on this little local button, like, look at this little cube icon in the toolbar. This says change to local space, use local space. All this is doing, it hasn't done anything to the node itself. It's just an editor thing. It doesn't do anything to the node. It hasn't changed anything about the node. It's just an editor specific thing, which makes it so that you can move the object in space, but conveniently along its local Z axis. So if I move and drag this up and forward and back, that's what I want, right? I want it to go forward and back like that. That's how we hit up. That's how we do the Q stick. See, it's like forward and back. That's awesome. We're like spearing that ball. But here's the thing. If you look at the position, since we didn't actually change anything about the object's properties itself, this is just like a little thing that makes it easier to set both the Y and Z at the same time. Notice how when I move it forward and back. Just to make this quite clear, in the aim container, what I'm going to do is I'm going <laughs> to create a new... You don't have to follow me, but I'm going to create a new collision shape, and it's going to be a box. See, this is like... Think about this as like this represents the like, you know the container that this cue stick is in. So when I move the cue stick forward and back like this, not only is it moving along forward inside of this box on the Z axis, but it's also when I'm in the local space, when I move forward and back, it's actually moving up inside of this like terrarium, this like box that it's inside of that represents the parent's space. So this is the space that it's actually operating inside of. So when I move along its local axis, it's actually moving up inside of this box, isn't it? So it's changing the Y position. So in this case, if we want to be able to move it in the code, we're going to have to figure out what is the Y position of the Q-stick and the Z position of this Q-stick, 0.3 and 0.7, when it's right next to the ball, and what's its Y position and Z position when it's furthest away from the ball. But here, here's the problem with that, though, because if I were then to rotate it back, to like, you know, this angle like this, you'll see that now the Y position of the ball isn't 0.3, it's point like 0.168. Because as you can see, no matter how it's rotated around this ball, the Y position and the Z position are actually going to be slightly different. So any change you do at all, any slight modification you do at all, anything that the designer does is going to mess up your code because you have a different Y and Z starting position um, expectation, right? And also, what if we want to be able to create an animation of the ball moving forward and backwards and we're trying to change just the Z? Are we going to change the Z and the Y at the same time? At the same same rate? It's like, there's, it's going to, you're going to create problems. So what I want to do is I want to make it so that all I have to do is set the Z because it's the most natural mo motion. We're not worrying about this whole like removing the whole darn stick at it, not like, you know, like including it's, uh, you know, we're keeping it, uh, <laughs> you know, like this instead of like, you know, like this, which is how we want it. We don't want it like this. Um, 
how do we do that? How do we make it so that we can just basically choose like local space inside of like the engine? You can't do that. As far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong. The way that you want to do it is you want to make it so that this Q stick is in sitting inside of a container that's not like this like terrarium that it's sitting inside of right now. We're going to put it inside of another container that the container is rotated. Okay, so imagine like you took a Q stick and you put it inside of like a giant terrarium. <laughs> Or you put it on top of like a board, right? That's what we're going to do. So I'm going to, with aim container selected, I'm going to create a new uh, node 3D. This is going to serve as the container that the Q stick is sitting inside of. Q stick container. Okay. I'm going to put my Q stick inside of this container, right? I'm going to zero out my Q stick's rotation so that it's like facing this way. The Q stick container, okay, is at zero, 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 which is perfect. It's hard to see the container that the Q stick is inside of because, again, and I'm going to zero out the Q stick's uh, position as well. So that's like right there in the center. I'm going to make it so that you can see what this container looks like. I'm going to hide this like terrarium thing for now. And I'm going to create another inside of the Q stick container. I'm going to create a node called uh, like a collision shape 3D and it's going to be a box. Sorry if this is going fast for you. I want everything out here so it's easier to see what's happening. And I'm going to make it super, super thin. Okay, cool. It's like super, super thin. So now the reason I'm doing that is because as I move the Q stick container up like this, you can see that the ball or that, sorry, the Q stick and this like surface that it's sitting on top of is moving, right? Because they're both ch children of the Q-stick container. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because, now check this out, when I rotate the Q-stick container, the Q-stick and that surface are rotating at the same time. Now, with the Q-stick, the container is rotated. So remember, the position of a node is with respect to its parent. So if its parent is tilted like this, then the Q-stick's position, if I move its along its uh, what is it? Move along the z-axis. Let's come back here. Bring these things back. Look at this. Look carefully at the position here. When I move this z, look. It's not changing the y. It's just changing the z because the Q stick is like it's moving. Gosh, I'm going to take like this little thing like this. This is the container that the the Q stick is sitting on top of. All right. As I rotate the container, the Q stick that's just sitting on the container is being rotated too by virtue of the fact that it's just its position, its uh, rotation is just with respect to its parent. So I'm not moving the Q stick independently. The container is basically rotating what the Q stick is going to be in global space. Now, when I do forward and backward, with respect to the container of the Q stick, its y-axis is not changing at all. It's staying zero, sitting right on top of it. So when I do just change the z of the Q stick, forward and back and forward and back, it's not moving the y. So we're able to change just the z coordinates of the Q stick, and it will allow it to appear to, appear to be sliding up and down, basically, in, in uh, on top of like what this the bottom of this containing node, this Q-stick container is. So how this works is the Q-stick container is what's going to do the rotation and the Q-stick is what's going to do the position. So with the Q-stick container, I'm going to move it. I'm going to go back to global space so that I can like kind of move it. Uh, sorry, don't move the container. I'm going to keep it zero, zero, zero. I'm going to rotate it such that it's the right rotation of the Q-stick. And then with the Q-stick selected in local space, I'm going to click and drag it back. Okay, if the Q stick is not quite like where we want it to be, don't panic and move the Q stick up because now you're messing this up by having the Q stick floating above the bottom of the container. Okay, you could do that, but if it's not where you want it to be, move the entire uh, because it's gonna ch it's gonna ultimately change. Remember, the ball is actually zero 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 inside the table. So its location is actually with respect to the aim container. So move the whole aim container up, okay? If if you want to be able to change the you know the position of the 
what is it called the the stick with respect to the ball okay if you need to all right anyways um with that being said just go ahead and figure out like what um properties like work for you q stick container just change its rotation the q stick can now move forward and back check that out so the minimum z or the ma the minimum z is going to be like 0.78 the maximum is probably going to be like one point i don't know we're gonna have to use the camera <laughs> to be able to figure that out okay but anyways let's go ahead and do that in the code so we can kind of mess around with it. so with the script selected hopefully this all made sense as to why we did this you can like hide all these collision shapes if you want or just delete them they were just there to just visualize the like manipulating what space the uh, children are moving with respect to and it can get very confusing if you are not very uh you know <laughs> acquainted with like thinking in 3d space all right that's okay um what do we want to do we want to make we want to move the stick forward and backward um depending on the mouse's y uh relative y okay so what do we want to do um let's start by just doing magic numbers i think that that would probably be okay don't you think <laughs> um do we have a q stick that we don't have a q stick we need to move see we have an aim container we have a q ball we are not moving the aim container the aim container is staying fixed to the ball's position okay we have a q uh ball we're not doing anything with that we need the q stick we need to be able to move the q stick remember it's the q sticks z that we're moving forward and backwards so let's go ahead and export a variable for the q stick if it's just called a q then i don't know just call it whatever you want um what is it it's a node 3d and I'm going to drag the Q stick. So with the play system selected, I'm going to drag the Q stick, not the Q stick container. Remember, Q stick container is just rotating the Q stick so that you can move the Q stick forward and backwards along the bottom of that like aquarium that it's sitting inside of, right? So with the Q stick uh, selected, I'm going to click and drag. <sighs> with the play system selected, I'm going to click and drag Q stick over to the Q stick variable I just created. Very good. This is what I'm talking about by using these variables this is a really good idea because notice how like much we've like messed around with the, uh, you know, the node hierarchy inside of the aim container and you can see or inside of the whole play system. So that's what I meant. All right. Well, what are we going to do with the Q stick? Well, it's going to be mouse motion thing, right? We're going to move the Q stick forward and backward um, based on the mouse's Y. Because, like, you know, moving the mouse's X allows it to rotate around the, mouse, the ball. Moving the mouse's Y allows it to go forward and backward um, uh, with, you know, toward the ball or away from the ball. Um, okay, so Q stick dot position dot Z. We know that's what we're going to change. And just like we changed the rotation degrees dot Y plus equals like this relative X, let's change the Q stick's Z position based on mouse motion dot relative uh y right because it's the mouse's y let's uh do that and see what happens <laughs> is it the same thing remember z up is like forward oh gosh look at that okay <laughs> really like it's doing something but here's the problem right it's like it's shooting towards this towards the ball or like looking at the back of the stick because it's like we're throwing the whole stick and it's going all the way forward so we got problems it's moving way too fast and well the problem with why it's moving so fast is because degrees there's 360 degrees in a circle right so when we're moving you know among 360 degrees by the number of pixels that it's moved in the last frame of the mouse x's position well like that's probably going to be mostly fine <laughs> right it moves 20 pixels and it moves 20 degrees okay that's not a big deal if you remember um in 3d space the position is measured in uh, me uh meters right so one meter is like what the length of the whole darn stick <laughs> so like it's going to be like one pixel is going to move a whole stick length <laughs> right it's like way too fast so we want to change like how fast it's moving 
by multiplying this relative y by some small number, like a hundredth of what it currently is, so that you move one pixel, you only move one centimeter, right? Let's go ahead and play. Okay, that's better. Now we can fix the aim cam, because right now it looks kind of silly. Maybe not. Maybe you like that. I don't know. It's pretty cool, but here's the thing. We can still move it too far forward. You can go like spear the ball. <laughs> Whoa, shoot the ball. And you could also go too far back. So what we want to do is we want to clamp the position um, between some minimum Z position and some maximum Z position. And we're so glad that we set it up so that we're only dealing with the Z position and not the Y position. It would make it a lot more complicated if we were dealing with a Y position because it's like the Y position is moving slower than the Z position or depending on the rotation. And so like, are we going to move the Y and the Z like different like amounts depending on like, no, gosh, that would be yucky, 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 yucky. Anyways, uh, let's fix it. <laughs> let's make it so we clamp just the Z position. Well, how do we clamp? First of all, let's attempt to move the Z position. That's usually a good start. Just attempt to move the Z position. And then after you've made that attempt, be like, okay, you went too far. <laughs> step back, step back. Once they go, once it trans, what was it going to say? Uh, once it trespasses the minimum or maximum, say like, hold on. You went too far, go back to the minimum. If you go over the minimum line, whoop, too far maximum. Go back to the maximum. So that's what we're going to do. Um, so we can do that by saying, okay, once you've set the position, you've attempted to set the position. Um, cue ball dot position, and not cue ball, cue stick. This is where my mind's at, folks. Equals, we're going to clamp, and we're going to clamp it to, um, okay, look, here's how clamp works. It's built in. It's a really cool function. Um, is it going to tell me? I'm not going to have to click on it. Look, so there's three arguments. There's this value, there's a min, and there's a max. The value is basically like, hey, I'm going to attempt to set it to this value. If it's between min and max, clamp is going to return the value. If value is less than the min, it's going to return the min. If the value is greater than the max, it's going to return the max. You get it? Okay, very good. So we're going to clamp the position that we're going to, the, the value that we're going to attempt to ask about, effectively, is the Q sticks uh, Z position. Now, notice how we're, it's going to go off the cliff here, maybe in a second, but let's just start with this. We're going to say, like, I'm basically laundering the position in some way. I'm cleaning it up. I'm asking clamp, hey, is it between these positions? If so, great. If not, set it to the min or the max, depending on how far you know it's wherever it is. Okay, what's the minimum? Okay, well, let's come back. What is the minimum? The minimum is going to be, we already had kind of talked about it. We already forgot. The minimum of the Q sticks Z. What the heck is it selecting the play system? Q stick. Thank you. 0.78 looks like about right. And then the mat, or 0.75? Touching the stick? Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Remember, this doesn't actually touch the ball. This is not like we're, we're hitting the ball by applying an impulse, magical impulse. This cue stick doesn't actually hit the ball, right? It's just a mesh. <clears throat> and then the maximum position, like, I guess, bring out your darn viewports. Have the aim cam selected. Take your darn cue stick. Move your darn cue stick. What is it at? If it's all the way back here, it's at 1.4 ish. That's basically as far as we need it to go. So 0.75 to about 1.4. And we can be like specific. Like, we don't need to use like really, you know, round numbers because the code is handling that. That's what's so cool about it. So 0.75 to 1.4. You might be like, these are magic numbers. Yes, I get it. I know they're magic numbers. We're just testing stuff out. <laughs> Test stuff out with magic numbers first. And then once they look pretty good, set those magic numbers to be the default values of your exposed numbers to the editor. You can always change those numbers later, but you have good defaults. All right, go ahead. Okay, that's as far forward as it gets. And this is as far... Uh, not moving forward and back. Uh, 
because I did cue ball position. <laughs> did someone like notice this before I did this? <laughs> the cue sticks. <laughs> We're gonna hey, I want to like launder my cue stick position. I'm gonna pass in the cue stick position, whatever it is, give it back to me as long as it's within these bounds. All right. There we go. It even might make it go back to 1.5. There we go. I love, love it. And then I can shoot, and it doesn't shoot the stick at all, and it doesn't go the right direction. So we've got problems. <laughs> let's fix it. All right. Um, let, next thing, let's let's like fix up these magic numbers. All right. So I'm going to create some uh, new values. I'm going to do export, and you might be like, "Why are you creating a space?" I don't know. It's because like these are nodes, and these are just primitive values. So I don't know. I, that's my. That's how I like to do it. Uh, let's have a stick minimum z, and it's going to be 0 0.75. Let's have an stick maximum z, and let's make it 1.4. And let's do an export there. And I'm exporting these so that the designer can choose like what they want to set the settings to. Uh, a stick um, Z sensitivity sense, I think is like the word that people use. 0 0.01. Now here's something I want to point out. Notice these little equal signs. What happens with these equal signs is if you set a value of something, a new variable with the equal sign, like if I did this in ready, if I were to say like var x equals uh, 10.5 or something, like it doesn't matter. Notice how it doesn't get mad. That's fine. Right, and if I set x equal to hello, it also doesn't get mad. See, this is the problem. When you say var x equals ten point five, what it's going to do is it's going to it's going to create x as a variant, a type called a variant. A variant basically says like, I am right now a float. I recognize that. However, since I'm a variant, you can change my value to a string. This could potentially lead to performance hits. You're not allowing the uh, GD scripts like runtime to be able to max op maximize its optimization as like new versions of Godot come out. So if you want what was called uh, strongly type this X variable, strongly type meaning that once we've set its value, we also set its type. We use what's called the walrus. <laughs> I don't know if that's actually what's called. I like to call it that the walrus uh, operator. <laughs> which says not only set its value to 10 and a half, but require that its uh, type is what the uh, um, parser is able to infer the type is on the right-hand side of the uh, assignment operator. It infers that this is a float because 10.5 is clearly a float, so it's going to set the value of x to 10.5. And now it's mad at me because it's like, no, you can't change, you can't assign the value of string as float because this x is now strongly typed. Okay, you can alternatively, instead of using walrus, you could say var x of type float is equal to 10 and a half. And now when we say x is equal to hey, jay, yay. This is Swedish, right? That's how you spell hey in Swedish, right? And it's mad at me in exactly the same way. Okay, so walrus, and this is what's called statically typing something. Static typing means that you're specifying the type explicitly. You're not inferring the type, you're setting it explicitly. That's what we're doing here. This is statically typing where we are explicitly saying this is a rigid body. Very cool. Hopefully that makes sense. So what I want to do is I'm going to walrus these so that we're sure that these are floats. Very good. Okay. Now that we have a walrus, let's go ahead and use them. Now that we have floats. Uh, this was, I think, it was like stick Z sense or some junk. It's like way off the edge of the screen I'm, at this point. It's not that bad. Notice how it's at column 73. The convention for GScript and really, I think, Python's PEP8 like style guide says it shouldn't go past column 80 or else you're like a bad person. So. Let's see if we run into that problem here. Stick min z and stick. Uh oh, I think we're in trouble. 
stick max z look we're even past this line oh my gosh oh my gosh don't tell the hoa don't tell the homeowners association <laughs> no here's the thing so you can always fix that like all you have to do is just create a new line so because this is in the parentheses of the function def uh, the function call it's okay i know that new lines are meaningful inside of uh gd script but since we're in parentheses, it's not going to assume that a new line means anything because it's uh, inside of parentheses, right? You evaluate what's inside the parentheses first. Now, I did this with two indentations instead of one because this uh, by style guides is like, this looks like maybe like a new code block for an if or a function definition. So just to make sure you're saying I'm just continuing a line, you do two indentations from the code block. Very good. And look, we can easily see it. It's very cool. Hit play. Make sure it still works. It works. It works. It works. It works. It works. Cool. Hopefully that makes sense. It still doesn't shoot at the right angle, though. I mean, it shoots. It literally shoots at a right angle. <laughs> it shoots at the right angle. <laughs> what? Right angle? Uh, it doesn't shoot at the correct. Hey, it fell off the cliff. All right. Very good. Let's make it so that it shoots the correct angle. Now that we have a better understanding of 3D space and how the children will uh, move, their, tra their transform will um, depend with respect to their parent, you might now try to apply this to the direction that we are going to be hitting our ball. So in handle shot input, notice how we shoot the ball always at 100. Zero, zero. It's always x1. We want to shoot it the direction that the aim container is facing, right? Now you might be like, well, what about the Q stick? No. <laughs> the Q stick, yes, the Q stick does have a position, but here's the problem with the darn Q stick. The Q stick is layered inside of a whole bunch of other nodes, right? The Q stick is inside of a Q stick container, which is offset already. The Q stick's like rotation is entirely uh <laughs> dangerous it's toxic it, the q sticks rotation is currently zero 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 so are we going to say like use zero 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 when we have tried to figure out the direction that we should shoot the ball notice how if i have the uh, aim container and i rotate the aim container the <clears throat> what have i done oh i'm using local space use a uh, global space why is my aim container rotated? It's, it shouldn't be. It, it's not rotated. It's just, a, it's just an optical illusion. Okay. And we rotate the aim container. Notice how, like, the Q-stick is doing what it's supposed to do, right? As you can see in the bottom camera. But if I look at the Q-stick, it's still 0, 0, 0. So, like, you can't use that rotation. There's nothing useful there. <laughs> um... <clears throat> And also the parent of the Q-stick container is rotated in this direction. This is not helpful. This is, this is very messy information. So the aim container is effectively the direction we want to hit the ball because the aim container is what's actually rotated. It's the aim container's Y rotation, as in like around the Y axis, that is meaningful to the direction we want to hit the ball. But here's the problem with using the aim container's Y rotation. And that is that the aim container is rotating in space, but the cue ball is not rotating with the aim container. So the cue ball, if we try to like hit it with the direction of the aim container, the cue ball is not in translated space. It's not trans. It's not. It hasn't been translated around this rotation. It's not in this terrarium that we've rotated. And now the ball is going to be able to shoot the forward direction. Okay, you could do that. You could try to make the cue ball as part of a node that rotates along with the aim container but just its y position y rotation and use that and that would work and where you can then use the forward vector because it matches the forward vector of the aim container don't do that because you shouldn't be rotating the cue ball in the code the cue ball should be able to freely rotate inside of the world it should be within the same context as the other balls. You're gonna create problems if you try to like do weird stuff with rotating the ball inside of the code and it's gonna, the friction on the surface is gonna mess up. The, it's just, don't do it. Let the ball be in global space, shoot the ball with respect to global space. The aim container can rotate, 
But what we need is we need to we need to figure out what is the rotation in global space with respect to the aim container's rotation. And how do we do that? I'm going to go back to single viewport mode to be able to explain this. Okay, this is something that's very important for you to be able to understand when you're working in 3D space. Okay, so I'm going to do this with the whole billiard table because I think it's going to be kind of funny. All right, the billiard table. When we look at the rotation of the billiard table, we are doing so with what's called Euler angles, 0, 0, 0. That's 0 degrees in the x, 0 degrees in the y, and 0 degrees in the z around those axes, which is really easy for a human being to be able to understand. Right? That's why we have Euler angles. They're very useful. If you worked in if you changed the edit mode to quaternion, you would see that what the heck is X, Y, Z, and W? Don't mess with quaternions, especially in the editor. In your level designer, I don't want to stereotype level designers, but level designers don't know what quaternions are. Don't mess with it. All right. Keep it in Euler angles for your poor, poor level designers. Um, and yourself, like you're not working in quaternions, don't kid yourself. But if we do basis, like what the heck is basis? Basis is something that's very, very useful for you to understand, though you're not going to work with it directly inside the editor. It's very useful to understand. The basis represents the each axis of rotation translated to its parent's space. I know that was maybe confusing. Understand this. Right now, since the billiard table is currently perfectly aligned with global space, right, the z, z uh, forward, like z positive, faces global z positive. Notice how if I hit this little like local, global, local, global, local, global, it's exactly the same, right? Because they are, you know, you know, they're line. It's basically like a human being that's facing north. Right. If we were to look at a compass or a map or like Google Maps or something like that, and you notice how like in Google Maps or something, it'll be like, do you want to be like in navigation mode? It's like, do you want it like the map to be facing north or do you want the map to be facing the direction of the car? Right. That's kind of like what this thing does. Right. And each person might have a different preference, but that doesn't matter. The point is that the world coordinates is like northeast, southwest. And you can think of that as like the global coordinates is this like northeast, southwest kind of deal. And right now it's aligned with its parents position. Uh, with its uh, parents' rotation. And therefore, the X component of the basis, their X, Y, and Z is each a totally separate vector. The X component of the basis is lined up so that X uh, is perfectly aligned with the X of its parent. Y and Z are perfectly aligned with their Y and Z because the X basis is 1, 0, 0. Good, right? It's pointing the exact same direction as the global space, where X in the global space lines up with x in its basis 0 0 for the z there's no translate there's no uh translation usually refers to like position but there's no like offset same thing with the y arrow the y arrow is pointing only you know one in the positive and these are unit vectors they always have a magnitude of one it only matters its direction not how like long the arrow is uh 0 and 0 for x and z there's been no translation uh, sorry, no offset. And Z, 0, 0, 1. So everything is perfectly fine. So you can really see what's going on here. What if I were to rotate this Q, like did a barrel roll, like do a barrel roll. Billiard table, if I hold the control key down as I rotate, I'm going to rotate it exactly 90 degrees. And when I do that, look what happens here. Okay, so if I do this whole like local, global, local, global, local, global, they're not the same. It's been offset, it's been rotated. Notice how if I go back to Euler angles, it's been rotated around the x-axis by 90 degrees. But in basis terms, what's happened here is I'm now in global space, right? Z is this way, you know, y is up, x is sideways. But if I go back to local space, you'll see that my y, my z, my x arrow is the same because I only rotated around the x-axis. See, the x arrow is the same and therefore the x basis is the same. But if I click on the local space, you'll see that um, uh, where is it? Um, the positive y has become positive x, right? Or, uh, sorry, blue. Z become positive z, right? Positive y in local space is lines with 
positive z in global space. See, this is the positive z in global space. This is the positive y in local space. And so therefore, you can see by the basis that the basis for the y direction in local space translates to positive z in global space. Let's look at the blue arrow in, in uh, you know, global space, positive z is this direction. But when I um, <clears throat> go to local space, you'll see that my positive z is down, just negative y in global space, right? The positive z in local space is negative y in what would be global space. And that's how it translates. See, where is z? It's negative one in the y direction of global space. When I say global space, I mean it's parents space. Okay, so that's what's that's how basis works. Now, the reason why this is helpful is because the aim container, right? When we rotate it around the y-axis like this, what we've done is we've offset it from its parent, which happens to be the same kind of space as the cue balls space, right? The parent space of the uh, cue stick container is the global space, basically. And we've offset it from uh, the aim container. We've offset from uh, that parent's space. So what I want to know now is what is the positive z, or actually negative z, because remember the direction we're facing is negative z. What is the negative z in translated to global space? And use that to apply the direction as the direction, the direction we're hitting the ball. Okay, so this is the direction we're facing. And what we want to know is what is the negative z of the aim container translated to the direction vector in global space and we can use that to apply to the ball okay i know like hopefully that made sense hopefully you learned something um but how, how are you going to be able to use this um something i just want to point out here i'm going to uh have a reappearance of uh, uh master chief from skyrim and this little character faces negative z which seems totally weird and counterintuitive but the reason that is is because in OpenGL, when we're working with like a uh like blender or working with some kind of digital content creator you're typically looking at the model that you're you're modifying right you're looking at your character's face so that's kind of the positive z of what you're working on but in a game, you're interested in what is the character looking at, not what you, not you looking at the character, but what your character is looking at. And that's why negative Z is what we're actually interested in, because we're not looking at our character, we're looking through our character. <clears throat> okay, anyways, very cool. That's my understanding. All right, so uh, let's like make use of that in the code. So when we hit the ball, right now we're just hitting it at one zero zero all the time. But what I wanna do is I wanna get the direction of the stick so I'm going to comment this out because we don't want this. We want a direction vector of some kind. Ver stick direction, right? This is what we want. What do we want? Like, we want to get the direction of the stick. Now, remember, the direction of the stick in its local space is useless because, you know, it's been offset, but the ball hasn't, okay? So to get the direction of the stick in global space, because that actually is useful for the ball, we are going to do the aim container. We're getting its z basis, basis in the z direction. But here's the thing. Notice how if I lead it like this, and let's just go ahead and apply the stick direction to be the direction that we're applying this impulse. When I hit play, where do you think it's going to shoot the ball? I'm going to try to shoot it this way, and what's it going to do? It's going to shoot it back. It's exactly backwards. Sometimes you know, you don't understand what the heck this works, how this works. And that's fine. Like, just try, just mess with basis until something good happens. And then hopefully you can kind of back step it a little bit and try to think about why it worked. If it, you never figure it out in your entire darn life as a game programmer, probably not a good thing, but it's probably workable, especially if you're an indie developer. Nobody knows that you don't know what the heck you're doing with basis because you can mess around until it works. And then when it works, you're like, it worked. You know, hopefully eventually you'll figure it out. Because basis Z is positive, right? We're, sh we're getting the direction of the sticks positive Z, right? We want the direction of the sticks negative Z because that's the direction of the sticks forward. So we can do minus negative aim container basis dot Z. And you can multiply a vector by a negative number. That's what you're doing effectively. 
and it just basically inverts it. So if I do play and then I hit shoot, whoa, it shot the direction that the stick was facing. Let's sing a song about it. Shoot it this way. Why? We're playing pool. We're shooting pool. We're shooting pool. We're shooting pool, Master Chief. All right. It's good. We're, it's good. Hopefully that all makes it. My gosh, can we get back to the code? Ugh. Anyways, you wanted 3D, right? This was your fault. You, the viewer, you wanted 3D. So this is what you get. If you were working in 2D, you're like, oh my gosh, snore. All I had to do is set the rotation. Ugh. All right, let's keep going. <laughs> um let's make it so that we can like animate this cue stick it's like kind of just goes the direction we're shooting which is cool but i want to animate it right i want it to like look like i'm shooting the stick instead of it like that's just bothering me like that i'm not shooting the stick that's stupid that's like i'm shooting a laser out of the stick that's not what i want um okay so how do we do that so what i'm gonna do um for this is like there's a few different ways we can do it we can do it like with a tween we can do it in the code we can like get the you know the minimum and maximum z and use a timer and figure out like the amount of time that's left to be able to like you know interpolate between the amount of time that's left on the timer holy moly don't do all that just use the freaking built-in animation system that's in godot the animation player so with the play system selected remember this animation belongs to the play system right because this has to do with playing the game so i'm going to with the playstation playstation play system selected i'm going to create an animation player you're like, really? Are we going to get into animation right now? I thought this was supposed to be code architecture. Where it's going to be short. Don't worry about it. Animation player. We have animation player selected. And what I want to do is I want to go between two different values. The stick's minimum Z and the stick's maximum Z. Right? That's what we want. We already figured out what the minimum and maximum Z are. So that's what we're going to do. So with the animation player selected, I'm going to create a new animation. Click new. And I'm going to call it shoot stick. I don't care. Call it something. Spell it correctly, though, because it's annoying to rename these animations. Um, OK, very good. And we can zoom in by holding control and scrolling up. And how a animation player works is uh, we have to specify, like, what are we um, translating, basically? What is changing? What property of what object is changing? So if I click Add Track, what am I changing? I'm changing the position, right? The 3D position. When I click on that, it's going to be like, okay, well, whose 3D position are we changing? The animation player can change anybody's position, including things that are outside of its parent. Don't, don't do it. You can change your uncle. Animation player is like, hey, Uncle Ball 2, you want me to change you? No, don't mess with your uncle, all right? Just only your siblings <laughs> or your like parent i guess in this case just within the play system what are we changing where uh we are moving the q stick forward and back so we're going to choose q stick so it's the q sticks uh position and what i what do i want to do well i have to set two i have to set uh a keyframe basically where does the q stick going to end up let's say in about half of a second if i right click here and do insert key and i click on the key so the key is selected. I right click like the insert key. The key is going to be at half a second, just so we can see what we're doing. And the Z position is at 1.28. Well, that's actually not where we want it to end up. We want it to end up at 0 .0, 0 0.75, right? So with the Q stick selected, what you can do is you can go back to local space, right? So that you move it forward and back. Because if, you, if you're in your global space, like check this out. If you're, if you're now in global space, and you can move it forward and back. The Y is now changing. Because if you remember, it's now like moving in front of and above that like terrarium, that like plate that it's sitting on top. Can you imagine if you were playing pool and you were like, you had your cue stick like on a plate and you're like, it just helps me. All right, it just helps. It's like, okay, no, that that bridge is, is disqualified. You can't use that kind of bridge. You know, it's like, make me. All right. So anyways, this is what we're doing. We're going to hide this. Cool. When you come back to this little animation player, the keyframe, it's 1.28. Remember, we eventually wanted it to get to 0 0.75. That's where it's ultimately going to get. So this keyframe, at once we get to half a second, it's going to be at 0 0.75 on the Z. Uh, I suppose, look, if I were to then like scrub this timeline, you'll see that like there's no actual animation that's happening here because there's not another keyframe. There has to be 
multiple keyframes. The keyframe specifies a checkpoint in the uh, value of this property, the value of, in this case, the position property. There's only one keyframe, so there are no checkpoints, right? This is the only checkpoint. It's always going to be 0.75. So I'm going to make another keyframe, and we're going to have to change this later, just so you know, if you already know where this is going. Don't be alarmed. Okay, with the... <laughs> what did I do to that keyframe? Did I delete it? All right. Insert a keyframe. With that keyframe, it's going to be starting at a zero, and that's going to start at position 1.4. So now when I scrub the timeline, and I can kind of zoom in here to look at my stick. Now, if you're in the situation where it's like, oh, I just want to go down a little bit. If you hold shift on your keyboard and then hold middle click on your mouse, then you can kind of drag your scene straight down. Makes it really nice. All right now, if I hit play, you can see like that's what my animation looks like. Look at that beautiful, it's such a beautiful animation. It's so beautiful. Oh my gosh. Right? And again, you might be like, he's not hitting the ball. Okay, move the aim container up. Okay, if you really, okay, move the aim container up. And you're like, what? You can't move the aim container. And you're like, yes, because look, the ball is going to be on the table, right? Zero, zero, zero. If you, like, if I hide the ball for a second. Zero, zero, zero is right here. So if I take the cue ball and I'm set cue ball position to zero 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 it's inside the table the, the ball is going to be on the table it's not going to be inside the table so zero 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 is like inside the table if we move aim container up it's not a big deal because remember in the code we're setting aim container to the position of the ball every tick anyway so it's like it's going to reset its position to wherever the ball is so you can move the aim if you really want to you can move the aim container like all the way the heck up here it doesn't matter because it's going to set itself to the ball so just put the aim container where it needs to be so that it's like you can use it as a good reference point. Coming back to the animation player and I hit play. Look, check it out. See, that's pretty good. But here's the problem. Oh, well, let's talk about the problem after we like put it in the code. So in the script for the play system, we're going to bring in that animation player. Okay, we again, wanna, we could reference it directly with the dollar sign, but I'm going to reference it through a variable. I think that's just better. It's going to be animation player. Okay. In fact, we might have more than one animation player for some reason. Probably you won't, but I'm going to say stick animation. Just so we're very clear that this is the animation player that we're using for the stick animation. Now, I'm still saying animation player instead of stick animation because technically it's a player. It plays things. It's not the animation itself. All right. And what is it? It is an animation player. Now, with the play system selected, I'm going to click and drag the animation player to the new variable that I just exposed to the inspector. And what do I want to do? I want to play that shoot stick animation I created when, when we shoot the ball, right? So uh, I guess right here is a good place to do it. Now, it's this stick direction and this cue ball apply central impulse both have to do with each other. So I don't have a, like a new line between them. But this animation player is different enough that I'll put a new line between them. The stick animation player dot play. Uh, shoot stiff. Why is it not like that? Should just be autocomplete. I mean, right now it's just making me feel uneasy. Like, why should I feel uneasy? I shouldn't feel uneasy. I'll ablido. That's what's going on here. All right, shoot stick. I'm gonna hit play. And now, if I hit, if I click, what? Okay, that's kind of what I wanted. Notice how it shoots the ball, but the ball shoots instantly. And the uh, right you, as soon as the animation happens, so there's a couple problems. The other problem is that like who shoots a stick like that? It's like way too slow. I mean, look at that. Like, what? Let's shoot the stick faster. So in the animation player, I'm going to select it. With the animation player selected, you're like, where did it go? Click on the little animation tab at the bottom, and I'm going to set this like uh, keyframe. It's like what? Point one, point two. What if I wanted to be in between those two? Don't worry, you can change it in the snap settings down here at the bottom, so I can. Say, I don't want it to snap every tenth of a second. I want to snap every hundredth of a second. Now I can really zoom in and look. See, I can snap to every hundredth of a second. What is this at? 0.18? I don't know. Whatever. Just go with a number. Whatever looks good. Hit play. Shoot it. <sighs> okay, I accidentally hit the... Uh, I clicked outside of the... Okay, here we go. That looked a lot better. It almost was like believable. But no, it's still very clear that we're shooting the ball before the animation is done. <clears throat> so what if I want to make it so that um, we want to be able to shoot the ball only when um, the animation has completed? 
So here's the thing, and where a lot of you, a lot of your alarm bells might go off, okay? But just don't worry about it. Don't be alarmed. Um, where so we want to call this function, right? This handle shot input. Oh no, we don't. Um, it would be helpful if we first uh, created a function um, for uh, shooting this ball altogether, right? Don't you think? I think that makes sense. Let's create a function that, um, like this, is where we like shoot the ball. We can't have this in the same place. We know this already right off the bat. These things can't be in the same place because we're starting the animation after we've applied an impulse, right? We want these to be in se at separate times, so they can't be in the same place. So let's create another function, and it's also going to be a private function, and we're going to call it strike ball. Okay, and the strike ball function is going to execute this, right? And we can also get rid of this. We can bring the stick animation player code up. <sighs> that would look awful. All right. There we go. So we want to call the strike ball function at some point. So we could do like a timer, right? We can set up a timer node that, like, you know, when its time elapses, we'll do strike ball, but like that has to line up with the animation, right? It's, if we change this to 0.18 seconds and 0.19 seconds, then we're going to have to update those. That's dumb, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to call the strike ball function inside of the animation player. This should raise a few alarm bells, and so let's be a little cautious here. I generally don't like stuff that affects the code that is executed outside of the code. I generally don't frankly like it that much but we're going to do it anyways just so we can see it and we can talk about it so i'm going to do add track and we're going to do um, a new track and it's going to be called a call method track and it's going to say okay whose function are we going to be calling whose method are we going to be calling we're going to be calling the play systems method right so if i click on the uh play system it's going to now okay yeah okay yeah that's good the play systems methods are what we're going to execute Okay, when are we going to execute the method and which method? So first we choose when, and it's going to be at this position right here, this 0.18. I'm going to right-click, I'm going to choose Insert Key, and it's going to have this giant select method thing. And it, not only can we select methods that belong to the script we've created, but also any other kind of methods we can inherit from all the other nodes, uh, all the other classes that our script uh, extends, such as Node3D. But I want Strike Ball. That's what I want to ultimately execute. We'll execute it, execute it right here at 0.18 seconds. See if I click on this keyframe, you'll see that it's calling strike ball at 0.18 seconds. If I hit play and I do this and I shoot, it's awesome. It works exactly how I want it to, right? We're able to shoot the ball wherever. <laughs> this is kind of its own game. All right. Um, that's perfect, right? It shoots only after the function, uh, after the animation is complete. So this is, but we have to be careful about this, okay? Some people will say, okay, well, the problem is that you shouldn't couple functionality with animations. And generally, yes, that's the case. But the problem, though, is like, that's not the kind of problem that we're dealing with here. The problem with coupling your functionality to animations is this idea that, like, I want it to... You know, like whenever the, you know, kick animation gets to like here, I'm going to make it so that like it kicks the ball, like as soon as the foot gets to the ball as according to the animation or something like that. Because guess what? Like, let's say that the animator like changes the, the you know, the, 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 the skeletal mesh animation where the ball, like the foot changes slightly or this character's foot is different than that character's foot or something like that. It's like, yeah, like that's going to create problems if you're trying to align it to some kind of animation or something. Um, but also because you're depending on the animation itself. So you might be like, well, that's similar to this, right? But no, this animation is actually so simple that it's effectively working as like a timer. Okay, we want the ball to be shot at 0.18 seconds after it's been clicked. Okay, that's effectively what it's doing. Like, you know, it's the it's the simplest type of animation, and generally that's like not going to create a problem. The problem 
And also sometimes like if you're coupling it to an animation, depending on the system, Godot allows us to call it like a method track. Sometimes you have to do some other kinds of like animation systems where it can actually skip that situation, right? Or you're in the code, you're like looking for something to happen in the animation from the code. <clears throat> okay, that's a problem. But with Godot, it's actually not that bad. It's gonna it's gonna reliably execute at the keyframe that it's executing. It's, so it's not it's not that much different than like a timer node, just like a fancy timer node. The problem, though, in my opinion, is that if there's a problem, there's a couple of different problems here. First of all, this method can you can't call you can't pass in variable parameters. Like you, you can specify parameters here, but they have to be like fixed numbers, like they fixed values. Like you, they can't be like some other kind of variable. We'll see why that's a problem later. The other problem is like you don't know when this is happening by looking at the code. Like if you were looking, this is kind of a rule of thumb. Think of this, if this were a GitHub repository, would someone be able to figure out what was happening by looking at the GitHub repository? Just the GitHub repository. Generally speaking, it's better code for you to be able to figure out what's happening by looking at just the GitHub code repository. You can't have, it's totally opaque. You have no idea that that's what's happening with strike a ball because you don't see strike ball anywhere in your code. It's never being executed. So it looks like this function is totally useless, but it is happening. And when is it happening? You just happen to know that it's part of this animation player. So I'd be very careful. Like I would make sure you like, you know, use documentation to say that animation player or actually Q stick animation player is, you know, Dick animation player executes this, you know, or something like that. Like you want to be very, very clear. It's just, I don't like it. I generally don't, but you know, it's the simplest thing for us to do. And I don't want to get into like trying to animate using the code. So we're just going to go with it. You can try to set up the animation from the code through the animation player. I'm not sure how you can do that, frankly. So we're just going to use the tool. All right. Very good. It's fine. It's not a big deal. Let's just keep going. Um, okay. Well, what other things happen when we hit the ball? Uh, when we hit the ball, we're also going to be like the, the stick is just still visible. Like that's dumb. Like let's make we already have the Q stick. We have a reference to it. So let's just set its visibility to false once you hit the ball. So if I hit play, the Q stick is visible. It's going to play the animation and then it disappears. Oh my gosh, that looks so good. That looks so good. All right, but here's the problem though. Um, there's actually a couple of different problems here. Um, one of the problems is that notice how if I shoot from here, it still plays like the whole animation. It's like I'm going to line up my shot and I'm going to hit it very, very light, I'm gonna hit it very lightly and then play the whole animation. It's like, come on, guys, it doesn't look right. So here's part of the problem with Godot. And uh, I, th I think it's just an oversight on their part. But the thing is that it's always going to play from keyframe zero to key to the next keyframe. Right? It's going to play from keyframe to keyframe. Your keyframes cannot, you can't do a variable thing. Like I can't say like whatever the current Z value is to some other Z value. I cannot do that. I have to set from a fixed literal number 1.4 to a fixed little literal number 0 0.75. I cannot set variable keyframes. I can't do that. But there is a functionality where instead of saying use the first keyframe to the next keyframe, you can say if there is if the first keyframe is not at zero, then use whatever the current value of that property is and animate it to the first keyframe. That's exactly what we want. But unfortunately, for some reason, Godot doesn't give me that privilege with setting the Z position. So what we're going to do is under add track, instead of 3D position track, I'm going to do property track. So I can get any kind of property I want. And I'm going to set the q stick again like okay and it's going to be like what property of q stick believe it or not we're going to set the position property it's like are you like circumventing the law here is this tax evasion don't we have a separate track just for this yeah but you blew it so i'm going to click open and you'll see that um they're exactly the same right this one modifies the q sticks 3d position this one modifies the q sticks 3D position, exactly the same, but oh, there's a conspicuous difference. This one has this little little update mode thing. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click. I'm going to do insert key again. It doesn't have this fancy looking like weird position icon. I didn't want to pay for that icon to begin with. I just wanted functionality. And the Z position, I want it to be 0 0.75 like before. <clears throat> but instead of this continuous um, update mode, which you can't change for some reason, that track, I'm going to choose capture. This is all very good dough specific, okay? Like hopefully there are things like this in other game engines that you're using. I don't want to dwell on this too much because this is not really code architecture. This is like good specific stuff. Capture means um, whatever the first, uh, if the if the first keyframe is not at time zero, then use whatever the current value of this property position and uh, go ahead and uh, interpolate it to the positions set here at the uh, first keyframe. I'm going to delete this first track that we made. Whoa, I clicked delete and it just like instantly killed it. Wow, no like, <laughs> no freaking warning. All right, very good. Let's go ahead and save it. Run it, see if it works. Okay, we are still able to animate. And um, now when I try to shoot the ball, cool, it shoots. Okay, well, now our cue stick is darn invisible. Restart it. Now what if I shoot it from like right next to the ball? Did you see that? Did you see that? It shot just from the position of the stick when we clicked shoot. And it just finished the animation at the end of that animation player. Again, I, I don't know. I don't know why Godot is like an oversight in my opinion. Like it's exactly the same thing, except we just like went through property track instead of 3D position track. It's exactly the same track, except this one's better. Do the better one, okay? It's like trying to trick you. It's like uh, you go into a store and like you get, there's like a coupon that's like, there's like a deal and this deal is like obviously better than the other deal. And you're like, why is the point of the other deal? It's like, well, the other deals looks, you know, has fancier graphics what all right very cool um this is good this is like exactly what we want um except that the ball always shoots the same the same velocity but okay like we're probably a little bit pooped out on the ball let's let's do something slightly different for a second when we shoot the ball notice how uh like it the camera follows the ball because the camera is inside of the aim camera right? And the aim container follows the ball all the time. Well, okay, that's all well and good, but what if you're like trying to, like you shoot the ball and there's balls flying all over the place and you want to be able to get a good sense of like where those balls are going? What are you going to just be like looking around, like looking like where's, where'd the balls go? Um, no, you know, just like in realistic mode, like if Master Chief gets this gigantic cue stick and like shoots, you know, what's like Master Chief going to do? Master Chief, as soon as he shoots, he's going to shoot and then he's going to like step away from the table and kind of like look at the table. He's like, and he's, he's going to stand real close to the table. Hopefully you can see this on the camera. He stands real close to the table. And once he shoots, he's going to step away and kind of like look at the table to see like where the balls went. So that's what we're going to do. Um, well, we already have a camera, right? Camera 3D here. It already looks at the whole table. So why don't we make use of that? I'm going to rename camera 3D to overhead cam. If you follow me, overhead cam. And what I want to do is I want to switch to camera overhead cam to be the current camera once we strike the ball, right? I, once we strike the ball, I want to set overhead cam to be the visible, uh, to be the current camera. And here's the problem, okay? I want to step back for a second. It's very easy for you to be like, well, if I want the overhead cam, then all I have to do is I just bring it into the play system, right? Just click and drag and bring it into the play system and then expose the overhead cam inside of the, you know, play system script, and then we can just do overhead cam dot make current right here inside of strike ball. Hold on. I know I've been giving you like free license to just throw stuff inside of the play system, but stop for a second. Our play system script is at high risk of becoming what we call a monolithic class or a monolithic script. That is to say that it's handling all aspects of our game. All right. We like we have animations, we have like sh shooting and all this other stuff. It's like, OK, it seems like everything goes here. No, 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 no. It just seems that way because all these things that we've been doing so far happen to do with the s playing the game, right? The play system of the game, which is to shoot the ball a direction like that all sounds perfect for the play system. The overhead camera, is that really like a play system thing? Uh, I don't know. Like the overhead cam can be something that maybe other systems use right? Like maybe when you hit pause, it goes to overhead cam, right? 
So what is the pause menu? Need to be able to get the play system's overhead cam? That seems like we're... Our fingers are touching things. We're just touching stuff we shouldn't be touching. So stop for a second and recognize that the overhead cam is not really a play system thing. It has nothing to do with playing the game. The, the like aim cam, that's a play system thing. Overhead cam, not as much. So instead, I still want the play system to be... Uh, I still want the overhead cam more specifically, to become the current camera when we hit the ball. But I don't want the play system to know about the overhead cam. The, overhead, the play system doesn't need to know about the overhead cam. Okay, This is where you should be thinking in terms of signals, in terms of events. Okay, That's, that's what you should be thinking of. All right, Events. Whenever something of note happens in the game, a situation that happens in the game, I'm starting to get a little jumpy, guys. I really shouldn't have drank all that tea. <laughs> um, um, the system, uh, whenever something happens of note, it's useful to think, is that something that we can log as a signal? And it's not log isn't the right word, but I'm just using that word to say, like, basically imagine if you were taking a diary. Uh, this is like my terrarium, my pool table, and it's my diary. And so I'm like the kind of person who goes around and uses cue sticks to write notes like, okay, today I ate cereal, you know, today I shot some bull, right? You know, you're talking about the things you did, the things that happened, okay? And that's what we're basically doing with signals. Whenever something happens, it's useful to be like, hey, this happened. Anybody who wants to know, hey, this happened. You don't have to know who those people are or who those, those systems are. They can subscribe to that alert, right? Just like how like, you know, you maybe want to subscribe to like a price alert or you want to subscribe to a weather alert. I guess those actually subscribe for you. Like, <laughs> like they'll tell you there's a tornado coming, even though you're like, please, I didn't want to know. They're like, I don't care if you want to know or not, but it's similar to that, right? Where the tornado siren people don't need to like, go physically to every person's house and be like, hey, yo, tornado. No, they just like send out this alert and everybody who subscribed to that alert receives that alert. And that's basically what we're doing here. We're saying something happened. When you hit the ball, that's a meaningful thing. That's a thing of note that has happened. The ball has been hit. Everybody who cares, pay attention. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a singleton that keeps track of all the situations that can happen of note okay you're like singleton isn't that bad let's start creating the singleton and we'll talk about why it's not that bad all right we're going to create a singleton and we can do that by going to the project project settings and the auto load tab again go do a beginner godot tutorial if you don't know how to do this or if you don't understand why how this works and we're going to create a new node that's going to be accessible by the singleton variable called game uh, events. These are the events that are associated with the game. And when I click add, it's going to probably be like, okay, cool, you want to create this game events, but what script is this game events singleton node going to be attached to? Game underscore events, that's perfect, except it's putting it inside the default directory. I'm going to click this little new folder icon. It'd be cool if it just automatically put in whatever direct directory, like it assumed, like whatever I had last created as like a script. I don't know. I mean, I'm going to come back here. I'm going to go into the scripts folder, gameevents.gd. That sounds like a pretty good um, uh, name of this uh, file. Gameevents.gd. Click, click create. There it is. A node is going to be called game events. It's going to be uh, attached to this game events script, or the script is going to be attached to the game events node. I'm going to click close. It's not going to automatically open up my new script. So I'm going to open it by going to my scripts folder and I'm going to double click game events.gd and it's empty. Close it, kill it. Too much. This time for real. Because all this is going to be is a collection of signals. That's all it's going to be. It's going to be a collection of signals. And that's why this is not that big. Okay. If your singleton was something like, hey, I'm handling the overhead camera. No, that's that's a singleton that like if not everybody needs to know that. We don't need the overhead cam to be a signal. We don't need it in play system to be able to be like, overhead cam, go do this thing. No, because then you've coupled the play system to the overhead cam, which was 
what we were trying to avoid in the beginning, right? So we don't want the overhead cam to be the, the singleton because then the play system script will only work if there's an overhead cam. The play system doesn't need to know that there's an overhead cam, right? But you know what the play system is totally okay with knowing? It is not going to be a big deal and it'll allow you to easily test your code without like worrying about, uh-oh, we also have to bring in an overhead cam or else we can't test it. Is there this notion that things happen in the game? Okay, that's totally fine. Everyone can do that. Everyone can see that and it can be coupled to everything because everything needs to know that things happen, right? It's okay for everybody to see that. And it's only just a collection of signals. There's no functionality in here. So we're going to create a signal and it's going to be called, I don't know, cue ball hit. And notice how I didn't use the underscore. And I didn't use the underscore because this is not private. This is something we very, it's very much we want everyone to be able to access. Cue ball hit. Um, and that's it. That's all we need to do. Signal, cue ball hit. That, that's, that's it. Like, see how simple it is? Now, if we go to the play system, then right here in the strike ball, okay, we've struck the ball, we've made the cue stick visible or invisible. And all we now need to do is game events. Now, because it's a signal or a singleton, a signalton, that's what this is. It's my signalton. I should have called it signaltons, dud, GD. That's bad. All right. Game events dot, and then what was it called? Q ball hit. See, it sees it and notices it and knows about it. Is game events is a signal or a, is a, how did that stupid sound come out on the mic? Is a, a singleton. We can access it from anywhere. Um, and the cue ball hit uh, signal belongs to it. And we're going to use this thing, uh, function called emit. So when we do emit, it's, it's basically like ring the bells. Okay. Alarm this cue ball. We, this has been happened. Cue ball hit has happened. It has happened. Emit. It has happened. All right, very good. Now anybody who is subscribed uh, to this cue ball hit signal will be notified. Okay, well, who's subscribed to it? The overhead cam. That's who we want to be subscribed to. Currently, the overhead cam has doesn't have any way to know that this has happened. So we're going to give it a script. And you're like, really? Do we have to create a script for the overhead cam? Yeah, well, I mean, eventually it's good. Okay. We're going to start with creating an overhead cam script, and that's fine. If we later decide that the overhead cam deserves to be as part of a separate system that itself controls the overhead cam, then we can refactor. It's not a big deal. This is a light decision. <laughs> we can refactor it later. Let's make an overhead cam script. It's going <laughs> to... Why is it in scenes? Like, okay, I get it that you don't want to put it in scripts every time, but why do you put it in scenes? Scripts. Overhead cam. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. You almost tricked me there, though. Overhead cam with the snake case, as good does developers themselves recommend. Overhead cam .gd. Um, very good. Click create and okay. Again, um, I'm gonna keep this here for now. No, I'm not gonna kill it. I hate it. <laughs> um, well, what about this overhead cam? Well, what we need to do is we need to create a function that is executed when the cue ball is hit. You can call it whatever you want. Okay, but by convention, you can just call it exactly the same thing as the signal, except with the word on at the beginning. <laughs> and also this little underscore to say like, hey, only the overhead cam should be calling this function directly. Very good. And what do we want to do? We want self, as in the camera 3D, to be current. So what is it? Current, make current. Very good. This is what we want to happen. But when should this function be executed? Well, it should be executed when this cue ball event has been emitted, right? So play system is not executing that overhead cam function directly. It is instead emitting this to cue ball hit. And whoever cares about that, which the overhead cam we want to care about it, will execute the functions that are connected to that signal. So on ready, we're going to um, connect the on cue ball hit function to the signal. Game events dot cue ball hit dot connect. What function are we going to connect it to? The on cue ball hit function. And awesomely, because with the newer versions of Godot, we have this concept of a callable function, we can just pass the function in directly. We don't need to use any weird string references. So on cue ball hit. And when you hit tab, it's going to automatically assume that we want to call the function. 
This is not what we want to do. Look what happens if we try to do this. It's going to be bad news. It's going to instantly crash because it's going to be like, we can't convert one argument from nil to callable. That is totally gibberish to you if you aren't familiar with some basic kinds of <laughs> uh, like functional programming. Okay. So what's happening here is on cue ball hit is calling a function. Or sorry, this, this we're calling the on cue ball hit function, right? When you use parentheses after the function uh, name, it's calling the function, all right? And when you call a function, it's this function call is going to evaluate to whatever that function returns, right? If we were to say like return 10, for example, then what's gonna happen is on cue ball hit is gonna evaluate to the number 10, and then it's gonna pass in 10 to the connect function. It's gonna be like, hey, cue ball hit, I want you to know about this function. It's just the number 10. It's like, what? So you can think of it as, um, kind of like, what are we thinking about now at pizza, right? <laughs> we always have to think about pizza. There are pizzas that you get cooked at the store, and then there's take and bake pizzas, okay? This here is like the, the, the pizza is first cooked, and then it's given to the customer, in this case, connect. It's like, here you go, here's my cooked pizza. It's like, well, the connect function is not interested in a cooked pizza. The connect function is interested in a take and bake pizza, okay? To do a take and bake pizza, you're like, here's the whole, here's the pizza that's frozen, a frozen pizza basically. And I want you to bake the pizza when you're ready. That's what we want to pass into the connect function. So instead of calling the function and passing in what it returns, we are going to pass in the whole function itself. Okay. This function's name, the identifiers on cue ball hit, we're basically using it like a variable. This is the function. Take the function, please, and call the function when the cue ball hit has happened. Okay, this has now basically been added to the list of things that the signal is going to call. Okay, it's basically like a subscriber list. We're going to call this function when the cue ball is hit. So now if I hit play and I click, you can see that, ta-da, it now goes to overhead cam mode. Hooray, and the ball falls to the floor. <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay, I hope it does. Uh, let's do like one more thing and I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> um, the ball falls through the floor. Uh, I don't like that. I want the ball to be, now that we're able to kind of shoot it whatever direction we want, it goes in overhead cam mode. Let's make it so that it can't go through the, the walls. And so to do that, we're gonna create walls. All right, just like the surface of the table, we don't, we could make it in the main scene, but let's make it in the billiard table scene. So I'm gonna switch over to the billiard table scene. It currently has this like uh, surface of the table collision shape. I want to create now collision shapes for the wall. Now I can continue adding that to the surface static body because a static body or any other body can have however many collision shapes you want and they'll all work. But this one's called surface. So let's make a new static body. It doesn't make any difference. If you really want to, you can just make that other static body called colliders or something. And that doesn't really matter. So static body 3D, these basically are free. These these like body these like static bodies are basically free. You can have many, however many you want because ultimately they're not really doing anything. It's just their shape that's sitting there. They're not updating forces. They're not updating gravity. They're not causing much problem. You can make however many you want, however many collision shapes you want. It's just however you want to organize it. I'm going to call this uh, static body, what should I call it? Let's call it walls. Or something. All right, very good. Let's make a new collision shape. Uh, collision shape. And I want to create walls. Okay, let's think about this smartly because, like, this can take a lot longer depending on how you think of this. Let's do again. You can, if you want, if you really want, you can like go back into your Blender file and you can try to do this stupid like tri mesh thing around the wall, the walls. I recommend against it because it's probably going to like the ball's going to hit the wall. It's going to hit some weird triangle and it's going to bounce backwards. And it's going to be like, what the heck? This isn't like breakout. Why, are, <laughs> why is the ball bouncing that direction off of a wall? To keep it like as least likely to doing that as possible, please um, don't do that. Make it as simple of a collision shape as you can. So box is what we're going to do. Box shape 2D, 3D, why did I say 2D? And this time I'm gonna keep it tall, okay? I'm gonna keep it tall and I'm gonna go straight to top view. And I'm gonna make it thin, but it doesn't have to be that thin. 
And if you drag this little green square, it allows you to move both of the axes that are between that the square is between at the same time. So the blue and red axis. At the same time. I'm going to kind of scroll down and go to this wall first. OK, now make this like it doesn't have to be thick. OK, like I said, with the surface, it doesn't have to be thick for it to work, because the problem is where the ball totally misses the surface of that collision shape. As soon as it's inside the collision shape, it doesn't matter how thick the collision shape is. It's going to be inside the collision shape and then it's going to fall. It's going to go through the wall. So you don't want to do that. All right. And it also depends a little bit on the physics engine. And you know what Godot, like every other game engine, like changes their physics engine, like they change their diapers. I mean, they change their underwear, right? They change it all the time. <laughs> I know you might be like, oh, what are you talking about? <laughs> Unreal Engine's been using their physics engine for like one and a half years. You know, it's like, come on, guys. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> so you might have to change some things, but all physics engines are pretty similar. I'm going to go ahead and make this a little bit smaller, but here's the thing. You might be like, I need it to be perfect. I need it to be exactly to the edge of the pocket. Don't do that. Don't do that. Okay, you want those pockets to be bigger than they are, they appear to be for multiple reasons. First of all, um, because you want the game to be easier. To, like, cool is hard, okay? You don't want the game to be needlessly difficult. Second of all, it, you're just bug testing this. You want the balls to go in the pockets easily, okay? You can always make it harder by adjusting the size of these walls later. And remember, all of these walls are going to share the same collision shape, so if you resize the wall for one of them, it'll resize it for all of them anyway, so it's totally good. I'm going to keep it like this, like really pretty far from the wall. And I'm going to. It's pretty good. So that's evenly between the two. And then I'm going to create additional uh, boxes that complete the pocket. But I'm not going to worry about those pockets yet. Those uh, those uh, walls yet. I'll fix them in a second. I'm going to finish with this because if this if this uh, billiard table is correctly proportioned, Every cushion, that's what I'm calling the, the, the wall here is called a cushion, to my knowledge. All cushions are the same width, approximately. The shape of the pocket is a little different. So you can't just make one thing called pocket walls and then move it around because this pocket is kind of like more V-shaped and this pocket is kind of like straight. But the cushions themselves are the same width. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate Control D and I'm going to move this one over to this wall, and it should be the same size. Be good, it's about the same size. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to select both of these collision shapes, and I'm going to do, I'm actually going to rename it to cushion, because um, cushion two. So that, because we're going to have like the pocket cushions, I guess. These are like wall cushions. Anyways, I'm going to select both of these cushions and I am going to control D or command D on a Mac, and I'm going to now move these cushions up. Okay, and they should be perfectly symmetrical to the top here. So now we can move them in place and they should be in the same place as the opposite side. Okay, um, now I'm going to select one of these cushions, maybe cushion one or something. No, let's do cushion four so that it duplicates it right here. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to now move this cushion over to this wall. I'm going to rotate it by holding control on my keyboard so it rotates around like 15 degrees at a time. And I'm going to move this cushion. You're like, wait, you're messing with the basis. Come on, folks. This is a freaking collision shape. We're not going to be messing with the, it in the code. It's going to be fine. Um, and then I'm going to move it up. And I'm going to put it exactly where it needs to go. Actually, look. I should have been using these little like diamonds, like line it up with the diamond. Perfect. Now it's like perfectly between. Why didn't anyone tell me through my pre recording that I should have been lining it up with the diamonds? <laughs> All right, we got kitchen five. Now don't drag it from the diamond, or sorry, from the little square. Drag it from just the x axis so that like it stays exactly put and is exactly symmetrical to the other side. Okay, very good. Now we've got this cushion in place. Now what else do we need to do? We need to make like the uh, kind of the pocket cushions, I guess. So I'm going to do um, these actually need to be different because if these need to be resized, 
not just rotated. They need to be resized. Actually, they don't need to be resized, but it's going to look really awful if they're not resized. So I'm going to make a new collision shape altogether. Um, remember, if you resize them, they're like they share each other. Remember, I could have just like duplicated it and did make unique. That would have been fine. If you remember from like hours ago in this tutorial. All right, collision shape. Or no, cushion, uh, pocket cushion. Okay, and uh, it is a box. It is a small box. All right. I'm gonna move it. I'm gonna make it a little bit thinner. And I'm gonna make it quite a bit less long. And I'm gonna move it in place, and I'm gonna rotate it to be the angle of the cushion, but I'm going to line it up here because if I do this, then it's going to like, the ball is going to get trapped right here in between these collision shapes. So I'm going to put it like all the way over here. And you're like, what the heck are you doing, Shaban? And my answer is like, just relax. Okay, come on. I told you. We want the game to be easy for now. All right. And then we're going to do this. And then uh, I'm going to put it on the other side. So I'm going to do control D and here's where you're like, oh, I know the math. I'm going to go to transform. I'm going to do rotate. I'm going to add it by like, you know, the offset from 90 degrees that the other one is. Okay. We've done enough math. Just rotate it. Come on. It's not a big deal. <laughs> Just rotate it. And then, uh, good enough. Put it right here. <laughs> do what you want. Okay. Like if you want it to be perfect, make it perfect. Um, and then I'm going to select both of these pocket cushions and I'm going to duplicate them and I'm going to move them to the other side and I'm going to hold control so that it rotates exactly 180 degrees, move it up, zoom right in, and it should line up just right. But because I didn't line them up with the darn gold diamonds, why did, why did you let me do this? We're going to drag it over, just select those cushions again. We're going to move it. Okay. This is what has happened now. Our cushions are bad because of me. That's okay. We've already gotten this far. In. I'm going to duplicate um, more of these cushions and I'm going to keep, ultimately, I'm going to keep their same size. Let me duplicate this one. And I'm going to move it down to this corner. And remember, I'm not going to change the size, I'm just going to rotate it. Remember, rotating is fine. Changing the size, because the rotation is happening, basically. And like, you know, it's not going to affect the size of the shape, so it's not going to mess up the fact that it's, uh, you know, the thing that I said earlier, that it's a uh, shared reference to the same collision shape. So now I'm going to duplicate it, and I'm going to move it into place, and I'm going to reuse these two cushions, five and six. However many times as I need, I'm going to move it up. Oops, nope. Move it just by the blue arrow. And then I'm going to hold control as I scroll, do negative 90 because you know how math works. And very good. It's okay, that's not great. Please do fix this on your own, okay? I'm now going to select pockets five through eight, and I'm going to duplicate all of them. I'm going to move them all the way over here, and I'm going to move them all over 180 degrees and drag them into place. And they should come out decent. All right. Good enough. Okay. Now, when I hold the middle click and I click and uh, I middle click and drag, it'll go back to perspective mode. And you can see like, whoa, these cushions are tall. Please refrain from trying to make your cushions like ex exactly as tall as the cushions. You're asking for trouble. The balls shouldn't be going out of the billiard table. In fact, if you want, you can, I guess, if that's part of the game and you want there to be like a kill Y, kill Y is in like the Y coordinate, at which point the ball is like killed. Like, you know, be my guest. Uh, but I don't want that. I don't want the balls to fall out of Okay, I don't want that part of, I don't want that kind of foul to happen here. If you want to, I don't know, you do whatever you want. But I'm making them tall because I don't want the balls to fall out. It doesn't really matter because you can't see these collision shapes anyways. So now when I shoot the ball, like, wee, 
Oh, look, it bounced it. And it went through the pocket. Now you're like, why did it look like it fall? It's because I made the darn pocket so, you know, so, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? So, like, I didn't even care. Look, notice how I can shoot the ball, even though I can't see the stick, because I have no means of I telling it that it's not allowed to shoot anymore. Okay, well, there's a few problems here. As you can see, um, I have to go to the bathroom. Um, there's a few problems here. Notice how it just stops on the cushion. Like, okay, I get it. It's called a cushion, but not. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that cushiony, okay? This isn't like a freaking Hollywood stunt cushion, like to prevent the person from like dying. Like, let him bounce. All right, let the ball bounce. Okay, it doesn't bounce at all. In fact, come to think of it, the ball doesn't really bounce off the ball either. Like, it just kind of, well, that's not that bad. And the ball just keeps moving forever. Shouldn't it like slow down on that surface? Certainly shouldn't just stop. Okay, we got to fix that. And uh, okay, that's not hard to fix, but it is very bathroom right now. So I'm going <laughs> to go to the bathroom. All right, so bon appetit or cheers or bottom up. Uh, all right, I'll be right back. And we're back. All right, very cool. Where were we? All right. Yes, I have to go to the I have to go to the bathroom. Okay, and uh, you know, even Magister Chief needs to go to the bathroom sometimes. It's Mister Chief to you. All right, so yes, the cute the they they hit the cushions and then they stop on the cushions. Okay, some of you may have noticed that like my directional light of my world has been changing because like I have a window in front of me, so it's like it's dark now. Anyway, whatever. Um, yes, it's gonna get late. So how do we do that? How do we make it so that the characteristics of a body bounce differently? Well, you do that with uh, what's called a physics material. So I'm going to switch to the ball um, tab, the ball.tscn uh, file, and you can change a physics material on a, a rigid body or really any body directly. And you notice how it says physics material is currently set to empty. So it's just going to use like the default, like nothing physics material if you click on this where it says empty um and i click new physics material then we now have physics material similar to if you were like create a new material or in you know a material on the ball mesh texture but this is a physics material okay it's not the same kind of material if i click on it you see it has properties just not nearly as many all i get are friction rough bounce and absorbent and so it's a real relatively limited physics engine but it usually has what we need um currently the bounce is set to zero which is to say basically it doesn't bounce at all. So I want it to, this is basically like the restitution value. How much, like what percentage of the ball's like velocity is kept when it bounces? So let's say 0.9, okay. <laughs> Zero, no bounce to one full bounciness. Okay, very good. Um, so now when I hit play and I try to shoot it against, no, oh, look at the ball just bouncing. You see who's bouncing? All right shoot it it's like oh look it bounces um the problem is it bounces like perfectly you see what i'm saying nearly perfectly it does kind of slow down but it just keeps bouncing folks it just keeps bouncing bounce and all this kind of stuff a little too bouncy what we want is we want the balls bounce against another ball to be different than the balls bounce against the cushion right now we're okay with 0.9 for the balls bounce against another ball in fact it might even be more bouncy against other balls frankly i don't know and if I go to uh, to change the bounciness of a cushion, if I come to the billiard table, I actually don't want the surface to be very bouncy. Actually, so it's good that we have different static bodies. But for the walls, I'm going to go ahead and um, under the physics material. Now, it's a static body. <laughs> so you're like, wait, I thought you said these were free. Okay, well, they're not like absolutely free, but compared to a rigid body, they're very, very, very basic. So basically all it knows is like, okay, something hit me. What do I want to do to the thing that hit me? Because it's not going to bounce. The static body's not going to bounce. But if I go under physics material, you can see that um, it also has the same things. For bounce, I don't want zero. But I want this absorbent thing. If I hover over absorbent, it says subtracts the bounciness from the colliding object. It's bounciness. So I want it to be absorbent because I want it to absorb the bounciness of the object. And like how much of the ball like velocity do I want to eat? I don't know, like 30%. I don't know. Let's find out. 
go and hit play. We hit the ball against another ball, they bounce. But when the ball hits the cushion, it kind of loses some of its speed. And so when we do this, you see, okay, cool. It's like losing some of the speed. I kind of like it. It's kind of reducing some of its speed, but there's a bigger problem here. Notice how the ball just keeps like rolling forever. <laughs> yeah, okay. We want it to not do that. And we don't do that with the friction. Okay, don't mess with the friction, all right? Um, friction at maximum is good because that means that the ball is going to roll. If you set the friction to zero, it's going to be like ice. It's going to be like freaking like uh, air hockey or something, right? <laughs> They're just going to float along and not rotate. Don't do that. Under the ball uh, scene, with the rigid body selected for the ball, instead of messing with the physics material, what we can do is we can create what's called damping. Damping is where a, a body loses some of its energy um, over time based on some kind of thing like motion or rotation or something like that. So if I scroll down here, let's look for where we can find damping. So angular, yeah. So there's damp mode. So we wanna, uh, there's also linear damping, um, but let's do angular damping. I think that's gonna be a little bit more realistic for the ball, that the ball loses some of its angular motion. Um, as in it's like rotation, which effectively is going to be its ability to move forward too because it rolls and moves at the same time. So let's change the damp to like right now it's zero. It doesn't damp at all. Like I already kind of uh, um, change the value as you want. Let's do like just start with one. One's a pretty good. Shoot the ball. Okay, it's slowing down, but I feel it slows down a little bit too slowly. So I don't know, like two, 1.5. Shoot it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See how it slows down now? That's better. Okay, so that's pretty good. I kind of like that. But that introduces a new problem. Because the ball like slows down the hardest that i hit this ball is like extremely light right like and also you want to be able to hit it lightly but you also want to be able to hit it hard right now you can only hit it like you know one speed which is like not great <laughs> i uh, i just want to take it aside real quick about the physics materials is that like you can look up the like actual regulation like restitution values of balls like pool balls and stuff like that and it's probably not going to be that useful be well i mean a little bit useful but like don't use exact values like that because these physics engines are approximate they're not like actually doing an amazing job at like and also even if you were like able to make it you know use exactly the same restitution values there's too many other like little variables on the feel of pool and ultimately you want to change you, you want the feel of pool to feel right okay so just modify these settings until it feels right okay that's my recommendation Let's make it so that we can shoot the ball at like different powers. Okay. Again, let's stop and think for a second. Like, okay, where are we going to do this? Are, is the ball going to know how hard it's going to be hit? Again, no, because it's the cue ball that's being hit, right? It's not the other balls. So it has to probably do with the play system, not with the cue ball specifically. Okay. That's one of the things. Um, but also, the other question that we have to figure out is. Um, uh like how are we gonna set that power you know what i mean like it's kind of like angry birds right but how are we doing that like are we set like we can set the power by having like a little slider thing that goes like power 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 but we already kind of have a visual indicator of power the closer the stick is to the ball when you hit it the generally the lighter it is that it's going to hit it the farther away the stick is generally the harder we're going to hit it so we already have some kind of visual indicator of how hard it is we already know how like minimum you know in the maximum balls like as our cue sticks position is going to be so let's think about it in terms of that but um before we do that let's first figure out what is similarly to how we figured out the minimum stick z position and the maximum stick z position let's figure out the minimum ball power and the maximum ball power so let's do that inside of the play system inside of the script under play system 
up here where we see export ver stick minzy, export ver, you know, stick maxi and all that stuff. Let's just add a couple more. Let's do export ver shot power min. And then let's uh, use the walrus. And, uh, well, let's not, let's just, let's use magic numbers for now. Okay. So let's just say float. Just keep it here for now. Just so that error goes away. And um, apply central. Right now, stick direction, we don't have any power applied to it at all. So <clears throat> let's make it so that we um, multiply the power by uh, some magic numbers. So like, uh, let's create a thing called... Wait, here's a problem, actually. Think about this for a second. Well, we're going to do it inside a strike ball, but we have another problem. We'll talk about it later. You can already see what the problem is going to be. We can create a variable. I'm going to call it shot power. It's called, you know, point 0.1 or something like that. Um, just to see if that, like, looks good. And um, let's apply the central impulse, and we'll just, like, uh, I don't know, multiply it by... In fact, we don't even need this shot power. Like, we're already getting too far into here. Let's just multiply it right here. <laughs> now, the stick direction itself, since it's a basis, is already a unit vector. So we don't have to worry about, like, normalizing the shot, the stick direction, because it's already um, a magnitude one. So whatever we multiply by is already going to, like, honor that, and it's not going to we're not, we're not going to have any problems with like the direction we're shooting is going to have like a different power just because of the direction it is. Um, if you don't know what I mean by normalize vector, uh, please do watch, um, I think, my concept lecture to uh, video on YouTube about vectors so you can learn about that. Basically, just a vector of length one. Um, let's multiply by atoms 0.1. Just see what happens. Shoot it. That's fine okay you really want to just tap real nice and then how okay one is currently its thing so how much stronger can we hit the ball like five five times the strength shoot that ball boom oh wow is that a little much not much enough let's much it more okay whatever point one to five that's fine you, you do whatever you want Type in whatever values you want. So, um, so here's the problem. Now that we have our magic number, we know that like 0.1 to 5 are the values that we want. Then let's go ahead and create like this is this is mostly harmless. We, we can do this, right? We can do the walrus, and we can say the shot power min is 0.1, and we can say and we're exporting it again because it allows the like designer to change. And when I say designer, I mean like you, if you're going to be making this by yourself. <laughs> Um, you can change it like in the editor or something. Oh, okay. Here's a thing that's important to recognize. Look at the problem here. Shot power max. I'm walrusing it to five. You see the problem? What is five? These are all floats. Obviously. Is this a float? No, that's an integer. So uh, you have two options. You can either do 5.0 so that you are saying, hey, this is definitely a float, or you can be exp listen you can say float but if you do that then it's like the walrus will get mad and so i kind of like that these are all lined up just make sure that you remember that this is a float it doesn't really matter if you multiply by an, it might actually matter it depends on how you are doing this shot power stuff <laughs> it might actually matter so keeping the types the same is going to be the safest thing to do um okay so here's where we need to stop and do a think okay are you ready for a think how are we going to know what the shot power is? I like the idea of the shot power being something to do with how far back the stick is. I like that, okay? So if it's here, it's like halfway. If it's here, it's like really light. If it's all the way back here, it's like really hard. As hard as it goes. How are we going to do that, though? Because if you think about it, when we shoot the stick, we're doing shoot stick here. That's where we know the stick's position. As soon as we play the animation, the stick's position is going to update. By the time the stick's position, like by the time it strikes the ball, the stick's position is going to be at min. So it's always going to hit it at min if we're basing the shot power on the stick's position. Also, like going purely based off of appearance can be problematic. So 
instead of like trying to set the um, power based off of like the location of a stick, why don't we make both the stick and the power to be based off the same number, the same percentage of power? You get it? Okay. So here's the problem. How are we sending that information? And that percentage of power is going to be based off of like the sticks, like the percentage of the sticks far backness. But how are we going to send that to the strike ball? Remember, the inside of an animation player, the method track doesn't allow you to call this method with variable values, right? You can pass in like some values that are, you know, just literal values. Oops, here literal values you can't best you can't base it on some kind of variable so that's another one of the problems with the method this whole like method track thing so it makes now now it's kind of complicated this a little bit better. i can't pass in a value so the only way for handle shot input to be able to basically send a value over to strike ball is by carrying around some kind of uh variable that both functions can see which it have to it has to be a member variable well, I mean, it could technically be something as ridiculous as like a singleton is holding it, but don't do that. We're going to make a member variable for it. And it's very, very member variable-y. <laughs> it's very temporary. Let's call it a shot percent, I guess, like the percentage of the shot. And here's, again, the problem. We, we can't like walrus this to zero. Whoops. If we walrus this to zero, this is going to be an integer. And it's saying 0, 0.0, now it's just getting out of hand. Since it's not part of the same flock of numbers over here, I'm just going to be explicit. This is a float. <laughs> be very clear. OK, um, so this is going to be a value that we're going to set in the handle stick or shot input where we shoot the ball. So as soon as we shoot it, that's when we're going to set the shot percent. And in the strike ball, we're going to use that value. We're going to use that to apply the 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 actual shot power between min and max really not not super preferable um but you know what it's it's really not that dangerous and we can we can fix this we can have strike ball pass a thing and we can actually like set this up but like at just like first just thinking about it again the so the the alternative unless you want to right what you think is a better alternative the alternative is really also kind of like to get it to animate and also be able to keep track of these things is is also going to have like it's going to you know add a little bit of messiness for this kind of thing this gives me pause but it's not going to it's again it's a relatively isolated issue that we can refactor without messing up a, a bunch of additional systems we're just taking something from here to there nobody else in the entire uh you know in the entire uh game project cares about it so like how these two people handle their affairs is fine we don't need celebrity gossip inside of our code architecture okay just because like these two systems are so close it doesn't really matter no one else cares about it let them deal with their problems and we'll have them deal with it later couples therapy is that is going to happen eventually all right this is fine. Okay, so how are we going to do that? So we're going to set the shot percent here. Percent. And this shot percent is going to be a float between 0 and 1. It's a percentage, right? It's a percent. And the percentage is going to be based off of the uh, percent between the minimum stick and the maximum stick uh, Z, right? So how do we get that? You know? Actually, you know what? This is going to be a better way to do it. Um, let's not base shot percent off of the minimum stick and the maximum stick Z. Let's set the shot percent with the relative Y. Let's do that. I like that a lot better. In fact, we can't do it here anyways, because we could. The mouse motion, instead of moving the aim, no, instead of moving the Q sticks to Z position, let's update the shot percent. I like that better. Because we're up, we're changing, we're going, we're using the mouse to set 0 to 100, 0 to 100. I love it. And then everything else will base off of the shot percent that we're, cha that we're setting with the mouse. Okay, I think that's a lot cleaner than setting shot percent 
to a value of like a position of some object. So much better, I like it. So we're gonna do shot percent is going to be plus or equal. So we're gonna change it by the relative y. Um, it's zero to one. So uh, zero to one is gonna be extremely, like we're definitely gonna, we, we're gonna use the stick sensitivity, uh, stick z sense. You can call it shot z sensor. I don't know. We're just gonna use stick z sense for now. And use that as the sensitivity. Because ultimately that's how we're applying it. Okay, so the problem, of course, though, is that the mouse's relative y can like be, you know, it can bring shot percent down to the negatives. It can go well above one, right? We want to clamp it between zero and one, right? So just like we had done before, the shot percent, I like this so much better. I feel, I just, I feel it. I feel its betterness. Okay. And it's going to be the shot percent between zero and one. That's so much cleaner. I love it. Okay. That's good. This is so much cleaner. This is better than how we did before. All right. So shot percent and the Q sticks, the Q sticks Z position is going to be a percentage of, uh, between its min and max based on the shot percentage. Okay. So our mouse allows this to go from zero to one, the shot percent. And then we're going to effectively just set this, the position Z value as a shot percent between its min and max. And how do you do that? Well, those of you who are familiar with basic, some basic mathematics knows about this function called LERP. Okay, LERP is called uh, linear interpolation. Linear interpolation, if I click on this, as we did with clamp, except how this works, really wait, come on, don't call it that. All right, whatever from and to so basically what's the min what's the max and what's the percentage the alpha the you know between min and max okay so if this value if so like from if it's like zero and max is a thousand and your weight is 0 0.5 then what's halfway between zero and a thousand it's 500 right if this was 1000 and then 2000 then what's halfway you know the weight of 0 0.5 What's halfway between 1,000 and 2,000 is 1,500. So it's really, really, really convenient function. And it's kind of fun to say, lerp. It sounds almost like slurp. Just tell all your friends about it. I like the lerp. And I like to play pool. All right, tell your friends. All right, very good. Um, <laughs> you can see I'm, I'm a huge... A huge uh, cool guy. All right. What are we doing? Oh, yeah. From what? The shot power. Uh, no, the Q stick men, right? The Q stick men and the Q stick max. Stick max. And uh, what is the weight? Well, the shot percent. And what are we setting this lerp to? The Q stick Z position. Now, as long as your weight, as long as this like shot percent doesn't go over, oh my gosh, it's right at 80. Whew. We almost got the police called on us. All right. Um, the shot percent. Uh, this, as long as that doesn't go like outside of zero and one, then these things will stay within stick min and stick max. Now, if it does go outside of zero and one, Lerp is not going to stop it. <laughs> Lerp is going to let you go. <laughs> What's a what's one hundred? What's one point five of one thousand and two thousand? It's more than two thousand. All right, it'll let you do that. Don't let don't. Okay, okay. These things we don't need anymore. But it sounds so sad to get rid of them. So I'm gonna do Control K so that it like comments them out. Like here they are. So just to make sure that this works, right? So if I go ahead and play it, still works. Ha 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 ha! It worked. See. Now the great thing about ooh, that was cool. Um, it's still going with this five. All right. So the great thing about this is now shot percent is a, a member variable of this function, not exported because again, this is something that stays right here. We have no business changing it even inside the inspector. Um, now that gets carried over. We know what the shot percentage. This is again not a very. It's kind of a messy way to pass values, but you know what. Oh, well, let's just go with it for now. You can always change it later. These things that I call light uh, decisions, 
I just generally don't like I just do not waste too much of your brain power thinking of a light decision. Just go with it. It's fine. You can change it later. Okay, fine. If you have a boss breathing over your neck who's going to say you're dumb, then okay, fine, whatever. You can stress every light decision and your game will never come out. But don't sweat it. It's pool. You don't sweat it when it's pool. All right, so let's keep going. <laughs> That's how I live my life. It's like it's pool. All right, so uh, now instead of times five, we can do times shot percent, right? No, because stick direction times zero to one, that only goes to one. So what we need to do is we also need to figure out the shot power based on that same shot percent. So let's do like a variable um, for the strike ball here, right? We can call it shot power. And let's lerp it between uh, what two values? Shot power min. Shot power max. And by the shot percent. Okay. And we have our stick direction. We have our shot power except that uh oopsie diddle i don't know why i need the stick direction to be first it's because i'm going to use it first here so instead uh now we can create something called um why am i doing that this is a local variable um we can create another variable called like shot like vector i guess if that's if you want to do that like ugh, i don't want to do that but i'm going to do it just so that it's like you understand it's not that big of a deal uh we're going to multiply the stick direction by the shot power remember the shot power is going to be a float in fact we're going to like walrus it so it's a float what are you talking about variable type inferred From a from a vari from a variant value, so it will be typed as variant. Is it acting like lerp returns anything other than variant? Oh yeah, because you can lerp things that aren't just numbers. Hey, that's cool. But what the heck are you gonna lerp? You you lerp vectors? Wow. Ah. I'm just going to leave it like this. Um, you can do like this kind of diddle. And then you can like over here, you can say like as a float so that it'll do the same thing as like mouse motion junk. Uh, but I'm going to hurt everybody's feelings by not doing anything. I'm going to let it variant. Not good. Not great. It only happens very unfrequently. And I want to hurt some of you who are like totally like obsessed with like statically typing. Or like strongly typing every single thing. I mean, it's whatever. It's not a big deal. If you can go into strict mode, that'd be cool. I don't know if there's a way to strict mode Godot to like force you to strongly type everything. Anyways, uh, so what? Stick direction? Nope. Just shot vector. Because remember, the shot vector is both the stick direction and the shot. Vector. Okay. Is it gonna work? I don't know. I kind of breezed through this. I haven't ate in a long time, so I'm not really thinking straight. Little tap. That was kind of a big tap, wasn't it? Don't you think? Oh, okay, that was a little tap. Oh, it's because five is ridiculously heavy. Oh my gosh. Did you just see what happened? I just saw what happened. That wasn't, that wasn't, that wasn't like because of my walls setting. Like that went through the wall. Okay, that went through the darn wall. In fact, I'm going to shoot it and see what happens. It's like it's gonna only happen when we don't look. All right. Well, you know what? We're gonna set it to. I'm gonna set it to 15. I'm gonna do it here just to show you can. Let's do 20. <laughs> We're gonna shoot it real hard. Shoot! Didn't go through the wall. Okay, you shoot it really hard. It went through. You saw that. I saw that. It went through the wall. It went through the wall. Wait. Actually, I haven't even saved it yet. I have to hit enter, and now. Oh my gosh! Now it's gonna. Now it's going to be extreme. 
He went through the ball. <laughs> Balls to the wall, as some would say. Okay, that was a little bit much. No one's shooting the ball that fast. All right, so it's 15. That's slightly more reasonable. Now I'm going to shoot it through the... <laughs> oh, it went a little, a little bit fast. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, it probably should never go that fast. Okay, let's set it back to five. Um, but even at five, if I like shoot at the wall, mm, didn't go through the wall that time. But I think I got lucky. You know what I mean? I think that whether it goes through the wall or not is less to do with like, in this case, less to do with how fast it's going, with how lucky I happen to be. See. The ball went through the wall, but I shot at a closer wall with the ball itself, the cue ball itself. So it was going to be even faster and it didn't go through the wall. And again, that's because it happened to be over a physics tick where the bodies were actually colliding. All right. They didn't fully go through the wall yet. And sometimes, even if it's going slower, it just happens to be that like, should I have brought a ball? Like, let's say that we're shooting a Master Chief. And we shoot the, you know, it's like this tick, this tick, this tick. If it's in the middle, then it'll like, you know, push it out. But if you go this tick, this tick, like this tick, this tick, and then it goes here, it's like now it's through the wall, right? It doesn't matter how thin the wall is. It could be a really thick wall. As long as it gets into the wall, then it's, it's done. It's gone. So here's the problem with this. And this is a really kind of an issue. This is a scary issue because you might try to make your walls all thick. You might try to do weird stuff with the physics materials. It's hopeless. Don't do any of that. Um, there's really not much you can do. So there's a couple things you can do, actually. <laughs> um, the ball, what we can do is under the ball, a uh, rigid body, there's this thing called continuous CD. So if I see, if you hover over it, it says, if true, continuous collision detection is used. Uh, continuous collision detection tries to predict where a moving ball will collide, body will collide, and instead of moving it, la 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 la, it basically uses like, uh, ray casts and stuff to be able to figure out like the collision course of the ball and figure out like okay in the next tick it's gonna go through this static body and so let's stop it like let's interpolate where that will happen and then like use that to adjust for its collision without changing the step right that's basically what it's doing or it might act, it might do it retroactively it seems like it's doing it um uh, proactively, but it could do it retroactively where it actually goes into a wall and then it checks the position of the last step and does a raycast between the ball's current position and like the last position. And if there was a body in the way, then it would like do a, uh, it would integrate the forces then. Uh, okay, anyway, but here's the problem. Let's go ahead and set continuous collision detection to on. Sometimes it's called like bullet mode or something, depending on the physics engine or the game engine. But here's the Here's what I think the problem is going to be. As soon as I shoot the ball, it's not going to... Hmm, that didn't look that bad. Um, I'm not too displeased, actually. That might fix it. That might have fixed it, folks. I was actually a little bit afraid that it was going to not properly calculate the restitution, the forces from the physics material. Uh, let's set the shot power to 15. Let's shoot it against the wall. <laughs> okay, that, I, that didn't look good, okay? That didn't look good. Let me shoot the ball. See, that wasn't that bad. That looked awful. You see how it's just like, okay, sometimes it's fine. But sometimes it just, you see, that was good, but that was great. But sometimes, like, if it shoots it right into the wall, it, like, just stops. You know what I'm saying? So, the, like, the best solution is if that continuous collision detection works properly. Because that is going to be the most robust thing. It's going to always, hopefully, will always work, right? It's never going to go through the wall. You don't have to worry about it. But if I shoot the wall directly, it just, that shouldn't happen, right? It shouldn't have bounced backwards. It should have only lost 30%. So sometimes I feel like this collision, this continuous collision detection thing is not, it like messes up some of the force integration. So I'm actually going to uncheck that for now and show you a different way to do it. So under project, project settings. And actually, if you weren't ever, ever, ever able to get the ball to not fall through the floor, 
sorry I've waited so long for this moment. But under here, I don't remember what it is. I'm just going to type. Oh, there it is. Physics. Physics common. There it is. Physics ticks per second. And you can read all about it if you want. I mean, it's all well and good. The point is that the physics engine, the tick is going to be fixed. Okay. It has to be as fixed as possible because with physics engines, you want there to be, you want the, your gameplay to be as deterministic as possible, right? Um, the frame rate of the game um, otherwise is like, you know, the updating of the animations and all this stuff. And it can look more and more smooth if it's like 200 frames per second and you've got this like monitor that can show that. That's fine. But for physics ticks per second, you want it to be exact. You don't want it to fluctuate. You want it to be exactly a certain number of ticks per second. However, if the ball is going very fast, then even in a 60th of a second, the ball could be through the wall. So instead of 60, we can do like 600, for example. Now this is max physics steps per frame. So basically like what is the maximum number of physics steps that you can have in a single frame? Remember the frames, like they're already separate, but you can kind of make sure that the physics steps, you're not doing too many physics steps in a particular frame because the frame rate could be really bad, right? If your frame rate is only like two frames per second, then like, you know, you like when the physics engine is going to crash the game, right? It's going to make it go really, really slow. So it's like, okay, but in this case, we don't want it to ever go like eight in a frame. We want it to go 80. So there's problems with doing it this way. By amping up the physics engine, remember I turned off continuous collision detection. By amping it up like this, then that was awesome. <laughs> I love that. Uh whoa and then it falls <laughs> i get amused by the simple thing. all right uh i gotta do it again all right but you see what i'm saying like this is great this is exactly how the physics is supposed to look i whoa it flew into the sky and it didn't do anything because we had the tall walls i love it i love it love it love it but the thing is like the person's <laughs> game is now going to be a more processor bound, right? It's it's going to be a lot more demanding on the processor to make sure that it's it's running properly. So that you can't guarantee. Um, but this is a, like it's just like there's some balls bouncing around. Okay, there's a like a lot of games out there that are way more demanding. Okay, way more demanding. It's not that big of a deal to jack up the physics um, step if the physics is incredibly important. This is a physics game and it's a relatively small physics game with relatively few bodies it's not that big of a deal to jack up the physics step and the max physics steps for a frame it really isn't so jacking it up to 600 is really not in my opinion is not a big deal but ultimately if you do play testing in the future then yeah just you can set continuous collision detection and just it'll mess up your physics gotta choose something it's better to update upgrade the physics step to make it more uh precise than it is to like rely on these little hacks and frankly as soon as godot changes their physics engine it's probably going to have like you know this continuous collision detection thing might be better who knows all right let's go let's go let's go let's go the ball doesn't go through the wall anymore that's all i care about okay so well what i other things i care about though is that like this shouldn't this isn't the whole game shooting one ball around with another ball and it's silly we want the ball the balls we want the other balls, right? We want the other balls to spawn. It's, it's late. Like, we've been working on this for a while. Okay? The cue ball can... Also, where do we want the cue ball to start? Anyone who knows anything about billiards is that, or pool or whatever, knows that you got to start somewhere. The cue, you can't just start the cue ball wherever you want. The cue ball starts at what you call the head spot. I'm not joking. It's called head spot. And where you start the ball rack, like that um, triangle of balls, you call that the foot spot. So the head of the table is one side of the table and the foot of the table is the other side. The head of the table is where the cue ball starts and the foot of the table is where the ball rack starts. And usually a billiards table has a like little circle, like a little uh, like a little sticker on the table that's like right here for the head spot. But fortunately the head spot is actually easy to figure out. Under the top view, these diamonds like line up so that like the the middle diamonds on these like little wall cushion things, where they intersect is the head spot. Okay, so where is that, right? So that's the question we have to figure out. And now we can just come up with a magic number for it, 
but what are we going to just like write it in the code like where who needs to know about it first of all there's multiple things they need to know about the key, like the play system needs to know about it because they're going to place the cue ball um and also whatever system is going to handle like spawning those uh other balls those are like 15 balls they need to know where the foot spot is okay so it would be nice if they were in one place okay and that's okay so where should it be now you could put it inside of a singleton called like globals or something but frankly these global values have to do with a, some kind of topic right so it's let's avoid coming up with like some big old singleton called globals for now that can kind of like tempt us to add just a bunch of other junk there that doesn't need to be there so um what does the foot spot in the queue the the, the 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 head spot have to do with it has to do with the billiard table right Ultimately, that's what it has to do with, just like the collisions and stuff. So why don't we um, create a script for the billiard table and create a couple of constants inside of the billiard table script um, that can be referenced elsewhere. Okay, I think that's good. So inside of the billiard table, I'm going to create a new um, file called billiardtable.gd and don't put it in scenes. I'm going to even write scripts here. <laughs> billiard table.gd. You're like, wait, hold on. What? The billiard table shouldn't have a script. It doesn't do anything interactive. It doesn't need to do anything interactive for it to have a script. Let's don't have a narrow perception of what a script is. But we don't need all the rest of this stuff. Okay, we're treating this like it's a singleton. But here's something that I want to recognize. How is another class going to reference this does it have to have a reference to the billiard table like in the play system is it going to have to refer to the billiard table similarly to how we didn't want to refer to the overhead cam it's like is this the problem that we're going to do um no actually we can create something that's basically treated like a singleton but even better by uh well first of all let's just create a constant so that we can see what we're dealing with so const it's going to be a vector. Let's, it's called a head spot because this is like constant case, as you would call it, or some people call it screaming snake case. And you have to set a value. Okay, you have to initialize a constant. You can't just say like, doo -doo -doo, like just end it here because like it's a constant. You can't reassign its value. So you have to set it as soon as you create it. And this is going to be a vector, right? Because it not only needs to be like the X position on the table, it also has to be like slightly above because that's where we're going to spawn the ball. And, the ball, and that should be like, the radius of the ball right so vector three and uh, the x position is effectively going to be where the head spot is going to be so it's going to be some number and then the y position is going to be the ball's radius actually let's fix that later so i'm just going to type in some magic number for now 0.2 which is an awful magic number 0.08 something terrible and z actually doesn't matter at all because the the head spot and the foot spot are both going to be at z zero and just to be sure of what i'm talking about here is like z as in like this like this position like is doesn't matter because they're going to be at zero see the blue line here they're going to stay at z zero but they're the head spot's going to be here and the y uh, the foot spot's going to be there so how do we figure out well what is the head spot where where is the head spot on the table now you could just try to like figure out what that number is, but it's useful to just create like a guide. So to create a guide, what I mean by guide is I'm going to create a node 3D. That's going to be my guide. So node 3D. And I'm going to call the node 3D head spot. And the only thing I'm going to do with this node 3D is I'm going to move its X position. See? Whoop, 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 whoop. Make sure you have head spot selected. And I want it to line up with these uh, diamonds. So I'm actually going to zoom in on just these two diamonds and as i move the like you know this one okay that's cool but guess what it doesn't matter what this one's going to do because it's always going to be in the middle of that one so the only one we really care about is this one well if the problem is when i move along the x-axis it only gives me a guide for this stupid thing so what you do is you can click on this little like move both at the same time thing <laughs> in order to like reveal the other one so if you kind of do this and drag it over, right, then that's good, right? So like you can push it wherever you want. You can just set Z back to zero, right? Like, in fact, I can like move it like up here, like just right next to it. Where is it? Perfect, right there. 
and then I'm going to put z back to zero. That's the head spot right there, negative 0.535. Okay, and if we try to do the math, that's like, so half of the surface of the table is about half of a, a little bit more than half of a meter from here. So that means that the table is like a little bit more than two meters, 2.2 meters wide, 2.2 meters. Um, I mean, we can just do the darn math, right? I'm going to open up the calculator. 2.2 .2 times like 39 inches. 85.8. Okay, so those of you who are familiar with um, pool tables should know. <laughs> should, you got to know. You should know that I think like the regulation size for like a uh, 8 foot pool table is like 88 inches, the surface. So this actually looks like it's the scale. That's pretty cool. All right, but the point is it's at negative 0.535. And we've gotten that figured out by this little like head spot reference thing. And so when I come back to the script, I'm actually going to type in negative 0.535. That is the head spot. So if I want to set the cue ball at the head spot, if I come back to the play system, on ready is when I want to set the cue ball's position, right? So let's do cue ball dot position is equal to the head spot. So if I type in head spot. Okay, well, that's not helpful because head spot refers to what? It's going to assume, it's going to try to look for a variable called head spot. It says identifier head spot is not declared in the current scope. So it's going to either look for a function or it's going to look for a variable. It can't find anything. So it's like, okay, well, the billiard table. You know, it's like, well, wait a minute. How am I going to get that const from the billiard table? So this is what's really cool. Um, from the billiard table, what we can do is we can make this a class. I say class name. Now it was already a class. Each GD script is a class. Okay, but if you want to get, if you want to access like these constants from it, you'd have to load the script. But if you use class name, it basically is like now an alias for this script, more or less. Okay, so class name, billiard table. Now again, uh, classes like Node3D are Pascal keys by default. So now we have billiard table const head spot. So if I come back to the play system script and I do Q position. Uh, cue ball position now we can say billiard table and it knows about it because when you do class name it's able to access that class name from all of our scripts because it is now a type of data inside of our project and we can refer to this billiard table we can create a new billiard table if we wanted to now this is not the same thing as creating an instance of a scene okay i don't want to get into the weeds here just the point is that we are able to refer to this class name and when we say dot you see there it is head spot we're able to get a constant from a class by referencing the class name and then using the constant. And then hit play. And now look, the ball it bounces a bunch because that was a little bit too high, it, right? 0 0.08 was a little bit too high. But notice how it's at the head spot. Look, there it is, it's at the head spot, which is awesome. Okay, first of all, <laughs> let's, let's not make it 15. Uh, five is five is well enough all right but do you see what happened here we were able to do that so notice how without creating a singleton we were able to still access this from anywhere because it's just a constant right you can't change it anywhere anyway so the developers of godot had the, the foresight to recognize that this is a this is something that you might as well make accessible from anywhere right it's just it basically belongs to the billiard table Right? So that's actually really, really, really cool. So, well, here's the problem. It's not really a problem. This is where someone might make it a problem. This is where you hopefully have like colleagues and friends and co programmers and lead programmers who are reasonable people because they might look at this and be like, that's a magic number. This whole vector is a magic vector, really. It's a magic vector. It's like on the magic school bus, taking a ride. Enjoy ride on the magic school bus. What do you think you're doing? Don't get caught up with this, okay? This is pool. This is a regulation 88 inch table. This is fine, okay? This has meaning. If you really want to, you can be like constant. What's like half, like a quarter of the tables with constant quarter table width equals or something, and then put that here, negative quarter table width. If you really want to be like that, but don't be like that. This is fine. 
But you might be like, well, what? But look at that. Our billiard table has a head spot uh, thing, right? What is it called? A head spot? Node 3D. Why don't we just access the head spot, right? Like, why don't we just do like, you know, uh, I'm actually just going to comment this out so that we still have it there because that's the good one. What if we just did like, you know, head spot dot position dot uh, X, right? Ta-da! We did it! No, it's like assign value for constant isn't a constant expression. In order to assign a value of a constant, it needs to be what it's called a constant expression. It has to basically always evaluate to some number based on these like numbers. Okay, this is not that. Okay, this is a problem. And also, head spot doesn't exist until ready, right? <laughs> so you can't just do it at the top of a script like this, right? The script doesn't, you know, depend, this constant shouldn't depend on this existing. So you can never do that. You can never set a const that way. Okay, well, you might be like, okay, well, if you can't set this on ready, then what are we going to do? Well, instead of a const, what if we did a static variable? We created a static variable called static. Now, those of you who are familiar with static variables know that a static variable is kind of like a const, <laughs> but you can change it. It's a constant that you can change. That's basically what it is. It belongs to the class, not to the individual uh, instances of this class. So this head spot, if you change it in one of the instances, it'll change it in all of the instances. Again, it's like a constant that can be changed. And you can access it from anywhere, similar to a const. In fact, if I go to play system, we can say, Q, look, see, it's still, it's not mad at me. Right? It's fine. If I hit play, it's going to be like, you can't get the node of a null value. Well, you can't because head spot doesn't exist yet. You have to do it on ready. Okay. So I guess we'll make it on ready. You see how you're like starting the pile on silliness here? You're like, okay, cool. Then we're going to set the head spot here. Equal to this. Here. Right? This will start undefined. And then we'll set its value here. Now I want to hit play. Like, okay, it worked. Right? First of all, you got the stupid ready function. This I don't like it. Why are we adding this? And the other thing is, you if you, like, again, thinking like a game programmer, how are you sure that this ready function is going to be called before this ready function? The answer is you're, you're, you don't. You're not sure. One of these ready functions is going to be called first. <laughs> and whichever ready function is going to be called first matters a lot. This is what we call a race condition, where you don't have any control over it. This is happening for all intents and purposes, as you as a programmer, asynchronously. And you don't know which thread is going to happen first. Okay. This is not good. You can't put it in the ready. This might work sometimes, but you change the order of your nodes sometimes, and then it breaks. You can't do that. This is bad. Bad news. Don't do it. So you're like, okay, well, what if I just do on ready? Okay, well, this actually is starting to look like maybe a solution, because on ready gets called before the ready uh, virtual functions are called. So this actually would be called first. Here's the problem, though. It says the on ready annotation can't be applied to a static variable for some reason. I don't know why, frankly. That's the same thing as this. We're, we're creating the static variable on ready. What? OK, well, you know, that's how you want to be. So we can't do it. So now you might be like, OK, well, why don't we just not make it static? Let's just make it like this variable. See, it works now because on ready, head spot exists inside its position. But how are you going to access the head spot variable? It's no longer static. It's no longer constant. Inside a place system, it's not going to work. See, it's like, what the heck is a head spot? Because head spot now doesn't belong to the class. It belongs to the instances that of the class because it's just a normal me member variable just like how each member variable has a different position even though it's the same ball or something like that they can all have different positions right so now this is just a member variable it belongs to the object that was created not the class itself and so this is now uh this is now a ambiguous because which billiard table are we talking about there could be more than one okay so this isn't going to work it's like okay so now what do we do it's like okay well 
I guess what we can do is we can refactor this again so that uh like we'll have this anonymous bear head spot, but we'll just call it like let's let's make a static variable just like we did before called head spot. But we can't set it here because again this isn't ready yet. But I guess what we can do is we can do an on ready variable called like head spot cheat. <laughs> And we'll set its value, let's see if this is even going to work, um, to a lambda function. And that lambda function is going to set head spot, the static variable, equal to this ridiculous thing. I'm going to put this down here, and that's okay, because again, if you remember, it's inside of a parenthesis. And um, what are we going to do with this? We're going to call this lambda function. Is this going to work? Okay, it's trying to get no. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to get rid of this. <clears throat> Let's do. Okay, I get it. It's still running. Just calm down. Okay, this is not set yet, so it's not going to be mad at me. It's the head spot doesn't exist yet, remember. This is fine, right? So let's just see if this will. It's. Oh, wait a minute. It got mad for a second and then it stopped getting mad. <laughs> it's like, okay, you can't set it to nil. So this current thing is nil. So apparently that didn't really work either. So on ready, you're trying to like set this, you know, stupid thing to like a function that you're going to call right away. But in that function, you're going to like set this. Oh, maybe it doesn't know it. I mean, it should know what headspot is right here. Like, what if I... Hey, don't try this at home, folks. What if we say billiardtable.headspot? So we're referring to the class name. What? The heck? Was that? <laughs> okay, because... Okay, is the, it has, shouldn't have anything to do with the namespace, right? It, this function, this lambda function should be able to... But I just, like, get... Okay. Okay, guys, this is this is what we're dealing with. This is what we're up against. Don't do this. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Do that. It's fine. Golly. Sheesh. Constant. It's fine. Ugh. It's like, and a ball, you know what? The ball can have constants too. I went into my ball script. Let's go into the ball.gd script. We're going to call it ball. And we're going to create a constant. Frankly, I don't remember where the constants are supposed to be at the top. I have to check the style guide every now and then. Uh, and what do we want? Ball radius? Diameter? Radius. Sure, let's do radius. And uh, what? Zero point was a half of a diameter. 025 was it? Let's do 027 just for good measure. <clears throat> so now we have this thing called ball radius and you can access this from anywhere. So the billiard table can know about it, right? So it's like negative ball, uh, whoops, negative just ball radius here, right? Ball radius, they're constants. They should be immediately set before anything else happens. Perfect, doesn't bounce. Love it. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Now you might be like, isn't this a race condition? Because like this is a thing and this is a thing. That's a good question, actually. <laughs> like if you try to define a constant like here that depends on that constant, like actually, like yeah, if we were to say like constant x equals head spot, like is it gonna get mad at me? Because it like was defined in the wrong order. That'll depend a little bit on the interpreter, on the 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 the, 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 the compiler in this case. Okay, it should be fine. Um, if you need to, you don't need to do this either. You can know, just type in the magic number. Um, all right. So very good. We spent a lot of time on that, but I just want to be very clear with you. Don't get too caught up with like these stupid things about like <laughs> magic numbers and global variables and stuff. Uh, foot spot. 
we're going to need this eventually. So it's just the same thing, but positive. It's on the uh, symmetrical opposite side of the table. Um, okay, so what do we want to do? Let's keep going and let's set up balls, the, the balls, the other balls. Right now, there are no other balls. Well, there is. There's that one other stupid ball. Let's get rid of it. Let's delete it. <laughs> Finally, get rid of that other ball because we want to spawn the balls, right? We want to spawn the balls uh, with our, like a ball rack of some kind, right? So um, let's do that. You know what? So here's the thing. So we already created the play system that handles all of the play stuff, playing related things. So why don't we create a node that handles all of the like ball spawning? It seems reasonable. Uh, so I'm going to create, because uh, I mean, someone's going to have to handle it. Is it going to be the main scene? Don't do that. Put it in its own thing. You can make it separate. You can test it elsewhere and all that kind of fun stuff. So I'm going to create a new node. <clears throat> and I'm going to call it... I mean, there's already a thing. It's already a thing and cool. It's called a ball rack. Let's call it a ball rack. I think that's cool. People who know will know. All right, so ball rack. And what are we going to do with the ball rack? Uh, we're going to create a ball. Duh. Let's make a script because, you know, script has to, is what you need to create balls. Uh, first of all, scripts folder. And second of all, pass, second of all, uh, cam, uh, snake case. Ball underscore rack, not two underscores. Three, in fact. No, just one. Oh my gosh. One underscore. Ball rack dot gd. Cool. Okay, kill everything because I hate it. And bring it back instantly. Um, well, what do we need to know about the ball rack? Well, it has to spawn a ball, right? So it needs to be able to access that ball.tscn file that's right here. We can load it in the code, but you know what? It's kind of nice to just load it. Um, through uh, a, a variable that we expose to the editor. So let's do export variable. We'll call it ball tscn. I like that. Because I want to be sure it's not a instance of a ball scene. It is the packed scene that we have right here inside of our file system. So it's ball tscn. And what is it? It's a packed scene. Again, take a beginner tutorial if you want to kind of learn more about that. Now, with ball rack selected, I'm going to drag the ball.tscn file, not the ball.gd script, the ball.tscn file into this uh, variable that we just created. And we're going to create a ball. And it's going to be inside of the ready function. And where's the ball rack going to be located? So actually, I think, yeah, so the whole ball rack should be located at the foot spot. Okay. And we'll assume that that first ball in the triangle is the ball that's right there at zero, 0 of the ball rack. So I don't want the balls to be some offset from the center of the table. I just want them to spawn in place at where the ball rack has been located. So let's set the position. I'm going to say self that position equals uh, billiard table dot put spot. Now you might be like, why are we typing self.position? Can't we just type position? And the answer is yes, but I don't like it. Because when you, in, like, that's just my personal opinion. You see, in fact, right here is already a problem. This should be underscore ball.tscn. Um, and it killed the value of the variable over here. Um, so actually, thank you for reminding me, me. I'm thankful to me for that reminder. All right, so yes, this shouldn't be accessed elsewhere. So anyways, I'm going to drag it right back in. But the point is that when you just say position, it just looks so much like a local variable. You can change the color, I think, so that, like, see, like, if you look very carefully, like, it gets, like, slightly different shade of gray. It's like a bluish gray. You can update that in, like, the editor settings if you want. But I don't know. I like it better when I say self that position when I'm referring to uh, a, a uh, property that's built into the the nodes that were inherited from, you know, underscore is very clear that we're talking about a memory variable, but position doesn't have an underscore. So self that position to be clear. So that's going to set the ball rack's position at the foot spot. And we're going to spawn a ball right there at the foot spot, right there at the position of this ball rack. Uh, so to create a new ball, we're going to do their new ball, uh, I guess. Well, you know what? We're going to, I guess we can do this all on ready. But, you know, we might actually in the future um, 
have the balls like respawn without having to like recreate the rack. So it's actually also like more descriptive. Let's create a function that's like spawns the balls. I don't know. Let's call it rack balls. <laughs> rack balls. Let's do that. And uh, let's just call it on ready. And we'll call it elsewhere. We can call it on some kind of signal if like we want to re rack the balls. Let's say that you accidentally on your first shot, you hit the eight ball in. What are you going to do? Respawn like all the balls? You just like delete all the balls and respawn them. What if you just want to re rack them? Right? Maybe you can even have like a little like variable here. I mean, you're not going to literally write false as a parameter, but you know what I mean? To say like whether they should be like re racked or they should be spawned. I don't know. Whatever. I'm just thinking out loud. Um, let's rack the balls. Let's um, start by having only one ball. Bear, I don't know, new ball. Uh, except not a hyphen because that is trying to subtract things that don't exist. Um, uh, and what should the the new ball be called? What do you think? Let's do ball dot the ball tscn file, and we're gonna do uh, instantiate to create an, a new instance of a ball. And uh, what are we gonna do with the ball? <laughs> we're going to do something with it. Uh, we're going to set its position. Um, to what? It's it's already at zero zero actually. Well, oh yeah 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 yeah. Because remember the foot spot is elevated, so it's not going to go through the ground. So we're fine. Zero 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 is fine. Let's actually just do new ball. A uh, dot. Not new ball. Let's add the child right here. And we're going to do self.addChild to be clear that we're not like adding it to something else. New ball. Okay. Its position at 0, 0, 0 should actually be fine because it's going to put it with respect to the ball rack. Because when we add child, it's going to make its position with respect to the ball rack. So go ahead and play. There's our other ball facing the opposite way. Well, that ball is white. And that ball shouldn't be white. So how are we going to do that? Well, see, our new ball, whether you like it or not, as far as I know, there's no way to pass variables into this instantiate. There's no, like, you know, function, like, scene creates or something like that, and, like, it accepts variables. Tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure you can't do that. You can't pass anything in like that through the instantiate. So the ball, if we wanted to have a certain texture, like for the 8 ball or the 9 ball or the 10 ball, we can't do it right here inside a rack ball. In fact, I mean, we kind of partially want to do that. This is one of these things where it's like, should the ball rack handle it or should the ball handle it? I think kind of a little of both. Okay, because the ball needs to apply the material, right? And having like the rack balls like do all the texture stuff and applying it to materials is I think well outside of what this ball rack needs to do. Okay, I mean, it likes balls a lot, but it doesn't need to get that private. You're like, let the ball have some privacy to handle some of its freaking, you know, texture stuff. So inside of the ball script, um, we're going to create a function that's basically like the constructor function for this uh, class, uh, for this scene. And let's call it, uh, I don't know, setup balls. If you want to add a space here, like set up balls, like, I don't care. Whatever you want. And what uh, what information does it need to know? Like, the what's the maximum amount of information that we feel like the ball rack has any real specific need to know? The ball rack is spawning balls. So the ball rack should know where it's spawning the balls. I think that's a very useful thing for the ball rack to do. Okay? The ball rack needs to know, like, is going to be the one deciding where the ball is spawning because it's going to spawn it in the triangle. And also the ball rack will potentially tell the ball what the number is. So the ball rack will like procedurally figure out what number the ball is and also where it's located. And the ball can handle the rest. The ball's like, oh, that number? I'm going to assign this texture. I'm going to do other stuff that I need to do that like is just a little bit outside of what the ball rack needs to do. So let's do setup ball. Balls? Ball. One ball. And it's going to take a ball number. It's going to take a ball position. What should we call that? Should we call it like 
pos underscore x. Like, uh, really, it's up to you. Ball x. Oh. Yike. Pos x, pos y. I think that's probably better than ball x, frankly. Whatever. I already wrote it, so that's what we're doing. Self.position.x equals ball x, I guess. Self.position.y is equal to ball y. You're like, could we do like a vector 2? Or vector 3? <laughs> do who you want. We're just setting the x and y because we don't want to mess with the z. Okay, let the z be the z, whatever the z is. <clears throat> um, okay, well, what else do we need to do? We need to apply that texture to the ball. So the stuff that we're doing on ready, we don't need to do on ready anymore. Because the only time that we're applying a texture is when it's in that triangle, right? Like 1 through 15, those balls are the only ones we're applying texture. The cue ball doesn't, in fact, this is dumb. Like the cue ball shouldn't be doing this. In fact, I'm glad it didn't crash the thing. Like the cue ball doesn't need to set its material because it doesn't have one. Well, it does, it's just white. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and cut this and paste it here. I'm going to pass on the ready <clears throat> so it doesn't like get mad that there's no code block. All right, so we have a material. Um, And, you know, maybe we are going to do it inside of ready. Let's just create a new function so we can do both. Apply new material, and it's more descriptive anyway. Okay, let's apply new material, and that's what this is going to be. And we can call it inside of ready, and we can call it inside of setup ball. This way, like, if you want, and it didn't crash the queue thing, so it's fine, the queue ball. So this way, if we want to be able to create a ball just, like, out of thin air, it's fine. Like the texture, it'll take the texture in that's exposed to the editor, and it'll still allow you to like test stuff out ball at a time without using the ball rack. Okay, and then for the setup, uh, we're gonna apply new material here as well. But the question is, of course, like what are we like what material are we applying? Well, we're applying the one that whose texture property, you know, is this. Okay, well, this depends on someone like dragging that uh, texture from here to that texture uh, property inside of the inspector. Well, as you may have figured out, like the ball rack's not going to do that, right? The ball rack is just going to pass in a number and the ball should figure out what texture to apply by a number. So there's, okay, there are a lot of good ways to do this and there are a lot of dumb ways to do this. For the sake of time, we're going to do a, like, we're not going to go into the, like, really into the weeds of, like, some beautiful, elegant system to, like, apply these textures by the ball number. And partially it has to do with the fact that, like, we've been given these weird numbers. So actually what we're going to do, um, let's go ahead and just rename all of these textures. This is such a hack, but it's not great to, like, depend on this, but it should be fine. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the ball number that we get from the setup ball function, and we're going to grab the texture based on a number. So the number has to match the JPEG. So I'm actually going to come back over here, and for um, the pool, like let's go ahead and open up that. Uh, My assets, 3D pool. You can see my little shmup thing <laughs> from before the beginner tutorial. Um, under assets, this might crash stuff, maybe, because we're doing it outside of here. Hopefully not. Um, and okay, 72 is ball one, 73 is ball two, 74 is ball three, 75 is ball four. Okay, so what I'm doing it here because. Doing it here is awful. Like if you can right click this and choose rename and then do one and hit enter, it's like, okay. And now if you want to go to the next one, you can't use arrow keys. You can't like hit tab. You can't do freaking anything. You have to click on it. You then have to hit F2. Um, but the uh, code editor allows you to um, just like hit F2 and then two and then hit tab and then check that out. Three tab, four tab, five tab six tab seven tab 
8, tab 9, tab 10, tab 11, tab 12, tab 13, tab 14, tab 15. Come back to Godot, reloads them, and they're all back in place, and they're all correspond with their number. The black ball is the 8 ball, so that already it looks pretty good. So what are we going to set the texture to before we do apply material? This texture is going to have to be, we're going to set the texture. We're going to use the load function. Load function allows you to grab assets from your resources. And I'm going to uh, set, I'm getting like messages from students, where we're going to get one .jpg. Let's let it finish the rest. And instead of one, now you can do, String interpolation here. I think the string interpolation actually in Godot is like even harder to read it to, than to just like concatenate. Just, I'm just going to concatenate. <clears throat> and we're going to convert the string, or sorry, the ball num. Very good. Let's see how many characters we're at. We're at 71. This is mostly fine. I'm actually going to embiggen it so that you can still see it more easily. Um, this is actually reminding me to statically type my ball num. It's supposed to be an integer. My ball x is supposed to be a float. My ball y is supposed to be a float. A flout. A flow out. Flow at. Flow at. Float. All sorts of wonderful animals of the animal kingdom. All right. So, yeah. And uh, cool. So we're going to take whatever the texture is. We're going to add number. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, whatever it is, .jpg. Does this make sense? Hopefully it makes sense. All right, I'm going to come back to um, play system and test it out. So on ready, we're going to, not the play system, what am I doing? The ball rack. And uh, we're going to rack the balls and we're going to new new ball. And we're not going to, we're going to add the child, but we're going to first set up the ball. So new ball dot set up no what what was it okay this ball is going to be a ball right so can we look if we type in ball like this is this is going to work let's find out set up ball and what's it going to be so far it doesn't seem to like it right it's like am i allowed to do this is this a scene is this a script the script is actually the, the C, uh, what is it called? The, the, the class name actually refers to the script, not the scene. So it's like, are we allowed to do that? Okay, let's find out. Let's do the eight ball and let's set it at zero, zero, which is, you know, right there at the foot spot. Hit play, it's going to get mad at you. It's going to be like, you can't set up ball on rigid body 3D ball. <laughs> it's like, uh, okay. I guess not. So I can't do that. Now, like this type of thing is one of these types of things where it's like, if you're a beginner and you're still trying to figure out static typing and stuff, sometimes it helps to just kind of like start typing stuff. Like, well, can you say as ball? Does this work? And now when I hit run, you're going to see, no, it's mad at me because it's going to say like non-existent function set up ball and base rigid body of ball. Okay, so I can't do that either because it's Paul.tsen file. So even though technically it's a ball, the problem is that the scene is not a ball. The scene is a rigid body. The script is a ball. I feel like this is like some kind of standardized test right now. The script is a ball. The scene is a rigid body. See, so it doesn't really quite work the way you want it to. But that rigid body happens to have a script on it that has a setup ball function. So it's like, okay, this is kind of confusing. It says, okay, well, it's still not working. Like, why, why isn't it working? Okay. All right. Oh my gosh, I need to stretch for a second. Uh, so we have to deal with these types of issues sometimes. Okay. Um. Actually, this should work because the ball does have the script on it that has a setup ball function. So now I'm actually confused. See, you can start to see like my 
energy is fading. Um, let's close this out. The ball script. <laughs> Guys. Set a ball is not supposed to be internal. Set a ball is supposed to be public. We want ball rack to call it. And I made the assumption. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and play it. Okay, now it works. Very good. Now it dies. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So now if I do as ball, it's not going to crash at me. Is it going to work? Okay, good. It works. Whew. It did it did allow me to convert the rigid body to ball because the ball the rigid body itself is a ball now. Okay, because of the script. All right. That's what our script allowed us to do. It's both a rigid body and a ball. See, as we can see here, it's a ball and a rigid body. Whew. Very cool. Now, fortunately, the fun thing here to do with this setup ball is now hopefully it does give me tooltips since it knows that it's a ball. See, eight ball num, zero, zero. Very cool. Good. That behaves exactly how I want it to. Um, very good. So now we have this new ball, setup ball, and it's and it's the eight ball, isn't it? I got so distracted that I didn't even notice. It happens to the best of us, folks. Like you start to forget like your own name at a certain point. And it works. It, cool, it's an eight ball. So now what we want to do is we want to spawn more of the balls, right? We have the balls, we have the ability to spawn a ball by number. So if I do one, then it should give me the yellow ball, right? Yes, good, yellow ball. Boom, there it is. We want to spawn all the rest of them now. Rack balls allows us to do that. So um, what I want to do is I'm going to loop through. I'm not going to be like, ball one, ball two, ball. No, I'm just going to create a loop for it. Four and I... Um, in the number of balls we want to spawn, 15. So this is a cool shorthand in GDScript that allows me to effectively... Um... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we can't we have to do it uh, here. Um, where it's going to go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, blah, 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 all the way to 15. Right? So if I type I here, it's actually going to be problematic because... Well, it's not going to be totally problem. It'll be slightly problematic. This will be fun. They're all going to try to spawn in the same position. What is the physics engine going to do with it? <laughs> okay, some of them died. Some of them are there, <laughs> right? Some of them went probably through the floor. Um, but notice how there's a white ball in there. It's like, why is there a white ball in there? Why is that at the top? Conspicuously. That was fun. <laughs> I love it. Look, it's full. We did it. I'd like to see you stack stones, except balls. Like, oh my gosh, can you imagine? Um, the problem is that it starts at zero, and there's no ball zero. So uh, that's actually the cue ball. The cue ball is ball zero. So I'm going to do plus one, I plus one. So it's going to be one through, and then it goes to 14, but it's actually going to be 15 because I plus one is uh, 14 is 15. Okay, good. Now there, it starts at the yellow ball at the top, and then it's the blue, and then it's the red. It's the, okay, and those are all solid balls. And then at a certain point, like it runs out of, balls because it probably went through the floor okay uh very good so this is cool it worked we were able to spawn um like a bunch of balls at once 15 of them right i guess but uh they aren't spawning in the shape of a in the shape of a triangle at all okay and also they're not spawning randomly let's fix that because that's actually easier to fix. so notice how it always starts with the white ball at the top and the blue ball and the, you know let's spawn them in a random order so one way we can do that is let's create an array called ball nums. And we're going to set it like walrus equal to an array that goes from 1 through 15. And you can try to like, okay, well, do I make like a blank array and then this i in 15, like then, you know, add like append to the array or like, uh, you know, add to the array, let's say. <laughs> I actually don't remember all the time we had GD scripts. Like, is it dot? It's not dot push. That's JavaScript. I never remember. Like, I there's too many programming languages in my head. So it's like one of those. Add, pen, push. One of those things to the array. Um, but no, we actually have a function called range, and range allows us to supply a number, a starting number, in a 
ending number, and if you hover over it, it tells you blah, 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 it spits back an array based on that range. In fact, it's useful to just print it just so you can like see like uh ball nums. What does it look like? If I hit play, you should see down here it's uh one, two, three, four, five, up to fifteen. Okay, cool. We verified that that is indeed the array. I'm gonna erase that because we did what we needed to do. But look what we can do. It's built into this game engine. It's shuffle. Now, shuffle isn't always there. It's typically shuffle is not built into the programming language whatsoever. And that's one of the advantages of GDScript. Not like Python, because shuffle, as far as I know, is probably not as part of Python. So cool. We didn't have to worry about writing the shuffle function ourselves. So now when we go through the indexes of that array, 0 through uh, 14, it should be a random number. It, like it's a it's in random order. So now when I hit play, you'll see that yellow is... Oh, well, duh, because we're still just doing i plus 1. <laughs> okay, instead of i plus 1, let's uh, get the index of the ball nums array. The bail nums array. The demon ball number. Ball bail nums. How dare you attack Asgore? What, what is it called? The Diablo thing? Asroth? I don't know. Whatever name of the Ararat something. Ball nums. I. I. Good. Random. Starts with purple. There's some stripes in there. Yeah, I missed entirely. I was so in awe of the randomness of that ball stack that I missed. That was, it was all that randomness. That was the fault. It is, I was, I was, I was uh, RNG'd right there. I had bad RNG. All right. Um, very cool. Uh, what are we doing? Yeah, we'll see. They all stack. Like, they're random. But they're all stacked, so like, let's stop. Let's stop with the shenanigans, okay? We don't want this anymore. Uh, should we comment it out, or we? Yeah, let's just comment it out. Don't try to like make use of that. We're gonna just redo it. Well, these two we can keep. Like these two are things that we're gonna keep, okay? I don't want to rewrite these things. Oh my gosh. Okay, we're gonna do a loop to spawn these. Okay, fine. We're going to keep all of it. <laughs> Except for the loop part. Um, we want this. What's the problem? Oh, because I doesn't exist. Okay, well. Comment you out for now. Um, so, we'll just talk about commenting out. Uh... Next time I go to the bathroom, I should at least eat a date. Sheesh, I'm losing energy. Um, we want to spawn this in like a pyramid shape. A pyramid? No, 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 no. In a triangle shape. So let's think about how we want to create this uh, loop. Um, actually, I created a screenshot of what this uh, loop can look like. This loop, this uh, triangle could look like. So this is the foot spot. This is zero, zero, right? Let's think of this as zero, zero. And I'm going to say 0, 0. Let's assume that this is basically two dimensions. Y is not included. So 0, 0 is basically like X, 0, Z, 0. So this is going to be the starting point of our loop. That's a good way to start. So effectively, this is what's going to happen. And notice how there's different rows. The first row, there's only one. You can think of it like a column, but I'm going to think of it like a row. This um, is the first iteration of the loop, and there's only one, right? The second iteration of the loop, there's two. The third iteration of the loop, there's three. That's starting to sound like a pattern. The fourth iteration to loop, there are four. The fifth iteration of the loop, there are five. So there's actually two loops happening here. One loop spawns all of the balls in a particular row. And the second iteration, in the second, the nested loop spawns each ball within that row. Okay, so this is zero, zero in the first, you know, basically, so we can start, we can start with that. You don't have to like, you know, worry about it too heavily. Let's just start. We know it's going to be a nested loop because there's two dimensions effectively. Um, and so the first uh, iteration of the loop, we're going to say four, and then we're going to do uh, I and how many are there? How many rows are there? There are five, right? We have to look at it again. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, cool. There are five. Next iteration of the loop. Um, and remember, we're not going to do anything here because we're not spawning things except for in the nested loop, because the nested loop is where we're going to spawn each ball. 
And the outer loop is where we're going to spawn each row, so to speak. Okay, so four and then four J. This is by convention to use like I and J for this stuff. You can say it row, but then what are you going to call this? Triangle item? Ugh, awful. For J in, uh, well, here's the thing. How many times are we going to, we're not going to do five, right? We're going to spawn five balls per row. How many balls are we going to spawn? Remember, first row, we're going to spawn one. Second row, we're going to spawn two. Third row, we're going to spawn three. So I starts out at zero. So this first row is going to be I, except instead of zero, it's going to be I plus one, right? I'm not going to put spaces here because I don't like these spaces. This looks awful to me. Whenever you're just basically like saying like offset I by one, either plus or minus, I actually like to just keep no spaces. I want this to be basically like one, you know, inextricable unit. Cool. So this should only spawn 15 times now, right? Why are you mad at me? Oh, because I need another event. Um, okay, this should spawn 15 because this is going to happen five times and this is going to happen like one more than the last number of times in the last row. I mean, if you darn must, like, you can go ahead and do it and see if there are 15 of them. Now, balls num i means it's going to just be 0 through 5. It's just going to be, you know, the same five balls every time. See? <laughs> There's too many orange balls. Um, but look, there should be 15 of them. If you really want to do that, then you can. But for the sake of time, I'm going to assume that this is fine because I've written enough loops. I'm pretty sure this is good. But where are we going to spawn them? That's the next, that's the next trick. So there's a couple things. So let's come back here. This is zero, zero, right? We'll start here. This is the start of our loop. Like this is effectively zero, zero. Okay, well then therefore where is, because that's the foot spot, right? That's zero, zero. The next loop, let's say we start here, right? Well, where is that in terms of its X position? Well, it's like not quite a whole ball diameter. It's like what, about 90%? Of a ball diameter over so it's like 90 percent of a ball diameter over and both of these are the same right so that's going to be 90 percent times like the loop the the row we're on okay very good and that's going to be our x for each of these okay but the z what about the z like what how much are we going to effectively put it on the z okay well let's say that this is the starting item for each z well what's the first whenever you're like confused about like how to do a loop sometimes it just helps to just look at the first couple rows and then the other rows just kind of follow. It's, it's not that hard to like expand it out to however many rows you want. So the second row, that's kind of your critical row. So this one's zero, zero, great. The next one, the Z is half of a diameter, right? It's a radius down, It's right? It's a radius down from zero, right? One radius down from zero. Row one, this is row zero, row one is one radius down from zero, right? Cool. Row two starts at how many radiuses from zero? One, two. Row three starts at how many radiuses from zero? One, two, three. Ho, oh, oh, ho. How isn't that nice? Okay, very good. That's the starting uh, ball in each row. But how? what about the next ball in each row? Well, it's just one diameter over. So we start at two in this ball, row two, two radiuses from zero. And then we do one diameter for the second one, one another diameter for the next one. So zero times diameters for the first one for index zero, one times diameter for index one of the J row, the J loop, and then two times diameters for index two of the J loop. Sounds like we got a lot of patterns that are not that hard to deal with. So let's go. And you might be like, that was, no, that hurt my head. Well, I mean, if you want, you can just like if you really absolutely hate the heck out of like writing a darn nested loop, then just like you can just in your ball rack, just like add a bunch of little numbers or something like that. Just set up your ball rack in the code as like a bunch of balls that don't have textures. Don't do that, though. That's so like limiting. You, it's good to be able to rack them balls. Good to rack a ball. Good to rack some balls. Good to do it in the script. At the end of the day, if you like absolutely must, then you create 15 magic numbers out of it. All right, so let's go. Uh, so what did we say we're going to do? So we have our setup, but this is effectively where these numbers are going to change. It would be helpful if we had those 
um, diameter and radius, right? Uh, we can add that here. Let's make it ball diameter. It's like, really? Can't you just do radius times two? I'm literally going to do radius times two. It's like, yeah, but did you not? Couldn't you just do radius time? Come on, folks. This is like one byte. Just relax. Oh, of course. It's, well, <laughs> it's, we're fine. Okay. We didn't, we didn't specify what this is. Let's, uh, let's walrus this. All right. Um, I'm back to the ball rack. And I don't want to write ball dot because like we're already running off the screen. So I'm actually going to create a couple consts like just right here. Diameter is equal to ball dot diameter. Did I call it ball diameter? Okay, good. Like I'm especially glad that I'm like shortening this up a bit. If you just want to make it R and D, that would actually probably be better. It would be better if I just wrote ball dot diameter. And ball dot, you know what? Whatever. We're going with it. It's actually not very fun to refactor this. It doesn't like, <laughs> doesn't like go through the code. It doesn't recursively like go through all your code files if you try to rename it. All right, anyway, so diameter and radius. Uh, what did we decide? Well, X is easy, right? Oh, in fact, let's make them separate variables so that like ball X even. We'll even call it ball X because that's what we called the parameters inside the set of ball function. Um, and what is it? It was just I times the diameter, right? But not just the whole diameter. It was what? It was like 90% of a diameter over each time. Uh, I don't know. You can always change it later. 0.9. You're like, what magic number? Uh, come on. Just let it go. Let it go. Let it go, Junior. All right. Ball Y. Equals, see, that was easy, right? The first one is going to be zero times all that junk. It's going to be zero. Great. The next one is going to be one times that. We're fine. Ball Y is going to be a J and I situation, right? Oh, no, 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 no. It's the Z. Whew. Again, they almost called the police. And if you really want, you can use a little walrus. <laughs> so walruses are cute. They should have made the walrus more cute. Should like automatically update to like an emoji of a walrus whenever I type it. Um, okay, well, the first one was at uh, I times the number of, uh, you know, radiuses based on the row, right? The, so this one starts at I, which is one times radius. That's one. This one's I2. This is ra two radiuses. This is I3. That's three radiuses. Okay, so... The starting point is going to be I times radius. But in, if you need to look at the billiard table to remind you that positive Z is this direction, then cool. So when we offset our ball, we're going to subtract to go up, right? So um, and what was it? The number of diameters. So the first j, this is j times zero, no diameters. It's going to start at that position. Uh, the next j is going to be one diameter. So j times the diameter. So however many j's there are is the number of diameters we need it to be offset. And ball x is going to be passed in here. And ball y is going to, ball z is going to be passed in here. Did I do ball x and y? Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. That's why they were spawning like in the middle. No, actually, it's because they're just all stacked on top of each other. That's still the problem. Is that it? Sometimes it's like, don't think too hard. Just try it out. <gasps> they're still all yellow. <laughs> oh, because we're doing ball. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. So it's like, wait a minute. We don't have a clean. Um, counter that counts from 0 to well, 1 to 15, right? We can't just use i because that just goes to 5. We can't use j because that just depends on the row anyway. It's like, should we do some kind of weird arithmetic? Don't do some weird arithmetic. Just like, don't think about it too hard. Just create a counter, okay? It's going to start 
Should it start at zero? Or should it start at one? Uh, no, it should start at right. We don't want it to start at one because we're not trying to pass in one and then two and then three and then four and then five. We want it to pass in the shuffled index. No, well, the index is the same, but the shuffled number based on that index. So let's do ball i as like the index of the ball. And uh, after we add child, let's just increase the index by one. So every iteration of the loop, we're going to go from zero into however many there are going to happen of j through this like nested loop, and that's going to be 15. So, so instead of ball nums i, we're going to do ball nums ball i, the index. Okay. And that's fine. You're like, is that going to be like zero, one, two, three, four, five? Is it going to be the same balls? No, remember the, the uh, array is shuffled. Oh my gosh. Oh my, well, first of all, the, the, that was a terrible place to put the eight ball right there back in the corner. Like you're almost like asking for that stupid eight ball to go into the pocket right away. But look at that. Well, first of all, we can still shoot the ball, which is kind of a hilarious problem that we haven't solved. And the other problem is that, uh, no, let's not talk about our problems yet. Let's talk about our like victories. That was a victory. We have a cue ball in the head spot and we just broke our first rack and i just just didn't even like make a ceremony out of it and i should have okay we just broke our first maybe we should increase the speed a bit <laughs> but look it's a rack oh <gasps> it's a ball rack we've been talking about balls and racks and shooting and like you know it's just a matter of time before we start talking about potting balls into a pot someone comes in like your mom's gonna come in and just be like what's all this talk about pot and shooting and you're like uh we're playing pool all right very good let's keep going hopefully none of you are like that young let's keep going let's keep going <laughs> we're just shooting some ball it's cool uh okay what are we gonna do next um Okay, let's take like a short, no, you can hit pause whenever you want. I'm not going to take a break. I'm going to keep going. But what I mean by a break is like our brain is racked. Okay, you know what I'm saying? It's racked. So let's do something simple. Right now, our balls keep track of numbers, right? In fact, they don't. <laughs> we aren't actually saving the number. Like we're getting the ball number in here and we're just using it to load in the texture. But we're not actually saving the number. Would that be a useful number to save? I don't think, it's pretty harmless to just, add it let's just add it i think it's pretty harmless i'm going to create a new variable it's going to be called ball num and this could be something useful in the future actually let's go ahead and uh, walrus this to zero by default we're not going to export it like this is not something you're going to set outside or it's only going to be set by this ball setup function for now but this could be something that's useful to um you know to be especially at the very least for debugging like if something's happening weirdly and you don't know which thing is happening weirdly, you can debug the ball and get its ball number. You know, you don't have to like look at the ball to see what ball like messed up or went through the floor or whatever it is. You can just check by its ball number so you can kind of like debug a little bit better and set it equal to zero. And now, uh, not zero, to ball num. Now, you don't need to do self here because like it's an underscore, it's pretty clear that it's a member variable um and you can't use a walrus here because we've already used the walrus here you only use the walrus when you are declaring the variable okay we've already declared it it's already its type it's going to assume we're trying to walrus it twice we're trying to set its type twice you can't do that let's just use a normal simon operator to update the value all right so ball num is ball num you know what i'm saying sounds pretty good but Let's go further than this because ball number um, is all well and good, but like eventually the player needs to know, well, I guess not the player, but the game at some point needs to know who's solids and who's stripes because the game isn't about like hit the three ball in. No, the, the game is hit the solid balls in or the stripe balls in, right? And so it would be useful if the ball also kept track of what type of ball it is. Is it the cue ball? Is it? eight ball is it a solid ball is it a stripe ball it's like well can't you figure that out by the ball num can't you be like if ball num is eight 
okay, yeah, you could do that, but like, why would you do that? It would be so much easier if we just had like a type of ball solid in Stripe so that whenever you need in the rules to check if this ball matched up with the player's suit, we don't have to like add an additional thing to be like, is it less than eight? You know what I mean? Like, don't do that. Just let's create a type of ball. Okay, so whenever you're thinking about creating a type, I'm not talking about creating another class name called like extends ball and it's called stripe ball. No, you only do that if like there's actually an, a reasonable reason to do that. There's multiple reasons why that's a bad idea. Not for, for, for no other reason than like the player needs to know if they're a ball, a stripe or a solid, right? If there aren't solids or stripes. And if you created like, an ex, like a subclass of ball for solids and stripes for no other reason than specifying its type, that's just going to make that hairy, silly. Whenever you're dealing with like a type of something that's simple, it's just like, this is a solid ball, this is a stripe ball. Don't do anything fancy with inheritance. Just use an enumerator. Okay, that's what we're going to do. We're going to create an enumerator. But like I said, it's, the ball might not be the only one who cares about what it is, right? The rules need to know in some which way, wherever we're going to be processing the rules of the game, that needs to know whether it was a ball, a stripe, or a solid ball right so we want this to be like a global type we want this to be a type that you can access from anywhere okay and we're going to do that by creating another singleton and you might be like oh no singletons no come on a global enumerator type is something that doesn't mess up anything if it like if you need it to be part of every script that it exists that's fine like if i could just define it inside of the namespace in some random class without it being a singleton, I would do that too. In fact, you can do that, but it's a little bit easier to find if we just make it a singleton. So under project, project settings, and there's nothing fancy we want to do with this. Similarly to the game events, there's nothing fancy here. It's just going to be like a few very a few values. That's it. That's the whole, the whole class is just going to be a few values. So we're going to create a new auto load, and this one's going to be called enums. Like if you open up any number of like GitHubs of game projects, you're going to find an enums singleton somewhere. Or it's going to be a static class, actually, a static class called enums. But you can't create static classes in Godot. Well, you can if you are using C sharp. But we're not using C sharp. We're going to call this uh, um, object enums that we're going to be able to reference from anywhere. Click add. It's going to again say like, do you want it to be inside of the root? You'd be like, you're never right. You're right every time. If it were opposite day, it's not opposite day. You're always wrong. All right, we're kind of put in screen. That was rough. It the, the engine already crashed on us once. Like we don't need to like tempt fate. At least we kept the Godot icon, the good luck charm. So, anyways, enums.gd inside of the scripts folder. Enums.gd. Cool. Now we have another uh, auto load. It's called enums. And let's go ahead and uh, hide the texture folder forever. <laughs> don't mess with that. And um. Like I said, there's better ways to do that. Uh, and we're going to open up enums.gd. Okay, kill it. Kill it. I kill that code faster than I kill a mosquito. That's sucking my blood at the moment. All right, cool. Enums, what is, what are these going to be? Um, enum, we're going to call it ball type. Enumerators, by convention, by style guide, recommendation, should be Pascal case, like classes and stuff. And well, what is this? enum going to be it's going to keep track of solids and stripes but there are other types of cube other type of balls like a cue ball and an eight ball now you can't call it eight ball with an eight you can't proceed a variable with a number it's going to get mad at you and you're like this isn't a variable well, it kind of is actually <laughs> so eight ball spelled out an enum an enum enumerator we say enum here is just setting this to value zero this to one this to two and this to three that's all an enum is in fact we could have written it out we could have said like const solids equals zero in fact we can like you know walrus it to zero and we could have done const stripes const cue ball const eight ball and then this would just be enums dot solids in fact we could have called this instead of enums dot gd we could have called this ball type dot gd so that anywhere we wanted we could say ball type dot solids Though, let's not do that. Even though there are actually benefits to doing that, and it actually solves some of the problems with like changing the enumerator structure, like 
rearranging the values inside of the enum, it's going to create more annoyingness than it's going to solve because this is built into Godot. It's now a type. We can now like add it to the inspector. You'll see. It'll be great. Solid stripes, cue ball, eight ball. Very good. Those are the those are the different balls. Now, eventually, like there are different types of pool games, right? There's like, uh, like snucker wucker, whatever. Like, ask a British person. Snicker snacks. <laughs> I don't even know if it's just like a British thing. What do they call it? Kicker, snooker, snooker, something like that, right? Some of these don't even have numbers. Some of them are just solids. They're just like red and yellow, right? It's like there aren't even striped balls. So like you can add more here later, but you got to be careful. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, if you're going to add like red, and yellow or whatever the heck you're going to do, this might, this game might allow you to be accessible to our British friends who play sn snooker. You're, some people might be like, dude, they play snooker in the United States. In fact, they don't even play it in Britain. And I might be like, okay, well, sorry. I'm not a pool elitist. I'm kidding. Um, I am. Swimming pool elitist, though. All right. Uh, what are we talking about? I've lost my train of thought. We didn't time, way too many times. We're going to change the ball type. Okay, so when we uh, set up the ball, we're going to set up its ball type. So let's create... Along with ball num, let's create something called ball type. Why don't we do that? I think that's good. We're going to create something called ball type. Um, actually, this one, we, we may want someone else to mess with it. The, the rule system might want to know what type of ball it is. So I'm actually going to get rid of that. Now you might be like, can't you just use like getter and like do some other thing like that? Yeah, <laughs> we could, but I'm just going to make this basically uh, public for anybody to see it because knowing if it's solids or stripes is simple. It's fine. We're just going to make it something accessible. We don't need any other fancy stuff. If we need fancy stuff, we can create the getter. Then don't just make getters all over the place. I mean, some people will be like make getters and setters all the time, all over the place, whenever you want. I'm not like that. I make them when I need them. We don't need one yet. So uh, what is the ball type? It is a ball type. Enums.ball type. That's what my ball type is. Uh, and in the setup function, we're going to set up like, well, what is the ball type based on the ball number? So we set the ball number. I'm just going to continue using this because it's like one character less, but it's exactly the same value. And we're going to do if ball number is equal to the eight ball, for example, this is an easy one. The ball type, and again, no underscore. So I'm actually going to do self dot ball type so that we're clear that this is a member variable is equal to enums dot ball type dot eight ball. That was an easy one. Okay, well, what about the cue ball? Remember, we decided that the cue ball is zero. By default, it's zero, and we're not setting it up through the setup ball function, so it's going to be the zero ball. This is a little bit fragile, a little bit fragile because like later that might pose a problem if again like the setup ball function is for snooker or for some like thing doesn't have ball numbers. We're going to kick the can down the road. We're going to assume that <laughs> if the ball num is one, is zero. We're, here's the thing. It doesn't even matter because we're not even set. This cue ball is not getting set through here. In fact, this is actually going to be a different problem. I'm going to just copy paste because I'm getting lazy. We're going to say cue ball. Like I'm talking about all this stuff being fragile and junk. This is never going to happen, right? Because the setup ball function only doesn't get called on the cue ball. So while we're at it, let's go ahead and say that it's uh, the default value is uh, the cue ball. So it's cue ball unless we say otherwise. All right, and the, it, sh it, has to become, it has to come through the setup ball if it's not the cue ball. Let's just kind of make that a thing. And unfortunately, we can't force that to be a thing. That's just a thing that we're going to have to remember. Um, elif ball. And so here you might be like, shouldn't we use like a switch statement? First of all, there's no switch statement in Godot, in GD script. But there's a match statement, and we'll do that later. But right now, this is not a great use of the match statement because 
if it were just like ball eight is eight and zero is Q and three is three or something, then fine. But we're it's okay. Notice how we have to be a little bit more specific here. If ball is less than eight, then it should be uh, the it should be solids, right? Because one through seven are solid balls. So suddenly the match doesn't seem to make a lot of sense anymore because like this is not just like one simple pattern they all follow. They follow kind of slightly uh, irregular patterns. So match doesn't really work for us very well. And this can be an else because like we're we like to live dangerously. <laughs> that's good. And that's gonna be stripes. Um now just be very careful. The mat the order matters because like if we say less than eight, well zero is less than eight. So if you did this below this, we would accidentally make a cue ball. Right? So make sure we're checking our like exact numbers first, and then we'll say less than eight. Then we're gonna assume that this is greater than eight because well, it's not less than eight and it's not eight, so it must be greater than eight. Logic. Logic. Nice. Nice. All right, I'm not even going to test it. I'm just going to assume it's good. <laughs> because well, like, to test it, it's going to be annoying, right? What am I going to do? Go into the ball rack and like check ball type and print all the ball types? Well, it's not going to really help because it's going to be either zero or one. It's going to be kind of annoying to check. I mean, it's really not that annoying to check. But this is such simple code that I'm just going to let this be a headache that I spelled something wrong later. You should check it. I'm not going to. All right, um, let's go. Let's hit play. So now when I shoot the ball, nothing's different, in fact. In fact, let's just go ahead and shoot the wall because as protest for how little we got done with that thing. You see how the ball just bounces around? I don't like that. Like, if you're a good shot, you're not going to be bouncing the ball. Like, you know, it's not going to like fly all over the place. We're not even hitting it very hard. Like the physics engine, even though we're applying a central impulse, like there's just too much bouncing around, you know? Like, do you see how it's like bouncing up? It's like kind of messing up the the like angle. See how they're like blah, 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 blah. like if you're if it actually was hitting it centrally like that and it was rolling. I feel like how pool is supposed to work is the ball shouldn't be like bouncing all over the place like that. And I don't want you to be worrying about as a player like did I hit it right for it to like not bounce all over the place. So let's make it so the ball can't like bounce so at this point it's like the wall size actually didn't matter at all because i'm going to fix this right now we're going to fix it quick in the ball this applies to all of the balls i don't want it to be able to go above a certain y position well how do i do that well we could do it inside of the process function but since we don't already have a process function let's actually use the correct function in fact even if we did have a process function let's use the correct function this actually matters here so there's a function i know you might be like physics process and be like yeah, but actually even slightly better. So integrate forces is the function that we want. The integrate forces function is like the process function, except that this function, so when I say physics process, the physics process is, the it's like process, but it executes every step of the physics engine rather than every frame of the game. And so that's a much better place to like make sure you're like, check your velocity, set your velocity and stuff, because the process function is not synchronized with the physics engine. Okay, so setting velocities and stuff in the process function can lead to problems because it's kind of going to be between physics steps and stuff. And the physics step, so it's going to be like the physics step is going to set the velocity and then the velocity is going to be randomly set in the middle in between physics steps. And then the next physics step is going to set the velocity. That might not be a problem, but it might create kind of unpredictable behavior. So doing it inside a physics process is actually a good idea, but integrate forces is even better because it's like right as we are going to integrate the forces we can set the velocity. So we basically override any type of velocity we're going to set by the physics step because we're doing it right when the forces are being integrated. Integrated means like applying a velocity to the body. So what we're going to do here is all we're going to do is we're going to just like, you know, set a maximum y position. And you can do that by doing self dot. Well, what's the velocity? There's different kinds. Um, let's do linear velocity because again, it's the position that we're interested in, not the angular velocity. And we're going to set the y position to never be above a certain value. So therefore, we're going to use the min function, which basically says, like, I want there to be, like, I know it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but you're setting your max by using the min. Because, like, whatever you set here, like, you know, 2, 
and then whatever number else is there, it doesn't matter how big it is, the maximum value is going to be 2 because it's going to choose the smallest number in this list. Okay, so you set the max by using the min. Okay, well, that's just how it works. So what is the maximum y uh, position that you want to be able to use? Uh, well, let's not use magic numbers. Let's do ball dot ball diameter. Let's let the balls like bounce up to about the height of a ball. Just not as great, just as wiggly bouncy. This is like a freaking whammo product, these freaking pool balls right now. Like they're getting a little exciting. We don't want these. These aren't supposed to be bouncy balls. Come on. Uh, what is the ball? Uh, but what? So, so the minimum between whatever the ball diameter is, and that's going to be like the Y position. Uh, you know, above the the table, and um, and whatever the current linear velocity is, right? Duh. Now I said duh. That might be insensitive if you're like I have clueless. I'm not clueless. I have no clue. Like I'm very confused. Hopefully this makes enough sense. We're gonna just basically let the y velocity be itself unless it's higher than the ball diameter from the table. Okay, very good. And this happens every, you know, physics step, just right at the nick of time. Now let's go ahead and shoot the wall. Da ha ha! Hey hey hey! Oh, it doesn't fly all over the place anymore. We doesn't fly all over the place anymore. Doesn't fly all over the place. Her, oh my gosh. <gasps> this is, <laughs> okay, there, off the table again, but yeah, I'm pumped. Have I been recording? Oh my gosh, I was freaking flipped the lid. It's getting late. All right, Um. cool, stays on the table. Okay, here's, okay, look, the ball, I'm able to shoot it all over the place, which I've been using as like a debug tool, but I think we've gotten to the point, we've leveled, we've leveled up as, programmers at pool players that we can stop just like letting ourselves shoot the ball really nilly even after the ball has already been hit so let's fix that finally let's make it so you can't shoot the ball while the ball is uh, in play i think so so this is where we actually have to have a think moment for a second because it's like well how are we going to do that let's just do the dumb thing first and by dumb i mean like the the simple thing first that we're probably going to have to refactor right away. And that's just to use a darn Boolean, right? So this is not a great idea, but let's just do it anyways. Let's create a Boolean variable. And it's just going to be called, like, what? when are we allowed to shoot the ball when we're currently aiming, I guess? So, like, is aiming, is walrus set to true by default? And uh, so when we shoot, where do we shoot the ball? See, this is how it gets kind of unruly. Start putting stuff in functions and stuff. And you might be like, well, actually, there's even better ways to do it. Yes, there are. Talk about that, but maybe. All right. Handle shot. This is it. So is action just pressed? And is aiming. Right? Both of those things must be true. Uh, or else. Or, 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 or else. Okay, well, we have to set is aiming to false. So when should is aiming be false? Like, I guess when we hit the ball, right? Should we do it after we admit the ball was hit? Mm, let's just do it here. Is aiming is false. Because we've hit the ball. We're not aiming anymore. We're watching the ball float around. Cool. So again, default is true. If we're currently aiming. And then, as long as we're currently aiming, and remember, is aiming is like this is now checking if this is a true key value. It's going to be either true or false. We strongly typed it as a Boolean, so this is fine. Is aiming, is aim equals false. When we use things like is or has, like that implies that this is a Boolean. So don't get too excited about like, you know, checking its exact value. This is fine. And is aiming. Is aiming equals false. We're going to say well, after we strike the ball. So now when we hit play, and when we shoot the ball, we're able to shoot it. Very good. But now I'm no longer able to shoot it because is aiming is now false. And this can only be true if we're using, if both the shoot has action happened and we're currently aiming. 
So now, uh, okay, well, see, we can already see how this is going to be a problem. Because, okay, what are the different states of this game? Okay, we're aiming, and we're watching the balls, right? So, like, balls in play, currently. So you can't touch the balls when they're in play. You can't shoot a ball when they're in play. It's fine. But you can only shoot when you're aiming. You can't, shouldn't be able to shoot when you're doing other stuff. What other stuff are we talking about? Well, for those of you familiar with pool, like if you hit the white ball in or commit a foul, the opposing player can take the ball and put it anywhere on the table. So that's a different state of play where you have to be able to allow the player to be able to choose where on the table we can place the cue ball. There's also the play where you choose which pocket the eight ball needs to be put in. You shouldn't be able to hit the ball in either of those situations too. So like, yeah, yeah, and is aiming, but what are you going to do? Have like three other brilliance here? And is like ball in play and is ball in hit? Like you see how like that's going to get really hairy because now you've got like four brilliance that you have to check to make sure like this is true and that one's not true and this one's true. You know what I mean? Bad news. Don't do that. So when you know ahead of time that this isn't going to just be like a simple just brilliant situation, but it's going to be like a state of the game, like a state of the, the play state of the game, you should be thinking a little bit, a little bit more expanded. And so you got a kind of a couple of choices here. And um, the next step up, like next rung up the ladder, in my opinion, is to create a finite state machine. Finite, I'm even going to write it out. Finite state machine. This is what we're going to do. You create a finite state machine when basically the object can only be, or the game or whatever, can, uh, can only be in one state at a time. Okay, so if you think about like, uh, like I don't know, like a firearm, like one of these like shooting games, and I don't mean like a pool kind of shooting game, and I don't mean like a Pokemon Snap kind of shooting game. I'm talking like a, like a real gun, like a well, a real fake gun shooting game, right? Those those guns have like you know a reload state. They have like a shooting state. They've got like a it's cooling off state or like, you know, it's overheating state. <laughs> you know, there's an idle state. Each of those are a single state and they can't be the other things at the same time. It can't be like shooting and reloading at the same time, right? It can't. So whenever you're in that situation where you're deciding on like, you know, how to manage the state of a particular object that can only be one of those things at a time, you should be thinking finite state machine automatically and when you think of a finite state machine one of the things that immediately comes to mind is an enumerator because if you think about it under the enums.gd each like a ball can only be one of these things right an enumerator can only be one of these things so in a similar fashion we can create a state of the play of the game let's do that so in the enums.gd let's go ahead and do enum dot play state i guess that's pretty good and Let's start with, well, there's aiming and then there's ball in balls in play. Is that a pretty good name for it? Sure. So a couple of things here that we have to think about when we're doing this. This is not going to be all of the play states. We can add some more of them now, but it's we're not necessarily going to be able to guess all of them right now. Eventually, we're going to add more stuff. If we add more stuff, that can be problematic because and we'll see probably the problems later on because when you reorient this around you change these values godot doesn't instantly realize we did this okay and so it can create problems where something that it thought was index one which is stripes if we move like we put something here at the front then stripes is now two right it's not zero one it's now zero one two and so now it's going to potentially mess up the game and create really bizarre kinds of behavior. So if you're ever going to change the enum, you should probably just restart, you know, <laughs> if you're ever going to like add to it. It's just a rule of thumb. Uh, it's a safe thing to do. Anyways, play state. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing to think about, and that's fine, we can add change to the enum later. The other thing we have to think about, <laughs> okay, is that this is another kind of big decision. This is, this is one of those big decision moments. Not a little decision, not like, should we do this? Should it be an under, you know, don't worry about any of that, right? Um, this is a big decision moment because handling what state the game, like the play state of the game is in, is going to affect a lot of systems probably. And also it's going to be in all sorts of parts of our code. We're going to say like, are we aiming? Are we, is the balls in motion? Like even inside of the play state. 
uh, play system script. And if we want to change how we do things, it's going to add a lot of refactoring. And at that point, if you're going to refactor, you really have to like basically create a new branch of your version control system to like start messing with stuff because you can like mess up your entire game and want to go back to a fixed like a working state of the game so and one of these things is um a having this whole idea of like a uh using the state design pattern so those of you who have read about like design patterns may have learned about the gang of four who have like kind of defined a lot of these kinds of design patterns inside of software engineering not just game development and one of them is the state pattern and so a lot of times if you try to like do advanced godot tutorials probably i assume that some of these are going to talk about the state um design pattern and the state design pattern effectively allows you to create a different class for every state like you would have the aiming state class right you've got like a state uh class and then you like extend that state class with like an aiming state with a balls in motion state or whatever kind of state and then the actual code of those states is being handled inside of those classes rather than are we in the aiming state are we in this if this if that if the other which is safer than a bunch of booleans but it can get kind of hairy when you have just like checking enums all over the place some of these things can get a little bit kind of it's going to it's going to probably balloon our play system script and make it a little bit harder to follow but if everything is inside of its own class then maybe it's a little bit easier and all you have to do in the play system is basically in the process basically like call the current state you know process function directly so that it can handle itself but here's the thing about this and i'm mentioning this because again this is trying this is like a game code architecture co course and i have to kind of mention this kind of thing this is not at this that point yet because while we might have problems in the future where it's like we've ballooned our play system where we're checking hey is it in the ball in hand state is it in this state is it in that state we can kind of decide it's hard to guess entirely at exactly at this point but in my opinion what you're doing by adding the state um, design pattern for a game as simple as billiards is you're just adding a different kind of complexity that itself can be difficult to scale and start adding kind of uh, a bunch of um, elements to your code base which are just like there because it has to be there because your play state would be confused if it wasn't it's just going to add a lot of additional code and it can actually make it difficult to follow what's going on in having a bunch of weird edge cases in your play states that like you're like oh darn it we need to get access to this particular variable or this global thing or whatever it might be and now your play states are all kind of confused Again, we wouldn't be able to really know that unless we tried to go that direction. In my opinion, it's better to just do the simple solution first. You can refactor even a big decision later. I know it's not preferable, but for a game like billiards, I don't think it's big enough that it's ever going to really matter if we just use enumerators for our play state. I don't think so. I cannot anticipate it being big enough. Okay. If you just want to practice the play state, the, the play, uh, the, uh, state design pattern cool i don't think this game is big enough to really warrant it or it, this kind of game really warrants it because it's a single play system as it is okay so very good we're just going to use the enumerator for play state and instead of is aiming let's get rid of that and let's create a variable called i guess it's going to be like the current play state right let's just like play state i don't want to add too many numbers here and what is it going to be it's going to be a play state enumerator and is there a default state uh sure it's going to be the the aiming play state okay this is like what the trash okay yeah no not and is aiming but and is the play state equal okay well that's gonna add, that's gonna definitely go off the side of the screen so to make this work there's a couple things we can do right so it's going to be and and one thing we can do is we can add a backslash to say hey we're on a new line now so and and see now it's fine right and uh what is it uh the play state is equal equal to specifically the enums the play state enums aiming state 
So you can do this and that's fine to use the backslash to say, hey, we're on a new line. See, we can't do it like this. Now it looked like we could do it like that before, but that remember is because there were parentheses. Okay, no parentheses here. Since there are no parentheses, it thinks that there's some kind of logical break here in the code. Um, so you have to use a backslash. I don't generally like to use the backslash when I can avoid it because look, it works fine right now. Okay, well, it's getting mad at this. So just go away for a second. Um, it works fine for now, but look, if you add a space here, then it gets mad. <laughs> like, it's so fragile, it's annoying. So, why did you come back? One undo. So, um, and also it's at the end of the line. It's harder to like see that it's happening potentially, I guess. So I'm going to instead put this if structure like good old Java or JavaScript or C sharp in, in actual parentheses. And that's fine because all we're doing is we're saying this is an expression evaluate the expression inside of here but since we created this parenthesis <clears throat> it's telling the interpreter hey yo don't worry about <laughs> like this is not the end of the line yet until this happens okay very good and um is aiming not equal false but more specifically the the play state that we are now in when we hit the ball right which is what uh play state becomes um enums that play state dot falls in play is that really a good name for that well it's too late now we already did it <laughs> and we can test it out and we can run it and it should still work okay cool it shoots and it doesn't shoot anymore <laughs> like we missed the break and it went in the hole what do you even do in that situation do you like start over does the next player just put the ball right next to the break and you know all right anyways um so cool it didn't really change anything but it's going to help us down the line to to work with an, a play state enumerator okay we good uh we good let's go okay so currently um you can't like the next player can't play yet you can only take one shot before we were able to take shots willy nilly, and that was kind of fun. Have you ever done that as a kid, as an adult? Just like you keep hitting balls as they're going, and then you like pinch your finger, and you're like, "Dang it! Who designed this terrible game? Should have been playing with ping pong balls." Um, no, but see, we have a problem, right? And so, yeah, we want to make it so that we want it to change hands. Well, when is that going to happen? So we're at another big, uh, big decision moment. Okay. I'm actually going to look at the table because it kind of helps clear my mind. Stop looking at the code. Stop looking at the code. What's the problem? Okay, well, when is it that it's time for the next person's turn? Well, when the balls have stopped moving, right? That's when we decide that it's the next person's turn, right? Or whether it's the next person's turn. You know what I mean? When's the next shot going to happen? Whether it's the same person's turn or the next person's turn is when the balls have stopped moving. So that's kind of what we have to check. That's going to be the next thing that we want to do. But we have to think about this. Okay, this is kind of a big decision. It's not as big of a decision because we kind of kicked the can down the road on like how we decide whose turn it is next. We'll think about that in a second. But first we want to figure out when, um, how do we ch check to see if all the balls have stopped? We have a couple of decisions. And I think most of these kinds of pool games, the way that someone will handle it is that they'll create like a big old list of balls, right? You'll create like a big old global list of balls, not necessarily global, but somebody's got a whole big list of balls. And in that uh, list of balls, you're checking to see if all the balls are stopped, right? You have a function called have all the balls stopped. And you're going through the list of all the balls and you're checking if their velocities are zero or close to zero, whatever. And then you say, sure, they have all stopped. I want to try to avoid that because it might actually end up being the best solution to just have a big old list of balls somewhere, but it really can snowball our code architecture around this big list of balls. Like for example, if we're checking to see if like certain things are the case for processing the rules of the game, sometimes you're just gonna be like, oh, I'll just check the big old list of balls. Okay, I don't like that. I don't like a big global list of stuff generally, okay? You know, and you can be like, well, can't we just make the ball like have a group like set in the ball script, like or in the sorry, the ball scene? Can't we just like add a group called ball? That is such a thing that's so fast to do. 
And it now you're going to be like, now that that exists, you can be like, oh, get all the balls in a group. Yay, check them. Let's stop for just one sec. Take a deep breath. Let's forget the list of balls for a second. <laughs> because when you have a big old list of balls, it makes your code dependent on the stupid big old list of balls, which is maybe fine, but it can potentially make it difficult to test your game. Because, you know, you're depending on this big old list of balls existing, and those big old list of balls have to exist in memory in order for you to test them, right? And so you can't just load them up and test them because you have to load them into some kind of place and then check this list of balls based on the values of those balls themselves. I like to keep things more primitive because it's easier to test them. It's easier to inject, use dependency injection to inject values into particular functions to test to see if the rules are working, to test to see, um, you know, any number of different things. As we go forward, hopefully we'll see what I'm talking about. So let's try to use a solution that avoids that big old list of balls for now. And I think we can do that, especially with balls in motion. There are other ways to do it. They're not perfect, but they avoid the big old list of balls for now. Um, so how do we do that? Well, like I said, primitive numbers. Let's check to see how many balls are currently moving, right? And the ball can notify that value itself. The ball can say, hey, I'm moving or not. Should the ball handle that? Well, in this case, all the balls have to stop moving, including the cue ball. So I actually kind of like it being in the ball script in this situation because this applies to all balls, right? The ball knows when it stops moving. We don't need some other script to check if a ball is not moving anymore. The ball can do it. And because of that, this is where you should start thinking in terms of signals. Hey, I stopped. That's a situation, right? More importantly, all the balls have stopped because it doesn't matter when one ball has stopped. Generally, nobody cares about that. What somebody cares about, any other system cares about, is have all the balls stopped. Well, how does a single ball know if all the balls have stopped? Okay, that's when you're like, the big old list of balls. <laughs> big old list of balls. I know, I know, I know. That's like the obvious way to check if all the balls have done anything. But what we can do is we can revert back to this thing that, we, that I had mentioned before, which, which is this idea of having a static variable. I'm not sure that the style guide tells you where to put static variables because I think static variables are relatively new to Godot. So static variable and this static variable is going to know how many balls are currently moving. Does that make sense? So num balls that are moving. And it's a static variable, so I'm not going to use the underscore. That's very important. Even though we may not use this outside of the ball script, we're not using an underscore because the underscore means that it's a member variable, a private member variable. Static variables by default are always public. Okay. And uh, so just don't don't use the underscore. I, you can use the underscore if you really want to. I mean, it doesn't really, it's not the end of the world. Um, let's start out by saying that this isn't into, like, this is going to be zero, right? But remember, is this a float or is this an integer? If it's zero, I generally like to be very sure, like very specific. This is an integer. It starts at zero. No balls are moving at the beginning. Okay, we're just using an integer. And why are we using static? Because if we didn't use static, this is now going to be a separate variable for every single ball. Each ball is going to have their own num balls moving, just like how each ball has their own ball num and each ball has their own ball type, right? Static variable means that if anybody changes this value, it changes it for all of the balls. This is basically, like I said before, it's like a global constant that you can change. <laughs> okay, it belongs to ball not the individual variables. And so when we change it, we change it for all balls. And what we're going to do is we're going to have the ball report whether it has stopped moving by adding or subtracting to this number of balls moving. How do we check if a ball is moving? Well, inside of like physics process, you can check to see if the velocity is zero or whatever. And the thing is, you actually, it wants to be entirely zero. You might be like, well, isn't that annoying to wait for the ball to entirely stop? Yeah, well, maybe it's annoying, but the problem is that you're going to get into weird edge cases where let's say the ball is like less than 0.01, right? Close enough. That less than 0.01, I can guarantee is going to lead to the, hey, all the balls have stopped, except that they haven't. They're at 0.01 and one's going to fall in the pocket after you have processed the state. And now you've got a ball that's like totally unaccounted for that fell in a pocket between turns. 
oh, make sure it's exactly zero. And there's no better way to make sure that something is exactly zero than the physics state is entirely sleeping. So with the ball selected, if I look here, you can see that there's this sleeping thing. If I hover over it, it says, if true, the ball will not move and will not calculate forces. Perfect, it can't fall in a pocket if that has happened, right? Good, that's a physics engine thing. It's a very common physics engine thing. It, don't, it doesn't like, if something is not moving, then why are you calculating all sorts of stuff on it? Okay, so just let it sleep until something hits it. So let it sleep, guys. Why should let me sleep? Good golly. What are, what are we doing? Yes, so how do we know when it's sleeping? Well, you can check every physics step if it's sleeping. Oh, or guess what? Under the node tab. So with ball, ridge ball selected under the node tab, you can see that there is a specific signal that's built into rigid bodies called sleeping state changed. And that sleeping state changed variable will fire whenever it becomes true or false, whether it's sleeping or is now is now sleeping or is not sleeping. I love that. That's perfect. So if I double click on sleeping state changed and I'm going to attach it to the ball script and I'm going to let it create this function called on sleeping state changed, I'll click connect and it's going to put it down here. Now you might be like, wait, hold on, aren't virtual methods uh, overriding, like overriding virtual methods, shouldn't they be like above your custom methods? And the answer to that is this is not a virtual method. <laughs> this is a custom method. We could have called this whatever we want. Okay. This doesn't get called magically automatically. We just, we hooked it to a signal and happened to call it the default name they decided on. But do not think of these signal things as uh, the callbacks as a virtual method. They are not. In fact, we could have just called it something else, but I like to keep it the default. On sleeping state changed, well, what are we going to do? Well, when the sleeping state has changed, what I want to do is I want to add to the ball like the num balls are moving if uh the ball is no long is is no longer asleep and i want to subtract from it if the ball is now asleep so we're going to do an if statement we're going to check if self and remember this is a rigid body it's a ball and a rigid body because it extends rigid body self dot sleeping oh that's it self dot sleeping sweet um if self dot sleeping we're going to subtract the number of balls that are moving. And I'm typing, ball, like, look, I just kind of just did that, just like out of just, I, that's how I like to work. I could have done num balls moving equals minus equals one, right? And it's not going to get mad at me. But I want to be specific that we're talking about the balls num ball moving, not this particular instance of the balls num ball moving, but all balls. That's what it is, a static variable. And this is being explicit because self that num balls moving isn't going to work. This isn't going to work because this doesn't, it's a static variable, right? And it might actually work actually because it, I think it thinks that it belongs to itself. Ooh, I don't like it. Blah, 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 blah. Blah. Ah. All that num balls moving. This is a static variable. It belongs to all balls. Else, well, that means it has to be not sleeping. So let's do ball dot balls moving plus equals one and you might be like couldn't you do something more clever like uh whoops can you have just said like ball that num balls moving like plus equals like converting the boolean to a integer or something no don't do fancy trash keep it easy to read we're focusing on two things here, and I should have said this at the beginning. We're mantras. Okay, this is our pool mantra. This is, well, our game programming mantras. Your pool mantras might be different, but your game programming mantras. Readability, scalability. Okay? Scalability because your game designer or yourself are going to the heck feature creep your game no matter what. This game is going to be an online game. We've decided already, even though we don't want it to be, because we want it to be. It's going to be it. And you're going to have to add networking to it. So just assume you're going to have it. This game is going to be Snooker and 8 ball and 9 balls and 15 balls. There's going to be however many balls you want. You're going to have to scale this because it's going to happen. Okay, people want like avatars and achievements and stuff. 
get ready. Scalability. Readability. Because someone else might be reading this code. Your readability like metric should be if someone were to like randomly find this in GitHub, which would be kind of creepy if it was a private repo. But anyways, but let's say someone found this in GitHub. How easy would it be for them to figure out what the heck was going on? If you started doing fancy junk like balls.num ball moving is like integer convert sleeping state or some junk, like that's not readable. Don't be freaking fancy. Just this is readable. Come on. Anyways, that's my opinion. Okay, so we've we've updated uh, num ball. You know what? Let's print it. Print and uh, we're going to print. And I'm actually, look, I'm going to do something really kind of weird because now that we're on the topic, of like Siobhan's like weird opinions. <laughs> uh, let's colon space uh, and uh, let's do numballs moving. A couple things are happening here. First of all, I'm using a comma, which is basically the same as like a plus, but commas are better because sometimes you're not going to have something concatenatable. Okay, if we want to concatenate the string to like the array values of something, that's like you'd have to convert that to a string. So instead, just use a comma because you can we've printed an array already and that's it's not hard to do that so use a comma it's basically like printing twice on the same row second i have a space here this is this looks awful to some of you because you know all the other times we're calling a function we're not putting a space here but i'm putting a space here because i'm dumb because i'm like weird i guess when i'm doing a print statement like this i think of this as like a command and I can't not have parentheses because this darn command is not a command, it's a function. Okay, so this is just me. These are temporary anyway. No one's going to see them because I'm going to delete them. But I don't like this because it's not really, I'm not really calling a function. I'm doing a print command almost. Everybody's got their weird thing, right? That's my weird thing for now. Go ahead and hit play. Um, Current ball, okay, well, already we have a problem. Current balls moving is negative 16. That doesn't sound good. I kind of like that it's 16, though, because there are 16 balls. And then I hit the balls. Now it says num balls moving is zero, which is the opposite of true. Like, or not opposite, but you know what I mean? There are every ball is moving. And now it went back to negative 16. That's actually good, right? That means that there's rhyme to this reason. Is that a thing? There's method to this reason. What I mean is like that's a pattern, right? Clearly what's happening here is at the beginning of the game, they're all moving, right? They're all not perfectly on the table. They're all falling. And now they're all currently moving. And so what it's done is it's subtracted one uh, from uh, each of those, right? Now they're all moving. So we added 16. So now it's zero, which, per which is perfect. Now like... A lot of them have stopped, but now some of them are still waiting. Negative 12, and that takes me back to negative 16. So I like it. The problem is that like the ball might start in the sleeping state or the not sleeping state, depending on the situation. And we don't want our game to break because of that. So it's already scary to do this. Some of you may already be like, red flag, red flag. It's more like a yellow flag, but I can see why this is a problem. Because what if it just like your game wouldn't let you ever start your turn next? How would you know? Well, what was it? It probably was related to this. Like, what if, like, you know, a ball somehow, like, subtracted twice in a row, somehow? Like, we're depending on this heavily. And the only way we can debug it, like, is what? Look at the number? Like, we don't know which ball it was that is not or is sleeping. This is a problem, potentially, right? What if a ball falls off the edge? It's never going to sleep, right? So, yes, you're going to have to add some wrappers of, you know, uh of checks to make sure that certain things th so that this type of system is a little bit less fragile there are other ways you can do this you can instead of saying balls moving you can like just append it to a list of balls nums if you want or something like that but in any case i like it just being a, just a, a, an integer for now even though it's relatively fragile we can make it a lot less fragile by saying whenever a ball spawns go ahead and set its um you know whether it's moving or not um based on its initial initial uh state so like if not self that sleeping so if it's not sleeping then 
this we start out with zero, right? That's the number of balls that are moving. If it's not sleeping, then go ahead and add to that immediately. Num balls. We're, so num balls moving is uh, plus equal to one. So basically, what we're saying here is like we're gonna assume you're you're sleeping because uh, we're saying zero. Uh, we're starting everything at zero. However, if you happen to not be sleeping, go ahead and immediately, like when you when you're on ready, immediately notify and say like, hey, you know, we're sleeping. Uh, sorry, we're we're not sleeping. Go ahead and add one to the num balls moving. Does that make sense? Okay, we're assuming that all balls are sleeping at the beginning. If it's not the case for a ball that is like on ready, then go ahead and add to it. This should be relatively robust. Current balls moving is zero, like that. Current balls moving is 16. Sounds good. If it goes back to zero, then I think we're on the money. It goes back to zero. We're on the money. Okay. Very good. So what's happening here now is like, okay, well, this is the moment that the ball becomes zero. Actually, right here. This is the moment that num balls become zero because it's not actually asynchronous, right? One of these balls is going to be the last ball, even if they all happen to be like the same tick. One of them is going to be the last one. This is going to be hap this is going to happen one last time. And at that moment, it's going to be zero. And at that moment, we can check, hey, if ball dot num balls moving is equal to zero, then pass. Then go ahead and well, I'm going to probably delete this print here in a second. Then at that moment, we want to let everybody know that all the balls have stopped. Again, you might be like, that sounds bad that it's in the ball. Why would the balls need to tell everybody that all the balls have stopped? Well, it's not going to be in the play system because the play system only cares about the cue ball. It's not going to be in the ball rack because the ball rack doesn't care about the cue ball. So we're going to create another thing called balls system or something where are you going to be checking that there's really not a great place to put it if you think about it at least going this way having the ball know for all like because of the static variable that all the balls have stopped moving at the time when the all the balls have stopped moving seems like a reasonable enough starting place okay since a lot of different places might care that all the balls have stopped moving um, let's go ahead and make a uh, event for it. So under game events, so game events.gd, I'm going to create a signal and I'm going to say balls all balls stopped. Um, cool. Who cares about it? Well, let's not worry about who cares about it yet. So let's come back to the ball and let's admit it here. Game events dot all balls stopped dot Init. Okay. Oof. Perfect. Okay, so now we have to ask, like, who cares about this? This is one of our last big thinks, our big decisions. Okay, this is a big think moment because we have to decide, okay, well, who cares about whether all the balls have stopped? Does the play system care? I mean, I guess, but what's it going to do when all the balls have stopped? Is it going to be like next turn? How does it know it's his next turn? Whose turn is it next? Does the play system care whose turn it is next? We want the play system to not become a monolithic class. The play system doesn't care whose turn it is. The play system doesn't care whether this person hit this ball in or that ball in, and therefore it's this person's turn or that person. No, the play system should only care about moving the camera, like looking around and shooting a ball. It doesn't care about whose turn it is. It doesn't care about whose stripes. So the person, the, the system that should care about whether the balls have stopped or not is whoever is going to be processing the rules of the game. And we don't want the play system to process the rules of the game because the play system only processes the play gameplay of the game. Somewhere needs to process the rules of the game because when the balls stop, that's when we have to decide who got what points, whose turn is it next, did someone commit a foul, that kind of stuff. Right? So let's think ahead in terms of that. So who should handle the rules? Why not we just let's make a, a script to handle the rules? Let's call it rule processor. Even. 
It's called rule processor. I love that idea. I like one script handling all the rules because that way, again, when we're like readability, when we look at this in like GitHub or something and we see there's like a rule processor script and all of the like scenarios having to do with the balls like hitting each other and falling in the, the ball, you know, pockets and stuff is all handled there and you get to determine whose turn is is next, who's going to win, all that kind of stuff is handled in that script, then it's very easy to find. And you know, like if you ever need to check something about the rules, you can just go to that script. This is a perfect type of thing for a script like that. Okay, to be able to process the rules like that. Another thing about it is um, it makes it easier for you to like swap out rules, right? If you have this rules script, then basically you can have your different rule sets come into that rule processor script. That isn't to say that they all need to be hard coded into the rule processor script, but they can all be plug and play into that rule processor script. This also makes it so that, you know, we're talked about scalability. The game is going to be a network game, right? We're going to have a multiplayer online turn-based thing. Like <laughs> you just have to assume that the game designer, the publisher, whomever is going to tell you, you know what, we got to add network play. By having a rule processor, script that makes it closer to having like a dedicated server that runs on that script right makes it easier and then the play system doesn't have to doesn't have to be in the dedicated process or, or the dedicated uh, server as much because that's only something that you visually see and you change with your input and then you make the call or whatever hey i'm going to do this particular command and then the rule processor handles like you know what happens with all the balls etc it makes it easier for you to be able to have that replication with the server we're not talking about server development right now, but anyways, um, so this is great. So I like it. So I think we should um, make a rule processor script. I think that's a good idea. So at this point though, it's like, okay, you all a single rule processor script. So, hmm, what type of node should we create where there's a single one of these scripts running? And at that point you might think singleton. I wouldn't blame you but I want to avoid it for a second. You might be like, Shimon, you just said that it was okay to do singletons. It is okay to do singletons. These enums and these like signals and stuff, that's the perfect time to do signal singletons because like those are just like a couple of global variables basically that have to do with a specific type of thing. But rule processor is a little bit more complex than that. Okay, the rule processor could potentially have other things like child nodes potentially, or maybe you want to export variables to be able to plug in these rule sets, right? That you can just drag and drop into side of your rule processor. You can't do that if it's a singleton in your auto load. You can't like select the singleton and like drag and drop stuff. You can't export, as far as I know, you can't export um, variables like that. That doesn't work. So you've, you're eliminating a lot of the like uh, benefits that you could potentially have with the rule processor script. Another problem is that by having it as a singleton, you're tempting other systems to depend on it. Don't do that. It's okay for other systems to depend on enums and to depend on game events because these are just incredibly simple. But the rule processor is gonna be more complex. You don't want to tempt yourself in the future to just call the rule processor directly by saying like rule processor dot do a thing, you know, or like in the play system rule processor, you, no. no, 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 no. You don't want the rule processor to be called directly. It's handling things indirectly through signals. And so because of that, um, if by having it as a singleton, you make it too easy for you to couple it into other code systems. So don't do that. I don't like it to be a singleton. So instead, to force myself to keep it from being a singleton, but still allow it to be a single script, I'm going to create in the main scene, I'm going to create a new node. I'm going to click create new node, but it's not going to be node 3D because there's no position in the rules script. It doesn't need to know where it's located. So we're just going to do node. And this also prevents you from accidentally thinking, let's add position. Let's make, let's set position of objects within the rule processor script. No, you don't want to be tempted to do any of that trash. So I'm going to make it a node, most generic thing that you can call it. So it's basically a singleton that you're like having the discipline to not, to not like function as this globally accessible thing. So it's like a it's like a classic definition of the word singleton. The singleton design pattern implies that it's globally accessible, but a singleton itself doesn't imply that it's globally accessible. A singleton is just, you know, an object that has only one instance. So let's go ahead and I'm going to call this rule processor inside of my main scene. Again, this makes it more plug and play. I love it. All right. 
Um, and I'm going to create a new script, and it's going to be called rule. <laughs> Put it in the scripts folder, first of all. Snake case. You're really tempting me, Godot, to use Pascal case. That's what we do in C Sharp. You're tempting me. And click create. Rule process. Spell it right. Don't change the name later. All right. It's rule processor. Create. You don't want any of this. Trash. <laughs> Start from scratch. Okay. You would think, oh, shouldn't there be a process function in the rule pro? No. Get rid of it. <laughs> but you know what you are going to have? You're going to have a function. Instead of process, we're going to call this process rules. <laughs> That's going to happen, right? We're going to process rules at some point. So I'm going to create a function because, like, you know, it's going to happen eventually. In fact, like, process rules. <laughs> process game rules, just so, like, you know, we're not being that cheeky. Um, okay. This is going to be called at some point, probably when all the balls have stopped, right? So let's do that. Um, so the ball says, hey, all the balls have stopped. Cool. And the rule processor needs to know that that's happened because it needs to know that it needs to process the rules suddenly. So um, I'm adding space up here for no reason. <laughs> I meant to, well, I, yeah, I'm going to create the ready function. So on ready, we're going to, <gasps> on ready, we're going to uh, connect the game event. Uh, what? All balls stopped. And we can connect it directly to process rules, but maybe we don't want to process rules instantly. Sometimes, um, you know, I guess in most cases you would process the rules immediately after all the balls have stopped. Sometimes maybe you want to process the rules also after, like not when all the balls have stopped. Well, that's fine because you can still call, call it. If you want, you can start with just processing rules right away. Dot connect. As soon as that happens, go ahead and process rules. Ularis. It doesn't seem that I just my spidey sense is tangling here. I don't like that. Anyways, at a certain point, you start getting like a spidey sense for this. Um, okay, so, well, fine. It process, it's going to process the rules, but eventually we're going to need the play system to be able to start playing a game again, right? So how should we do that? How should the play system be able to, should the rule processor, at this point, hopefully you should have know that the answer is no. Rule processor should not directly re reference the play system. Okay, don't do that we can still communicate with the play system to say basically like, hey, it's time to play again without processing, without um, calling the play system directly. So what we're going to do is let's create another game event. Um, and let's make this game event called like shot completed, I guess. I want to say shot completed. I don't want to say turn completed because the player might have in pool if you hit like your ball in like a solid or stripe ball in and you don't commit a foul and it's still your turn so i don't i want to keep the integrity of the word turn so we're going to say just that the shot has been completed and in rule processor let's say at the end of the rule processor uh code we are going to emit like once we're done processing the rules that's when we're going to say that the shot has been completed it doesn't always happen though, right? Sometimes when you finish processing the rules, like someone won the game. You didn't always just say shot completed, keep playing. But we can mess with that later, right? We can use like if statements and stuff depending on how the rules are processed. So we'll, sh we'll just say no matter what, we'll go ahead and say that the shot is completed. Okay. Um, so what happens when the shot is complete? Well, the play system should know about it because that means that let's set up a new shot. So in fact, Let's create another function and let's call it setup, setup next shot. 
Because that's something that we know is going to happen, right? We're going to have to set up the shot. And it's going to have to be a function at the very least because this is going to happen when a signal happens or, you know, secondarily after a signal happens. So we have to have this as a separate function anyways. Generally, think in terms of like writing these little defined functions. Okay. And well, what happens when we need to set up the shot? Well, our Q stick needs to be visible again, right? Like, look at the strike ball. Like, Q stick became invisible. <laughs> uh, we got, got to make it visible again if we're going to set up another shot. Uh, it's got to be visible. We're just going to set it back to true. Not tour, true. And um, what other thing happened? Well, when we did cue ball hit, we admitted that, if you remember, the overhead cam checked to see that, hey, look, the cue ball has been hit. And so let's make this overhead cam the current camera. So we got to set the camera back. We got to set the camera back to the aim cam if you're going to set up another shot, right? Now, remember, there's ball in hand mode and pick a pocket mode. And in neither of those situations would we consider that to be like setting up a shot, right? That would be a different function, right? So let's not worry about those things yet. Let's just talk about setting up um, an actual like shooting a shot. And so we need to have our stick back and we need to have our looking back. So let's, well, how do we do that? Do we even have that? I don't. We don't. We have the cue ball, we have the aim container, we have the cue stick, and we have the animation player, but we don't have the aim cam yet. So let's go ahead and export that. Aim cam. What is it? It's a camera 3D. And so let's go ahead and select our play system. You know the drill. Click and drag in. Ooh, woo, wapo. Inspector first. Aim cam. And drag it into the new aim cam variable. Very good. And uh, we're going to set it to be the current camera. So aim cam dot make current we decided was the function that we used. When does setup next shot happen? Well the setup next shot happens let's just do the simple thing first. I'll just change it later. Similar to how we just connected process rules directly to the all balls stopped. Let's go ahead and connect directly the shot completed to that setup the next shot. And again we'll refactor it once we like get a little bit more complex. Um, so in the game or the play system script in the ready function, um, I'm just going to do it right here at the top. <clears throat> game events dot shot completed. We're going to connect that to what did we call it? Set up next shot, right? Yeah, set up next shot, and get rid of those freaking pre baked pizza trash. You want to take and bake pizza if you remember. Take that, bake it when you want. Okay, call set up next shot whenever uh, the shot completed happens. So this should be everything, right? The balls emits that all balls have stopped. The rule processor receives that all balls have stopped. And then it calls process rules. Process rules completes processing the rules. And it emits, hey, the shot has been completed after it's processed the rules. And the play system receives the shot completed and calls set up next shot and it should make the stick visible make the aim cam current you might be like that doesn't seem very readable does it the answer is kind of you're right part of the problem with these signal systems is they can be hard to follow sometimes it's like you're it's like a breadcrumb trail of signals but if you want to have your separation of concerns and you don't want to just have everything just willy-nilly inside of a single script which you don't want to do which you're also still going to have to be chasing things left and right it's still better to keep things organized into meaningful or scripts that are meaningful to the specific concern that it has been uh, for which it's been designed. Okay, there's no perfect solution in game programming, so don't get too excited. All right, don't don't let some like swindler tell you like, hey, hey Oop is dead, Oop is dead, long live blah blah blah, or something like that. Come on, folks, don't fall for it. Object-oriented programming is still here. Inheritance is still here. Composition is still here. Signal, like it's all here. Okay, just use it when you should use it. Don't let some bigot tell you. I'm like telling you over the internet, like don't let these toxic bigots tell you what to do with your code. And it's true. Tell them Shaban sent you and then they can beat me up. All right, um, very good. Just don't misrepresent me. Don't 
tell people that Siobhan said that you should do everything or some I don't know. In fact, yeah, say that. Don't say other things. <clears throat> All right, let's hit play. Let's make sure it works. Okay, cool. We shoot the ball. Cool. I'm glad nothing went in the pocket because it'll never go to sleep. It just it falls forever. Well, look at that weird arrangement. That's kind of weird. Oh, ho, ho, ho. It worked. How well did it work, though? Let me shoot again. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> Can't shoot again. But we went back to the aim mode. We went back to. Well, did we? We didn't go back to the aim mode. We went back to the camera being current. We went back to the stick being visible. But we actually did not set the play state back. So before you get too, like, you know, eager and be like, yeah, let's set it back to aiming. Because that's what happens when you set up the next shot. Okay. Be careful. Okay, this is a think mode. This is a think moment. Be careful. If you say we're now back in aiming mode because we're setting up the next shot, how does the play system know we're in aiming mode? Well, it's because it's setting up the next shot, right? Because the shot's complete. Okay, well, the shot can be complete, but the shot being complete right now means immediately call set up next shot. But the shot complete might actually lead to the ball in hand mode because the shot's complete, but you first got to place the cue ball back on the table. The shot's complete, but you first have to select which pocket you're going to put the eight ball in. Okay, well, so suddenly we're not going to immediately call set up next shot. So how does the play system know what is the next play state? How does it know? Here's the thing, just because it's the play state doesn't mean that the play system needs to always be the one who sets it. That might sound scary because it's like this, we have a play state variable, it has an underscore. The play system should not let anyone else set it, right? Let's be careful here. Let's think about this for a second. The rule processor knows if you committed a foul. The play system shouldn't know that it shouldn't know anything about fouls or what counts as a foul like oh the ball went in the pocket oh the ball didn't hit anything oh the ball hit the wrong thing you know whatever it is that the foul is inside of uh, billiards right or inside of pool so the rule processor in some which way knows the idea of hey it's a foul and it knows that by it being a foul it means that we're gonna have to do the ball in hand thing right you're like, should it know that? Shouldn't it just be processing rules? Look, this rule processor should be like the umpire. Okay, like in tennis or whatever, like baseball or whatever the heck. The umpire, the referee, doesn't just know the rules, but the referee or the umpire is telling you what is the next play, the next action, right? Ball went out, 1530, you know, this new balls, give them new balls uh deuce that was a let replay it you know what i mean the umpire like the players are just doing exactly what they know how to do which is to play they they in like perfectly professional tennis they shouldn't have any say in whether it was out what to do if it's out they're not the ones keeping score they're not the ones calculating score they're not the ones seeing if it was a foul they're not the ones who say hey i'm serving i'm not it's not it's, this is not my side I don't have new balls. They don't know anything. They just play the game. And that's how we want it to work here. The rule processor is going to process the rules and it's also needs to know what current the current state of the play is so that it can change the state of play because the the state of play might not directly have to do with the player playing, which seems kind of weird for the play system, right? So let's not overbook our play system yet because as soon as we start saying, "Hey, it's now in aiming mode," Now we're starting to imply that it knows more than it should. It doesn't need to know that it's in an aiming mode yet. Someone else can tell it that it's in aiming mode, but that means they have to access the play system script, which is what we don't want to do, right? So now we're in this conundrum. This is why you're taking, why you're watching this video. How do we solve this problem? See, this play system might not be the only one that knows 
or needs to know what the current play state is. So in fact, I don't think we should monopolize the play state in the play system, even though it seems reasonable, but there are other parts of the code that should know what play state it is. You might have like some kind of menu system that should know what the play state is, generally speaking, perhaps, or other things like that. <clears throat> well, we have to think about this a little bit further also, because what about the game labels? See, we're just thinking out loud. The labels in the game that say like, this is its current player one's turn. The player one should now be shooting the ball. The label should know that you're in the play state aiming. Right? The, the label will say, hey, the player should pick a pocket. Well, how does it know that? If it doesn't know the current state of the game. How does it know what player's turn it is? Should the label system be attached to the rule processor? No, don't do that. Should it be part of the play system? No, don't do that. It should be a separate thing entirely. So we need to pass some basic information about the state of the game to everywhere in the anywhere that needs it in our system. But stop for a second, because you don't want to immediately be like, oh, let's just make a giant singleton. That's what a lot of people do. And, you know, necessarily, that won't necessarily be the worst idea. Um, but again, let's try to think about it a little bit deeper. Because if it's a singleton, and we want to test the state of the game when we're in this play state, and it's this person's turn, it, these people are stripes, these people are solids. This is how many balls that are left. How can we do that? How can we set that up? If it's a singleton, it's not really easy to do that, right? What we're gonna have to just like go into this singleton for the game state and just like like change a lot of the default values. Uh, well, you can do that, but like, how do you swap things out? Different different type of rule sets. What are you gonna do? Just change those willy nilly? You have two singletons. One called debug singleton. One called like release singleton doesn't sound good. So with all of that in mind, something that should maybe come to mind, but it probably doesn't unless you have more experience with this kind of stuff is we're going to create basically like a portable singleton. Now, I don't mean like a, the rule processor being its own node. When I mean by a portable singleton, I mean like a cartridge <laughs> that you can just plug in with the values you want to test or continue to you know you know test in the release state of the game or whatever game mode you want to test or whatever it is you want to do you want to just be able to change those values plug it in and test each system individually we can do that by creating a resource okay what we're going to do is we're going to create a script but this script doesn't necessarily allow you to create an instance of an object in memory it allows us to create an instance of a file in our file system and that file is going to possess the various values that represent the things that we want different systems to be able to know about for our game to work. So we're going to create the game state.gd file, but it's not going to be a singleton. It's going to rep, it's going to be a file. The game state is going to itself be a resource like a JPEG or acoustic.res. It's going to be a resource that we can plug in to whoever needs it. Okay. This might sound scary. That's okay. Just bear bear with me. That's what we're going to do. <clears throat> we're basically creating a snapshot of values, like a singleton whose values we can save. Pretty awesome. You can be like, well, can't we just create like a JSON file and just like load that into a singleton? <laughs> okay, well, yeah, but that's Godot has this built in and it gives you way more privileges than just like some random JSON text file. So if I right click scripts and I create new, we're going to create it directly. We're going to create a new script. We're not going to put it in the auto load. We're not going to attach it to a node. No node at all. Under the scripts here, we're going to put in the scripts. Okay, good. Thank you. It's like, oh, I like where we're going. I'm going to actually put you in the scripts folder by default. Instead of new script, I'm going to call it game state. GD. But I don't want it to inherit node because again, this is not going to belong to a node. This has nothing to do with nodes. We're creating resources. Unfortunately, we can't just like click this is a resource script because I guess this is just generally not very well known as a solution. And this is something that is really can be a really great idea. It's going to inherit resource because it's a this is going to spit out resources. Okay, not objects in memory. I'm going to click create. 
it doesn't open automatically, so I have to open it. So under game state.gd, I'm going to double click. It extends resource. And I'm going to treat this like a singleton for now. What are the things that we want our game states to be able to share with like the, the game labels, right? The like HUD, the heads up display, the rule processor, whoever needs to know about whose turn it is. Let's say whose turn it is. That's a good one. I'm going to say export. It's like export. Well, let's just start with there. I don't want to throw you off too quickly. And we're going to say the current player ID. And this is going to be an integer. I'm not going to set a default value. It's either going to be zero for player one or one for player two. Okay, that's a generally a pretty good rule of thumb. That's a very common thing in uh, game engines to assume that player one is is indexed zero. It's very helpful for a lot of things we'll worry about in a second. And we also want to know what the current play state is, right? Bar 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 variable uh, current play state. And what is it? It's an oh, see, suddenly the JSON is not gonna is not as good as this. It's a play state. Whoa, we can just write it out. It took a little while for it to like realize that we're okay. Okay, cool. But here's the thing. If we want to be able to modify these characteristics of the file directly in the inspector, we have to export them. So let's do export. <laughs> Annotation. Because technically the resource can have private variables if you know they somehow it depends on how you're using the resource. All right, so very cool. Now, what I want to do is I want to create a new game state. But we're not going to create a singleton. We're going to create a new file from this game state. You can create a new file, a new resource. Um, let's go ahead. Well, we are, this whole thing is a res resource folder, but I want to create a new folder altogether called resources. So I'm going to create a new folder. It's going to call, be called resources. You can call it game states, actually. Maybe that would have been better. I'm just going to call it resources because it's kind of more in line with the fact that we're talking about the type of asset it is. And under resources, we can do create new and we can do resource. Not a script, not a scene, a resource. And it's going to be like, what kind of resource is it? Well, are we going to say game state? Well, here's the problem. Game state is not available. It's because it's not a type yet. In order for it to be a type, it has to have a class. So we're going to say class name game state okay this is a game state we're going to create an instance of a game state but not as an object in memory but as a file so with right with resources right click the resources folder i'm going to click create new and i'm going to do a uh, resource but this time i'm going to type game state and there it is we're going to create a resource of type game state which happens to be born from the game state gd script click create where do you want to put it put it inside of the folder called resources because that's we right clicked and chose anyways that's fine and um we should do this for every uh not for every game state but for every like you know like we can have basically a rule set for snooker we can have a rule set for whatever we don't necessarily have to do it through resources but at the very least we want to have maybe a release game state or a production game state which represents like the state of the game when we actually release our game, which possess the default values that we expect the game to, to have when we actually release the game. And you can create now, there it is, right? It's release game state, but I'm going to right click. I'm going to do create new and under script, uh, whoops, resource. I'm going to create another one, but this one is going to be called, I guess, debug game state. So this is one where we can just kind of like mess with values or we can have a particular test that we want to be able to test. If we're doing unit tests, it's useful to have a particular set of values that we are trying to test to make sure our game is uh, robust. So under release game state, I can, if I double click on this, notice how in the inspector, I'm not modifying a node, I'm modifying this TRES file. And we can modify, what is the current player ID? By default, it should be zero. What about the current play state? Oh my gosh, you can choose between aiming and balls in play right there inside of the inspector. That is amazing. Okay, you see how that works? Pretty awesome. 
we can change those values for the debug game state. But for the release game state, we want to start the game like that. For our debug game state, we don't necessarily have to start with the menu. We have a resource that basically specifies where do we start. There's a number of ways we can use these. All right, um, I don't get too ahead of myself here. Who cares about this release game state? Well, the rule processor cares about it because the rule processor is who's going to be able to say whose turn it is. So under the rule processor script, what we're going to do is we're going to export a variable called game state. And it's going to be of type game state. Because this type exists now. Remember, we have class name game state. But since we are exporting it, how can we drag it in if it's, you know, like what? We drag in the TRS file. So with our rule processor selected, remember, it's not a singleton. Well, it is, but it's not an autoload singleton. We have it available right here to be able to drag in this game state. One of the advantages of using this node for our rule processor. We're going to drag in release game state. Drag and drop. Boom, we have it accessible. We can now use it. Oh my gosh, isn't this amazing? Okay, this is very cool. Who else cares about it? This is another aside that I should have mentioned before about the resources, which is if it were a singleton, then everyone has access to it everywhere all the time, right? Anyone can say game state dot whatever. You are tempting all of your programmers and yourself to say game state dot something to modify it directly. In this case, by using these resources, you are only exposing it to the scripts that specifically need to know about the game state. The ball doesn't need to know about the game state. The ball rack doesn't need to know about the game state. Only the rule processor so far needs to know about the game state, and perhaps the play system can know about the game state because the play system needs to know. What is the current play state? It needs to know because it's the one who's handling the play. So let's come up here. And actually, I'm going to get rid of play state. I'm not going to get rid of it yet because it's going to start like throwing errors and like breaking my autocomplete. But I'm going to create a new variable. Actually, I'm going to create it up here. Edpor, okay, ex export ver game state. My gosh, we are late. And it's going to be of type game state, just like our rule processor. And what we're going to do is we're going to select this play system. We're going to drag in the release game state into our new empty variable game state. And we're dragging in the same one because we're testing the systems together. If we wanted to, like I said, if we wanted to test this unit test, this particular play system script, which is a, not a, that's a weird thing to unit test. The rule processor makes more sense to unit test. We can unit test this thing. But when I say unit test, I don't mean like run the game and see if it works. I mean like creating a test suite that doesn't even necessarily run in Godot. And probably will, but like you create a whole separate, maybe even a project potentially, where you are just inputting. This is what's called dependency injection. I'm going to write that down just so like you know. Dependency injection. Dependency injection is the idea that instead of receiving values from an object that you now are depending on, right, you are receiving the values to do like a function, right? When you call a function directly, like for example, the ball script, this setup ball, we're basically injecting these values inside of here. We could hypothetically test this setup ball function isolated from any ball racks by passing in those balls, those, vari those variables directly. This is what we call dependency injection. We are injecting the things that it depends on. That's generally better because it keeps things decoupled. So this is kind of a form of dependency injection by using a script, uh, sorry, a resource like this because we're, we're able to separate our rule processor. It doesn't know anything about anything. We're just injecting kind of like a function, just injecting variable uh, values into it. And we can change those values set them and test them separately to make sure that our rule processor behaves the way we expect it. All right, very cool. Um, what does the play system need to know? Okay, well, it has our game state. 
we need to change every time that we use play state with the game play the game state's current play state remember the game state has a current play state variable so in the play state play system script i'm going to go ahead and comment out the play state and let's look where it yells at me okay enums.playstateAV. okay so instead of play state is equal to that let's do game state dot current play state is equal to that does it go all the way to 80 no let's spell game state correctly so the game state resources current play state is it equal to aiming cool this play state is checking hey or we're now saying balls in play now here's where you might like over refactor you might be like wait should we instead now create a function called ball struck and then inside of the rule processor it sets the play state to balls in play i mean okay you could do that if you really wanted to but it that can also get hairy by doing separation of current concerns it doesn't mean like one script changes the state always okay the the play state always that doesn't mean that it, it kind of leads to that sometimes but sometimes when you just do this what you're doing is your stupid rule processor is just going to have a bunch of stuff called like ball struck set game state you know this set game state and that's all it does that's not how the rule processor is supposed to work necessarily it's okay for the play state to be set directly within play system because it's the ball it's it's striking the ball okay there's no other thing that can happen other than the balls are now in play okay all right it might seem like some of the things i'm saying seem to be like contradictory and you know you might make a good case for it to some extent depending on it this makes sense to me but might not be sensible to you this is your project i'm just trying to tell you how i'm like i like to think so instead of setting the play state we're setting the game state's current play state okay very cool but again we haven't yet got back to aiming right we could do it here like a, but let's we're all back to the same place let's say that the umpire says whether it's time to aim or not the umpire says we're in ball in hand mode umpire says we're in select the pocket mode the umpire says you're, you can aim now okay let's say the rule processor says that so before we say the shot is completed let's change the state of the, the game so game state dot current play state is equal to uh enums dot play state dot aiming now you're like okay well see we'll use an if statement and stuff right depending on what the outcome of processing those rules let's try it out cool so far so good we shoot the balls We've told the resource that we are now in balls in motion state. Cool. Once it stops moving, all the balls are going to be stopped. It's going to execute that signal. The rule processor script received that all ball stopped, it called the process rules function. It changed the state of the play, the current state of the play, in the shared resource that. Both the play system and the rule processor are using and it said it's to aiming mode let's see if this is the moment of truth we we're able to shoot the ball because the play state received this the resource the same release uh, game state resource as the rule processor when it made that change kind of like a game state singleton with extra features and safeguards and all sorts of stuff that we already talked about it's not going back to the play state why because if you were paying attention one of the darn balls fell in that pocket and it's falling forever so it will never go to sleep and all balls will never stop well that's a good segue because we gotta make it so that these balls that fly off the cliff like that um, go into a pocket are actually 
stopped so that we can complete our shot. So let's set up our pockets. Okay, now that we hear brain might be like frying with all the like, oh my gosh, resources and sales and all the process. You betcha. All right. Um, what are we going to do? Let's set up the pockets. Let's do something simple. So the billiard table, okay, it has walls. It has a surface, but it doesn't have pockets. See, pockets are actually going to be a little bit different, potentially, in that each pocket might, it needs to do more than just like be a static body hitting things off the wall. The pocket needs to detect that a ball has gone into it. The pocket also, it could be useful, like you have to be able to select the pocket. When it's select pocket mode. The pocket probably should have some kind of type, like this is the top, you know, left, or they should maybe at the very least have like zero, one, two, three, four. Like they have to have some kind of ID once you've selected them. So we're probably going to want this to be its own scene. That's okay. Let's start by using the billiard table so that we can use it as a reference point for how big these pockets need to be. So with the billiard table selected, I'm going to create a new node and it's going to be an area. All right, like you might be like, why shouldn't it be a static body? It's like, well, static bodies don't know when they've been touched. Okay, I just want to be clear. If I select this static body, I go to node, you'll see there's nothing in here about hey, this wall has been touched. They are very simple. Static bodies are extremely simple. It's like, why don't we make a rigid body? What, a rigid body that doesn't move? Like, come on, be serious. We're going to make an area. Just like in Area 2D, there are Area 3Ds. And what do they do? They detect when something went into the area. Perfect. Pockets need to know when something went in the area. So I'm going to create a new area. <clears throat> now, eventually... Maybe you're going to turn this into a node 3D that has like multiple areas or something. So it's like, you know, an area that you use for selection. You know, you can refactor. It's not a big deal. I'm going to call this area pocket. And <clears throat> this pocket needs to know how big it is. And we do that with a collision shape because an area by default doesn't have a size, it needs a shape. So collision shape 3D. And actually, while we're here, notice how the it, we have area entered, area exited, body entered. That sounds good. Like when a ball, that's a body, right? Shooting pool, shooting pool. All right. Go back to the inspector. Why are we going back to the inspector? Because we're, okay, we're, because we're adding a shape here. What is it? I mean, if you really wanted this to be as like optimal as possible, you could do like a sphere or something in the pocket because like a sphere just like detects how far it is from the radius, basically. Let's just do a box. I mean, come on. The sphere is weird. <laughs> I mean, it's up to you. Make the pocket however big you, how, you know, whatever size you want. But here's the thing. What's more important is how big is the pocket going to be, like the area. So I'm going to go back to top view. I'm going to put it inside of this pocket. But here's the thing. Does it really need to be in the center? Because, like, when is this ball ever going to touch this part of the pocket? Like, what the heck? Is it going to bounce off of nothing? Bounce? Like, no. It's never going to hit that part of the pocket. So let's just keep going. So that it has a really big area to catch the ball. It flies over into here. And it'll definitely enter this pocket. Okay? But I don't like necessarily the height of the pocket. Because I don't want it to touch the pocket before it even falls off the table. So I'm actually going to move it down. So right as soon as it goes into the pocket, it's going to touch this area. <laughs> okay, very cool. I'm going to come back to pocket, and we're probably going to have to change the position of the shape anyways, because notice how the shape is like offset from its parent. So I'm going to make this pocket its separate script, because like I already explained, it's going to be a little bit more sophisticated than like a wall. So I'm going to right click on pocket, and I'm going to do save branch as seen. I'm going to call it pocket.tscn. We're going to put it inside of the scenes folder. Um, it would be prudent to create a node 3D called pockets so that they're organized and we can kind of like expand and hide them. 
but wow, it's late. We've been going at this for a long time, so let's go ahead and I'm just gonna like allow them to be all ch ch siblings of the other junk. Um, but I'm gonna come into this pocket uh, scene first by clicking on this little scene button, and I don't like that the collision shape is so offset from its parent because the pocket's gonna have to be in different places, so it's not gonna necessarily be in the same offset. It's gonna just kind of be really annoying. So I'm actually going to transfer. Like I like the size of it, but I'm just gonna reset the position back to the middle of the pocket scene. And now inside, back into the billiards table, I'm going to move this pocket down, pocket area, and I'm going to come back into top view, and I'm going to move it back to like a kind of a nice place, like a one meter wide, like little pocket radius, little pocket monster, pocket monster. Got it. Anyways, uh, let's go ahead and control D. I'm gonna put one here. Control D. I'm gonna put one here. And I'm gonna select all three and I'm gonna do Control D. And I'm going to zoom out. I'm gonna put them all up here. Okay. It doesn't have to be perfect, all right? These pockets are pretty darn big. Okay. I'm gonna come back to the pocket scene by clicking on a little tab. We have enough pockets, but we want to be able to detect when the ball has entered it. You may be like, should the ball know that it went into a pocket or should the pocket know that it went into a ball? Or that, I guess it's the same thing, right? Depending on your relative motion. All right, whatever. Should, should the pocket know that a ball went into it or should the ball know that it went into a pocket? Well, here's the, here's the, here are the breaks, folks. With the rigid ball, the rigid body selected, you'll notice that there isn't an option under rigid body to, to check to see if it entered an area. That's not a thing. It's got to be in the area. The area is the master of knowing the things that have gone in it. <laughs> okay. So the pocket is going to detect that the ball went into it. Okay. That's what we're going to do. And so we're going to do that by creating a pocket script. So with the pocket root node selected, I'm going to create a new script called pocket.gd, but we're not going to put it in scenes. We're going to put it in scripts. I'm going to click create. And delete. All right. And I'm come back to my uh, 3D view by clicking the little 3D button. <laughs> I'm like telling you as if like you haven't figured that out by now. And with the pocket selected, I'm going to choose one of these. What's the best flavor of ice cream today? The body entered flavor. Okay. This emits, uh, this signal emits whenever any body, which include balls and static bodies, so you got to be careful, enter inside of this area. So if I double click on body entered, I'm going to attach it to the pocket node because that's the one that has the script. You can see it right there. In fact, we can't add it to this because it's like, what the heck would you add it to? There's no script. Very cool. On body entered is fine because that's the default. Click connect. There it is. On body entered. <clears throat> and uh, well, what are we going to do with this on body entered? something right this is where we kind of have to have a think moment so the think moment that we want to have here is this body might be a ball it might be a wall it's starting to sound like dr seuss it might be a cat receiving a call okay um but what we, <clears throat> well, we want to only check anything if the body is a ball. So that's kind of the first step, right? Which is that we want to do something if the body is a ball. Well, how do we do that? Well, we already did this like as thing inside of the play system. Remember where we check to see if the mouse motion as input mouse motion. And we could do the same thing. We could say like body as ball. And if like, you know, true, like we could do that. That's fine. That would actually be totally fine. We don't want to do this though, because this means that we are assuming the body that's coming in is a ball. And technically it's an error if this on body entered function is called and this is not a ball. Technically that is an error and that might actually crash our game. So we don't want to do that because we don't want to insist, like we don't, we can't specify statically type that the body is a ball unless 
it is for sure going to be a ball every time. Instead, we're going to use an if statement. And we're going to check, hey, is the body a ball? If the body is ball. And you can do that because we have a class called ball, right? And it will only work if the body possesses a script whose class is ball. Now, what happens in this moment, right? I'm going to say pass for a second. So we know this is a ball. And there's a couple of things here. Okay, that we have to think about. Which is that um, the ball, things need to happen to the ball. The ball needs to go to sleep. The ball needs to stop falling, <laughs> right? The ball needs to be moved out of the location, right? I guess we can have it like kind of appear there, just like floating inside of the pocket. But that might look weird because like, what if another ball goes in there and it's like overlapping the other ball and they're kind of just like like overlapping each other? It might look weird. We can actually make it an actual basket so that the ball actually sits there and like goes to sleep with other balls. That would probably be not a bad thing. Well, I thought of it too late. So we're doing this. This pocket, it, like the ball is going to have to just like disappear basically. It's going to go under the table. It's going to be hidden. And it's going to go to sleep. Should the ball make itself go to sleep? Or should we have the pocket make the ball go to sleep? This actually is a... This is a good question. You know, the well... So, what can happen here is we can... Like, when the ball has entered this pocket, that's actually a situation that a lot of people may want to know. Like it may be even like a label that says like, hey, they potted the, this two ball. Maybe we want that ball to like appear in the label as like a little icon in the label to show that this player has earned another ball. Um, maybe, uh, well, the rule processor needs to know which balls have been potted. Maybe they need to know immediately. So it would be useful for us to have a signal that when a ball has been potted, this, this happens. So that we know for sure, because we're confident that this is a, this is a meaningful situation the ball has been potted. So I'm going to come to game events. That's a good way to kind of break it down. Dude, what you know needs to happen. So signal um, ball potted. You might be like, what the heck is a ball potted? And then you're like, yeah, that's what it's called. I, I didn't make the rules. It's called ball potted. We can come back to shooting up and balls and pot. and Like, okay. I don't know who came up with this game. All right, so ball potted. Uh, cool. But this is one of the first signals where just the fact that the cue ball has been hit itself isn't like the entire meaning of the signal. Knowing that all the balls have stopped is itself the meaning of the entire signal, right? But the ball being potted, like it would be useful to know which ball was potted, right? And it would also maybe be useful to know which pocket it went into. Right? Because if you're going to know if you are in the win state, it needs to know if the eight ball went in the pocket and it went into the correct pocket. So ball potted needs to know not only which ball was potted and also which pocket it went into. Now, this doesn't actually do anything at all. This is just kind of like a, like a, like a description thing. Like This doesn't even need to exist and the signals will still work. It's entirely optional. But it's useful because it's like saying that I want the signal to expect these types of things when it's been emitted doesn't actually do anything. all right so under pocket we know that we're going to do that so we're going to say game events this is when it happens right game events dot uh, ball potted dot an emit and specifically the body which is the ball and self which is the pocket as we said is the body ball yeah well okay then this is the ball um all right and then we're passing in the pocket who needs to know? Well, the rule processor needs to know, right? But before we get to that, we want to like decide. We want to set the ball so that it's asleep and it's out of the way. Um, well, who's going to do that? This is a, this is the question, right? So we now we have a signal, so we know we can do it in different places because we have the ball. The ball we can put it anywhere we want. Well, whoever receives this signal can do it. The rule processor can do it. Should the rule processor do it? Uh, no because the rule processor just handles rules. It doesn't move balls. Okay, I, that, I guess that's what I decided. Should the play system do it? 
No, because it handles play system. Should the ball rack do it? Uh, no, because the cue ball can be potted. It has nothing to do with the ball rack. The ball rack only really spawns balls. So don't think about that. Right here in the pocket? Like body dot do stuff? Actually, that's conceivable because the pocket already knows it's a ball. You know, it's conceivable to say that it's meaningful to the pocket that the pocket knows what to do with the ball because the pocket is like, you know, to place the position of the ball. Because actually, if you look carefully at this stupid billiard table, the pocket each has like a little like gold, like ball catch. Like, you know what I mean? Maybe the pocket has additional stuff where it sets the position of the ball right here so that it can gently roll into the ball catch. Like that would be kind of cool. So actually it's perfectly conceivable for you to modify like the ball directly because the ball doesn't need to know anything about the fact that it's in a pocket. So I kind of am tempted to just right here start doing stuff with the ball. But even so, even if we do it here, I think that the body, the ball should know how to set its own freeze state, like the sleeping state. And so that we can just call a single function, kind of like how we did ball dot setup ball. I think that we should do that inside of the ball. So let's go inside of the ball and start working on that. Um, so no matter what, the ball should be frozen if it's been potted. So we can do it here. We can create a function called like, you know, freeze the ball. I really do like that. Okay, sorry, I'm doing enough thinking. Okay, um, I recommend doing that, but you know what? I'm gonna do another way, not because I think it's the right way to do it, but because I wanna show you another way to handle this type of thing and to show you that it's not the end of the world to do it this way. I don't like this as much as doing it in the pocket just off the top of my head. But let's make it so that the ball handles itself. So how would you even do that? So in the ball script, let's say it needs to know that a ball has been potted because it needs to know that it needs to set itself to be uh, asleep. Well, well, we have to connect ball. Let's create a new uh, function. So on sleeping state changed, let's do a uh, function on ball potted. It takes a ball and a pocket to pass for now and um in the ready function we're going to connect put that at the top here um game events dot ball potted dot connect let's connect it to on ball potted okay so this is going to call but here's the problem because this ball on ball potted is going to be received on all the balls because if we've connected it on ready then every ball is going to receive this ball potted signal so whenever a ball has been potted what's going to happen is every single ball is going to receive the ball in the pocket that's been potted inside of this function so if we were to say like self dot position is equal to like I don't know, like under the table. I, we're getting lazy here. We're getting sloppy because it's late. It's magic number, like a half a meter under the table. If we do that, look what happens when we pot a ball. All of them go under the table, right? Because again, all of them are going to receive this, are going to have this callback function executed when any ball has been potted. So in order for this to work, we actually have to check to see if the ball is. Oh, no, we're not trying to check its class. We're trying to check if it is exactly equal to this particular ball. The ball that, um, you know, again, if there's 16 ball on ball potteds that are going to happen all at once, only one of them is going to be this ball. Right. And if this ball happens to be the one that was potted, the lucky ball, this is almost now like Powerball. Are you the lucky ball? Yep. OK, go under the table. It's like, well, that doesn't sound fun. Well, I never said there's a fun game. All right. Ball is self. If the ball is self, then put, it, put its position under the table. So now if I, you know, shoot ball into the hole. 
only that ball, like the rest of them don't go under the table. Just the cue ball goes under the table, right? So that's good. I wanted to show you this because this looks awful. It's happening 16 times, right? And in order to be able to know which one is which, you, ha you have to say ball is equal to self. This is bad. I don't, well, I mean, that's the thing. It feels bad. But unfortunately, there will be situations where the pocket actually isn't the most obvious thing. The most obvious thing might be the ball. It might be the most obvious thing for the ball to do this, to do on ball thotted. That might be the obvious thing. Sometimes we don't know like which one is which and therefore we know how to like call them directly or whatever. Sometimes we want to apply it to something that we don't have like immediate access to that reference. So in this case, it's like, or maybe the separation of concerns doesn't make any sense for it to do it in that script. And it really does make sense. The best one might be this. And so I want to show you that it's okay. It's actually not okay if like this is happening all the time on like tens of thousands of balls. It's not okay if you're just doing it on a enclosed system. Okay. If it's an enclosed system and this is part of like play system, for example, have the play system handle it. But the pocket is not part of the ball. They are totally separate systems. Okay. So you have to kind of make a compromise. And sometimes this is actually the best way to do it. To say, hey, have I was I the one that was potted? It's not a big deal. Checking to see if something is equal to something, even if it happens every tick, is not necessarily the end of the world. If there's tens of thousands of these things, then it starts to get a little sloppy. So be very wary of this. I just want to show you that it is okay to do it this way. Just be kind of careful. All right, so how do we tell the ball to stop moving? Well, we can say self dot sleeping is equal to true, right? Sleeping. If true, the body will not move and will not calculate forces until woken up by another body. That sounds good. <clears throat> but here's the problem with this, and I'm just going to let you know right off the bat because it's kind of a, it's kind of a, I don't know, it almost seems like an oversight in the engine. Because if we say sleeping is equal to true, is it going to emit this, this, um, sleeping state changed uh, signal. If I come back to the ball and I look at it, I hover over on sleeping state changed. Okay, well, it doesn't seem to tell me anything, does it? This is just where we just, like, this is a potential problem waiting to happen. Inside of the ball script, I'm going to actually go to rigid body. I'm going to look at the documentation. Look at the signals. Sleeping state changed. Emitted when the physics engine changes, physics engine changes the body's sleeping state. Note, changing the value sleeping will not trigger this signal. It is only emitted if the sleeping state is changed by the physics engine. Or you explicitly call emit signal sleeping state changed. I don't like that it's a string reference, so let's try to avoid that. We can. So I'm going to come back to ball. And well, we can't just say self dot sleeping is true. We have to say self dot sleeping state changed dot emit. Hopefully that'll work. We don't have to actually do like emit signal. In fact, the fact that it tells you to use emit signal tells me that this is pretty a little bit out to out of date because like we now have this ability to call us directly on the signal. Let's try it. Okay, here's a problem. I want to hit another ball in. I don't want the cue ball to go in because if I do the cue ball, then it's going to like mess up everything, right? Because we don't have a way to put the cue ball back on the table. I want to be able to hit a, another ball in. But look at this. Like when I'm going to wait, I have to wait. Programmers don't wait. Programmers just like the tests. I mean, no, they don't, but they like to. I mean, yeah, okay, you can play the game, but oh my gosh, this is going to take forever. Okay, let's, no, immediately let's stop doing that. Now, of course, you can be like, why don't we just take a ball? like instance and just drop it right inside of the pocket so that we can test it. Okay, I mean, you can do that, but you're kind of now opening up the possibility that the play state, like that the game state is not perfectly reflective of what's happening in the game now that we have the ball rack. We've made it relatively robust, but I just want an excuse to add a cheat mode. Let's add a cheat mode. I want to make it so that we can roll the ball around whenever the heck we want. <laughs> this is not a very good way to like set up testing this. That's part of the reason it's useful to set up things in a simple manner that you can inject values to test things because a game like this is annoying to test because it depends so heavily on physics. So if I do games, 
play state, right? Placed system. Inside of the play system, let's make it so that we can just like create a cheat. And we're going to make the most glaringly bad cheat mode there is. Okay. Let's create a function called uh, process cheat mode. <laughs> okay. Process cheat mode. And uh, what it's going to do, we're going to say the cue ball. We're going to just like apply a force to it every tick. And um, let's be really lazy. Just the vector three right here and now. And let's make it so that we have to add the extra break. Yeah, extra tab. Um, <clears throat> well, this is the X that we're setting, right? There's this, and then there's this, and there's this, right? There's X, Y, and Z. We're setting X. Okay, let's look at the table. Positive X <clears throat> is towards the foot spot, negative X is backwards. So if we're looking at this in terms of like uh, top view, okay, so if we want it to move right, we want it to be right is positive X, left is negative X, up is negative Z, um, down is positive Z. Okay, we've been reminded. So X, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do get in, input dot get action strength. So our keys, let's do, WASD. Let's just use the ones that are built in. UI uh, right. In get action straight, it's either going to be zero if the UI right is not being pressed, and it's going to be one if it, the action is pressed. UI right. Okay, uh, very good. And what do we want to do with this? Let's uh, subtract, just adding like another line break. Input dot get action strength of UI left. Okay, so you see what's happening here? Uh, let's go ahead and create, uh, I'm going to use a leading uh, comma because it just, like if you don't have this and you just have something like start typing here and you have the comma at the end here, I think this looks really bad. Like it's very, it's hard to, like it looks like you're like making statements. We're very clear that we're actually just setting uh, arguments of this vector three constructor. <clears throat> so comma, what, y, well, zero, right? Nothing's happening on the y. The z, we're going to do get action strength. Uh, what was it again? Dot down was up, <laughs> right? UI down moves the z up. Subtract by whatever it is that's going to be going down. UI up. Okay, this might look very scary to you, but this is not like a code architecture thing. So what's going to happen is if both are zero, then it's going to be zero. If UI right is one and UI left is zero, then it's going to be one. If UI left is one and UI right is zero, well, zero minus one is going to be negative one. You see how this works? It allows us to be able to set our vector this way. Where are we going to call process cheat mode? Well, I guess we're going to have to call it in the process function. You're like, what about, shouldn't you put it in the, like, the, the physics process function? Yeah, you should. I'm not going to. <laughs> this is the cheat mode, folks. You're like, are you seriously? Like, what about input, like, integrate forces? Shouldn't you put it in there? Wasn't that the best place to apply force? Yeah, maybe. Probably. Okay, see, look, I'm able to move the ball around. Okay, it's moving way too slowly. Blah! It's got to move faster. Process cheat mode. Uh, let's multiply this vector by, I don't know, five. <laughs> All right, cheat mode. We okay. Look, it moves a lot faster. Mm, can move even a little bit faster. But the point though is like, yeah, okay, we can do eight. You're like, shouldn't you create like a variable that you expose to like change this? Mm, yeah, I guess so. Might be probably good. Let's just use a magic number though. I don't really care. 
It's like, should you do apply central force? Isn't wasn't there like a torque one, like apply torque, and this is like a rolling ball? Yeah, but then like you have to worry about like which axis it's rotating over, and so it's kind of like you have to think a little harder. And I don't want to think, so let's not worry about that. <clears throat> Isn't this like not frame rate independent? Like every process tick, like what if our frame rate was slow? Wouldn't this like be doing this slower? Yeah, it would be bad. <laughs> make it independent isn't this like gonna be one zero one in one zero zero like isn't this gonna cause a pro like it's if we move diagonally the ball is gonna move faster than if we move the ball like sideways see like if we move diagonally look it moves faster than if we move sideways because like the vector hasn't been normalized and one zero one the length of that vector is the square root of two because the pythagorean theorem one squared plus one squared is two divided by you know, the square root of two instead of one zero zero which is a magnitude of one shouldn't we do like dot normalized here yeah but that's like 10 letters that i have to write i don't want to write them i just want to be sh like i i just want to be clear with you folks like you're taking it too seriously this is fine okay this is my cheat mode all right it's not going into production i'm using this to cheat to test my game I'm deliberately making it stupid as long as it works. Okay. Don't expose variables. Don't worry about all this stuff. Don't worry about magic numbers. Like, I'm just really want to let you know how much it really doesn't matter that, like, you have a cheat mode that follows all the rules. Okay. The reason we have a cheat mode is so that we can, like, knock stuff in pockets. Go in the pocket. Go in the pocket. Now, is it going to go to sleep? Didn't seem to go to sleep. Went in the pocket, right? So, anyways, but we we're able to test that very quickly because we're using this cheat mode thing. All right, you know, like, just as like a personal note, like I like to add stupid stuff in. Like, have you ever like put sand in your hair just so you can like scratch your head later because it's kind of fun to pick the sand out of your head? Yeah, I hate to admit that, but like as a kid, like I love doing that crap. Like, this is kind of like that. What you're doing is, like, this is easy the heck to refactor. Anyone can refactor this. All right? This kind of gives you an out for, like, procrastinating or procrastinating refactoring. Procrastinating, right? Where you, like, you, you know you've got to work and you just at your computer and you don't, like, you're kind of fried. You're a little tired. Last night was a long night. And you just want to just, like, do easy stuff. This is exactly what you're doing. You're throwing yourself a bone so that you can get work done without really getting work done. You know what I mean? Like you're you're doing easy junk. So leave junk like this so you can clean it up. It's it's not a big deal. Um well we have other problems, right? The fact that the ball is potted. We try to set its freeze mode and it didn't do anything. So what gives? Why didn't it do that? Well, let's figure it out. We gotta figure it out. So um in the ball, it knows when it's been potted. It knows when its sleeping state has changed. I'm actually gonna bring this sucker back. Number of balls that are moving. Currently zero. Cool. Cheat mode. Get in the pocket. It also gives you something to do, you know what I mean? Ball's moving. One. That ball didn't go to sleep. That ball fell in the pocket. It didn't go to sleep. Why didn't it go to sleep? Well, let's think about it. If we set a sleeping state to true, we said that the sleeping state has changed. But what is sleeping actually doing? The body will not move and will not calculate forces until woken up by another body. Example, collision apply impulse is it possible that gravity is being applied to it because it's not under anything that makes sense because if you set a ball to sleeping in the middle of the air shouldn't it fall if there's nothing underneath it then it should fall is there a way to say like more than just sleeping is there a way to be like no it needs to be like totally not doing anything let's look at it freeze that looks pretty good 
if the body's frozen, gravity and forces are not applied anymore. That looks good. So self dot sleeping, we still got to do that because it's still got to be asleep. But let's start first uh, freeze it. So what is it called? Free frozen? What? What the heck is it called? The state is called freeze? What the heck? Okay, that's... Is that like a carryover from the physics engine? Okay, that's not a good word for that. This is a verb, for folks. I don't know if you know, but whoever's like working on this engine, freeze is not is is not a noun, or is is not a. What is that even called? Sleeping, frozen. Okay, I suddenly sounded so smart until I wasn't so smart. But freeze is definitely not the right word. That's like an action. That should be a function. Freeze the ball. Okay, freeze is equal to true. Let's see. Will this work? Let's try it out. Go! All right. Go in the hole. That was fun. Okay. They all went to sleep. Perfect. So the gravity was the problem. And shoot a ball. Oh my gosh, this is awesome. We're hitting balls in pockets and it's letting us go to our next turn. Let's go ahead and knock this darn solid ball in. Check the time every now and then. My God, it's so late. Can't believe how long this tutorial is. All right, um, all balls stopped, and it's this horrible like texture thing going on. If I would love to fix, that. we just do not have time to fix that. All right, um, awesome. Let's go ahead and we can unprint that again. You can't print. You can't unprint what's been printed. That's the rules of print. Once it's in. Once it's in the newspaper, you can't take it back. All right. Um, uh, but it worked. We had to freeze it and sleep it. Because remember, it's the sleeping state that is how we're handling this. It's not the freezing state. Makes enough sense. Because we don't want it to be in the frozen state forever because we want it to wake up. Great. Cool. Uh, what do we got? So the ball, we handled that the ball is potted. Okay. It emits the signal on ball potted. That ball potted signal. Ultimately, we want the rule processor to do something about it. But mm, let's worry about that later. Let's worry about that when we're like dealing with the rules of the game. Let's take like a short break. Let's create the lab like the HUD. Okay, which says like whose player, like whose turn it is, and. And uh, like what the that person is supposed to do. Let's go ahead and do that. We don't have any way to show like whose turn it is. So before we even start like talking about like the rule processor, like we want a more you know effective way to be able to show like what whose turn it is. So you would think let's go to 3D mode, but actually we're gonna have to go to the 2D mode because the HUD. You know we're gonna create a HUD. Right? It's going to say, like, it's going to have a label to say whose turn it is, and there's going to be a label to say what, you know, they should be doing on their turn. So with the main selected, I'm going to click on create a new child node. So there's going to be two labels, basically. And those two labels, I don't want them to have separate scripts. This is like the play system. Let's create a HUD system that handles all of the things that are in the HUD, including, like, their avatar, including the other stuff. Don't make a separate script for every label and every like box. Let's create a whole separate kind of global box. We're going to create a container. So I'm going to click plus and I'm going to create a new control. We can kind of look at the controls. There's different kinds of containers. What kind of, oh my gosh, there's a lot of them. Let's just do like the most basic one. This is a margin container. It's, it's basically just a container that allows you to like set, you can set the margins actually without this margin container, <laughs> frankly. But let's just do margin container. This is not a like, controls and labels and stuff class so let's do it fast i'm going to rename hud uh margin container to hud everyone knows what hud stands for it stands for um hug your dad 
everyone should be should hug their dad if their dad is still around and they're not an awful person. It's also the housing in urban development. Right? Okay, no, it's a heads up display. Everyone knows that. All right, so let's go. I'm going to create a new child node. They're going to be a label. Play it up on the label. Label. And it's going to be the, uh, what should the label be called? Player label? Player turn label? Eh, player label. It's fine. Let's create a new node. It's going to be a label. It's going to be called uh, instructions label. <laughs> instructions label. It's like, you know, it's what you get in the, in the box. Tells you what to do. Okay, um, I want the player label to be on the left and I want the instructions label to be in the middle. I think that's better. So to do this, what I want to do is I'm going to make the HUD as wide as the top of the, the viewport. Now, this game might be played on this phone, which has a different aspect ratio than this phone. So instead of worrying about exact pixel locations, which is not a great idea, Let's use this little like set anchor preset to this top right one, which says I want it to be as wide as whatever the viewport width is. I like that. Um, player label, what do I want it to say? So under inspector, I'm going to have it say like player. Uh, one, I guess. Just so we have something that it's probably going to say. You need to say player X, I don't care. Player one, and what does the instructions label say? It's going to say, uh, it's going to tell the player what to do. Um, aim and shoot. Ugh. Now, notice how it's like they're overlapping each other. That's because the margin container doesn't actually do anything with the like labels overlapping. If you wanted to do that, you would do like some kind of like horizontal, you know, split container type of deal. But I actually don't want to do that because this that actually make it difficult for you to center the label, the instructions label in the center, right? It would be just the center of the rest of the uh, container. So I actually do want it to be simple, like a margin container. And um, this instructions label, I want it to be horizontal alignment. Let's make it center. Okay, cool. This is looking really a lot better that I want it, but there it's too small. Like I can hit play and just see what it looks like. Okay, cool. It says aim and shoot at the top. It says player one at the top. They're small and they're kind of just like there's no margins. Like, that's why we have a margin container, right? Let's make them bigger. So with the player label selected, under the label settings, I'm going to click on new label settings. I'm going to open it up and under font, I'm going to change it to, I don't know, like 24. That looks actually pretty good. But before you do exactly the same thing and like open up the label settings for your instructions label, they are going to be the same font and the same size. Well, maybe they will, but let's say maybe they won't. But in this case, let's say they will. So what I want to do is I'm going to stop for a second and I'm going to save this label settings. So under this, I'm going to choose save. And I guess put this into resources. It's a resource file. And let's call it, um, I don't know, HUD font settings or something like that. And... Um, the instructions label with it selected, I'm just going to click and drag HUD, HUD font settings over to the label settings. So now when you modify it in one place, it'll modify it both because they're both getting from the same file. Okay, cool. That was fast and easy. Don't, you know, don't be too scared of doing stuff like that. Under the HUD, we want to go under, I think, theme overrides because that's like, I guess, a theme of this container. It's not very intuitive, but that's where it goes. And uh, we're going to add a left margin. So I'm going to add, uh, what's it, a good, like 10, let's just do 10 pixels from the left or density independent pixels. I'm not sure how it would work on a mobile device. When I do that, okay, notice how it's moving both the player label and the center thing to the left. That is not how it would work if you're like doing a website. The margin wouldn't affect it. But it affects this. So I'm actually going to have to on the margin right, let's set it to 10 also. So it moves this centered thing back to the right but the player one labels still fine because it like ends right here see it ends like it's not actually gonna be affected um going back to the margin container i also want to move it like i guess 10 pixels from the top hey that looks actually a lot better when i shoot the ball it still says aim and shoot okay well that's not good we don't want to just continue to say aim and shoot we'll fix that maybe in a, in a minute All right, so, well, when is it going to change? When is it going to be like player two? 
You know, when are we going to change the instructions? Well, at the least we know that we're going to have a script for the HUD. Let's start there. It's going to create a HUD and we're not going to put it inside of scenes. We're going to put it inside of scripts. And this is where it's like, okay, so it should be lowercase, even though it's like an act, it's this all caps acronym thing, but that's fine. And I get rid of all this. And we know that we're going to modify the player label and instructions label. So let's go ahead and export those. Like do what you know you can do. Don't think too hard about it. Don't get out the stupid whiteboard and start drawing like a freaking like crime scene investigation. All right. I know some of you want to do that. And that's fine. Do it if you want. But in my opinion, motivation follows action. Okay. Not the other way around. Action doesn't follow motivation. You don't just suddenly magically become motivated and then you start working. It usually works rather that you start working action and now you're motivated to keep going. So just start doing stuff that you know how to do. You know you're going to do this. Just start doing it. Um, this is going to be the player label. And uh, it's going to be a, a label. And this is going to be the instructions label. Where's my AI to write it for me? You know what I want. Come on. Do the rest. AI. Where's my AI? I'm like saying, where's my AI? And it's going to like take my job. As if I have a job. Like, what am I talking about? I mean, I'm a teacher at a university, but like, I guess AI will take that too. Well, you know, I welcome them. Good luck, AI. Teach the students. Teach them well. <laughs> the kids are in your hands. I, robot, the kids are in your hands. All right, player label, instructions, label. Cool. We're going to set them. How? When? What? So now we got to do a think. Why do we have to do so many thinks? Uh, well, we have to do a think. So we already decided a long time ago. You remember it wasn't that long ago, but it was long enough ago that we had stopped worrying about it or thinking about it recently. Our, we did this whole stupid resource thing partially because we knew that like this game state was going to be needed by things. We already decided that it would be annoying to try to like pass around some kind of like dictionary of values through signals all over the place just because we want to avoid using singletons. We already figured out that that's what we we created this resource because whoever needs to know whose per turn it is and who the current play state it is should get to know that. Okay? This is not some willy-nilly place to do it. This is where we have a player label saying what whose turn it is and an instructions label saying what they should do. This is a perfect place for us to know what the heck is going on with the game. Game state. Come on. All right? That's why we did it. Don't get too ambivalent. We're playing pool, right? It's supposed to be fun. Okay, well, here's the problem now. Like, when are we doing it? Well, if we look at the game events we already have, are we going to change the label when all balls have stopped? No, because it doesn't know anything about what's happening at, at, in the game when all the balls have stopped. Maybe it's ball in hand mode next. It doesn't know that just because the balls have stopped. Shot completed? No, this is the same problem. Like, we can't just check on shot completed because it's like, I mean, I guess we could. We could say in the HUD, if shot completed, then like go to aiming state. But like I said, remember, maybe the shot has been completed, but we're now in the ball in hand mode, right? That's like after the shot was completed. So you can get yourself in trouble. So really what we want to do here it has nothing to do with these game events that we currently have. Kind of, maybe. Cue ball hit, I guess. That's a good time for us to be like, hey, let's turn off our label. Right? But ultimately, really, when the current play state... No, what am I doing? When this game state changes, like when the current play state changes, that's a good time for when the instructions label to change. Because our play state is what kind of instructs what the instructions label is doing. If we're in the aim and shoot state, then we should aim and shoot. When the balls are in play state, we should not have any instructions. When we're saying pick a pocket, we should say pick a pocket, right? Which just sounds like an <laughs> not something I'm telling you to do. Go pick a pocket, please. Come on, you pocket picker. You pick pocketer. You pickety pocketer. Anyway, that's a good time to do it. Whenever this game, this play state changes is when we should do it. 
So should we like create like some kind of ridiculous list of like connections? Like, okay, well, the game state changes when the cue ball is hit. The game state changes when this happens. The game state changes when this happens. Let's not do that. Instead, how about we just create a signal that will fire whenever the play state changes? Why not? Why don't we do that? That's what we're going to do. Let's do exactly that. So um, <clears throat> let's create inside of our game events. We're going to create a signal. And it's going to be play state. Or should it be? I guess. Play state changed? I think that's pretty good. Okay. And inside of our HUD, we want to do something like, let's say, uh, inside of the ready function of the HUD, we're like, we're doing it kind of out of order this time. Instead of like when it's mitted, let's say like when it happens. Um, blah. It's generally better to do like when it's emitted because I like thinking that better. When does this happen? And then worry about what the subscribers do when it happens. Because a lot of times when you're like, when should it happen? And you think about it and you're like, there's not really a good place to put it. Um, in this case, we're just going to do it the other way, just to show you that you can be a really broken-minded person. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, well, what, what's the function that it's going to do? Well, it's going to update the text, right? And here's where we're going to like, you know, update the player label and update the... Um, what's your problem? Oh, yeah, because we haven't done anything with it. Um, let's go ahead and do game events dot play state changed dot connect i'm doing this first because like we know how to do this and what i'm about to show you is something that you haven't known how to do so let's do this first <sighs> and update text is what should be called whenever the play state is changed let's update the text you might be like shouldn't it be like update instructions text yeah probably but we can refactor that that's a light decision that's a light decision we can refactor it. don't stress about it but what we should think about is when is this play state changed? Well, here's the thing. It gets changed in both the processor, the rule processor function and the play system, which at this point you might be like, see, that's part of the problem. N no, even if it always happened in the rule processor, it's still annoying to call that stupid signal. I'm like being pretty brash here that stupid signal every time you change the state you might be changing in multiple places right like when the ball is plotted let's call the signal well i guess that doesn't change the state of the game but you know what i mean like if we process everything through these to have you know it change the play state through the rule processor it could be changed in multiple places and what are you going to call it every single time no the best place to do it is just where is the play state itself where is the play state you know the play state happens in where the game state what this darn resource file yes this darn resource file whenever this changes because that's when it changes that's the important thing the current play state is the variable that changes right so what we're going to do is whenever it changes whoever changes it let's make something happen okay that's what we're going to do how do we do that though how do we detect hey this is changing so let's do something as we change it that's where we use a, what we call a setter function. Whenever you are doing something a little bit more fancy, when we either get or set one of these variables outside of just getting or setting the variable, a setter or a getter function or a setter function is a great thing to do. So I want something to happen when we set this play state. So I'm going to create a colon here, and I'm going to use what's called a setter, which is the set function. All right? And it's kind of like a function, but it's not. Okay? <laughs> It's not quite like a function. It looks like a function, but you can only put it in this way and it has to be called set. All right. And here's where you, you pass a value, which is basically the value. And some people will be like, just always call it value. It's like, mm, it should always be a new play state, right? Whatever the new play state is. But with that being said, I just want to point out that this is not a function. You cannot say, well, it has to be, you know, a play state. Like, you know, it has to be the play state. Well, it's probably gonna yeah it gets mad at me it's like what are you doing what what's happening what the heck 
it doesn't like it, okay? Because it's not really a function, okay? And also, this is inferred. Like, of course it's going to be a play state because that's what we're setting. It can only be a play state because when you set the play state, the setter function is going to be called with whatever you're setting it as, and it has to be a play state. So it's, this is not a function. It's redundant for you to say that. This is definitely going to be a play state. Okay, so well, what is the things that we need to do? Well, we need to change the play state, right? The current play state is equal to like new play state. That's something that needs to happen, obviously, whenever we set a value. But also we want other things to happen, including we want the game events. Specifically, we want the play state changed event to be emitted. See how that works? So if we didn't do this, this is the default case for all of these variables. Current player ID, the default set is current player ID equals the value. So it's kind of pointless to create a setter that does that. We only really create a setter if there's something additional we want to do with, whenever that particular variable is set, which there's a number of things that could potentially be the case. In this case, yeah, we want to say, hey, I've been changed. This is a very common pattern, a very common pattern. Whenever you want to notify everybody that this variable has been changed, regardless of who changed it, this is an awesome place to put it, right here inside of the setter. It's like, hey, I've been changed. Current player ID, hey, I've been changed. Create a setter for it. So this is a very common um, kind of pattern. So the HUD cares about when play state is changed. So, uh, okay, cool. Now we have this updated game state, but let's make sure that it's added. Notice how if I hit the HUD node, currently the game state is not loaded in. So let's click and drag release game state into it. And what are we going to do? Well. Um, let's make it so that the player label is updated. So player label dot text is equal to player one. No, that's why we're doing this. String what the game states current player ID. Now remember the player ID is going to be either zero or one. So you might not have thought of like you can have hit play, but like I have the four. I know that this is something we're going to have to add one to. We're not increasing the player ID by one. We're just saying. If it's player ID zero, we'll make it one. If player ID is one, make it two. Because that, you know, human beings don't like seeing player zero. Like, what? Well, I'm not player zero. What are you calling me? A loser? All right. Um, and for the instructions, well, I like I just started going right away. Let's 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 do the same thing. I know that we're gonna have a problem here. Instructions label, because like it isn't just always going to be the same thing, right? Instructions label uh, dot text is equal to what? It depends, right? It depends on whatever the stupid text is. So uh, whatever the play state is. So let's create a, a string that by default is nothing. OK, this is a very common way to handle things. By default, it's nothing. So we're going to say that this is equal to new instructions. This way, this is the default case. We're basically creating the default case. It's an empty string. So whatever happens here is what is going to change new instructions. OK, well, it depends on the state. If it's the ball in hand state, it should say, like, place the ball on the table. If it's the pick a pocket state, it's choose your pocket for your eight ball. If it's the aim and shoot state, well, it's shoot, aim and shoot. So here's where it's like, this is actually a good place for a switch statement. There are no switch statements inside of GDScript, but there are match statements. And it works exactly like a switch statement, but like slightly more powerful. And I'm not going to talk about all the different ways that you can use the match statement. The match control structure. I don't really like calling it a statement. Anyways, um, and what are we matching on? We're matching on the game state's current play state. And just like a switch, except you don't actually say the word case. You just start writing what you're matching. Supposing that that current play state is enums.playstate.aiming. Let's set new instructions to be equal to aim and shoot. And you know what? Nothing else, right? In fact, I'm going to put them right next to each other. Nothing else because we don't have any other states. You're like, well, what about, you know, ball in, balls in play? Well, we're going to go with the default in that. We're going to go with that. I'm not going to create another match just for that. I mean, I guess you could, but I'm not going to bother.
You can be like, couldn't you use the like default state for uh, for the match, which is like the stupid underscore? No, I'm not going to do that. Readability. What? Underscore? What the heck? Okay, look it up. The match statement use the underscore to mean like the default. I mean, okay, if you know what it looks like, then fine. It's like, you know, but don't, you know, just set, I, I like to set the default state here and just change the state as it goes. <laughs> My opinion. I mean, it doesn't always work that way. But anyways, hit play. And remember, I didn't actually emit this play state changed anywhere except for that setter. So when I shoot the ball, doesn't say aim and shoot anymore. Doesn't say aim and shoot anymore. Just as player one. Okay. And I don't know, hit a ball in just because whatever. <laughs> Get in there. <laughs> slow the ball down. Hey, that's another feature of cheat mode that we can slow the ball down faster. Comes back, says aim and shoot. Awesome. We now want it to say player one or player two, depending on the rules. And I'm afraid that I'm going to lose this recording. This recording is long. Like, I should freaking hit stop and hit start again. You think I should do that? I think I'm going to do that. So I'm going to stay in exactly this position, and I'm going to hit stop, and then I'm going to hit start immediately afterwards. Okay, I'm going to, like, stop. Start. Okay. <sighs> Hopefully it's saved. All right, that's one of the risks of doing this ridiculously long tutorial. <laughs> what happens if I if something happens? It's like the file's too big, and then it like crashes it. Whew. All right, let's keep going. Um, what did I say? Yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna make it so that um, <clears throat> like we actually change who the player is, and we do that by the rule processor. Finally, our rule processor that does basically nothing is gonna have to start processing some rules. But for it's a, I should eat something. Oh my gosh. It's like been what, 12 hours? I'm out of water. I'm going to have to eat Master Chief. I've got a chopstick for it. Um, so what are we going to do? Well, let's, okay, we're going to have a big think moment for now. <sighs> There's a lot of things going on here. Not only does the player label not update, but also like who is solids and who is stripes? We shouldn't update it after every shot, right? Because only if they hit the right ball in, right? If you hit the right ball in, then it doesn't change their turn. Oh my gosh, I guess we have to do that. We have to figure out, well, how many balls are left, right? In order for there to be like a win condition. We have to figure out, well, when has a foul happened? So that we can, you know, go into the ball in hand mode and we can set the cue stick, the cue ball back on the table. Let's just get this through. But all of these situations depend on what depend on what happened during that play what happened on the stupid table that is what's going to dictate whose turn it is a foul like whether the cue ball went in the pot like all that stuff depends on what happened during that turn so how are we going to process the rules we have to know what happened during that turn how do we know what happened during that turn? I guess we're going to have to get the big old list of balls out, right? No. Not the big old list of balls. The balls don't need to know anything. Balls don't need to know, hey, I hit this ball. Hey, I won in this pocket. I'll remember for you so we can go through a big old list of balls. Don't do it that way. I can guarantee someone's done it that way. I don't like that. Don't do that. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to consider what are all the meaningful things that can happen while the balls are in play? Okay, what are all the meaningful things that can happen? I'm going to actually just like scoot around on the screen while I'm doing this. What are the meaningful things that can happen? Well, one of the meaningful things can happen is that a ball went to a pocket because that's what determines who is solids and who is stripes. That's what determines if the player keeps their turn or not because if the cue ball went in, then they lose their turn. So that's when we know that that foul is committed. But there are other fouls that can be committed. Such as, what if you hit the cue ball and you don't actually hit any other ball? That's a foul. So you only would know that if you know which like balls hit other balls. So when a ball hits a ball, that's a meaningful thing that happens. When a ball goes into a pocket, that's a meaningful thing that happens. Technically, when a ball hits a cushion, that's a meaningful thing that happens. Because in some rules of pool, and someone's like, it's every single rule of pool. 
if you hit the ball and you hit your suit first, but it your ball or any other ball doesn't go in a pocket or hit a cushion, then that's a foul. So you have to know when a ball has hit a cushion in order for you to not know if that's a foul. Also, if for it to be a valid break, at least four balls have to go into a pocket or a cushion. So you got to know when a ball has hit a cushion. So ball hit ball, ball hit cushion, ball went in pocket. All of those are meaningful things that have happened for the rule processor to know what to do, for the rule processor to decide if it's been a foul. It's scalability. Scalability. We might not have all the rules yet, but we want to be able to add the rules as necessary as easily as possible. And the rule processor can handle it. But for the rule processor to handle it, it needs to know what happened during the turn. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up a system of occurrences. We're going to call them occurrences because I don't want to call them events, and I definitely don't want to call them signals. <laughs> occurrences is like a synonym for event. S scenario that happened. I like it, occurrences. It's also kind of spooky, and things have been spooky. Shadows didn't appear. That's about it. All right. Um, <laughs> what we're going to do for occurrences is this is going to be a type of data that keeps track of what happened in that occurrence. Whenever you're dealing with a type of data, oftentimes it's useful to consider it inside of a class or a struct. We can't use structs in GDScript, so let's not even think about it. We're going to create a class called occurrence. And this occurrence is going to know whether, like, what happened in that occurrence, right? I'm going to say pass for now. And you're like, what are you doing? Why are you creating it here? Why don't you create like a separate? I have to create a colon. Why don't you create like a separate file for it? Like we already did class name, like etc. and other things. Because who knows what an occurrence is? Who cares about what an occurrence is? Nobody cares about what an occurrence is except for the rule processor. No part of your script. In fact, I want to be very deliberate about this. I don't want to accidentally start worrying about occurrences anywhere but the rule processor because I want to be very explicit about this separation of concerns. Only the rule processor needs to know what an occurrence is because that's the only thing that's going to be processing them. Okay? I'm going to add some freaking octothorps just so that we have, you know, occurrence class classes or something like that. Now, I say classes because we have created what's called a nested class. This class is now only available to be created within this script. It's like, you're like, no, actually, technically, if it's a singleton, you can like do blah, 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 dot occurrence. Don't, don't give me lip. All right. <laughs> this is a nested class, which means you should only use it inside of this class, <laughs> generally, with some exceptions. But there are different kinds of occurrences, right? There's a ball to ball, ball to cushion, ball to pocket. So we're going to create a different type of occurrence called a pocket occurrence so that we can create, we can assemble a list of occurrences. All of the occurrences fall into a list of occurrences because the order matters, right? Sometimes it matters that you hit this ball and then it hit a cushion. If you hit the wrong ball first, then that's a foul. If you hit the, the, the ball of a different suit than yours, First, that's a foul. You need to know the order, and they should all be in the same list of occurrences. But we can say what kind of occurrence they are and specify their uh, properties based on that kind of occurrence. So what does a pocket occurrence need to know? A pocket occurrence needs to know um, uh, that it's a ball, that there's a ball associated with it, right? It also needs to know the pocket. A pocket occurrence needs to know the ball and the pocket that happened in that occurrence. Okay, it's like, wait a minute, what's a pocket? Okay, well, got to create a class name for pocket now. And you're like, isn't that like kind of except? No. Saying a class name is just like an alias for the script. Okay, it's not a big deal. Class name pocket, it's fine. When you created the script, you created a class already. So don't, don't get don't be plussed about it. Be nonplussed about it. Right? I just wanted to add something. It was kind of a dumb thing to add. All right. Go away. Hey, it went. Okay, so pocket occurrence. Okay, we want to keep track of a big old list 
of occurrences, not a big old list of balls. So I'm going to create a variable that only belongs to this, and it's going to be called occurrences during shot, I guess. And what is occurrences during shot? It is an array. But it's not just any old array. You can specify that the specific stuff that's in this array. It's an array of occurrences. Okay? When does a pocket occurrence happen? Well, a pocket occurrence happens when a ball is potted. Huh. Let's create a function called on ball potted. Hey, don't we already have one for the ball? Yeah, we do. What is it? No, what is it? It's a ball and a pocket. We can even be specific and say it's a ball. It's definitely a ball because we're only calling it when we know. We're only emitting it when we know the ball and we know the pocket. And what we're going to do when the ball is potted, we're going to create a pocket occurrence. And this pocket occurrence is going to be a pocket occurrence. Dot new. That's how we do new in GD script. It's kind of like, you know, C sharp. You say new pocket occurrence. It's fine. Here's a new pocket occurrence. Well, what do we need to do with the pocket occurrence? Well, we need to say what the ball in the pocket were so that the pocket occurrence can know what ball in the pocket it was. Now, you could create a function that you have in the occurrence called like set occurrence. You have blah, blah, blah. You can create another one in here, said set. set or we can just not bother with that and just set it directly because, gosh darn it, it's just got a couple of properties. Let's not freaking get overzealous here, all right? It's okay. Sometimes it's okay. The pocket occurrences ball is the ball. The pocket occurrences pocket is the pocket. Okay, see? Belongs to a pocket occurrence. We create a new one. It's going to have its own pocket and its own ball. And we're assigning the property, that property, to the ball in the pocket that we received from the signal that's going to be emitted. On ball potted. Right? We need to connect that signal. So game events. Dot ball potted. Why is it called ball potted? Someone tell me. Someone please tell me. Why is it called ball potted? Why is it called ball pocketed? Is it called a Pottle? Is it called a pottle? Is it called a pot? What? Anyways, connect. Uh, which thing are we connecting it to? Uh, on ball potted. Why you automatically call that function in the context of the connect method? Whatever. It's not a big deal. Keep Godot small. Put this extra two 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 lines between functions and classes and stuff. All right. Oh, but there's one last thing we need to do, right? We need to add to our occurrences during shot. This is where I get to be reminded. Okay, it's a, it's called append. <laughs> All right. Okay, append uh, what? A pocket occurrence. So every time a ball goes into a pocket, we're going to append that pocket occurrence into that occurrences during shot. Does that make sense? And now inside of... The process rules is where we get to evaluate our occurrences that happen during the shot. So we know that we're going to go through this list. So again, we know what's going to happen. So let's just start writing. It helps us think, it helps us jog our minds sometimes. I need to do that. Stay awake. Uh, not funk. See, this is what's happening. Uh, it's going to be a loop, right? We know that there's going to be a loop in here. Right? For occurrence. Why did we have to choose a word that's so hard to spell? How many R's are in this darn thing? All right. Um, in, instead of just like 15, like we're not, we don't want indexes. We want like a for each loop basically. And so we say in the uh, collection, which is this uh, occurrences during shot and uh, something. <laughs> okay. So for every single occurrence, we get to do something. <laughs> okay. Well, what are the things that we want to do? Uh, well, sometimes they are a pocket occurrence. Sometimes they're like a ball to ball occurrence. But I'm going to say if the occurrence is a pocket occurrence, 
Now, okay. Okay. Yes. We could have done like occurrence as pocket occurrence and then done like some kind of if that way. We could have tried to use a match in some kind of way. You don't have to overdo it. Expression, type, occurrence, so it can't be of type pocket occurrence. Uh, yeah, it can be it. Oh! Sorry, hopefully that wasn't too loud. Yes, yeah, so a pocket occurrence is not an occurrence yet. Anyone who was like, why haven't we done this yet? You thought right. Good job. I award you one. Siobhan, good job. Praise. Compliments. That's high. Don't spend it all in one place. All right. Um, class pocket occurrence extends occurrence. Now we know that a pocket occurrence is a, an occurrence. Now it's like, okay, well, that's fine. Now we can say that it's a pocket occurrence. We can ask if it's a pocket occurrence because it is an occurrence, right? For occurrence in occurrences during shot. Remember, occurrence is an occurrence because it's in an array that has to be an occurrence. We specified that. And it worked. It worked. Static typing works. It worked. It told me that we had a problem. It did. We had this problem. All right. Um, so what happens when the pocket occurrence, when the occurrence is a pocket occurrence? Well, there's a couple things. We want to know, hey, was it a solid ball or is it a stripe ball? Was it the eight ball? Was it a cue ball? Right? So like there are some things that need to be checked, right? Like, you know, handle eight ball and cue ball, right? But let's start by um, test checking to see if it's a object ball. It's called an object ball if it's a solid or a stripe ball so that we can assign who is solids and who is stripes because that's like kind of the very first thing we need to do in order to know whose turn it's going to be <laughs> in the future. So that's going to be the first thing we want to check. We want to check, was this ball, and we know it, it was a pocket occurrence, so we know there's a ball involved here. So var ball, which is a ball, is equal to occurrence, specifically this occurrence, dot ball. Remember, ball is a property of the occurrence, and it's definitely a property of the pocket occurrence. So we want to check, is this an object ball? So how do we check? Well, we can say dot ball dot ball type, you know, equals like uh, solids or equals stripes, literally or equals stripes. But we may want to be able to ask that question elsewhere. And this is a perfect thing where the ball knows that it is solids or stripes or eight or cue ball. It knows that already about itself. So let's just make a public method that does the work for us to tell whomever that it's an object ball. It knows it's an object ball, but we're not going to create a separate type called object ball because that's not a type. Because either it's solids or stripes, and that means it's an object ball. So right here, so setup ball, we already have a public function here. We already have some private functions, but the public functions should be kind of like gathered here together. All right, so funk. Let's make it a question. Is object ball? Is, ob is object ball? And we don't need to know anything. We don't need to ask, like, pass any arguments into it because it belongs to the ball, and the ball knows all it needs to know. What is it going to return? Well, it needs to return if it's going to, if, if that ball type, ball, and we don't have to say self dot. I mean, we never did, but we already, um, What? Oh, because we didn't put the underscore. <laughs> well, we still can, we want to know if it's an eight ball. So we can always check, hey, is it an eight ball? It's kind of inconsistent. It's almost like, should we have said is eight ball, is Q ball? Not really, because that's what the ball type is. Like we can check that directly. We're just saving like slightly some text, maybe. Frankly, this is not this is not necessary really to have this is object ball method, but whatever. I just want to show you you can create public methods and it's totally fine for this particular case. <laughs> you know, in my opinion. Um, well, what does it need to be? It needs to it's it has to be either solids. Okay, this is definitely gonna run off the line. So I'm gonna create a 
left parenthesis, couple of indents, self. Well, hold on, we need to say or. Or self dot ball type is equal to enums dot ball type dot stripes. In this case, if this is true or this is true, then return true. Otherwise, return false. In my process, uh, this is something I got so many scripts now. The rule processor, we're going to check hey, is that ball is object ball? But we're going to ask it as a question. So if ball is object ball, I'm going to say pass for now. This is like, this is all writing itself, basically. This is, this is the, this is the love. This is the beauty. How many more, like, stare, this, you know, cliche words can we say? This is the, I can't think of any other ones. Anyways, this is, this is pool. <laughs> no, this is what's great about it because about having good code architecture. And I know good code architecture is like, you know, subjective. But at this point, you may have already, your game could have already died from technical debt. It could have like just crashed into the sea. But instead, if you have good code architecture, it's like it writes itself. I'm not even thinking anymore. As soon as I've decided, hey, let's do this occurrence system, we already have this on ball potted. We already know the ball. We already know the pocket. We are able to set up the pocket occurrence. We're able to create this list. We're able to check to see this list. We're able to know, hey, was it an object ball in this process rules? Because we already thought ahead to have this process rules function. Oh my gosh. It writes itself. It's awesome. So, um, which is good because like it is well past midnight and uh, <laughs> I need to sleep eventually one day um i'll sleep when i'm asleep my sleep state has changed all right let's uh what are we doing um well well actually one thing some of you may already throw a stink at me right through the camera you may have noticed that i haven't statically typed any of my functions because all of my functions so far have been void. You're like, well, you can still say void. Like, you can still do it. Yeah, it's probably faster. But you know what? I don't like writing the word void that many times, okay? After I write void enough times, I start feeling lonely. I start feeling lonely, guys. But when it's not void, then that's when I'm like, okay. It's actually returning something. If I see this word return, that's when I'm like, okay, it returns something. My opinion. My opinion. You're just like, well, it's still faster. To... No, I don't care about that. You know what? They should update GDScript to automatically assume I mean void. I'm kidding. <laughs> but anyways, let's keep going. Um, so yeah, it returns bool. Because that actually is meaningful because we're setting its value to something. Okay? It's useful for this to know that it's going to be a boolean. Okay, so let's make it so we can assign like who is stripes and who is solids. Okay, let's do a think. Let's do a think. God, too much thinking. Where do we know that it's solids or stripes? Does the play system need to know that? No. Play system doesn't need to know that. The rule processor should know it? Yes. Should the label know it? Like the HUD? Probably actually, because player won, and it should say like that the player is solid, so that the player knows to hit the solid balls. They might forget. So this is a perfect time where it's like, that has to do with the state of the game. Moreover, in our, our game states, that's a useful thing to assign automatically. Like in the debug state, we can say that this player is solid and this player is stripes, so that we don't have to like every time assign solids and stripes first. We can just set it up. This is a perfect thing to put in the game state. So let's go ahead and do this. It's like, isn't this a function? Shouldn't we have like two lines? That's a good darn question. Like, it's starting to look bad. Okay. As soon as we start like having too many of these exports, all this game state does right now is export variables. It's like, this is what I mean. There's no like hard and fast rules for the universe unless you're in an HOA. In which case you follow the HOA's rules. 
But let's say that, you know, I don't like that it's all so close together, okay? I like it better like this. That's how my resource I like to be. Okay, we're going to create a variable. Here's think number two. How are we storing this? Are we saying like player zero suit or something? What if there's three players? You're like, why would there ever be three players? Do not ever underestimate your designer's ability to feature creep. <laughs> because some players of some pool games, it's like you go by numbers, right? It's like number one through four is player one, and numbers five through eight, you know, or whatever. Ah, uh, okay. Five through seven, or not eight, but nine. Just get rid of the 15 ball. 10 through 14. I don't know. Okay, whatever. Just they're going to come up with it. Just. <laughs> so instead, like, let's assume there's going to be more than one player. We already know that our player ID is going to be either a zero or a one or potentially a two. So what would be nice to be able to extract the player suit would be for it to be an array. Because if it's an array of like player suits, like solids or stripes, then if we get the array at index zero, the current player at index zero, you get to get their ball suit. This is part of the advantage of having a player ID like this, because you can have all of the various characteristics of the player, of the different players in an array, each individual arrays, where each index of the array is associated with the player ID. You might be like, wait, shouldn't you just create like a player class then? that says like this thing and that thing and then have like an array of players. Yeah, you can do that. But I like to keep it simple for now. We can always refactor. I always say like we can always refactor. We've already kind of like went with this, so let's go with it. <laughs> oh, I'm like laughing about it. I'm like, ha 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 ha. Uh, okay, well, let's, <laughs> let's uh, uh, export this uh what is it going to be let's say ball suit the reason why i say ball suit is because it's really the balls suit like are we really going to go into enums and create another thing called player suit and also call it solids and stripes let's not do that because if we want to check the ball against the player suit then like it should be the same type so let's come back to the game state and the ball suit <laughs> by Player ID, oh, that's not a great name. But I'm just going to call it that anyway. Okay. And uh, what is this going to be? It's going to be an array of what? Ball suits, ball types, enum.ball type. That's what it's going to be. Ball suit by player ID. It's called enums.maltype. Sometimes you have to wait a couple seconds. All right, so now if I come back to like this release game state, you can see there it is, ball suit by player ID. It's an array. This is kind of confusing a little bit, but it doesn't know how big the array is. We, we didn't say how big the array was. We can't really say how big the array is unless we give a default array, which we can do. We can say like equals and then like set up the default values. I don't want to set default values because I don't want to hint at what the default values should be. Because I want there to be a debug game state, a release game state, and a snooker game state. <laughs> Whatever game states we want. So I'm just going to go with it. And I'm going to say there's two items in this. Solids, stripes, cue ball, or eight ball. You see the problem with this? Well, first of all, the player should never be a cue ball. That doesn't make a lot of sense. But we're just going to ignore that for now. The problem is, why are they both solids? Because the default is going to be zero. We're not going to be negative one. That's not an enum. That's not a possible enum. It has to be a possible enum. It has to be a possible value of that enum. Well, there's no, like, I'm not a thing yet. Well, gosh darn it. <laughs> so let's add that as a thing. So under ball type, let's add another ball type called, I don't know, to be decided, TBD, to be determined. You can call it none. You can call it whatever the trash you want. I don't care. TBD is only three letters, and I was already close to the end, so I'm going to go with that. Um, okay, so I saved it. Here's what I'm talking about when I say like restart Godot. We've cr we added that as a ball type. We have the release game state selected. I want to change my player suit 
to be t to be de to be determined for the release game state, and that's not an option. Why the heck isn't it an option? We saved it because Godot isn't like updating everything all at once all the time. Whether it should or not, that's up for debate. But it's kind of annoying. So when you're in a situation like this, you can always restart Godot, and that'll say like force this to be a possible thing. Another way to do it is to just break your game on purpose. So under game state, I'm going to be like ball types with Z. Check that out. It's going to be like, uh, what is a ball type? Is a Actually, I don't even think this is going to work because it's not even going to update this until I fix the error. And if I do this, it's still, no, actually it fixed it. Break your game. You could have made it like an integer first. And then like it would have become like, you know, an array of integers. And then you can change it back to ball type. And then it's like forcing it to go back in and figure out what the heck is a ball type. Cool. Now I'm going to set it to TBD for both. We don't know what they are yet. Okay. So that's very good. Next, uh, we already did the enums. Um, what else do we need to do? Well, we got to do the rule processor. We know we're eventually going to do that. We're going to deal with the HUD also. Let's do the rule processor first. We can do both. I don't know. We already kind of had some momentum in the rule processor, so let's keep going. If it's the object ball, what we want to do is we want to um, check if this... See, there's a couple things. First, we have to make sure that we, don't, we haven't already set the ball suits. And then we have to set the ball suits. So we can do that all here, but here's the thing. If the ball is an object ball, then we also want to assign like a score. We want to reduce like the number of balls that are left. It's going to be probably a pretty big little if statement here. So I want to separate this out into like their various like specific things that it needs to do. So I'm going to create a new function down here, I guess. I'm actually going to put it here because on ball pot it is. Let's keep it closer to the occurrences and let's keep this closer to rule processing. Like, don't like get in the habit of thinking, oh, it has to all be in the right order. Like, it, it, they're both private methods. Just put them in whatever order is like most convenient. Um, let's do like this. This method is going to be private. We can underscore. And here's the thing: we're not just setting the ball suits in this function. We're checking the ball suits in this function. So we're going to say check and set ball suit for players because it's for both players. Whoever, whenever one ball suit is applied all of the ball suits are applied. You might be like, well, if it's in that three-player game, well, if it's in that stupid three-player game, then we can reassess, but we're doing this. And what does this need to know? It need, well, it needs to know what the, the ball is, right? And I'm not going to do the problem that we did before with the stupid like animation player method track. I'm actually going to pass the stupid data in. Okay, and it's going to be a ball. I'm not going to create like a member variable to pass things between functions. Golly, I don't like it. Okay, well, um, so what are we going to do? We first have to check. Now, the reason why I'm doing check and set, and I'm going to actually do this here right here. So check and set. And that's the first thing we should do because the first ball you sink is going to be your ball. It's like you might be like, well, actually, technically, if you hit in two balls in one turn, then you actually don't yet know. That's why we have occurrences. You can, you can check for that if you really want to. But I'm not going to check for that. Not right now. Pass in the ball. Okay. The reason I'm doing check and set is because this is what we would call a function that has side effects. Okay, this changes the state of our game, right? It changes the balls. So whenever we have something like this and it's like a subroutine, then like it's useful for us to be clear that we might be setting the state of the game by saying set ball suit i like to be explicit about it also i like to say check and set because we could have done the check out here and then say set ball suit for players this is both checking if there's the balls if uh you know if there already has been a ball suit assigned and it's going to set it if not we're saying we're being very explicit about what this function does It'll like don't just say like some meaningful junk here. Okay, just make your function name meaningful. I mean, sure, you can add documentation if you want, but like 
make your very your stupid function name meaningful. That's more important. Okay, so well it has to check, right? So let's do if uh what? If the game state a the ball suit by player ID, if either of them has been set, then like we should skip this, right? So we should only do this if either of them is ball type to be determined, right? So if like zero, now this is not very descriptive saying zero like this, but really it doesn't matter though because it's, it's either of them. If player one has been assigned, if player two has been assigned, it doesn't matter. If either of them have, are still uh, TBD, then we, we're gonna be assigning a ball suit. We're gonna be assigning both ball suits. So like that doesn't look great, but whatever, let's keep going. Well, how are we going to set the ball suit? Well, we are going to set it by doing exactly the same thing we just wrote. See, ball suit by player ID. But we're going to set it equal to something. But not zero, because it might, the first ball that gets sunk or gets potted might be player two. So we can't just say zero. We have to say, well, whoever the current player is. Well, how do we know what the current player is? We have that value. Game state dot current player id okay, this is again looking bad <laughs> this is looking long it's already 74 characters equals well the ball type of the ball right whatever the ball was in like whichever that first ball is is going to be the suit for uh, the current the player who's currently the current player wait okay, this is way too long in fact we're probably going to say current player id a lot so uh Let's like shorten it. Let's create a local variable here. CP ID, <clears throat> current player ID. Cut action. And we're going to do CP ID here. In fact, let's do CP ID here also because I guess there might be some version of pool where like only one person's, like if there's multiple players or something. I don't know. It just looks more descriptive. Like seeing a zero just kind of looks bad. Just like a magic number zero in the middle of our thing. So that was easy enough. The current player ID is going to be set to whatever the ball's type was. Here's the problem. What about the other player? See, when I do game state dot ball suit thing like this, what's the other player's ID? What are we going to do? How are we going to do that? Right? uh well let's do we can do some trickery right we could say like if cp id is equal to zero then other player id is equal to one if single c current player id is equal to one then okay that's awful i don't recommend doing that um instead we can just do some basic trickery the other player id is going to be well since it's either going to be zero or one and that's the same thing as true or false right generally speaking <clears throat> what we can do like i'm already like thinking too hard about this <clears throat> um well see here's the thing uh <laughs> about doing it this way is that this like trickery that I'm about to write right now or like the other player's ID is going to be something that's probably hard to read. Okay. It's probably going to be hard to read it. Um, so just keep that in mind. So, um, Let me think. All right. It's like I can't even think straight right now. Um, what if we... See, this should be something easy to do. So if we say not CPID, what's that going to be? Well, if it's zero, it's going to be true. If it's false, it's going to be... Uh, or if it's zero, then not... Yeah, it's going to be true. If it's one, it's going to be false. 
Okay, well then if we convert that back to an integer, then that works, right? Because if it's not, if it's CPID is zero, it'll become true, and then the integer version of true is one. If we say not one, then it's going to be false, and the integer version of false is zero. And so, there you go. This looks terrible. Remember readability. So what I recommend we do here is let's create a function so that we make that craziness, that like hard to readness, meaningful. So let's say get other player ID. I'm just gonna make it private for now. We can re we can um, put this somewhere else if we really need to. But so far, as far as I'm concerned, only the role processor needs to know who the players are. Like swapping between you know which player what player the other everyone else just gets the data who the player is you don't need to know who the other player is necessarily it's going to take in a player id integer and it's going to return a player id integer and it's going to return this other player ID, the CPID. Now this is a lot easier to read. What's your problem? Oh, because it's the player ID. Whatever, like if it's the other player currently, it doesn't matter. It's whatever you pass in as the player ID. Okay, let's think about this a little bit more. Um, so we have one other thing we need to do. We've set the 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 players the ball suit of the current player ID, but we want to set it of the other player ID. But what is it going to be equal to? Can we just create like an other ball type? Well, we could. You can say like get other ball type here. Like, but really, how many times are we going to be getting the other ball type? Maybe more often than not. More often than once. I don't know for sure. But let's just assume we're not going to do it in another place. Let's just do it in a light, a little bit easier to read way, and we're just going to do it here, and then we can make it its own separate function if we actually need it elsewhere inside of the rule processor, which we very well may. So um, how do we get the other suit? So this is a little uh, programming trick that's useful to know. If you, if there are two values, right, that you're picking between, and you know what one of them is because it's stored in a variable, then this is kind of a this is kind of a trick. Let's create a variable called suits remaining. And this suits remaining is going to have both suits in it. It's going to have enums.balltype.solids and it's going to have enums.balltype.stripes. Both of the suits are in this. Now what I want to do is I'm going to say suits remaining, but we're going to get rid of them. It's like, there are three in the bed, and the little one said, roll over, roll over, and then one fell out, and they died. I don't know how the song goes, but the point is that, you know, you just get rid of one. <laughs> We're going to say erase. Okay, I already knew the name of that function, but arrays have built-in functions. We can go through the documentation. One of them is, I just kind of scroll through here. There's filter, there's a blah, 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 blah. One of them is erase. If I double click, if I click on it, erase, it removes the first occurrence of the value that you pass in. So it's basically like find and then remove at that index. Basically what it does. It's very nice. So erase, what are we erasing? We are erasing the cur the uh, ball type, right? Whatever that ball type is. So if the ball was solids, it's going to erase solids from this list. If the ball was striped, it's going to erase stripes from this list of suits remaining. So what we're going to set it to is whatever is remaining at index zero. Because whatever is at index zero, I'm big in this, whatever is at index zero is going to be whatever is left. Okay? It's a trick. The more you know. I am like gonna collapse. All right, that's okay. I'm like, you know, Mozart with Salieri. I don't want to like toot my horn. I'm not trying to say I'm Mozart because Mozart doesn't toot any horns. Mozart plays the piano. Think of it that way. 
No, it's because Salieri like forces them to work Mozart to work right in that movie Amadeus. And then, I don't want to tell you what happens. Oh no, spoiler! I'm telling you that you're all gonna kill me. That's what I'm saying. It's your fault, subscribers. No, I'm joking. It's my own dumb, my own dumb fault. Let's keep going. Uh, okay, so this is how we set the uh, the ball suits. Um, so let's print it. Print. What is the ball? Not the ball. What am I doing? The game state dot ball suits by player ID. Let's just print the whole darn thing. In fact, let's just say balls. The uh, player suits. <clears throat> And we're printing a whole array, so we can use this comma. Play. Okay. Ta-da! Let's just, uh, just let it stop. Without hitting any balls in. Uh, it didn't tell me anything? Oh, yeah, because that only happens when you hit a ball in. Guys, why'd you let me say something like that? Okay, we actually have to hit a ball in, or else that's not even a print. I meant to do it like outside of the his object ball. Hey, but so far it means that it probably worked. His object ball. <gasps> Is it gonna fall in? Oh, it didn't fall in. Okay, well, here I come. Dun, da, 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 da. Okay, we hit the solids in. So player one, so index zero should be solids, right? Which is zero. Awesome. Okay, this is okay, there's something scary happening right now notice how this is going off the fritz it's like 450 4 500 600 700 why is it doing that but so far we're okay notice how it says zero and one that's good right because ball suit zero is solids player index zero <laughs> is uh you know the first index of this array right if i hit hit stripes in then the player suits like zero would be the second item because player two is the second index of the array and one is see so the, the items of the array mean the suits and which item is the player right so zero means solids one means stripes first index is player one second index is player two okay but we have a problem right it's like three thousand times did this print that sounds really bad well, a couple of problems here that potentially could be at, you know, could be related. First of all, this process rules function is happening way too many times. When does it happen? When does it happen? It happens every time all the balls stop. Okay. You see the problem? <laughs> the problem is it happens all the darn time because the balls, like, are like going in and out of sleep state because like look like see me doing this like this cue ball is probably on the fritz i don't know why but it's going in and out in and out in and out in and out of sleep states i guess you're like well why isn't it calling that right now well maybe it is like we just don't know because we don't have any print statements on process rules in fact if i said print processing rules near 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 take over siobhan's teaching job Look, it's saying processing rules just all over the place. You see, that has been here. That problem's been here for a while. So, okay, we shouldn't be processing rules all the time. We shouldn't be processing rules when we're aiming. We should only be processing rules when the balls have stopped in what circumstance? When the balls are in play. That's when we should be processing the rules. So here we actually, okay, I knew it. This hunch was right. So we shouldn't instantly call processing rules when all balls stopped willy darn nilly what the heck we want it to only call it when the balls have stopped and we're in the balls are currently in play play state i knew it so um let's create a darn function on all balls stop that's when we should call process rules but not all the time only if the game state is current play state is equal to enums dot play state dot balls in play. That's the only time it should process rules. For now, 
We can change it later. But for now, that's the only time we should process a role if it's in that play state. So did I get rid of that already? Because that was just so unsightly. Print, bring it back. Processing. All right, save. Hit play. Okay, it's still happening all the darn time. Oh yeah, because I didn't. See, this is why we do this. This is why you should just check every time. This doesn't look right. Hey, it looks better. Um, this is why we should not just like move on, even though I've been doing that a lot, is because we haven't connected it to the thing we just did. All sorts of things. So on, all ball stop. Pass in the pick and bake pizza. Hopefully you didn't start the tutorial at this point because you're like, what? Pick and bake pizza? Oh, stop. Keep that print statement. <laughs> Doesn't call it. Doesn't call it. Sweet. Now let's go ahead and stop the ball. And why, I, I didn't need to shoot the ball that far. I could have shot it like an inch in front of me. Inch, sorry. Centimeter. Hey, hey it only calls it once. Perfecto. We've been talking about pizza a lot. I've ba I'm basically Italian now. So let's uh, delete the print of the rule. I, I'm not Italian. In fact, that was probably horrible. I'm Mario. That's who I am. Who plays pool? Why isn't there a Mario pool? There probably is. We're making Mario pool. Let's sell it to Nintendo. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's not enough code <laughs> for this to be an Nintendo game. Uh, okay, well, what's the other problem? Because we know there are other problems. For example, if we think about it, it was calling that same, this print, like, constantly here, as if ball dot is object ball, like, that shouldn't have happened. It should have only called that function all the ridiculous amount of times in the process rules function outside of this for each loop, right? This shouldn't have been called constantly, because this should only happen once we've processed the rules for that turn. It's not like that turn was continuous, but wasn't it? Here's something that it's very easy for us to have forgotten about. We have this uh, array called occurrences during shot, right? It's keeping track of the occurrences during that shot. Not all occurrences ever. When we do ball potted, we're just continuously, just like mindlessly adding it to the occurrences. We're like, hey, just keep adding them. These occurrences just keep happening. All right. No, we want to get rid of the ones that are here. Like it doesn't automatically, like the GDD script doesn't automatically know, hey, let's get rid of those occurrences. So when the shot is done, which is like, I guess right here, let's, let's clear that list. Dot, uh, what? let's look through here. Clear, that sounds good. Clear the list. Now it will get rid of the, all the occurrences right before that shot is completed. Complete. All right, let's go. Master Chief knows how I'm feeling. I'm gonna hold him close. All right, we're gonna make it through this together. We're gonna make it through this together. Uh, what do we got left? Um. We've assigned the player suit. It seems to work. Okay, let's make it so that the HUD updates the text. Because we don't want to just like print it. Um, why was it getting mad at me for a second there? It was like, hey, 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 he's here. He's here. Go back to normal. It's like, hey, what? What? What happened? It's like, oh no, Siobhan, nothing. Nothing wrong. All right, let's keep going. Um, We're going to change this. It's going to say player whatever, one or two, but let's like make it so that uh, it like says in parentheses whether it's solids or stripes. This already is extremely long. I like this CPID junk. So let's do var CPID is equal to game state. In fact, let's just call game state GS, but whatever, it's too late. I mean, it's not, but. <laughs> Uh, current player ID. We can convert all that stuff into just four letters. It's very cool. You're like, well, why didn't we just call it CPID in the game state? Because that's not descriptive at all. This is just a local variable. Okay. Like, 
whenever we need to shorten it, we can shorten it. So whatever you want, it's just this, it's just for this function, okay? It's a short function. You can always very quickly see what this means. This, if you're just using all sorts of arbitrary abbreviations, like that's not going to help anybody. Okay, um, because that's where we defined it originally. All right, I'm just like game programmer thinking, right? Um, okay, so actually, while we're at it, let's just fix this, shorten this, CPID. How about that? How about that? All right, shortened it up. Um, well, what else? Uh, well, we want to know who, what the player suit is. So let's start typing. So player suit. Well, what is the player suit? Well, it's whatever the game state dot ball suit. I'm hearing like shots. I think literally there's a shooting going on right now. I'm a little bit nervous. And I know I joke about everything. But I'm a little nervous. Like, I'm hearing shots. Like, this is not the 4th of July, which is an American holiday. It involves blowing up stuff. All right. Game state dot ball suit by player ID. Uh, the CPID. Okay, well, here's the problem. This player suit is going to give me what the current player suit is, right? It's going to give me that ball type that is either solids or stripes. But if you remember, solids or stripes is either 0 or 1, right? Come back to the games. Not game state. Um, Enums. It's either going to be zero or one, because an enumerator is just a, is just uh, integers. This is zero. This is one. This is two. This is three. This is four. I don't want to say, hey, we're in player state zero, like that. What? No. Our game's uh, ball. Your your <laughs> ball suit is zero. Uh, I don't even know if it's called a suit. Okay, that's like I'm pretending like this is cards or something. So what we want to do is we want to say, okay, if it's zero, then player suit is solids. If it's one, then player suit is stripes. Well, you know what the problem with that is? Well, first of all, you could rearrange it, but you could just do a match and you can say set player suit, the string equal to like player suit string equals and then a match. Like if you do the whole like game state by player ID and say if it's solids, then equals string solids. And you're probably eventually going to do that if you want to to say anything like more than just the name of the ball suit. But I want to teach you one additional thing you can do. One of the additional advantages of using an enum instead of just a bunch of like consts set to variables or <laughs> don't do strings. Please don't do strings. But you could. Um, you can actually get the enums as an array of the string representation of the enum names. So that you're basically getting an array of solids, stripes, cue ball, eight ball, TBD. You can do that. You can just get it back as an array of strings representing the names of the enums. To do that, uh, what you can do. Uh, well, first of all, before we do it, let's just check to see if this is not. If it's TBD, then we want to skip this, right? So only if it's not TBD. So if not the player suit is equal to enums dot ball type dot tbd, right? Only if it's not this. So what we're going to do is we're going to say a variable a ball type as strings. Ball types as strings? Whatever. And it's going to be enum dot, what is it called? Well, first of all, the type that we want. Just ball type. Bolly type in its enums. A, a property of enums is called keys. See, actually, can, I think it's called keys. Like, yep, there it is, keys. We can see how big, how many there are. We can check if it's empty, blah, blah, blah. We can do keys, which is basically like the string names of those, uh, of the ball types, as I had mentioned. So now that we have the keys, what we can do is we can use the key the zero or one from the player suit because the player suit is going to be zero or one because it's getting the raw ball suit in enumerator value and we're going to use that as our key to be able to get the string from our array right because if it's zero it's going to get the first item of the array which is solids right so we're just going to go ahead and do it directly so player label we already have player label and we're just going to add to the player label actually it's the text of the player label we're going to just add to it 
uh, I don't know, like a space and then like in parentheses. This is probably not a great way to do it, but you know, for the sake of time, let's just do something. And oh my gosh, you're trying to help me, but you're not helping. All right, very good. Plus, plus. It's like I'm creating some like ASCII art here. Uh, well, what is it that we want to do? Well, we want the ball type as strings and uh, specifically at the location of whatever the player suits uh, enumerator values. Again, player suits can be either zero or one because it's not TBD. I guess it could be like Q ball or something. But anyways, if it's, well, it could be like red or yellow, right? It could be whatever. It doesn't matter as long as it's not TBD. Um, it's like snooker or something. And uh, so it's basically we're going to wrap it in like what look like parentheses inside of the uh, HUD text. So this is what we're actually going to print. We're going to put inside of the HUD the value of either solids or stripes. When we do enums.ballType.keys, it's going to give me back an array of strings, solid stripes, you know, cue ball, etc. And we're going to get solids or stripes because player suit is either going to be 0 or 1 based on basically the index of that enumerator. If this is confusing to you, this shouldn't be confusing to you. If every like, then everything else was confusing. I need to not belabor this. <laughs> I, okay, I don't want to dismiss it. Maybe this is the only confusing thing. To do. <laughs> Extract this out, like if you really need to. Call it balls or player suit string if you really need to. I should have just done that. It was shorter than okay. So player one currently says nothing because it's TBD. In fact, I'm just going to go, ooh, don't go in the pocket. I forgot. I'm going to actually just do nothing. It should still be TBD. It should just say player two. Actually, it doesn't say anything because remember, we never actually change whoever the current player is. Shoot the ball. That was kind of cool. I'm so bad. I have not shot like one ball in. I think one time I've hit a ball in. Go in the pocket. Thank you, cheat mode. Now it's going to still say player one, but hopefully it'll say what player one is. Stripes. We hit the stripes in. Perfect. See that? Worked. <clears throat> Remember, and it worked because the play state changed. Inside of our rule processor, we changed the play state right here. So that changed. Um, like we had changed, we had set up the new like you know suit for the player by player id and then we changed the state and so the hud was able to change take in the new changed game state and make sense of it through it's connected on games on uh, play state changed um callback for that signal okay wow Let's make it to someone else's turn. <laughs> Too many turns, right? So in the process rules function, remember the player can either keep their turn or they're gonna lose their turn at the end of this shot. So how do we check to see if they should keep their turn or if they should lose their turn? Just like before, set a default in, in some kind of local variable. Um, let's call it, let's make an assumption about what's gonna happen and we'll change the assumption if it becomes the other thing. Uh, ver player keeps turn is walrist to false. We're going to say that we're going to assume the player is going to lose their turn. And that's a great assumption because we're going to test it. If that remains the case, if player keeps turn is equal to false, and you're like, couldn't you say like not player keeps turn? Yeah, I'm just showing you a different way to do it. I have different moods. I like saying equal equal to false when I can. Like when it's at the end of like a like a conditional expression like that, it's kind of annoying to like keep writing things out. But if it's here just by itself, I like doing this because it really reinforces what we're checking. We're not doing anything falsy. We're not saying like is it zero, is it null, is it whatever. We are checking specifically if the player keeps turn is equal to this value. Okay, it's a little bit safer and it's a little bit more descriptive. So anyways, um, and supposing that's the case, then we are going to change whoever the current player is. So game state dot current player ID is equal to the other player, right? Hey, we're using it another time. Get player, other player ID. Oh, wait, do we have that CPID junk up here? We don't. 
<laughs> their CP ID. It's going to be very useful. Game state dot current player ID. Okay, awesome. So we can use CP ID here. Okay, remember we created this function. It returns whatever the other player's ID is. So we're going to set the current player ID to whatever the other's player ID because the player didn't keep their turn. They committed a foul. <clears throat> or something like that. Failed to hit a ball in. Okay, so we give it to the other player. So let's test it. Remember, it's always going to be false. So it doesn't matter whether we hit a ball in or not. It's going to be the other player's turn. Should be. And we're changing the game state, and the HUD should know about it. Player two. Very good. Cool. It worked. Okay, well, that's not actually the case. The player should only keep their turn. But the player should be able to keep their turn, right? So the player keeps their turn should be equal to true somewhere. Somewhere in our code, we need to say player keeps turn is equal to true. And also, let's get rid of the stupid print statement. Actually, don't just litter your code with commented out print statements. Don't be lazy. Gosh darn it. Delete your print statements you're not using anymore. You can rewrite it quickly. It's so it's like it's like one of these things where you're like you get stuff and you're just like kind of put it in your house. And for a while, it's like eh, it's not a big deal. But then it gets to the point where you want to burn your house down because you're like, there's too much stuff in here. Get rid of the stuff before it gets out of hand. You don't want stupid commented out print statements everywhere. It's so silly. Don't do that. Especially because like, if there's a print that's happening, just like print, and it's like, dang it, that's annoying. Where is that coming from? You can search your whole code base for print. If you search for your whole code base for print, and there's like 300 commented out print statements, and it's like, dang it. <laughs> I mean, it's not like that big of a deal. All right. Um, so when should this player keeps turn be equal to true? Well, when their ball, when they hit in their own ball type. Okay, so, well, when should that happen? Well, when there is a pocket occurrence and that ball happens to be of the same suit as the player. But we want to check that after we check the, and set the ball suit for the player because we want to allow that first ball to go in to set the suit and then also to give the player another turn. We don't want to like check to see because the ball, the player is going to be TBD until this happens. So let's let that happen first if it's the case. And here we're going to check if we're going to check if the ball's type is the same. And you can do game state first. You know what? That maybe would have been better. Not necessarily because this is kind of short and this is going to go off the edge of the screen. And so we kind of have an idea of what is the rest of this is going to say. It's going to be ball suit by player ID, specifically the current player's ID. If that's the case, oh my gosh, we got to 80. We're at 80. The homeowners association is mad. <laughs> Someone's going to call the police. Or worse, the homeowners association. All right. Um, some of you are like, what is a homeowners association? Is that like an America thing? It's basically like a kingdom set by a bunch of people Let's just say that i don't want to get too much further it's like i'm like this super cranky about this as if this is like affecting my life right now all right um we're playing pool what we have nothing to be upset about in this situation where the ball is the players you know matches the ball suit for the current player then we're gonna say that the player keeps turn is true this this is how we break the curse Okay, this is how we kiss the frog. This is how we break the curse. Okay, and in that case, this won't happen. Let's test it. Why not? Okay, if I like hit the ball for like a just an inch, it's like boop. That was more than an inch. Let's just end it. It should now be player two because we didn't hit a ball in. If I hit this, cool. Now let's go ahead and hit a ball in. Let's hit, I guess, this stripe ball. You go in. Go in. I feel like a red winged blackbird right now. I'm just like bossing them around. You go in. <clears throat> All right. It says player two stripes. You see how player two shot? Player two kept their turn and their stripes. Wow. I'm not going to waste time. You can test it if you want, but you can keep hitting in balls. And then as long as it's a stripes ball, you're going to keep your turn.
that was pretty sweet. And that, that was it. That's all we needed to do. It wrote itself, basically. We only added like a couple of lines of code. We didn't have to worry about stuff. And we didn't have to worry about all these systems are now coupled with each other and all this other stuff because we set it up well to begin with. We had our big decisions. We made the right decisions. Now it's so easy to be like, this is the occurrence that happened. This is the ball that went in. These are the player suits. And everybody knows who needs to know. And it all set up. It's like I just wrote a line of code and everything worked. Okay, let's handle fouls. Same thing. Let's assume that a foul has been committed. Or let's assume that a foul has not been committed. Ver foul committed is equal to, let's walrus it equal to false. A foul has not been committed. But if a foul becomes committed, we're talking a lot about committing things like crimes and HOA stuff, but in this case we're committing a foul. Don't give the HOA an idea. This becomes true if a certain circumstance happens. When does a foul get committed? So many things. Oh my gosh. If the ball doesn't hit anything, if the ball goes into a, the cue ball goes into a pocket no matter what happens, if the, you know, unless you also hit an eight ball and then it is lost, but into a pocket, if the ball hits the wrong type of ball first before it hits, you know, the correct ball, if, you know, there's all sorts of different ways to commit a foul. Let's just handle one kind of foul in this tutorial and let's just make it so that, that when the cue ball goes in the hole it's a foul so if ball dot ball type is equal to specifically the enums ball type the cue ball if it was a cue ball then there was a foul that we know is equal to true sorry about you that's a foul you don't hit your cue ball in let's stop putting so many spaces okay that's a foul. Um, <clears throat> what else is a foul? Well, let's not worry about that. I already said that we're not going to worry about that. Um, but we do know that um, we're going to have to ask a question about whether or not this foul has been committed, right? If foul is committed, we want to do something. Something. It's going to be the ball in hand, right? Um, but if it's not a foul, then do everything else, right? If it's not a foul, then um, player keeps turn. Should they keep the turn always? Not if they commit a foul. But let's ask that question above if the foul is committed, because the foul being committed actually has like a little bit more to do with what ends up happening. Whether the player keeps their turn or not is something that we can kind of just like do as like a quick one-off. We're going to set the play state to aiming if it was a foul, if it was not a foul. So if it was a foul, then let's think about it. But if it wasn't a foul, then we're going to the aiming play state. And regardless, we're going to clear the occurrences during shot and we're going to uh, complete the shot for now. Get out of here, Nats. Okay, well, what is it? Well, we're not going to go to the aiming play state right away. We're going to go to the ball and hand play state. Do we even have that play state? I don't think we do. So if I go to enums, no, we don't. So we're going to expand the enumerator. Oh, gosh, we're going to expand an enumerator. That's another one of these times where we should probably... I should have brought another water bottle or something. <clears throat> we're going to do enums. No, what am I doing? We're going to do ball and hand. We're going to add that. Because that's what happens when you foul. That's what always happens when you foul. No matter what version of pool you're playing. I think, right? I don't know. I'm way too lazy to type this right now. Ball in hand. Okay. Yeah, that out of town right and we can even play it just so we can see what happens right if we hit a ball in oh actually well when the cue ball goes in it's gonna be a foul but like look what happens it's gonna be like uh we're down here now <laughs> okay that's not good we want to place it on the table right so let's come back to the play system and what are we going to do uh, when we set up our next shot? 
We're going to set Q-Stick to visible. We're going to make the aim cam the current camera. Really more than, okay, there's other things that happen if it's in ball in hand. We're not actually going to set the Q-Stick to visible. We're not actually going to make the aim cam the current camera. We're going to stay in the overhead cam, and we're going to place the ball on the table with no Q-Stick visible. But we are so late right now. Okay, I'm going to let you like create the additional functions and like do smart things. I'm just going to, this setup next shot thing happens whenever shot is completed. And shot is completed like always. <laughs> We're just going to go with it. This is not how we want to do it, but this is how we want to get done with this tutorial. And let's ask the question if the game state dot uh, current play state is specifically the ball in hand play state. Again, we can always relocate this. It's not a big deal. We're just making use of the fact that this is always going to be called. And so if it happens to be ball in hand, then we got, we're just going to move the cue ball directly. See, what really you should be doing is going into ball in hand mode. But I'm going to like assume that we're instant. In fact, I'm going to even write it down. For now, like complete ball in hand. Completed. Complete ball in hand instantly. Okay, like this is what happens at the end of ball in hand, which is you place the ball on the table. And we're going to not just <laughs> complete it. We're going to put it specifically in, let's just put it in the head spot. You're like, well, what if there's already a ball there? Well, yeah, ball in hand prevents that from happening when you actually complete it. We're just kind of testing this out. Um, cue ball dot position is equal to a uh, head spot. What was it? Billiard table dot head spot. And what else do we need to do? We need to set the cue, the game state back to um, enums dot play state dot aiming. Because at the end of ball in hand, you're going to go back to aiming. Right? At the end of ball in hand, you're going to set the cue ball's position. Right? Both of those things are going to happen. So like we're just kind of cheating. You're going to have actual functions where they actually call a function that says like complete ball in hand or whatever it is you need to do. <laughs> but I'm just doing it all right here because I just want to instantly complete ball in hand, just putting the cue ball back to where it goes. At this point, this is where you might start thinking like, wouldn't it maybe have been better to do that play, that uh, state um, design pattern thing? Right, because anytime a play state has changed in the setter, we can basically call the enter function of the new play state, and then the exit function of the play state whenever you know it's it also like exit the last one, exit current play state, set the new current play state, set its enter function, and kind of handle ball in hand separately through its own like input system so that it's like moves the ball around. You know what? Maybe you want to do that. Welcome to. But you know what? I really still don't think, I still don't, and I stand by it. I don't think that this is going to be too much of an issue to deal with this uh, state machine, this finite state machine, just by using like matches and conditionals. Um, what are we, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to see if like this, like cue ball going in here is not going to end the game. It's still underneath the table. I think I know what the heck is going on here. Uh oh. Let's hit the balls and then go inside the pocket while those balls are still moving. Okay. Still went down there. <laughs> Is this happening? Uh, it should be. Let's solve this problem. Okay, if there's a foul committed, if the ball was, oh, no. For our ball script, we set the default to be the cue ball. Here's where we can kind of debug it. <laughs> and you can use um, 
you can use uh, what are these stupid things called? Breakpoints, if you want. Let me use prints because it's just easier for you to see what's going on. And I mean, that's not a really good reason. Print. Um, actually, no. We know this is going to become true. We're down here. So we're going to print foul committed. This is going to be helpful to us, debug. We're going to say, is foul committed true or false? <clears throat> Let's shoot it right in the pocket. Foul committed is false. That was a foul. That was a foul. Some balls. Go in here. I suspect I know what's going on here. Falcon is false. So it seems that the problem actually has to do with this. This is never actually becoming true. <laughs> you see it? You probably saw it a long time ago. And you're like, when's Shabon going to catch it? Maybe never. Because Shabon's so tired, we never catch it. We're checking to see if the ball is a cue ball if we've already confirmed that it isn't. Is the ball an object ball? Well, if it's an object ball, it's not a cue ball, right? So, oop. Okay, good. You see what I did? I had this in the wrong stupid place. Happens to the best of us. And I'm not the best of us, but it happens to the best of us, whoever they are. Okay, set the ball. Let's go into a pocket. And foul committed is true. And it went back. It went back. Ta-da! But I can't shoot the ball yet. Because the ball is frozen. I should have let you guess. But the ball's frozen. I set it back, positioned it back, but I didn't set it to be unfrozen. Let me check one thing here real quick. I shoot it directly into the pocket. Oh, I'm glad I did that. We could have done the tutorial. We could have finished the tutorial without that. I may have not caught that. Um, do you see what happened here? It's like, wait a second. I shot the ball directly in the pocket and it said foul committed was false. But when I hit the balls and the balls are moving around when I go in the pocket, then, if I'm guessing correctly, foul committed is going to be true. Why did this happen, everybody? Why did this happen? What is this? This is like a what we would call a dastardly bug. Because it, there's no error, and it behaves unexpectedly. This could be even more dastardly if it wasn't as clean cut as balls are moving, the cue ball goes in, foul. Balls are not moving, cue ball goes in, no foul. This bug is what we call a race condition. We ran into a race condition. Remember how I was warning you about potential race conditions with like setting head spot inside of the ready function and like if it's needed elsewhere before it has been changed, then it could or could maybe not be actually set. We are dealing with a grade A race condition right now. So the problem with this, the race condition that's happening here, is the state of the game depends on two effectively asynchronous calls. Two things that are happening at the same time, where sometimes the thing that happens at the same time, this one wins. Sometimes when the same thing happens at the same time, this one wins. And you as a programmer don't have any strong sense of which is when. That's bad so we want to fix that so where is that happening well let's look let's do a look see here when does on balls stop happen here this is what i'm going to try this is what i'm this is going to demonstrate what the problem is i'm going to say occurrences and i'm also going to list the occurrences during the shot it went over but whatever If I hit the balls and then go in the pocket, 
look what it's going to say. It's going to say foul committed, true, and there's the occurrence right there. The cue ball falling in the pocket, right? That was an occurrence, ball to pocket. But if I run this again, and I shoot this right into a hole, into a pocket, ha, false occurrences. It's like false pretenses. <laughs> false occurrences. Uh, yeah, it says foul committed, false, and occurrences is an empty array. So the rule processor ran, and there was nothing in the array, which should have been a foul, frankly, because no occurrences happened. <laughs> but we aren't checking for that foul yet. This should have been in the array. So let's backstep it, breadcrumb it. This, is, this should have happened. On ball pot, it didn't happen. This did happen. Process rules got called. So what happened here is this on ball potted didn't happen. This on ball stopped did happen. This on balls stopped shouldn't have happened until all the balls either stopped or were potted. So what's happening here is this on ball stop is happening in processing rules before this on ball potted is called. So when is on ball potted called? It's being called inside of the ball function. Whenever on ball, no, it's not. It's in the pocket function. Sorry, the pocket script. Mm -hmm. This is the only time where ball potted is emitted. Who is listening for this ball potted? Who's listening? The ball is listening for on ball potted. The game's, uh, the rule processor is listening for on ball potted. You see the problem here? The problem is that whose on ball potted is going to happen first? Is the ball's on ball potted going to happen first? Or is the rule processor's um, on ball potted going to happen first? Which one? It matters because. When the ball's on ball potted happens, it is going to freeze and it's going to say that its sleeping state has changed. And when its sleeping state has changed, it's going to call this function, which is going to emit all balls stopped. So if the cue ball was the last ball because it was on ball potted, then it's going to say that ball stopped moving is now zero and it's going to emit the on ball stopped signal, which is going to happen instantaneously, synchronously. It's going to emit the on ball stopped and what's going to happen is that the rule processor is going to get that in the on ball stopped and it's going to process the rules because the ball got the on ball potted and called on ball stops first before the rule processor was able to add the occurrence to the on ball uh, to the list of occurrences because it's on ball potted lost the race for the race condition i'm glad this happened because we now have to fix it. Unfortunately, race conditions aren't always, they don't always have a really clean, nice fix. Race conditions often are awful. Okay. Um, this is one of the problems with signals. Okay. Everyone can like spout on about how signals are the solution to everything. They aren't the solution for everything. They are great for decoupling systems. They are great. But you know what? The next trend might be like, never use signals. The, I mean, it's always extreme. Usually they push back in like an extreme way. Right now, the trend is, yay, you know, composition, signals, la, la, la. But these are the things that happen when you use signals. Because when you pass junk into some kind of signal, like here, call this. In what order are they going to call it? Who, which subscription is going to get it first? A lot of times it doesn't matter. Sometimes it does. And when it does, that's when you really just sometimes it's better to write code that's a little bit more annoying, a little more coupled potentially even, so that you have more control over this, the order in which functions are being called. Now, some of you might be like, well, actually, there are a lot of ways you can handle that with signals and stuff. Yeah, absolutely and obviously. But we're now taking a little bit of a hit on readability when we try to like make up for the fact that this kind of system runs into potentially a race condition. It's always going to be a hazard of something like a signals system. 
when you like don't call a number of functions in like an orderly manner in separate systems that all kind of communicate through a signals system. Anyways, so um, so what we need to do is we need to delay the calling of whatever function we feel like needs to be last. What should happen last? Well, we want to make sure we account for all of the occurrences before we process these rules. So the process rules function sounds like a perfect thing to happen at the end of the tick. Whenever we are entirely done, we want to call this at the end. And you can do that by using what's called call deferred. When you do call deferred, process rules is going to call at the end of the tick. Rather, it's going to make sure that it's at the very end. So even though on balls stopped is going to happen first because the ball potted happens first, and therefore the on balls or all balls stopped uh, signal is going to emit first. Um, this is going to wait and call it at the end. I'm going to go ahead and hit play. Shoot the ball in the pocket. Nice. Foul committed. There's my occurrence. I guess we can run it again and make sure that it's still working for the other balls. Balls are moving. Get out of the way. Cheat mode. Foul committed. There's my occurrence. So I fixed the race condition. <clears throat> I want to make it clear, though, um, that don't follow me. I think this is the cleanest way to do it. But you can fix it if you were to choose to fix it. And you might choose to fix it by delaying the emission by doing like emit, delaying the emit um, inside of the ball script. So instead of like calling all balls stopped right away, you can call this all ball stop signal deferred. I don't like that as much because unless you can like, unless inextricably, the all ball stop should be the last thing that happens among these signals, then fine. But that's not always the case. That seems contrived. It makes more sense to say, let's wait to process rules until we got all the occurrences. That makes sense. Saying just arbitrarily, seemingly, oh, let's just delay when all the balls are stopped. Why? And there's no obvious reason for that. Even if they're what, like, you should definitely comment this. You should definitely, definitely, definitely say this prevents a race condition. If you must. There's other ways to handle this. It's just probably just the fastest way. But if you wanted to be able to defer an emit call, I really want to let you know that this emit function is not really an ordinary function. Call deferred should happen, should work on any kind of function right it doesn't matter what the function is you should be able to defer it but for some reason if you do call deferred on emit if you remember correctly maybe it's been fixed it hasn't been fixed um it's like what is an emit cannot find property emit this is a method okay it should work if i click on this it says Okay, this is apparently a method, and it says emit the signal. All callables connected to the signal, but is the signal, is this emit function callable? Apparently not. <laughs> this call deferred should happen on any callable. So if you're in a situation like this, and there's probably other situations like this in Godot, I just want to help you figure out how to sit, handle it. You can still just defer this by wrapping it in another function. You can create another named function called like call all balls stop emit if you really want to. But you know, you can also just create a function here. We'll call it, uh, like, there's some, like, I don't know, what, what should we call it? Um, emit all balls stopped equals func. This. Comment this out, just I still have it. And so now what we can do is we can say emit all ball stopped dot call deferred. Do you see what I did here? This is what's called the lambda function. Okay. I've stored this 
uh, inside of this identifier, instead of using the func keyword, I stored it inside of like a normal variable. And we can use call deferred on this function that we're just like creating as like basically the local variable inside of this. Uh, if this looks bad, first of all, um, but it does what we need it to do. You also don't need to name this, by the way, if you wanted to. Let's comment this out. Comment this out. Uh, oops, I didn't use control K on this one. You can actually call deferred on this directly just by, <laughs> just like I had done before with the anonymous function syntax. Okay. Um, deferred. See. I've just created an anonymous function. It doesn't even have to have a name. As long as you put it in parentheses, that's the expression. The expression itself is the anonymous lambda function, and we can call deferred directly on it without even having a name. Just the same ways. And we set anything to an equal sign uh, on the right-hand side as an expression. So this is an expression. We're just calling deferred on it. It looks terrible. <laughs> I'm just going to keep it here because, I don't know, for posterity. Get out of town. What? What's your problem? I don't have any problems. There shouldn't be any problems. Oh my gosh, it's because it's got like weird indentations. Gosh, these indentation languages. Oh boy. All right. Fixed it. So our race condition. Well, okay, the ball is still frozen the heck when it respawns, right? This is pool. Shoots, nothing happens. Let's unfreeze it. Well, if we look just while we're here, we're just um we're doing this on all bond on ball potted. I want this like setting the freeze state thing to be something that like I can put in a function so that I can use it in other places. <laughs> because I'm not always going to just set it to be frozen. I'm going to set it to be unfrozen. This is a great uh function. I'm going to make it actually a, a public function, so I'm going to put it here. I'm going to call it a set freeze state. And I guess new freeze state. It's going to be a boolean. <clears throat> and we're going to do this. Because the sleeping state changes when we freeze and unfreeze. Um, no, we're not going to change the position. We only do that on ball on ball potted. We're going to set the freeze state here, but instead of uh, self dot freeze is equal to true, let's do self dot freeze is equal to whatever the new freeze state is, and self dot sleeping is going to be whatever the new freeze state is. And we're going to say that a new sleeping state is, you know, the sleeping state has changed because whether we set this to true or false, the sleeping state has changed. And here we're going to say self dot that free state. I, again, I like to do self because I'm being very clear that this is a method that belongs to this particular class. <clears throat> I guess. Uh, when we've potted the ball, the free state should be true. Inside of the play system, it's like, should we put it here? Should we set the position here and also freeze it or unfreeze it? Sure. We made it public for this reason. It's the cue ball. The play system knows what to do with the cue ball. It can call the uh, the you know the, the freeze state on it directly. Um, so we've changed the uh, the play state, and let's set the cue ball's freeze state. Set freeze state. Shouldn't it know about this set freeze state function? Isn't the cue ball a ball? No, it's a rigid body 3D. We never fixed that. Okay, um, the fact that it didn't autocomplete is because it's a rigid body, not a ball, right? So what we can do is, um, now that we know that the ball has a class name, we can say that this is a ball. The re the awesome thing about that is now here inside of the main scene, I can create like a rigid body 3D. And if I try to, okay, with, let me move this up a bit so we can see it. <clears throat> if 
I have play system selected and I try to update the cue ball to this rigid body 3D. No can do, no smoking sign, because it's not a ball. Delete that rigid body. However, if I click and drag, if I click play system and I trick, click and drag cue ball here, it does allow me to do it because the cue ball is a ball. Because the rigid body that this cue ball, you know, rigid extends um, in the script, we extend it to be a ball, right? The ball extends it. All right, very cool. Now that we've done that, and we've said it's a ball, can we say sleep state chain? No, what do we call it? Dot set freeze state. Auto completed. Let's set it to false. It should be false now. Right into the pocket. Player two, can you shoot? Player two can shoot, one right into the pocket. <laughs> okay, so what should happen is it should be player one's turn because we committed a foul. And there's no solids or stripes. Let's have the player one hit the ball. This time, let's have player one hit a ball in the pocket. Uh, let's do the, the solid ball. It should still be player one's turn, and they should be solids. Well, will you look at that? We still are player one, and we are still solid. Isn't that awesome? If we hit a ball, a solid ball, into the pocket, and we commit a foul, it says it's player one's turn still. It shouldn't be. So let's fix that real quick. Um, in the rule processor, when do we allow the player to continue to keep their turn? Only if we say that their player turn, uh, keep player turn is like true. No, 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 no. The player should lose their turn. Not only when their player turn is false, keeping their turn is false, we want to set the other player ID here. Let's get rid of this, solve this problem. Um, also, so, or, if a foul was committed is equal to the truth. So the player should lose their turn if the player keeps turn as false, right? Which is to say that they didn't set their player turn as equal to true or that foul committed is true. In those two cases, so or the player should lose their turn regardless of if a ball went in of their suit. Doesn't matter. They lose their turn if they committed a foul. I'm going to assume it works, okay? Just we don't have time to like, you know, do anything about that. We got to figure out how to handle uh, how many balls are remaining, right? There are seven balls. There are seven solid balls and seven striped balls, and we want there to be a win condition, right? So how do we determine how many balls are left? I guess we're going to have to make that big old list of balls, right? No, let's not do that. No big old list of balls. The reason we didn't do the big old list of balls, one of the reasons we did not do the big old list of balls is because it makes it easier to test. By having just simple numbers like this, we can just set different values and test them. If we have to check to see if all of the solid balls are actually gone, then all of the solid balls have to actually be gone before you can test if the win condition is going to work. Okay, that's fine. But how do we determine how many solid balls there should be on the table? By the ball rack? This is going to be really annoying to test if we start like using objects in memory to determine the uh, conditions. Instead, what we're going to do is go back to the game state. We already keep track of who, like what ball type each player is. Why don't we keep track of how many balls are left for each player? Just as simple integers. There, um, what balls remaining by player ID. This will make things a lot easier to debug. Right? Um, but what is this? It's a, an array of integers. I'm going to expand back out my little editor. I'm going to drag this over. I'm going to double click release game state. Here's my balls remaining. I'm going to make two. And we're going to say, by default, it should be seven and seven, right? OK. 
because there should be seven balls left for solids and seven balls left for stripes. I want to test this code to make sure that my win condition works. So let's say there's just one ball left for each. This is the beauty. So in my debug, like we would probably do this in the debug, but for the sake of time, we're just going to do it in the release game state. In the debug game state, I can set whatever I want and say that this player has two left, this person has three left, this person has one left. This also makes it easier to change the rule set so that like there are three players and each player has however many left, right? We aren't shoehorned into one type of thing and dealing with a big old list of balls makes it kind of more unruly in that way. I know this seems like, well, isn't this kind of like too simple? Like, aren't we going to run into problems? Yeah, potentially. You can run into problems any kind of way. Come on. This is like, let's, <laughs> I'm okay with this problem if there is one. Okay, so when are we reducing that number? Again, so in the game state, we have an array of integers where index zero of that array is, refers to the player one and index one of the array is player two. Okay, so inside of my rule processor, I'm going to determine how many balls are left um, for each player. So if it's an object ball and the, it's the ball, they hit their own kind of ball in, which is what we want, then the player keeps their turn and they actually reduce one of their balls remaining. So game state dot balls remaining by player ID, it's the current player's ID, and we're going to uh, minus equal that by one. They have one fewer ball that they have to hit in pocket. Um, that's good. But else, what's the else clause here? If the ball was not the ball type of the current player's ID, should the other player loot like reduce one of their balls remaining? It's not their turn. Yeah. So it doesn't matter whose turn it is. Regardless, if it was an object ball and it w was not the player's ball, then reduce one for the opposing player. Game state. Dot balls remaining. It's just writing itself. I love it. So the opposing player ID minus equals one. Is that a thing? Did we write it here? We didn't. Uh... Opposing player ID is get get their player ID. Pass in the current player ID. Did we use this get other player ID already? Yeah, we did. Let's, so we don't need to do all this. We can just say other player ID. It becomes the other player ID's turn. Okay, do you see how that works? It just wrote itself, basically. Isn't this beautiful? And the, the fact of the matter is we keep track of all the balls that went into the pockets. So we can check all the balls that happen. We don't go like one at a time. Oh, this turn was this thing. We go in like balls potted. Whose turn is it? Like, no, we're not dealing with that kind of stuff. We're just going through all the occurrences and we can check to see who's the current player. What is the order of occurrences? We can know what happened in the order that it happened. It makes it so much easier for us to be able to check the kind of weird fouls there are. Okay, so that number goes down. This number should get to zero. So now we can kind of create the win state. We don't actually have to think that much harder. We can do print like balls remaining and check to see, but for the sake of time, this is actually relatively simple what's happening here. Hopefully, you know, it doesn't, it shouldn't require that much, you know. This pass, okay, handle eight ball and cue ball. Okay, we've, we've done all that. So let's get rid of that. And we're going to check if the ball type is the. Eight ball. That's the win condition, right? Dot eight. Why do I write Bali type? Am I some kind of freaking like what is the word to describe the person who writes Bali type instead of ball? I mean, it's pool. Cool. Here are my Bollies. It's, you know, it's because we wanted to, we want to be less vulgar. These are bollies. They're not balls. Ugh. We're bollies. What were we doing? We're checking the win state, basically. If it was the eight ball and the current player has no balls left, then let's say that's a win. <laughs> 
You're like, don't they have to pick a pocket first? You're out of time, folks. Okay, you do that. That's you. <laughs> All right. You're smart. You know, like it's going to write itself, kind of, right? Partially because we've set this up in a way that it's easy to do. So let's do one last thing. Let's do winning player ID, I guess. And let's like, we can't do positive infinity. Like if we do inf, that's like infinity, but that's going to, that's a float. I think positive infinity is, is of type inf. It's a floating point number yeah no we want it to be an integer so don't do that um this is negative one because there's no no one's player id is gonna be negative one so you're like isn't this kind of ugly it's a local variable in a process rules function if anyone ever wants to see it they can look inside of this function it's not affecting any other system it's not even affecting this system <laughs> it's like the rules process system it's just the stupid little like you know this is the easiest thing to refactor it's just within a function it's a local variable come on don't sweat it it's fine um so how do we want to handle this um if the ball type is uh was the eight ball there's one other question we need to ask about it right we need to ask if also uh the player has no more balls remaining is less than or equal to zero because i guess it could be in the negatives if we started at two and there's like seven balls right and we hit two balls in on that turn um if that's the case if it's less than or equal to zero then the player wins the winning player is the cpid actually if it's the eight ball then any other situation you lose the winning player is actually the other person Even if it was on your turn, they, they you don't they can win by you losing. Effectively, they can win without ever hitting the ball one time. You can just lose, just go out there and lose. Hey, loser, let's go lose. Get in. All right. Anyways, whatever. You, that was an awful use of that meme. All right. The winning player is the opposing player. If we ever were to hit in the eight ball, and we instead of like if we didn't have all our balls in, then we lost. There's actually more ways to lose. Like you could have had all your balls in, you chose the wrong pocket, you lost. You could have had all your balls in, you could have selected the right pocket that the ball went in, and then you hit the cue ball in, you lost. There's actually multiple ways to lose. And we can deal with that later. But for now, this is fine. Okay, we now have a winning player ID. But we want to be able to um win right just because it's a local variable that's set here if the winning player id is not negative one then somebody won so who should know if somebody won like everybody come on tell the whole town ring the bells we're playing pool somebody won all right uh let's go to enums because we gotta let somebody know that somebody won not enums game events signal somebody won Nah, let's just do game ended come on here's the thing though okay who won who needs to know the hud needs to know no the hud doesn't let's make some kind of like game over label okay you in your own time you should create a screen system that has like a game over screen a pause screen that has nothing to do with the hud the hud is like ongoing information about the game as it's being played the game over screen is shouldn't be a HUD thing, even though technically it's like, heads up, you lost or you won, but it should be a modal through a like a screen system. And I'm not creating that screen system in front of you, so, but it shouldn't be part of the HUD. So I'm going to create it. It's just going to be like a label out of the blue. We're going to call it game over label <laughs> because that's what we called it in the beginner tutorial. And if we had an actual screen system, that's what should control this label potentially, but uh, we're just going to have it directly on the game over label. And oh my gosh, just for old time's sake, right? You know, not scripts. Let's see. This is an extra long one. My golly. Game over label. Yeah, I wrote it pretty quick. Here we go. 
die, as in get rid of the text. Not you, my delightful subscribers and people watching. Subscribe if you liked what you've been seeing so far. Um, well, on ready, it's like, didn't we just get rid of that? Yeah, but I didn't like the comments. All right. No comment. Let's connect the game events. Uh, let's get it. We're getting ahead of ourselves, but um, on, on uh, just game ended dot connect to what is going to eventually be on game ended. That we haven't created yet, but you know, we're going to create it right now <laughs> on game ended. Yes. Um, here's the thing about this situation. Now does the game over label need to have the resource, the game state? How are we telling other people who won? You know, like maybe the high score system, maybe the achievement system, maybe the like, whatever. Who needs to know who won? Potentially a lot of people. But should we really put it in the game state? Just because a lot of people need to know doesn't mean you always have to put it in the game state. The state of the game where like the play, like sh the, you know, whoever the current winner is for this moment. I don't know. Is that something that you really need to test to like say like this player won? Go. I guess like you could do that. I think it's a little excessive. I don't think that it really has anything to do with the state of the game. Like whoever the person who won. That sounds like kind of a one off. Like this person won. That has to do with the signal, not with the state of the game, in my opinion. So I think that the game ended should just say who is the winner. Winning player ID. I think that's a better use of this. Because whoever calls game ended, which is going to be probably just the rule processor or maybe like some other like quit the game thing. Um, or fit the game. This winning player ID. Whoever calls it is going to know who won. Just tell everybody through this signal. You're like, well, why did we do that with other stuff? I'm not going to rewind to talk about exactly all the different times we did all of these different things. <laughs> okay. Shot completed has a lot of stuff associated with it, potentially. We created this game state system for a reason, okay, to make this a lot easier. Winning player ID as being part of the game state to like add as debug information or add it, it's just not a very meaningful thing. We can always refactor if necessary. It's like <laughs> mantra it's readability, scalability, we refactor whatever. <laughs> it's like what, how it works. It's fine. That's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to call this function game and uh, we're going to emit that signal game ended when the game is ended. Well, when has the game ended? Well, I mean, you know, the winning player ID is greater than negative one or not equal to negative one. Either way. Um, and that should all that like fouls being committed, play states being aiming. None of that has anything to do with like, like you shouldn't be going back to aiming if someone won. You shouldn't be going to ball in hand when somebody won. So who cares about the fouls? If someone won, they won. So let's do if the winning player ID is greater than negative one or not equal to negative one, whatever you want to call it, something happens, right? Otherwise, all the rest of this stuff happens. Okay, so well, what happens? Uh, well, the thing we already talked about, right? Game events dot. What was it? Game ended. I'm blanking on stuff. Emit. But we're passing in the winning player ID, if you remember. Cool. What does this game over label say, actually? Let's just click the game over label. Okay, let's make it take up the whole screen. So anchor preset, make it take the whole screen. Let's put it in directly in the center, both vertically and horizontally. And let's make it say player x whoever player x is wins it's small so let's just drag this label setting to here so that's bigger <laughs> all right you can make it even bigger it doesn't matter this is a placeholder anyways so game over label should do what um on game ended actually we're going to get the winning player id for, from this signal mission winning player id we're going to say self.text is equal to 
player convert winning player ID to a string. Can we please? Wins. Player game over label should be invisible by default. So I'm going to click the little eyeball icon and I'm going to set it to be visible also. Okay, those are the things that should happen. Again, it's like we haven't tested the code in a while, but this is relatively simple stuff. If anything is broken, we can kind of go back and debug it pretty quickly. So what's happening is that if the ball comes in and it was the eight ball, then the player who wins, right? It's someone's going to win. Once the eight ball goes in, somebody won, right? If the player, if it's the current player doesn't have any balls left, balls remaining, then the, the current player wins. Otherwise, the opposing player wins. That's it. When does ball remaining by player ID get reduced? When it's an object ball and the object ball matches the player's ID or if it matches the other player's ID, <laughs> right? We're subtracting remaining balls regardless of whose turn it is. We're going to reduce it by whatever that type of ball is. And uh, the rule, the release game state starts at 1-1. One, one. It should be 7-7, seven, seven, but we want to test it out, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first lose, I guess. Gosh darn it. I need to make it hit harder. Get out of here. Uh, oh my gosh. This is the worst. Get in the darn pocket. Some of you are like, okay, it's already over, isn't it? Get in the pocket. We hit the eight ball in. The player does not have zero balls remaining. So it should say, <laughs> so it didn't quite work the way we wanted it to. Player one wins. It should have been player two, right? That's why we test ahead of time. The winning player ID is CPID if the player uh, CPID's uh, balls remaining is less than or equal to zero. Okay. And we passed in correct player. Oh my, you know? It, the ob it shouldn't be, an, like, it better not consider that the eight ball is an object ball. That would be bad. So I guess it could go deeper than <clears throat> expected. Okay, so let's let's do it. I don't want to leave it here. If it's an eight ball, let's go ahead and print the balls remaining. This thing. Probably not the best thing to check. Set that eight ball in. Wait a minute. That eight ball is like not where it should be. The eight ball should always be in the middle of the rack. I don't want to fix that before the tutorial's over. Get in there. Do I have to like just create a separate thing for Oh my god. Here we go. Balls remaining. One? Oh. I did the whole thing. Balls remaining one is not less than or equal to zero. So winning player ID should not be current player ID. 
Dang it, did it say player one wins again? That's bizarro land. The winning player ID should be the current player ID. If only if this is true. That shouldn't have been true. Is the opposing player ID correct? Should be. I'm way too tired for this. Um. Oh my gosh. Guys. Oh my gosh. This is why you don't program it like anyways, um the game over label is just saying the winning player ID. That's either zero or one. <sighs> player one is zero and player two is one. We had to add one to it. I'm going to assume it's good. We tested it. It should have said player two. It was fine. But I do want to fix that stupid eight ball thing right before we leave. Notice how the eight ball is now where it should be. That's not where the eight ball is supposed to be. Actually, there's a couple other issues. Yeah, that's definitely not where the eight ball should be. But look, notice how when we lose, like player one's going to lose because we're hitting the eight ball in. I guess we could like test hitting in a ball and then seeing it say win. You test it out on your own. I'm pretty confident that this is good. See, player two wins. Look, what? Why are we able to shoot? Why are we able to shoot? Why are we able to shoot? <sighs> the reason we're able to shoot is because under play system, this happens, right? The cue ball position is set where it goes, is set the freeze state. The cue stick is becomes visible. The aim can becomes current. This is happening. Why? It's happening because shot completed happens. Why is shot complete happening? Because we're doing shot completed here. <clears throat> Don't do shot completed there. Do shot completed. Here. Right? Well, that's a good guess. Let's go ahead and hit these balls. And the eight ball is almost where it was supposed to be. It's like, come on, come on out, eight ball. See, it's easy enough to do cheat mode when it's like hitting any random ball. We're just trying to hit the eight ball in. We're good. <sighs> Player two. Player one, two wins. It's swapping back and forth constantly. Okay, so we've got another problem. The problem is that rule, the process of rules is happening, and it's continuously happening, right? And we're not clearing the occurrences. So basically, we're setting the eight ball every single darn time, and we're calling process rules. Why are we calling process rules? Process rules happens when all the balls have stopped. Right. And all balls stopped when the play state is balls in play. So when that turn ends and we don't do shot completed, then we're never setting play state back to aiming. This isn't happening. This only happens if we didn't win. So the balls are still balls in play right now. And since they're still balls in play, when the balls stop after the eight ball is potted, it's going to call the function. It's going to do on ball stopped and it's going to on all ball stopped <laughs> because and it's going to do call deferred and then it's going to come back in and it's going to try to do it and it's going to do this again. But it's going to like it's going back through that super loop where it's just like, you know, doing on ball stopped, on ball, all ball stopped, all ball stopped, all ball stopped, that same problem. So we're going to do the hackiest solution of all time. This is not a great solution. Um, there's a lot of different ways we can do like a hacky solution here. <laughs> when we win, we're going to set the, uh, game state. Uh, we set the game event, uh, game ended game state. 
but let's let's change the game state itself right and we don't actually have another game state to set so let's just set the current game state equal to uh not the current game state current play state equal to anything other than balls in motion enums dot play state dot it doesn't matter at all rules process will not happen unless balls are in motion so i don't know ball in hand just for kicks it doesn't make any difference at all like fix this please fix this please um let's make it so that the eight ball is always the fifth ball that's easy in the setup balls function if it's uh the eight ball then we set its type to eight ball right but uh, hopefully this actually will be relatively easy oops um We're not doing it in the setup ball function. What am I doing? We're going to do the ball rack because the ball rack is who chooses where the balls are. <sighs> this is this is where my brain is at. Okay. Um, uh, what? Where do you think we should put it? Where do you think? This like rack balls function. Right? Where should it be? Why am I like talking to nobody right now? So the problem is we want the right now the eight ball is going to be just one of these random numbers. So what we're going to do is let's keep track of well, what is the uh the index of the eight ball. Where is the eight ball right now? Let's walrus it to let's look for the eight ball inside of this um, shuffled ball nums. Find what? Number eight. Okay, let's now back up. What is the number at where the eight ball should be, which is at position four, right? Rand num at index four. Let's walrus it to whatever the ball nums are at index four right um it doesn't like this we can't infer random index index four variable because the value doesn't have a set type ball nums i guess range oh yeah range doesn't range returns a variant what the heck did i control click what control click range okay oh no it returns an array of what of like it could be a number of things apparently why shouldn't it always be integers what oh my gosh is it could it be something other than apparently so let's just say it's equal to this but as an integer I don't want to muck around with floats. You don't have to do this. It's not really. All right. Um, so now that we know where the eight ball is and we know where the eight ball should be, then what we can do is let's go ahead and set where the eight ball should be, which is at index four. Remember, one, two, zero, one, two, three, four. That's where the eight ball should be. Let's set that to be the eight ball specifically uh what eight that's where it, that's what should happen at that index but now there's two eights probably so let's set wherever the um really ball nums at wherever the in the eight ball was and let's set it to be whatever the number was at the index four so you see what we're doing we're saying hey where's the eight ball it's like at one, two, six, eight, nine. It doesn't really matter. It's somewhere in here. 
And let's like back up the number of where the eight ball should be. So we've taken that ball out basically. We're holding it in our hand, we're backing it up. And we're gonna put the eight ball in where that eight that ball should be, which is uh, the eight ball should be, which is at index four. And since we're we've backed up that random number that was at index four in our hand, we can now place that where our eight ball was originally when we randomized. So now let's test both of these things at the same time. If I click this, the eight ball, maybe I got lucky, but the eight ball's where it should be. My gosh, I should have broken that harder. Now when we knock the eight ball in, whether we knock in another ball first or just the eight ball, let's let the player one win for a change. Go ahead, go win. Get the other ball in first. Player one should win, and it should only say player one wins, and it shouldn't go back to aiming mode. Nice. And it says it's solids. It's like, by the way, you're solids. Player one wins. Worked. All right. I think that we are long overdue to end this tutorial. And you might be like, wait, hold on. You didn't do ball in hand. You didn't do pick a pocket. You know what? This it, this was enough for hopefully this is kind of like, yay, free version, big, you know, tutorial. And you can make that rest. In fact, in the comments, if you want, go ahead, post like a YouTube video of a screencast of your finished game. Put it on itch. Do, you know, whatever. Please engage. Leave a comment. Um, but I'm thinking, you know what? This whole like, let me know if you want me to do this. If you want another video where I can finish the ball in hand. I can finish the whole setting up the choosing in the pocket. I can handle some additional fouls. You know, I can do some basic other things. I'm probably not going to go in and do all sorts of like, but who knows? Just let me know. And I can make that video. And I think I'm going to set up like a Kofi or something like that. It's kind of like Patreon. And so I can do this whole big tutorial that's like free. Everybody can see it, which is cool. But like, if you want to get the full, the rest of that, like, you know, the last couple systems, then to support me, to support my channel, then I guess you can, you know, uh, pay, pay for that like addendum in Kofi or something like that. Um, let me know how you think about that. The video already covered a humongous amount. Hopefully you can just tack tackle this on your own. You should hopefully at this point know how to be able to do um, really most of the rest of what you would need to do. So please do leave a comment, share this video, like this video. If you found, if you found it to be useful, go ahead and share it to somebody else. Let me know in the comments how you felt about the tutorial. Okay, I really value the feedback. Um, it's this feedback of yours that's motivated me to come back and keep making videos. After a couple of years, you just left such nice comments and stuff. You're like, please help. You, you're like Your videos are like how I like to learn. And it's like, you know, I felt like, okay, I got to keep making these videos. So I value that feedback. It motivates me. Say what you liked about it. Give me, uh, you know, feedback. And I can, you know, maybe go from there. I don't really have a very strong rest of my outro other than thank you if you came this long, came this far. Uh, I really value you and your, uh, you know, subscribing and, you know, watching this video this far. So thanks again. I'm sorry, I'm really tired. Uh, but, you know, until next time, wishing you peace.